Chapter 301 Reservoir If you look down from the sky above where village, the ravine where the village is located is like a claw mark scratched by a giant dragon. The entire wall village is located in the green claw mark. And the tidal flat downstream of the river bend is like a claw mark scratched by a giant dragon. A pool of green blood flowed out. In just three days, great changes have taken place upstream of wall village. And the prototype of the first reservoir has been revealed in this area. The upstream part of the ravine has been sorted out and covers an area of nearly an acre of semicircular stone slabs. Since there is no soil cover here, it is usually deserted and without any vegetation. Nearly 200 craftsmen and laborers work on this construction site every day, busy on the road, seeing the busy work scene in front of him. The old village chief was filled with emotion when he stood on the stone slope. He thought that when he was young, he also thought about changing the situation of the village and tried to transport the fertile river mud from the tidal flats downstream of the river bend, come upstream, and build fields on this barren slate land. However, when the rainy season came to the few acres of fields he had worked so hard to cultivate, all the soil on the stone slabs was washed away by the rivers and streams under the wash of heavy rains, and returned to the tidal flats and turned into mud. For this reason, the old village chief became seriously ill. And now the young knight Serdak also wants to do these things. And his ideas are far more bold than his original ideas. In Soldek's plan, the entire reservoir is divided into five levels. Its overall shape looks like a terrace. Each step is an independent reservoir, surrounded by five reservoirs. Interdependently, after the first reservoir is filled with water, the spring water enters the second reservoir through the overflow port of the reservoir, and so on, until the fifth reservoir is completely completed. The water in the reservoir will in theory. Water storage can allow the villagers of Wall Village to survive the dry periods in spring and summer. According to the requirements of the old village chief, the bottom of the entire reservoir must be flat. And because limestone has strong permeability, the bottom of the water reservoir needs to be paved with a 2-inch thick layer of Potsalanic cement as a waterproof layer. It's not that the price of raw paint in Helensa City is too expensive. Serdak even wanted to paint a layer of raw paint on the bottom of the reservoir. The foundation for the arc-shaped reservoir wall has begun to be poured. The only thing that gives the old village chief a headache is that there are only four horse-drawn carriages in the village. Even if they make three trips a day to continuously transport volcanic ash back, there is still too little volcanic ash. Every time after the volcanic ash is transported back and mixed with lime powder according to the proportion, the craftsmen on site swarm up and snatch up all the volcanic ash cement in an instant. The reservoir project came to a semi-standstill on the third day. After more than a hundred workers leveled the stone slabs of the reservoir, except for the necessary twenty workers who were grinding lime powder on the construction site, the rest of the workers were all they all carried linen bags and carried volcanic ash back from the depths of Mount Paglos by manpower. They heard that you could make money by carrying volcanic ash. That afternoon, the women in Wall Village approached the old village chief one after another and asked him to distribute this kind of good thing to the villagers in advance. The women in the village believe that their strength is not much worse than the laborers in other villages. And they can also carry volcanic ash back from the mountain. After all, you can earn 50 copper coins a day. For the women in the village, this money is not easy to come by. There is nothing in the barren village of Wall. But the people living here have a lot of strength. Even if there is less volcanic ash to carry back. And at the worst, they will get less wages. It is still better than staying in the village all day long where you can't earn the tinkling copper coins. The old village chiefs arranged for a few women with weak legs and feet to take care of children and the elderly in the village. The other women followed the laborers on the construction site and entered the Paglos Mountains to carry volcanic ash. When Soldak rode back to Wall Village, he just walked out of the mountain pass lined with wooden crosses. He saw a black line on the mountain road between the mountains and fields. This intermittent black line extended from Wall Village to the mountains. At the end of the road, Soldak thought something had happened to Wall Village. So he quickly galloped back to Wall Village, only to find that there were villagers carrying heavy bags on the mountain road. The villagers from other villages seemed to be migrant workers who came to work in the village. Each of them looked shabby. The sweat on their faces dried and then dripped down. The heavy bags on their shoulders were bulging and looked very heavy. A pair of shoes on their feet the soles of the straw sandals seemed to have been trampled to pieces, leaving only the back half connected to the straw ropes on the feet. The thick saws were stepped on the ground, and the toes were widely spread. One glance showed that they were all used to going barefoot. When these villagers from other villages saw Serdak, they wanted to step aside and let Serdak pass by on horseback. 
Serdak did not stop here. Because he found that there were some women from the village behind the team. Also carrying heavy linen bags. Struggling to follow at the end. He ran over on horseback. Jumped off the horse. And wanted to help the women in the village carry the heavy linen bags. But the women in the village refused to do so. They insisted on carrying the linen bags and followed the team one step at a time. Walking towards the village with footprints. Soldak, go about your business. We can do it just by carrying a bag of sand. The woman in the village put the linen bag on the other shoulder and said with a smile to Soldak. Her eyes she forced a smile. Fearing that Serdak would snatch her linen bag. Why are you all carrying this? Serdak asked with a sullen face as he saw each of these village women being so tired that they couldn't straighten their backs. We often see them chirping and chatting while washing clothes by the river. And we can also see them waving sickles in the wheat fields. The strong laborers in the village have gone to dig sulfur mines in Pudu Mountain. And it is these women who remove the wheat from the river. After being carried to the threshing floor in the field. And now seeing them carrying heavy volcanic ash towards the village like the hard workers in other villages. Serdak felt as if his heart was as heavy as a stone. Seeing Soldak's serious face. These village women who usually looked shrewd were naturally not afraid. They put down their linen bags and spoke to Soldak in the unique accent of Wall Village. Isn't it just to carry some dust from the mountains? The old village chief gave all these jobs to people from other villages. A bag of dust costs 50 copper coins. It doesn't matter who does this job. So why not do it first? But it's not like we can't handle it for our own people. So we finally begged the old village chief for this job. Soldak was immediately weakened by their comments and could only say, You can memorize less. I will talk to the village chief about the wages and let you get the same remuneration as the craftsmen. Hearing that Serdak was actually on their side, the village women immediately became excited and said repeatedly, Oh, this is not okay. Whatever rules are set, then follow them. The village chief is the best. We hate people who break the rules. So as long as they give us some reward, that's fine. There was even an older village woman who took Soldak's hand and said with great sincerity, Dak, I heard from the village chief that you paid for the construction of the reservoir, this time out of your own pocket. How much does this reservoir have? We all understand the point. Normally, we shouldn't get paid for carrying dust. How can we have the nerve to carry less dirt than others and still get the same pay as others? Serdak thought to himself that after all, the family background of the children and villagers was too thin. Even if the men were paid a lot of money for mining, they still wanted to make a little more money within their ability. Fortunately, Rita and Natasha were not seen among this group of village women. Thinking of this, he didn't say anything. He wanted to ride a horse to discuss with the old village chief. Since the sulfur mine brought a lot of wealth to the village, how could he further improve the living conditions of the villagers? You can't just eat stew and white bread every day. The whole village is struggling to have enough food and clothing. As soon as he arrived at the entrance of the village, Soldak saw old Sheila sitting under a tree and a group of children playing lattice in the open space. Little Peter also participated. He was somewhat immersed in the game and did not notice Soldak's arrival. Some sharp-eyed children nearby reminded Little Peter, who accidentally made a mistake in his jump and was defeated, and then happily threw himself into Soldak's arms. Serdak held him in his arms and led the horse to old Sheila. Old Sheila looked at Soldak with a peaceful face and asked him, You haven't had dinner yet? Standing in front of old Sheila, Soldak always felt an inexplicable pressure. After all, no matter what the purpose. He could be regarded as taking over the knight status of his son. And now he slept with Natasha. On the bed, he said with a smile, I ate some on the way, so I'm not hungry yet. Has everything in the city been done? Old Sheila asked again. Her wrinkled face remained unchanged, and she raised her head slightly. Soldek scratched his head and said, It's done. This time I signed up at the Helensa Knight Academy. I will go to the academy to take classes in a few days. I will be an official knight after graduation. Old Sheila nodded slightly and glanced at little Peter tenderly. Of course, she could understand the implication of Serdak's words. If there were no accidents, this formal knighthood would fall on little Peter in the future. Seeing Soldak carrying him on the horse, little Peter leaned in Soldak's arms and screamed with excitement. And old Sheila's eyes lit up with a faint light of hope. On the construction site of the reservoir, the bricklayers were sitting on the outermost stone slabs of the reservoir to rest. In just three days, the place had begun to take shape. The bottom of the reservoir was almost flat. The gentle slope here was suddenly artificially flattened to a large extent. And the excavated limestone was piled into high stone piles on the outermost edge of the reservoir. 
a total of 37 cement piers are planned for the foundation of this half-moon arc-shaped embankment. So far, only 12 have been poured. There are also ground beams nearly 1 meter deep above the cement piers. According to Soldak's design, 8 steel bars will protrude from each foundation cement pier. These steel bars are tightly tied to the ground beam steel cage. And then the Potsalanic cement can be poured. Only when the foundation is firmly laid can a 3 meter high reservoir dam be built. The coolies hired from other villages had already carried bags of volcanic ash back from the mountain. Selena was counting the number of volcanic ash. From a distance, she saw Serdek riding back on horseback, her fair face showing an unabashed smile. She wore a long gray linen skirt, a beige sweater, and a scarf to wrap her long hair. Her tall figure stood out among the coolies. Signa did not get under Selena's skirt this time, but sat on a stone next to her, counting something on her fingers. On the mountain road leading outside the village, people carrying volcanic ash were coming back one after another, and Selena was unable to escape for a while. At this time, Serdak also saw the busy figures of Rita and Natasha. The two of them were carrying a large wicker basket filled with hot baked wheat cakes and were making their way to the craftsmen who had gathered to rest. They distributed wheat cakes, and several village women behind them carried steaming large wooden buckets filled with vegetable soup. These people had dinner on the construction site. It seemed that this group of people did not plan to rest immediately after dinner, and the construction site of the reservoir would not be completed until later. When little Peter saw Natasha in the crowd, he struggled to get off the horse and ran towards Natasha and Rita while jumping. Serdak led the horse to the stream and let it drink enough water before walking up to the old village chief. At this time, the old village chief was standing next to a large stone. The stone was covered with a sheepskin drawing drawn by Serdak himself, and he was explaining something to the bricklayers next to him. Just listen to what he said. The remaining foundation stone piers must be poured out tomorrow. These buried parts still need to be maintained with water for a period of time. The ground for paving the reservoir can be moved to the back. Now it seems that the volcanic ash is enough. I will increase the manpower for grinding lime powder overnight to ensure that there will be enough cement when the union starts tomorrow. Then he felt that the bricklayers around him were a little distracted. And they all looked outside. Just as he was about to curse, he saw Soldak walking in. And his expression softened and he said, Oh, Serdak, you're back. Okay. Okay. Everyone. Let's go eat first, and then tidy up the place before it gets completely dark. The old village chief waved his hand to drive away the bricklayers. Then he picked up the cup and took a sip of water. He took a long breath and said, How is it? Did your trip to Alinsa go well? Serdak nodded and said, It's going well. All the needed supplies have been bought. A large amount of supplies should be delivered tomorrow. I've only been away for three days, and the repairs here have already been completed like this. You are not afraid that these craftsmen will be exhausted and run away. Speaking of this, the old village chief said with some pride, You don't know how many people come to me every day to intercede and beg me to hire them to repair the reservoir. I can find such a job outside the mountain pass. What's not satisfying about it? Then the old village chief pulled Soldak and whispered, It's not that I'm too harsh. If you don't count these accounts, you don't know what you spend every day. After work was done the night before yesterday, I asked Selena to tally the accounts. Then I realized, good guy, as long as the work starts, we will throw at least one golden gold coin into the reservoir every day. In the past, I didn't even dare to think about it. As long as I think that if I finish the job one day early, I can save a gold coin. How can I dare to be tired? Chapter 302 Plan The sun slowly sank into the distant valley, and the sky became darker a little bit. The old village chief waved his hand, indicating that everyone could call it a day and leave. Craftsmen from other villages built some simple yurts next to the construction site. After finishing work, everyone ran to a small pool to wash up. However, in order to avoid affecting the water supply of the villagers downstream, the old village chief asked someone to lead an additional canal at the source of the river. This canal will be the main waterway of the reservoir in the future. Now it is just to provide some water for the construction site. Now it is simple opened up. A group of men were shirtless, showing off their strong muscles, and crowded together beside the ditch. The scene was also very lively. Serdak and the old village chief were discussing where to locate the gate of the first level reservoir. The old village chief wanted to place the gate in the center of the dam. This layout was quite satisfactory. But Serdak had a different idea. With the idea, Soldak wanted to set up a sluice on the east and west sides of the reservoir dam. 
but this not only increased the construction cost, but also greatly increased the difficulty of construction. The two argued for a long time, but still failed to convince each other, and there was a strong smell of gunpowder in their words. Rita brought over a stack of wheat cakes. The young woman following Rita was Charlie's wife. She held a can of vegetable soup in her hand. The two women placed the wheat cakes and vegetable soup on the stone platform. The old village chief then he woke up from the argument, picked up a piece of wheat cake and tore it in half, and took a bowl of hot vegetable soup. He said with some emotion, We usually eat corn porridge and cassava at home. Even if we eat wheat cake, it's not a holiday. It can only happen once a week. Who would have thought that just to build this reservoir, we have to take out two bags of wheat flour to cook scones every day. It's a bit unbelievable to say that we will live in the future. That will be the case. Soldak also picked up a piece of wheat cake and took the opportunity to ask Rita in a low voice if she had eaten. Rita nodded slightly calmly and then left with Charlie and his wife with a smile. Before leaving, she still looked at Soldak, could gestured, control his emotions. Of course, the future of Wall Village will only be better than now. We have just taken the first step. Soldak is full of confidence in this. The last rays of the setting sun reflected on the wrinkled face of the old villager. A trace of worry flashed across his dark face. And he only said, I have been thinking about it over and over these past few nights. The mine over there. How big can it be? What else can we get after hollowing out the sulfur? Probably these problems before him are what make the old village chief extremely anxious. Of course the real wealth is before our eyes. Serdak said, looking at the reservoir that had just begun to take shape. You mean this reservoir? The old village chief's eyes lit up slightly, as if he had found some answers. The reservoir is just one of them. What Serdak actually wants to say is, the reservoir is just one of the test products. Once it is confirmed that the volcanic ash cement is as rumored, then Wall Village can ask Kalinsa City to while transporting this new type of building materials to replace the original stone or wooden houses. Wall Village can also form a construction team in the future to build gorgeous Baroque-style buildings everywhere. What other business is more profitable than real estate? Before Serdak could finish his words, he was directly interrupted by the old village chief. The old village chief said excitedly, Yes, when all these reservoirs are built, the village will no longer have to worry about being unable to farm during the dry season. At least some chickpeas and cassava can be planted on the ridges in spring. As long as they can sustain in the rainy season, everything will get better. If there is enough water in the reservoir, the yield of these wheat fields will not decrease and everyone will no longer worry about food rations. Only food is the most real thing. Serdak knew that now was not the best time to talk about the construction team and real estate. Even if he said it, the old village chief probably wouldn't understand it. Instead, some of the benefits that the reservoir in front of him could bring gradually emerged. His eyes passed over Wall Village and saw a large tidal flat on the far side of the river bend below the village. If a large amount of rainwater had not gathered here during the rainy season, causing terrible waterlogging. Perhaps that tidal flat would have been the most fertile soil. The rotten reeds and red thatch made the mud extremely fertile. Sardak pointed to the tidal flat downstream of the village and said with emotion, These reservoirs are built. When the rainy season comes, the rainwater washed down from the mountains will first gather in the reservoirs until the fifth level is reached. Only when the reservoir is full will the excess rainwater flow into the tidal flat downstream. I plan to dig a drainage channel on the tidal flat downstream of the village during the dry season next spring, and all the excess rainwater will flow into the drainage channel. In this way, the tidal flat will no longer be dry and waterless in winter and spring, but will instantly turn into a swamp full of water during the rainy season. To us, that piece of land will be a large area, fertile soil. There is probably nothing in the world that impresses the old village chief more than land. After hearing Soldek's thoughts, his eyes lit up with his many years of farming experience. He certainly knows what kind of land is more suitable. Farming. His lips trembled a little, and the delicious vegetable soup even became bland and tasteless. His slightly cloudy eyes looked hard into the distance, as if a beautiful picture had appeared in his eyes. The old village chief nodded repeatedly and said, The tidal flats are full of fertile mature soil. No matter what you plant, you can have a good harvest. As long as the floods can be solved, it will be a large area of fertile land as long as the reservoir can be built. Tomorrow spring, I will take people to open up wasteland in that tidal flat. The deserted land outside the Paglos Pass does not follow 433. The Green Empire does not like the land here. You will be able to get 60% of the land by then. 
Whoever reclaims the title flats will get the remaining 40%. Why do you want to give me so much land? Serdak asked in surprise. The old village chief took it for granted at this time and said to Soldak, This will be your fiefdom. After you become the lord here, whoever reclaims new farmland here will naturally have one of yours. Share. This is a rule. And if you spend so much effort to build a reservoir, you should harvest the tidal flat. The old village chief seemed to have discovered the ultimate goal of Soldak's insistence on spending huge sums of money to build a reservoir. He was indeed very farsighted. Serdak did not understand the laws of the Grim Empire. Those coolies carried volcanic ash for a day. And at night, they rubbed each other's cramped legs outside the yurt. Soldak thought that the sets of wheels and axles that Carl ordered for him would arrive in Wall Village tomorrow together with the materials he purchased. And he said, 40 sets of wheels and axles will probably be delivered tomorrow. As long as these can be delivered. With so many axles installed, we will have 23 carriages. And there will be no need to use manpower to carry the ash. The old village chief smiled bitterly inside. The women in the village still hope to make a good sum of money by carrying volcanic ash. So they don't want to put the carriages together. Serdak shook his head. Carrying volcanic ash was such a heavy job. Even if the strong men in the village did it for several days. If they didn't know how to adjust, their bodies would inevitably collapse. What's more, women whose physical strength was far inferior to men would inevitably collapse. He said, when the volcanic ash transport capacity is sufficient, we will need more lime powder. At that time, we can set up a mill specifically for grinding lime powder. Women in the village who want to work can be arranged to work in the mill. A mill for grinding lime powder? The old village chief asked doubtfully. Well, Serdak said to the old village chief, I found that many people in the village of stone troughs for pounding wheat. The old village chief nodded and said, In the past, the village organized strong laborers to go to the quarry to find work after the harvest festival. These stone troughs were carried back from the quarry at that time. But since Digo Village was in the Grand Canyon, a windmill was built next to it. So few people in the village pounded wheat at home. It was easier to carry the wheat to the mill. And these stone troughs were left idle. Serdak took out a charcoal pencil and found that the parchment in front of him was already filled with various figures. He directly drew the sluice gate of the reservoir with a few strokes on the big stone in front of the two people, and then drew under the sluice gate. Obviously, if a water tanker is placed in the center of the primary reservoir, it will flow directly into the secondary reservoir. In this case, the water tanker cannot be placed. Only by placing the water gates on both sides of the reservoir can the water tank flow directly into the secondary reservoir. Two water wheels were lowered at the edge. Then he explained to the old village chief, I want to build a water wheel next to the sluice of the reservoir. Then we will have our own mill. We can build a simple mill first. Even if we can't grind wheat, it doesn't matter. Then coarsely grind lime powder first. And when the reservoir is built later, it will not be easy to grind wheat. Water wheel mill. The old village chief did not expect that a water wheel could be installed in such a step reservoir. It was not difficult to talk about it. But no one had ever thought about it. Soldak continued to explain to the old village chief, Actually, this thing is not much different from a windmill. Of course, it won't be difficult. When Digo Village built the windmill, as one of the designers, the old village chief once visited the major mills around the city of Valenza. He was naturally extremely familiar with the windmill. Otherwise, how could the villagers of Wall Village be eligible to use the windmill in Digo Village for free? Serdak walked into the house under the bright moonlight. Gubalai Moss stood beside the material trough and chewed grass leisurely. The saddle on his body had been removed. Gubalai Ma saw Serdak walking into the door and casually I flicked my ponytail twice. Not sure whether it was to welcome him or to ward off mosquitoes and flies. Every time at this time in autumn, mosquitoes and flies always swoop on me desperately. The oil lamp was still on in the main house. Soldak paused at the door and saw old Sheila still sitting in the house. Seemingly teaching Rita how to sew linen shoes with wooden saws. Then he walked into the house and chatted with old Sheila. Saying H. Lo. Rhea saw Soldak coming back from outside, and her big eyes looking at him were full of expectation. Serdak smiled and said, I was in a hurry to go to Helenza City this time. I didn't ask you what you wanted me to bring. I just bought it when I passed by the grocery store. Don't think this gift is too shabby. After saying that, she took out a beautiful comb from her arms and handed it to Rita. Rita's face, which was flushed by the sun, was particularly attractive. She took the comb with joy. When she was in a good mood, she would squint your eyes. Rita inserted the comb in her thick golden hair and whispered to Soldak in an embarrassed voice. Actually, 
You don't have to buy us gifts all the time. I just want to say that I like this gift very much. You have been working hard for a few days. So take a good rest. Old Sheila said to Suldak. Suldak nodded and said, Then I'm going to rest. Walking out of the main house, Suldak saw Natasha carrying a bucket of steaming hot water and pouring it into the wooden bucket in the bathroom. It was hard to believe how her slender waist could carry such a big one. When the man from the barrel saw that old Sheila and Rita were not coming out of the main room, he quickly came over and hugged Natasha's slender waist from behind. Natasha was startled at first. She looked behind her and saw that it was Suldak. So she put down the big wooden barrel in her hand. But then she found that the two of them were stuck together, and her cheeks immediately turned red. At this time, old Sheila and Rita were both awake in the main room. Naturally, Natasha was unwilling to let Cernak take advantage at this time, and she did not dare to push him away hard. She could only try her best to hold Soldak down and try to explore. With her hands in her clothes, she looked towards the main room, worried that someone would come out from there. She bit her lip and begged softly, Hurry up and let me go! I will be hit by Rita soon, and I will laugh to death from her. Of. Serdak hugged Natasha's soft body, and of course refused to let go. He searched for Natasha's soft lips, and wondered how Natasha could escape from Serdak's arms. Just when she was about to lose herself, he only escaped by promising Serdak in a low voice that he would come to him secretly after everyone went to bed. Serdak didn't care who Natasha prepared the hot water for, and got into the wooden bucket to take a comfortable hot bath. As expected, not long after, Rita held a pile of cleanly washed linen clothes and put them these clothes were placed on the wooden rack next to the barrel. And he complained to Soldak. You are in a hurry. Natasha was obviously helping me boil the water. Why did you take it? Sardak huddled in the big wooden barrel and pretended to be asleep. Ignoring Rita at all. Rita had no choice but to turn around and walk out. After taking a bath, all the fatigue was gone. Soldak returned to his room and lay on the wooden bed. He fell asleep in a daze due to his relaxation. Before he woke up from his dream, he felt a warm feeling with her soft body in his arms. Soldak opened his eyes and found that Natasha had quietly slipped into the house with wet hair, as if she had just taken a shower. Seeing that Soldak was asleep, she wanted to sneak away quietly, but she happened to be seen by Soldak, who had just woken up and held him in his arms. Chapter 303 Natasha Bursts of barking broke the early morning tranquility of Wall Village. A light morning mist shrouds this small ravine. And when the sun rises, this morning mist will quickly dissipate. There was a gentle sound of the door being pushed open in the yard. The hinges on the door of the main house were probably lacking some lubricant. There was a squeaking sound when the door was pushed open. It was the sound of the door opening that woke up Serta, who was sleeping soundly. Coo! This is the sequelae left on the battlefield. Any disturbance will make him alert again. The blanket next to the window lifted up a corner. And Natasha would always quietly leave the room just before dawn. She is a reserved woman, shy and reserved and not good at expressing herself. Her life circle is very small, and she occasionally talks to Soldak about the affairs between old Sheila, Rita, and little Peter, and talks about some of the troubles in life. She doesn't really need anyone to help her solve them. Just hope there is a quiet listener. In fact, Soldak is a very good listener. He will not interrupt easily. He will only express his opinions at the appropriate time. He will not complain or have any prejudice. Natasha likes it very much, lying on his arm, whispering to him in his ear, the softly spread golden hair, lake blue eyes, and the extremely soft touch of milk-white skin under the moonlight all clearly told him Serdak. This is not a dream. Natasha said that old Sheila would suffer from leg pain in the winter, and the pain could only be relieved by sitting by the fireplace all day long. In the past, she and Rita would run to the woods to pick up some pine cones, and the pine nuts and mushrooms are their extra harvest. Although the days in the past were a bit difficult, they were not hard. Life was always full of fun. Rita is a guy, Tashigadubi, who is good at finding fun everywhere in life. Her innocent-slash-cheerful-slash-optimistic personality always infects Natasha. Her various tomboyish behaviors also conquered many women in the village. Rita's figure is not related to slenderness. Above, but her waist is definitely not thick. It is the kind of muscular waist with clear mermaid lines and abdominal muscles. She can easily carry two buckets of water and walk several times from home to the stream and back. She can carry the grass was taller than her body. And she walked back from Bago Pasture without stopping. In Little Peter's heart, Serdak has always been described as a great hero by old Sheila. Little Peter's biggest ideal now is to become a knight like Serdak. 
and he practices very hard every morning. Soldak wondered in his heart whether he should be more strict with little Peter. You must know that becoming a knight is not something that can be achieved overnight. The hard work required is far beyond ordinary people. At this time, Natasha must be making breakfast in the kitchen. However, even though her life is now rich, old Sheila is still very frugal. There were piles of wheat flour in the corner of the kitchen, and a whole row of hams hung on the beams. But everyone still ate chestnut porridge every morning, and occasionally some cassava was added to the porridge. Only Soldak and little Peter had it on their plates. To see wheat cakes and thin slices of ham, Rita was very busy in the morning. She had to go to the stream to fetch water early in the morning and she also had to go to Bago Pasture to cut grass and feed the cattle, especially when Serdak was at home. There were a group of Gubwa horses. Nearly twice as much fodder needs to be prepared as usual. Serdak lay on the bed for a while and planned to get up to help Rita with some housework. He originally wanted to carry the bucket out to fetch water, but Rita grabbed him and said in a nagging voice, I'll do it! You don't even know where to get water! During breakfast, Serdak learned from old Serana that there were some particularities in fetching water in the village. Women usually went to the creek to fetch water in the morning. The water source was close to the upper reaches of the creek. If there was when idle men in the village go to fetch water, they will be chased and scolded for half a street by the shrewd village women. If they stay away from the water source, the water they fetch can only be used for washing. Although this place is poor, the villagers are also very concerned about drinking water hygiene. Very seriously. After having breakfast, Old Sheila took little Peter to the yard to milk the cows. Soldak also swallowed the last mouthful of chestnut porridge, bit into the corner of the plate and baked wheat cakes, and followed old Sheila out. We, Rita asked from behind, Brother, are you going to the reservoir construction site? Wait for me and Natasha. We are going too. Natasha followed Rita, standing at the door without saying a word, looking at Soldak with expectation. Her eyes filled with ocean-like tenderness. Listening to Rita's Chris shouting, Soldak stopped in his heart felt warm for no reason, and said, Um, you are also going to the construction site? Rita quickly wiped her wet hands on the apron, took off the apron and folded it, then caught up with Soldak and walked side by side with him. Of course, Uncle Bright chose a few of us to give to those the craftsmen prepare lunch and dinner. Natasha and I are responsible for baking wheat cakes. You don't know how good these guys are. They can eat at least two bags of wheat in a day. Natasha and I have to bake wheat cakes since morning. Until night. After saying that, she followed Soldak's footsteps and walked out. Natasha followed Rita, lowering her head and smiling silently. Rita continued to say to Soldak, There probably isn't much wheat flour in the granary. Otherwise, you can tell the old village chief that we will fry some multi-grain cakes today. We can't give them wheat cakes every time. We all I didn't eat so well. Soldak pondered for a moment and then said, Three meals of wheat cakes every day are sufficient. This was agreed before. This cannot be changed casually. Don't worry about not having enough wheat flour. This is not something you should consider. Seeing Serdak say this, Rita spread her hands indifferently and said, Well, I just wanted to remind you. Then she praised Serdak. By the way, the wolf skin mattress you gave me is so warm. Natasha, what do you think? Rita turned to Natasha on the other side and asked. Natasha was a little hesitant thinking that she didn't sleep in her room at all last night. How could she feel the warmth of a wolfskin mattress or the warmth of a big pervert? Natasha didn't know how to answer, so she could only he hesitated and said, Well, it's not bad. Rita asked with a look of disbelief. You couldn't bear to make the bed last night. Right. Indeed I didn't. Natasha's fair face turned red. The three of them walked out of the yard together and walked along the village path towards the reservoir construction site upstream of the ravine. As soon as they reached the reservoir construction site, they were stopped by a young man from the village. Night, Serdak. Villager A Caravan came from outside and said it was specially delivering goods to you. Come here. Soldak didn't have time to take a look at the construction site. So he left Rita and Natasha behind and walked directly to the entrance of the village with the old village chief who had just arrived at the construction site. This caravan delivered 40 sets of carriage axles and three large carriages of wheat. These 200 bags of wheat flour were almost enough to feed the craftsmen at the reservoir construction site for two months. It is expected to snow in two months. The water reservoir project in the village will be stopped by then. Chapter 304 Changes In the past two days, the old village chief built another simple thatched pavilion on the north side of the village central square. All the caravan carriages arrived at the village square. At the call of the old village chief, 
a group of village women began to move the carriages in a hurry. The axles were all moved into the pergola. The old village chief stood in the center of the square, standing together with Suldak, pointing to the pergola on the north side and said, I thought about it last night and planned to set up a carpentry workshop in the village. All villagers with carpenter skills can you can enter the carpenter's workshop to work and build this pergola. It was originally intended to store the purchased wheat flour, but now it seems that it would be good to turn this into a carpenter's workshop. These carriage axles use bearing bushes, which are coated with dense lubricating oil. As long as they are gently moved by hand, the carriage wheels can rotate easily. The axle is forged from black iron, but the wheels are made of wood. Some wooden strips are nailed to a round wooden board to increase strength. Such ordinary wheels are easily damaged in rough places and require a carpenter's workshop for repairs. The old village chief held the carriage wheels with his hands and said to Soldat confidently, We will build these 20 carriages first. And then we can also build a large water wheel here. Although the carpenters in our village are skilled, they are ordinary. But they are a group of good children who are willing to endure hardship and learn. And they are worth cultivating. There are indeed several good carpenters in Wall Village. But they are still digging sulfur mines in Pudu Mountain. The old village chief has sent someone to deliver a message to them. And they are expected to return to Wall Village in the next two days. Serdak looked at the pile of wood in the pergola and asked the old village chief, when the main dam of the reservoir is built. Some wooden boards for pouring volcanic ash cement need to be made. Since we want to establish carpentry, we need to buy more wood. Do you know where there is a wood factory nearby? The old village chief was stunned for a moment. Probably according to his idea. The wood in the pergola was enough to make a truck carriage. He was a little confused as to why more wooden boards were used when building the main embankment of Su Suichu. At this time, a caravan leader standing nearby quickly took the opportunity to interject. Knight Soldak, it is said that Baron Lloyd is the most famous forest owner in Helensis City. He owns at least five lumber mills. You can buy some wood from Baron Lloyd. If you don't want to come forward in person, our caravan is willing to buy it for you. And we will only charge a pitiful shipping fee. After hearing this, Soldak was a little tempted. He was about to discuss it with the caravan leader, but saw the old village chief winking at him calmly. It was obvious that there were some words that were difficult to say. So he immediately understood and pondered. After a while, he said, I will think about this matter. When the caravan leader saw that Serdak did not pick up the topic, he said no more. After the caravan leader walked away, the old village chief whispered to Soldak, There is no need to buy wood. There are many public forest areas over the mountain pass. You can just find two pine trees in them, and you won't have to spend any money at all. But money? Isn't it said that cutting down trees is not allowed in the forest over there? Serdak asked strangely. This is not the only thing you are not allowed to do. As long as it doesn't really touch the interests of those lords. Who cares? It's not the golden oak. The old village chief said with a smile. At this time, the village woman who was transporting the carriage axles to the arbor approached the old village chief and said distressly. Uncle Bright, the warehouse is almost full. What should I do with so many bags of wheat? These wheat flour will be stored at the construction site first. The old village chief looked at the sky midway through his words. He hesitated, and then he could only grit his teeth and said, Forget it. It might rain in the next few days. Please keep these wheat in my house. More than 200 bags of wheat flour can almost completely fill the house of the old village chief. Just when everyone was unloading wheat flour to the old village chief's house, they saw a horse team walking on the mountain road from a distance. Without even looking at the faces of the young people leading the horses, the sharp-eyed villagers shouted at the top of their lungs, Our the cavalry is back. This time the village's horse team came back from the Pujuoshan sulfur mine. In addition to bringing back 20 bags of sulfur ore, they also brought back bad news. Two new neighbors appeared in the sulfur mine in the rocky area. There were actually two young salamanders. I don't know where they ran out. They occupied a corner of the rocky area. Although they were very important to the miners in the rocky area. There is no hostility but it has seriously hindered daily mining work. No one dares to approach the two salamanders at all, and can only hide far away. However, there are only so many stalagmites with sulfur mines in the rocky area. After being occupied by salamanders, there was very little area left for the masons. This time Luke came here in person, just to come back to invite Soldak, even if he couldn't hunt those two salamanders, or at least drive them away. Moreover, in the sulfur mines in the rocky areas, they have to swallow a large amount of sulfur or every day, which is the most terrible thing. Seeing that there are sufficient supplies at the reservoir construction site in the village, 
The next step is to build the foundation of the reservoir as planned. The old village chief can handle it here. There were no more urgent matters for Serdak to solve. So Serdak decided to leave for the sulfur mine in Pudu Mountain to have a look. In addition to expelling the two salamanders, he also wanted to give the people of Pudu Mountain the mason sent some materials such as long thick old leather boots, dust masks, cross mine picks, and water gathering scrolls. Once all the sulfur mines were moved into the warehouse, Serdak was ready to set off. Luke just sat under the shade of a tree and took a sip of the cool stream water then mounted his horse again and set off with Serdak back to the sulfur mine in Pugil Mountain. Along the way, you can also see long lines of laborers walking quickly into the depths of Paglos Mountain. They have to go to places with volcanic ash. Those places are far away from the village of Wall. It takes at least a day to walk back and forth. Even so, the volcanic ash in that area is very thin. Only a thin layer is spread on the ground. When you get there, you need to use a shovel to sweep the volcanic ash on the ground into a pile before putting it into a linen bag. If this horse team helps transport some volcanic ash, it can also solve some problems of insufficient transportation capacity. However, this horse team still needs to travel between the sulfur mine and wall village. So it cannot help yet. When we passed Bago Grassland, the thirstless growing here was completely withered and yellow. Only the weeds near the pond still had some greenery. However, the bottom of the huge pond was already bottoming out. Once the rainy season was over, without new rainwater, the water level here is dropping at a speed visible to the naked eye. By next spring, it will probably be completely dry. Saldak only stayed at Bago Pasture for a while, and then led the group of young people on horseback to the sulfur mine. Chapter 305 Don't Cry Signa. Baron Grenfell. I found out from Carl Casement that the knight who killed Taylor was indeed someone else. He is the newly promoted knight Serdak who came to Wall Village. From what I understand, it was he and his men who held Tyler back from Mount Paglos. But it was probably the villagers from the mountains. And I pursued the Knight of Serdak into the wilds of Mount Paglos. Here I saw a village being built. When I write this letter to you, I am preparing to enter deeper into Paglos Mountain, which is said to be an uninhabited dead land. I don't know why their cavalry went deep into it. I hope to find the Dark Goddess this time. Messenger, if it is convenient, Please bring me a portrait of the Dark Goddess Messenger. I guess maybe the Dark Goddess Messenger is hiding here. The Dark Red Knight put the written letter into a paper tube as thick as his little finger, and then tied it to the Knight Harrier's paw with a string. This young Knight Harrier was only two years old, and the yellow beak on its beak had just receded. The heather gray feathers felt smooth to the touch. He was held in the arms of the Dark Red Knight, and his round eagle eyes were constantly watching the surroundings. He raised the Knight Harrier with both hands, and let it spread its wings and fly into the blue sky. It flapped its wings and became extremely fast. In the blink of an eye, there was only a small black dot left. The dark red knight rides on a sturdy black scale horse, wrapped in a dark red cloak. The black iron helmet looks more like a black gold mask from a distance. A knight's broad sword is carried behind his back. It was extremely conspicuous in the wilderness outside Air Village. He withdrew his gaze from the sky, turned his head, and glanced at the long group of villagers in the distance, who were walking into Paglos Mountain in a long line, and then urged his horse to head toward Serta. They chased in the direction where the Kima team disappeared. When the dark red knight appeared in the wasteland, he had actually entered the sight of the patrol teams in each village. Although this desolate land has a vast field of vision and is difficult to hide and track, there are always some visual blind spots, and the village team investigators of each village often hide in these hidden places. For example, a crevice in a boulder may have been the home of the Grey Rock Iguana, but it is now occupied by scouts. Although the sea buckthorn grass is covered with barbs, it is nothing to the mountain people here. They have many ways to avoid these sharp spikes and hide themselves in the sea buckthorn grass. The sturdy black-scaled horse is extremely strong. This kind of black war horse with a trace of the blood of alien beasts is very rare. Its size is much larger than the ordinary ancient Bolai horse. When it appeared in the desert in the desert, on the beach, he was quickly noticed by the scouts of the patrol team. The heavy horse hooves can even easily crush the limestone blocks on the ground. The full covering armor under the scarlet cloak makes him look more like a heavily armored knight. However, the patrol investigators from each village discovered that the target of the Dark Red Knight was not their own village. Due to the powerful aura of the Dark Red Knight, they did not dare to act rashly. They looked around and saw the knight chasing Suldak into Paglos Mountain and they immediately decided to spread the news to the village of Wall. 
when the patrol team's investigators found the old village chief. He was leading for carpenters to repair wooden wheels in the carpentry workshop. He heard that a knight on a black horse was secretly following Serdek. And the old village chief's face, he showed a worried look. Selina, who was holding the parchment account book, turned even pale when she heard the news. Zygro, you ride on your horse and catch up with Soldak. You must bring this news to him. Go quickly. The old village chief ordered a young man next to him with a solemn face. The young man named Zygro did not dare to neglect and quickly put down what he was doing and agreed. Okay, Uncle Bright. With that said, he walked outside the pergola, intending to lead the ancient bolai horse tied to the pillar. A group of village women were chatting outside the pergola. A middle-aged village woman rushed out of the crowd, grabbed the young man Zagello's arm, and said in a panic, Zagello, you are going no. I think you must be crazy. When Zygro saw that it was his mother who was holding him, he looked a little embarrassed and whispered to his mother, Hurry up and let go. I'm going to deliver a message to Brother Serdak. When the middle-aged village woman heard what he said, she even whispered in a panic. You haven't even entered Paglo's mountain. And you don't know the way. You can't go. Then he grabbed his young son Zygro and refused to let him put on the saddle. Zygro dragged the middle-aged village woman ten meters away to get the saddle seat from the carriage. The village woman still refused. Rowdy continued. If you are afraid of embarrassment, then let me tell the village chief Bright that he will never force you. Zygro hugged the middle-aged village woman's arms and said to her seriously, But I want to go. I'm not as unbearable as you think. You have to give me a chance to prove myself. The middle-aged village woman cried loudly, Now is not a good opportunity. Your three brothers have all died on the battlefield of the Plain War. You still have to wait to go to Alenza City to serve in the army. No matter what you say this time, I will I won't let you go. Hurry up and let me go. The young man Chigua looked a little embarrassed, but he was worried that he would hurt his mother by struggling too much. For a while, the two people were in a stalemate at the door of the carpentry workshop. At this moment, a voice rang out. I know the road too. Let me go! Selina walked out of the carpentry workshop. She placed the account book in her hand on the wooden railing next to her. She picked up Signa, who was squatting by the railing and chewing wheat cakes. She held her little face in her arms. Inside, he kissed her forehead tenderly, whispered a few words into her ear, and then placed her on the wooden railing. Zygna didn't cry or fuss. She just blinked her big eyes and looked at Selina worriedly. She just sat on the railing obediently and without saying a word, watching Selina walk towards the Gubwa horse. The ancient Bolai horse didn't even have a saddle. Selina put one hand around the horse's neck and the other hand around the horse's back. She stretched her long legs gracefully and easily stepped onto the ancient Bolai horse's back her long chestnut with her hair hanging down her back. She looked extremely tall while riding on horseback. She spread out her long linen skirt, leaned her whole body on the horse's back, and hugged the ancient Bolai horse's neck tightly with her hands. Then he patted the horse's belly gently with his hand, and the horse neighed lightly, raised its four hooves, and ran towards the outside of the village. Originally, this horse was going to be hitched to a carriage and go to pull volcanic ash in the mountains. However, because the carriage wheels had some minor problems and needed to be repaired. The horse was tied up outside the carpentry workshop by Ziegro. None of them had fastened their saddles, and no one expected Selina to actually ride Gubwa and chase after her. Signa sat on the boulder, muttering something in a low voice. There was a touch of loneliness and loss on her young face, and her face was full of stubbornness, but she did not cry. Chapter 306 Dusk Serdak could feel that there was always a dangerous guy following behind him. However, the barge horse turned back and circled the Gobi several times, but could not find the pursuer. It was obvious that the pursuer was not only very alert, but also good at hiding himself. In this endless mountain wall with only gravel on the ground, he can actually hide himself. Thinking about it makes his opponent look scary. As for whether it is a human or a magical beast, Serdak has not figured it out yet. He once suspected that the sand wolves following him were a group of sand wolves. The sand wolves were extremely vindictive. If they killed the Sand Wolf King in the Wolf Pack, a new Wolf King would be born. The new Wolf King would probably come back. He launched an action of revenge. But it was obvious that a group of Sand Wolves could not make him feel such a great sense of crisis. If they were really a group of Sand Wolves, how could they hide their whereabouts? If it were other monsters that were good at hiding their whereabouts. The Glazed Leopard and the Thorny Tailed Crystal Lion had never been heard of in Paglo's Mountain. That's why he guessed that he might be a ruthless character in the bandit group. This was a bit troublesome. 
the other party had been hiding in the dark. He could not be found even in the vast Gobi Desert. And he could not let him know the secret of the sulfur mine. Serdak suddenly felt a headache. Serdak wanted the young people following him to spread out and search the area behind him with a net to find the stalker behind him. But his intuition told him that the price of doing so would probably be the loss of these young lives. So Soldak felt like he was shackled, unable to use his hands and feet to fight the pursuer. So he led the three young men in the cavalry team to the highest point of a hillside in front of him. Then he reined in the reins and stopped. He turned to the young people around him and said, You go to the camping site of the sulfur mine first. I want to stay there. Take a walk here and see if you encounter wild animals. As he spoke, he put some supplies in a magic waste bag into a linen bag and hung it on the horse. Night, Serdak. You are going to hunt. I think we should all act together. Sand wolves occasionally appear here, which is very dangerous. A young man in the team said to Serdak, Do you think Serdak is afraid of the sand wolf here? Another young man interrupted him and directly criticized him. The young man did not dare to get angry after being scolded. He should have the lowest status in a team at ordinary times. So he simply gave in and said, Okay, I didn't say anything. Although Luke felt something was wrong. He was a taciturn character and would not take the initiative to ask anything. He looked around the slope and probably felt that the view here was wide and he could see wild beasts in the distance. Of course, there must be wild beasts in and out first. In fact, apart from gray rock iguanas and sand wolves, few other creatures can survive in this deserted area. Luke said to Soldak, Then be careful. Then he led the other three young people and the horse team away from the slope and rushed towards the pussy mountain in the distance. Even if you ride a horse, you still have to travel more than a day to reach the campsite at the sulfur mine. Serdak rode quietly and stood on a high place, waiting until the horse team had gone a long way, but did not see the pursuer take the initiative to show up. Now that he had the commanding heights of his vision, Serdak wanted to stop and wait here quietly, unless the pursuer could bear not to show up. He set up a simple tent on the slope, and used a fire-gathering scroll to boil a pot of hot water. He sat down and waited for nightfall. When it was completely dark, Serdak could ride a horse and escape through the night, taking advantage of the darkness to completely throw off the pursuer. While it was still dark, Serdak set up an altar for the sacrificial ceremony on the Gobi. But he did not light the blue flames, nor did he summon the two-faced and four-armed gods and demons to offer his sacrifice. After preparing all this, he just waited quietly, in this vast land with a wide field of vision. Even if the tracker appeared in the field of vision, it would be too late for him to perform the sacrificial ceremony. During the day, the Gobi Desert is unbearably hot. The rock walls and gravel here are scorching hot. But at night, all temperatures here will plummet below the freezing point. In the extreme climate of sudden cold, this desolate and lonely place. Until sunset, the pursuer did not appear in Serdak's field of vision. Just when Serdak packed his bags and prepared to completely throw away the pursuer under the cover of night, a horse appeared on the horizon. Kubwa came to the horse, and a figure clung to the horse's back. Galloping on the gobi, the linen skirt and long chestnut hair on her body were flying in the wind, and the vigorous ancient bow lie horse took vigorous steps on the desert, leaping almost ten meters in one step. Just behind her, a black war horse followed closely. The hoofs of the black war horse fell on the ground like beating a heavy war drum. And the sound reached people's hearts, mixing with the rhythm of the heart. Every time the horse's hoof falls, it feels like the hot blood in the heart will be squeezed by a huge force and spurt out. And the body seems to be boiling uncontrollably. The scarlet cloak turned into a dark red under the setting sun. When Soldak saw the black figure, he stood up from the ground in shock. It was not that he had never seen such a powerful knight. There was also this kind of extremely powerful looking knight in the Moinling Expeditionary Army Camp in the Warsaw Plain. Knights, they ride horses with black scales all over their bodies, and wear armor with magic glow. Each knight has at least one level of strength. Only the constructed knights under the command of Marquis Solomon Bowen have this ability. Such a powerful knight. That's right. I didn't expect that the tracker turned out to be an extremely powerful construct knight, and he waited until the last moment to show up, seeing the construct knight chasing Selina in front of him. Soldak didn't have time to think about how Selina would appear here on horseback at this time. Without any hesitation, he took out a sand wolf head from the magic waste bag, offered as a sacrifice to the devil. Blessed body. Shield of blessing. Two consecutive beams of light filled with sacred aura descended from the sky, which were particularly eye-catching on the hillside at sunset. 
Selena hugged the ancient bull eye horse's neck and galloped across the Gobi. Her body seemed to be completely locked by the cold eyes behind her. The moment she appeared, the powerful knight rushed forward on the horse regardless of risk. To her, the black war horse seemed to have endless strength, running faster than the guba horse under her. Selena knew that if she continued like this, sooner or later, she would be overtaken by the black knight. Just when she was at a loss, she suddenly saw two rays of light full of sacred aura appearing on the hillside in front of her to the right. And a warmth suddenly filled her heart. She knew that Serdak must be there without having to look clearly. She gently stroked the neck of Gubalai's horse with her hand and urged the horse to run towards the hillside. The construct knight behind him was chasing after him. And the two horses rushed up the hillside one after the other. On the top of the hillside, Serdak was riding a horse, holding a Roman sword in one hand and a fleur de shield in the other urging the horse to dive down the mountain. Chapter 307 Believers of the Dark Goddess Facing a powerful construct knight, Serdak did not dare to retain any strength at all. So he charged forward with all his strength. Behind him, a two-faced and four-armed demon god appeared so clearly for the first time. Half of the demon statue exuded a sacred healing aura, while the other half exuded a dark and terrifying aura of death. Compared with the two, it is not balanced. The sacred aura has an overwhelming advantage. So the face of the god is facing the front, while the face of the devil is facing the north, and the momentum is slightly weaker. The Roman sword in Serdak's hand emits a hint of divine aura, and the iris shield also has a silver coating. The dark red knight, who was under the hillside, was secretly shocked when he saw Serdak's powerful force. He knew that although he had made adequate preparations this time, he still underestimated his opponent's strength. Only this knight exploded. It can be seen from his own power that if he had a complete set of magic patterns on the ship, his combat effectiveness would definitely not be inferior to his own. But now a cruel sneer appeared on the dark red knight's face. Let you take a look at the gap between constructed knights and ordinary knights. The dark red knight thought in his mind. The double-edged broadsword behind his back just flashed illusorily before appearing in his hands. And the black armor all over his body burst into a halo of magic. With countless magic threads. Threads flowed rapidly around the dark red knight. And those magic lines weave magic runes one after another. These magic runes transformed into groups of buffs that fell on the Dark Red Knight. As if blessed by countless attributes, the Dark Red Knight's physical condition exploded to another level. And this power not only made him stronger, but also extended to the black-scaled horse he sat on. The horse seemed I also felt this power. And the distance I covered in an instant was a full third greater than before. The Dark Red Knight gently clamped the stirrup with his feet. And the black scale horse neighed softly when charging towards the hillside. It actually brought an afterimage behind it. It was obvious that Selena could completely defeat the Dark Red Knight. Before the knight caught up, he merged with Soldak. But the Dark Red Knight suddenly picked up speed. The horse's running speed increased a lot. And he instantly caught up with Selena in front. The Dark Red Knight was like a huge black shadow. Chasing after Selena. Reaching out his hand to pass Selena directly on horseback. Selena, who was running in front, seemed to have had a premonition of danger. Her body was already tightly hugging Gu Bolai Ma's back. At this moment, Selena hit her body directly on Gu Bolai Ma's body. On the side, the dark red knight's big hand only grasped the hem of Selena's linen skirt. Hiss. There was a sound of brocade being torn, and a large section of a gray dress was torn off by the dark red knight, revealing half of Selena's snow white slender thighs. The dark red knight wanted to catch Selena again, who was hiding in the belly of the horse but he felt that he was being targeted by a murderous intention in front of him. He did not dare to be distracted to catch Selena, but focused his attention on rushing down the mountain. On Serdak, a long-lost pressure slowly grew in his body and mind. Looking at the growing shadow behind Serdak, the dark red knight drank softly. Ha! Huh. The magic pattern structure's mana flow rate suddenly increased, and the whole person's aura suddenly increased a bit. Serdak on the hillside jumped forward from his horse at this moment. He jumped into the air and rushed to the highest point. His body curled up like a cannonball and hit the dark red knight. The knight never thought that the opponent was obviously not a construct knight. But when he faced him head on, his momentum was not weaker than his own. Not only that, but he also used full strike with great confidence. The dark red knight sat up straight and raised his double-edged broadsword to face the swooping down Suldak. A faint black cold death aura radiated from the broadsword and the tip of the Dark Red Knight's broadsword exploded with a burst of energy. A vortex filled with the aura of death struck Serdak in midair. 
when the holy aura coming out of the Roman sword in Soldak's hand just touched the dark red knight's death aura. The vortex of death aura flowing around was like the ice and snow melting under the rising sun. The dark red knight was a little horrified, looking at the light golden sword light on the Roman sword. He no longer dared to have any contempt. He raised the sword with both hands and used all his strength to cut Soldak and parry it with one sword. At this moment, although the holy aura on Serdak somewhat restrained the death aura on the dark red knight, in terms of strength and fighting skills, the dark red knight was significantly higher than Serdak. The broadsword blocked Soldak's sword strike. The broadsword in the dark red knight's hand tilted outward, offloading Serdak's momentum to the left side of his body. At the same time, he turned sideways to avoid Serdak's dive. Just as Serdak and the dark red knight passed each other, drew his sword and slashed at Serdak's waist, trying to cut Serdak in half. Serdak was well prepared and directly waved the iris shield in one hand. The shield hit the double-edged broadsword and burst into a ball of silver light. Shield of Blessing the dark red knight was almost suffocated by the impact of Serdak's shield. The silver light seemed to completely dissipate the death energy around him. But Serdak did not follow up with any attack methods. The dark red knight took advantage of this with a chance to breathe. He clenched an iron fist and punched Soldak in the back. At this time, Serdak's downward trend could no longer be reversed. All his movements in the air had been completed. And he was unable to block the heavy punch of the dark red knight. The Dark Red Knight's fists were still wearing black iron finger cots. And Serdak only had a thin layer of Warcraft leather armor. The Dark Red Knight struck down with a heavy blow. And the double-faced devil shadow became when it solidified. One of the two-faced demon's arms suddenly became extremely real. The two sides' fists collided. And the solid arm of the two-faced and four-armed demon was suddenly smashed to pieces by the Dark Red Knight. The virtual image of the demon god in Serdak's spiritual world was missing an arm and a storm seemed to blow in the spiritual sea. But he completely dodged the punch from the dark red knight. Serdak landed on the slope. After rolling his body a few times on the slope, he stood up from the ground in some embarrassment. At this time, Gubbo came the horse also ran over. And Serdak took the opportunity to get on the horse. He saw that there was an obvious gap as big as a soybean on his Roman sword, which was obviously caused by the fight with the dark red knight. He has been following you since he entered Paglo's mountain. Selina rode around behind Serdak and reminded him in a low voice. Seeing Selina's chapped lips and dust on her face, Soldak knew that she must have endured a lot of hardships along the way. So he nodded slightly to reassure her. Are you the one behind those bandits? Serdak stared at the dark red knight in front of him and asked in a deep voice. The dark red knight never thought about saying anything to Soldak. What could he say to the dying person? He directly urged his horse to rush over and slashed several swords at Serdak since the double-edged broadsword was heavier than the Roman sword. The dark red knight completely crushed Serdak in terms of strength. Even Serdak Dak showed his power and could only barely parry in the face of the dark red knight's continuous slashes. The only good thing is that when Serdak was fighting in the Warsaw Plain, he was almost always dealing with evil spirits. The strength and speed of those evil spirits were not weaker than the dark red knight in front of him. Serdak was on the battlefield. He has always grown up under pressure. Therefore, although the strength of the Dark Red Knight is obviously much stronger than that of Serdak. He slashed down with a series of chops. But all of them were blocked by Serdak. The Dark Red Knight was secretly surprised. The knight in front of him was obviously slightly weaker than himself. And he did not wear the magic pattern structure. But he could actually compete with him head-on. His physical toughness and fighting will were extremely outstanding. Serdak wasn't feeling well either. He tried his best to block the Dark Red Knight's attack. He couldn't even make a decent counterattack. Moreover, after this group of attacks, his arms were numb and his body was almost exhausted. Exhaust? Although the blessed body continued to regain strength, his heart still sank to the bottom. Unexpectedly, facing this dark red knight, he had no chance of winning based on his strength. The biggest problem is that the constructed armor on the dark red knight is continuously gathering strength to support the dark red knight under the flow of magic power. And so far, the dark red knight has not shown his power. Apparently, he may feel that in this overwhelming battle, there is no need to show his power. Serdak regretted a little. When the sacrificial ceremony had just been held, he should have brought out two sacrifices. If he had death and decay and death's whisper, he might still have a chance of winning. But time cannot go back. At this time, I could only grit my teeth and hold on. The dark red knight rushed forward and launched another continuous attack. Serdak was even more unbearable this time and was beaten to the point where he could only parry. 
in the last few rounds of the Dark Red Knight's attacks. Serdak frequently raised his shield. Fortunately, this iris shield was strong enough to block the last few swords of the Dark Red Knight. After a round of attack, the Dark Red Knight always needs a few breaths of time to recover his physical strength, which also gives Serdak a chance to breathe. The red sun on the horizon completely sank into the mountains, and the purple sky slowly turned into black. The sky is full of stars, and there is no moon in the sky. Mount Paglos was shrouded in darkness. The Dark Red Knight, Black Horse, and black armor gradually blended into the night. The black two-handed broadsword seemed to have no trace every time it attacked. Serdak was at the end of his crossbow at this moment. And every time he parried, almost on the verge of collapse. Only at this moment did Selina realize that her appearance not only did not help Soldak in any way, but instead became a drag on him. He could have failed and found a chance to escape. But now that she is here, he has not escaped at all. She had survived seven rounds of attacks from the Dark Red Knight. The arm holding the Roman sword could hardly be lifted. And the shield on the other arm was also scratched with marks. She didn't know that Sir How Long can Dak survive? Serdak was indeed exhausted at this moment. And facing the attack of the Dark Red Knight, the blessed body could not recover enough physical strength in time. However, under such circumstances, Serdak found that in such adversity, the illuminated nodes in the body are actually constantly being illuminated. Every time the Dark Red Knight attacks, it is as if he is constantly stimulating the potential in his body, from the nodes being slightly loose, to a glimmer of light, to the light being completely destroyed, to light it up. It probably only takes three sword strikes from the Dark Red Knight, although the sacred aura emitted by those nodes in the body cannot restore Serdak's physical strength. It can produce a healing effect. The hidden wounds caused by the double-edged broadsword of the Dark Red Knight were all damaged by Serdak's own, healed by divine breath. Now the lighted nodes on Serdak's shoulders are almost connected into one large area. The Dark Red Knight's eighth attack finally left a long wound on Serdak's right arm. The broad sword cut the leather shoulder guard, and blood stained the entire sleeve red. The two once again fell into a truce for several breaths. Selina, who had been protected by Serdak, ran up to her at this time. She looked at Serdak with half of his body stained red by blood, and finally made a hard decision. She approached Soldak from behind, leaned close to him and whispered, That guy should be looking for me. I will lure him away in a while. You have to help me take care of Signa. Soldak stretched out his hand to touch her fair cheek and said every word with utmost seriousness. Listen carefully to me. You can take care of your daughter by yourself. Don't give up until the end. As long as there is a chance. I will do the same. Take you away. Soldak felt that his tone might be too strong. So he softened and comforted her. It's already dark so we don't have a chance to escape. When he rushes up again later, you can leave first. Ah! By the way, it's dark. Selina suddenly seemed to remember something. She interrupted Soldak's words and said excitedly, I seem to have almost forgotten that I am still the messenger of the Dark Goddess Selene. The moonless dark night is when the Dark Goddess is most powerful. I can still pray to the Goddess. Didn't you say that you have been forgotten by the Goddess Selene? Serdak asked her doubtfully. This was what she said last time while lying in his arms. Selina was a little embarrassed and immediately made a silencing gesture to Serdek. Chu, when the goddess is powerful, she will occasionally think of me. But at this time I am mostly sleeping. Who would I pray to her that everything is all right at night? After saying that, she suddenly stopped talking. Instead, she clasped her hands in front of her chest on horseback and whispered softly with her eyes closed. Selene, the goddess who rules the darkness. Please listen to the call of your believers in time. In this time of crisis. On this occasion. I, Selina, your most sincere believer. Send you my prayers. Are the prayers of the priests of the Temple of Liberty also so long? Soldat complained in his heart. At this moment, a beam of dark light suddenly descended and enveloped Selina's body. Chapter 308 Road to Escape Selina's prayer had just ended. Endless darkness surged in like a tide and Serdak and the Dark Red Knight were enveloped in black mist at the same time. It felt like someone had dropped a drop of ink in a fish tank, and the darkness was quickly dispersing in the air. The Dark Red Knight was worried that Serdak would take the opportunity to escape in the darkness. So he let out a loud shout, held the sword in both hands and rushed towards Serdak, trying to drag him off his horse, and hit the shoulder armor with the skull carved on it. Serdak, Serdak could only grit his teeth and raise the iris shield in his hand again. A ball of silver light burst out in the darkness. And the huge collision force caused the iris, shield in Serdak's hand to directly hit his chest. 
Serdak felt a huge hammer hit his chest. His throat felt sweet, and his mouth was filled with the strong smell of blood. His body fell involuntarily towards the darkness behind him, and he did not know how to shake the Roman sword in his hand. Where to? Like a giant bear. The dark red knight chased Serdak's body and rushed over. Seeing Serdak's body disappear into the black mist, he chased after him, but found that Serdak was on the stone ground in front of him. There was no trace at all. He took a few steps forward, and at this time, even the black-scaled war horse behind him disappeared without a trace. Being in the darkness, he could only see clearly objects within two feet. He was stepping on the limestone ground under his feet. When he lowered his head, he even realized that his lower body was also hidden in the black mist. He hacked randomly around a few times on the spot. The surrounding seemed empty, and the neighing of a black-scaled horse was heard not far away. And the dark red knight followed the sound and found it. It wasn't until Serdak completely disappeared from the darkness that the dark red knight felt some regret in his heart. He trampled the limestone blocks under his feet to pieces. He wanted to find his horse, and was about to whistle loudly when he felt a huge pain in his neck. Serdak fell to the stone floor, feeling strong dizziness. He endured the severe pain and coughed up a few mouthfuls of blood. Every time I cough, my body feels like it's going to explode. At this time, Selena came to Soldak silently. She appeared in the thick fog. A layer of light fog surrounded her body, and half of her snow-white arms emerged from the darkness. Stretching out, she wanted to drag Serdak away as he lay on the ground. At this time, she saw the dark red knight rushing from behind, and she was so frightened that she almost screamed. But then, Selina discovered that the dark red knight was clearly close at hand. But it seemed that she couldn't see her, and she couldn't see Serdak either. Even Serdak's rapid breathing was like the wind box in the blacksmith's shop. But the dark red knight seemed unable to hear. The armor on his body looked particularly bright in the black mist, and the skull sculpture on his shoulder opened his blood-red pupils in the darkness. She didn't dare to move, letting the dark red knight walk around. And finally she still weighed the broad sword on the spot. Selina and the seriously injured Serdak lay together, even though they were wearing heavy steel. The boot's foot only narrowly missed stepping on her right hand, and Selina lay motionless on the ground. Selina didn't get up from the ground until the dark red knight groped away in the darkness. This is the dark mist, dropped by the dark goddess Selene. As the messenger of the dark goddess, Selina can sense everything in the black mist. Seeing the dark red knight trapped in the black mist, she brought Soldax, the war horse helped him onto the horse's back with difficulty. Before leaving the fog, Selina recited a series of spells again. This was the only secret word spell she could use. Pain. As her spell ended, a black hexagram array emerged from Selena's feet, and a black rune appeared from Selena's head, and then she suddenly became disillusioned, appeared on the dark red knight's neck like a mark. The dark red knight felt a sudden and unbearable pain in his neck. He stretched out his hand and wiped it on his neck, and unexpectedly touched his hand full of blood. A muffled groan from the dark red knight came from the black mist. This curse of shadow word can only bring a little pain to the dark red knight but it is not a fatal injury. The dark red knight angrily charged around the area shrouded in thick fog, letting out a dull roar. At this moment, Selina was holding two horses alone, but quietly left under the cover of night. When Serdak woke up from his sleep, he found himself lying in the shadow of a large rock. He felt as if his body was falling apart. And then the fragmented memories returned to his mind little by little. He reached out and touched his chest with difficulty and found that his injury had almost healed due to the powerful recovery ability of the blessed body. His left arm was a little numb. He wanted to move his arm, but he found that Selina was sleeping soundly on his arm, with her long chestnut hair hanging loose, her charming eyes closed, and her long eyelashes seemed to be shaking slightly. As if she felt Soldak's gaze, Selina woke up from her sleep. Seeing Soldak's focused eyes, she smiled sleepily at Soldak softly. Are you feeling better? Fortunately, we have almost recovered. That guy was very cruel. It seems that your dark goddess has not given up on us. Serdak sat up with difficulty and said with a bitter smile while leaning against the limestone wall. Selina sat next to him, tied up her hair again, took a water bag from the side and handed it to him, and asked, What should we do next? Do we want to go back to Wall Village? Her fair face was now a little dirty. Serdak checked the wound on his arm. The scab had begun to heal. The blood flowing out made the sleeve turn dark red which looked a bit shocking. He peeled off the blood scab on his arm, and the wound showed childish flesh pink. I also saw the fallen Roman sword and Iris shield standing next to the stone wall. 
At that time, the Roman sword flew out of my hand. It must have been Selina who picked it up. Serdek looked around, took a sip of water, stretched his muscles a little, and then said, If possible, I would like to take a detour to the city of Alanza. Then Soldek said, I have to make it known to the public that the Dark Red Knight may be a member of the Black Magic Monastery. It would be best if the magicians of the Magic Guild Law Enforcement Group intervene in this matter. I guess a construct knight like him will definitely not be unknown in Helensa City. Maybe Carl can tell his name right away. If this is the case, then he will definitely try to find us. It is impossible for us to leave Paglo's Mountain alive. It is not safe for us to stay here. We will leave here immediately after dark. Two Gubwa horses were tied to one side and eating beans quietly. The two of them were hiding on the north side of the rock. The dark red knight continued to go north and could only find traces of the two of them when they went farther. So Serdak was in no hurry to leave here. Chapter 309 Tracking Night falls, and the coldness of the night quickly takes away what little heat remains on the rocks during the day. In the night, there is only a dark red line on the Pudu Mountain in the distance. It is said that the lava on the top of the Pupu Mountain is burning day and night. During the day, only billowing smoke and a large amount of volcanic ash can be seen. But at night, in the reflection of the night below, the red lava on the top of the mountain can almost reflect the gray clouds they're red, without observing the stars at night. As long as he looked at the specific location of Pudu Mountain, Soldak knew clearly that he and Selina were located on a small hillside on the west side of Pudu Mountain. The two simply packed their luggage, and Soldak took Selina all the way north along the Paglos Mountain. He planned to take a detour from the northwest of the Pussy Mountain to return to the city of Halanza, since he was not familiar with the nearby the terrain was between ravines and ridges and they were traveling at night. Therefore, after taking a detour, they actually found that the farther they walked, the closer they were to Pudu Mountain. When it was almost dawn, the two of them had already arrived at the northwest of Pudu Mountain. At the foot of the mountain, there are stones rolled down from the top of the mountain everywhere, and you can see the rolling river of lava slowly flowing down the mountain from a distance. There was thick smoke full of sulfur smell everywhere, and the temperature here became a little hot. A large piece of fabric was torn off Selina's long linen skirt, and a pair of snow-white thighs were exposed. She was wearing a pair of thick soled long leather skirts. Wearing boots, her lips looked a little dry, but her beautiful green eyes were exceptionally bright. She followed Soldak on horseback and passed through the foot of the rugged mountain. The ground here was covered with a layer of thick volcanic ash. Both men's horses suffered varying degrees of burns here. The terrain here was relatively complicated, and the stone slabs occasionally passed by undercurrents were extremely hot. Once they stepped on them, the horse's legs would first be trapped in the volcanic ash, and then they would be burned by the hot volcanic ash. The blessed body made Serdak's physique become extremely powerful, coupled with the healing power of the sacred breath. After a day and a night of recovery, the injuries on his body were already healed. Before dawn, Serdak pitched a tent on the north side of a large rock in the north-northwest of Pussy Mountain. The two of them planned to rest here for another day. If they didn't see the dark red knight chasing after them again, they would go there. Tomorrow during the day, we will go west along the Pudu Mountain, bypassing this mountainous area and trying to find a way to get to Holanza City. Serdak was very well prepared for this trip. He brought enough dry food with him and a brand new water gathering scroll, so there was no problem with drinking water. Therefore, Selina could still survive in such a dry environment. I took a simple shower comfortably in the tent and the sound of rushing water came from the tent. If he wasn't on the run, Soldak thought this might be a good trip. Under the dazzling sunshine, Serdak lay on a piece of gray volcanic rock and watched the majestic Pudu Mountain beside him billowing thick smoke. A large amount of volcanic ash formed thick clouds in the sky, forming a huge mushroom umbrella shape on the top of the Pudu Mountain. However, the sky dozens of kilometers away from Pudu Mountain was clear and blue, and volcanic ash kept falling down. He lay motionless on the rocks, and soon a layer of volcanic ash fell on his body. Selina walked out of the tent, and the tattered linen skirt stuck to her wet body, revealing the outline of her body very clearly. She climbed up the boulder where Serdak was perched. Her slightly curly long chestnut hair her hair was dripping wet, and her fair face showed a trace of rosy. She sat down next to Soldak, looked at the volcanic ash in the sky. Selina frowned, took out a handkerchief, and wiped her long hair little by little dry and rapid, and then put on a cotton mask like Serdak did. Although this kind of mask can effectively prevent volcanic ash in the air from entering the lungs, it blocks the air after all. 
making breathing a bit difficult. Thinking about Zygna? Serdek asked softly when he saw Selina hugging her knees with her hands and looking in the direction of Wall Village. There was a hint of worry in Selina's eyes. She nodded slightly and whispered to Soldek. If the Construct Knight can't find us and returns to Wall Village, no one will be able to stop him. Revenge. Serdek stood up from the boulder at this time. He raised his head and faced the falling volcanic ash. He squinted at the sky and said to Selina in a solemn tone, Originally, I had this too. We were worried. But it seems there is no need to worry now. Because he has already caught up with us. Hearing what Soldek said, Selina asked in shock, Ah, how did he discover us? Serdek let out a long breath. Until just now, I didn't understand how that guy could enter the deserted land alone and prevent me from finding him when he was tracking me. Now I understand. Serdak pointed with his hand, looking at a small black dot among the gray clouds in the sky. He asked Selina, Have you seen that night harrier in the sky? In the morning, I noticed it hovering strangely and nostalgically above our heads. Now, it's flying back again. Selina looked up at the sky full of volcanic ash and shook her head in confusion. I can feel that he is coming towards us at full speed. Let's pack up and leave quickly. No, it's too late to pack up. Let's leave now. If it's later, we may not be able to leave, Serdak said. Flexibly moving from he jumped down from the boulder, then caught Selina who jumped down, and pulled Selina quickly towards the two ancient Bolin horses. The two of them didn't have time to pack up their tents, so they quickly mounted the ancient Bolai horses and fled to the north of Pudu Mountain. Sure enough, the night harrier in the sky chased them, because he knew that the dark red knight was lingering behind the two of them. Serdak did not choose to leave the range of Pussy Mountain. Along the way, although the legs of the two ancient Bolai horses suffered varying degrees of burns, Serdak Kelly used his power of holy light to continuously treat the two horses, so the two horses could still barely move on this mountain road with complex terrain. It wasn't until night fell again that Serdak let out a breath, but he still didn't dare to stay where he was. He didn't continue walking eastward along the periphery of Pussy Mountain, but took advantage of the darkness and actually chose to lead the horse climb the north slope of Pussy Mountain along a hot lava river. Serdak walked up the mountain for half a night. The road up the mountain was very difficult. There were dead ends in many places, but Serdak never gave up trying to find a new way. After trying many times, the two of them actually couldn't get very far on the northern slope of Pussy Mountain. Serdak looked confused and said, It doesn't make sense. When we were at the foot of the mountain, I clearly saw a cave beside the lava river. We could only avoid the night harrier by hiding in the cave. Tracking Chapter 310 Tracking 2 Mount Paytas is called Pussy Mountain by the mountaineers outside the mountain pass because this active volcano erupts magma all year round. The entire peak has a magma pool of nearly 10 hectares or even more. However, this the magma in this magma pool is not rushing outwards. Relatively speaking, it is a very quiet volcano. As people describe it, it's like a pustule on an adolescent's face. Lava keeps bubbling outwards, but rarely actually erupts. Volcanic ash rains here all year round, but it is only within a radius of dozens of kilometers, because this place is deep in a deserted land. So this area is inaccessible, and few people come here. The dark red knight rode a black-scaled horse through the rugged foot of the mountain. The ground was covered with a thick layer of volcanic ash. These volcanic ash covered some surging underground magma rivers. These magma rivers were covered with a thin layer. A thin layer of magma is covered with a thick layer of soft volcanic ash. The black scale horse itself can weigh nearly a thousand pounds, and it is carrying the dark red knight and his heavy armor with heavy magic patterns. This allows the black scale horse to walk on the rocky ground covered with volcanic ash, and every step of the horse's hoofs will deeply trapped in the volcanic ash. The black scaled horse kept moving forward almost dripping with volcanic ash. The normal terrain is okay, but it will consume some of the black scaled horse's physical strength. Once you encounter a surging underground river of magma, if the black scaled horse steps on it, the horse's hooves will be burned by the hot volcanic ash, or the rock formations on the surface of the underground river will be trampled, and small streams of magma will follow underground. The horse's hooves were raised and sprayed out, sometimes even splashing on the horse's belly and the dark red knight's calves. Although the dark red knight made some preparations for this, the black-scaled horse still suffered serious burns on its four hooves when it crossed the foot of Pussy Mountain. Most of the fur from the black-scaled horse's ankles has been burned off, revealing the white bones. The blood flowing out is mixed with the volcanic ash, wrapped around the horse's hooves, 
and then peeled off as it moves forward. Even if the black scaled horse, the scale horse is a well trained military horse. But at this point, no matter how hard the dark red knight cracks his whip, he is unwilling to move forward. Even one step. The knight harrier on the dark red knight's shoulder was dirty, and its feathers were stained with volcanic ash. It shrank its neck like a quail and squatted on the dark red knight's shoulder with its eyes closed, not wanting to move at all. The edge of the nostril near its beak was also covered with dark volcanic ash. The night harrier's breathing seemed very rapid, as if it had some kind of lung disease, and it looked like it was dying. The night harrier completed its mission. It flew back from Baron Grinfell and brought back Selena's portrait for the dark red knight. It searched the sky for two days and one night, and discovered Serdek again, and Selena's whereabouts, and guided the dark red knight to pursue it here, and it seemed to be coming to the end of its life. Its lungs were filled with hot volcanic ash, and it couldn't even breathe smoothly because of it. It wanted to open its wings again to shake off the volcanic ash. But after opening its wings, it found that it could no longer take them back. It was like a stone sculpture fell from the shoulders of the dark red knight. And the volcanic ash continued to fall like snowflakes flying in the air. The dark red knight looked at the night harrier that fell into the volcanic ash. Only a handful of tail feathers were left outside. Seeing that it was about to die, the dark red knight just snorted coldly and looked indifferent. He ignored the night harrier and let its head be buried in the volcanic ash, while its body slowly twitched until it became stiff. The black-scaled horse refused to take another step forward, so the dark red knight could only abandon the horse and stride forward alone. He wore a heavy full-cover magic pattern armor, carried a heavy double-edged broadsword, and stepped on a pair of heavy black iron boots in the volcanic ash. Almost half of his calves sank in. The road here was not easy to walk, and it was hard to walk under his feet. The iron boots on his feet were slowly heating up, and his feet felt like they were stepping on a hot iron pot. He could only circulate the energy and blood in his body to resist the heat under his feet. This feeling of constantly using his body's strength was not pleasant. He thought back to how long it had been since he became a construct knight that he had not had such a painful experience. It had been so long that he had almost forgotten that battle. That was not on the battlefield. But a year after he entered the Black Magic Monastery in pursuit of more powerful power, when he was tracking down the Hell Flame, Black Magic of the H, L Demons, a man from the southern province of Petersburg, Indiana, the castle of the Lord named Fred Geary, he was fighting against the Sword Dancer. Unexpectedly, the Sword Dancer was a construct knight with both magic and martial arts skills. His swords burned with blazing fire during the battle. That scene the battle almost roasted the Dark Red Knight. But the Dark Red Knight used his powerful Dark Martial Art Dark Blow to split the Sword Dancer in half. After so many years in Alanza City, I seem to have forgotten those hard battles. He reached out and touched the black mark on his neck that was still bleeding. The pain was gradually awakening the fighting will deep in his heart. Could this be the power of the Dark Goddess? At dawn, the sky lit up a fish belly white, echoing the mushroom-shaped gray clouds above the head. The dark red knight stood alone on a huge rock at the foot of the mountain. He had been searching at the foot of the mountain all night, but unfortunately, he still couldn't find it. After losing the whereabouts of Serdak and Selina, he stuck his broadsword on the lava stone, took out the remaining water bag, and drank the water in one gulp. If they can't be found again, the dark red knight will consider withdrawing from this desolate land. Since the two of them came from Wall Village, they can go to Wall Village to investigate. He thought in his heart. The fiery morning sun shone on Pussy Hill through layers of obstacles, stretching the figure of the dark red knight on the boulder. The dark red knight was about to jump off the big rock, but he happened to be within sight. When he arrived at a cave, he looked up at the cave located between the walls of the lower half of Pudu Mountain. Suddenly an idea came to his mind. He covered the bleeding black mark on his neck with one hand and walked towards the cave. Fifty steps later, sure enough, the pain caused by the black mark on his neck was getting worse. He then turned around and ran nearly a hundred meters in the opposite direction of the cave, and the pain on his neck was gradually alleviated. They must have discovered the night harrier and hid in the cave to avoid the night harrier's pursuit. The dark red knight felt the pleasure of revealing the final answer. He stretched his body and couldn't wait to catch up with the man who returned. The knight who was not a construct knight stepped on him chopped off his head with a sword, and then brought the rather good-looking messenger of the dark goddess to Grenfell. I guess he wouldn't mind enjoying the spoils for himself. After all, he a priceless black-scaled horse was lost. The dark red knight thought of the black-scaled horse, touched his chapped lips and shriveled belly, and strode back along the original path. 
the black-scaled horse lay down on the soft volcanic ash. When it saw the dark red knight striding back, it let out a weak whine. It didn't even have time to look at its old master. The hands of the dark red knight. The broad sword had already fallen on its neck. And the black horse's head was cut off by the dark red knight's sword. Blood splashed all over the dark red knight. He couldn't care about that at the moment. And directly put his head over to drink the black scale horse. He then cut off a large piece of horse meat with skin from its hind legs. Held it in his hand. And began to climb the mountain of pustules in front of him. There are some underground lava rivers on the northern slope of Pussy Mountain. After the dark red knight suffered some hardships. He found that as long as he walked next to the more eye-catching lava river, although it was more unbearable than other places, it would never be the same. Then step on those hot lava underground rivers. When looking from the bottom of the mountain, the cave doesn't seem that far away. But when he started climbing the mountain, he realized that the cave was really far away from him. What made him feel refreshed was that he found a small pile of horse dung halfway along the way. He even bent down and pinched it carefully with his hands. He found that although the outer layer of the horse dung was dry, it was still moist inside, indicating that this piece of horse manure has not existed for a long time. So he was even more sure that Serdak and Selina must have hidden in the cave. Their horses also suffered serious burns. But with the power of Serdak's holy light, the two ancient Bolai horses can still walk. Moreover, Serdak has already found a way to avoid the underground river of lava hidden under the volcanic ash. He can sense the magic elements around his body. As long as he experiences it carefully, it is not difficult to find the thick fire element in the rocks under his feet. If you avoid those fire element belts in your perception, you can avoid those underground rivers of lava. Selina followed Soldak. Although the two of them were fleeing, she looked at the broad arms of the man in front of her and felt extremely at ease. She always had the urge to pounce from behind. Go up and hug him tightly. The heat in your body rushes from the soles of your feet to the top of your head. He is brave and decisive. And will not give up easily. In adversity. He is like a solid shield standing in front of him. Always facing the first storm. Selina looked at Suldak in front of her with extremely bright eyes. Her face was covered with a thick mask. And she was slightly panting while climbing. Fortunately, the two of them were not going very fast. And he seemed to have deliberately slowed down to accommodate himself. How long do we have to go? Selina asked quietly, leaning next to Soldek. Are you tired? Do you want a drink of water? Soldek handed the water bottle in his hand to Selina. He took out the water-gathering scroll from his arms and unfolded it. The water element here was quite thin, and the dripping water droplets fell very slowly. Serdak poured the water on his body, and he felt much cooler for a while. He casually wiped his face. She placed the water-gathering scroll on top of Selina's head, allowing her to enjoy the rare coolness. She raised her head in the magic rain, letting the water droplets fall on her fair and delicate face, and then flowed down her neck into her plump and plump face. On the white chest, the somewhat dry lips were moistened by the magic rain, and instantly turned into bright red rose petals. The beautiful big eyes looked at Suldak infatuatedly, and the bright red rose petals bloomed with the most beautiful smile. The two of them rested on a stone. The two Gubalai horses needed water. Feeding and treatment. Soldak did not dare to give up these two horses. If he walked back to Wall Village from here, it would take at least half a month. What should we do if lava keeps flowing out of the cave entrance? Selina asked Serdak. Serdak said without thinking. Then let's find other caves. Even the knights on this road probably won't be able to ride horses like us. The Night Harrier wants to find us. At least during the day tomorrow. Don't worry. He won't catch up so quickly. Soldak seemed very confident. And then he slapped his forehead hard and said, By the way, I almost forgot about this. Then, under Selina's silent gaze, Serdak rearranged the temporary altar for the sacrificial ceremony beside the big stone. Selina stood aside and watched in stunned silence as the four blue fires appeared. The phantom of the demon god watched as he skillfully took out a wolf head and sacrificed it. And then a holy light fell on him. Is that the god you believe in? Selina asked Serdak, who was packing for pottery bowls. Serdak put the pottery bowl into his magic pocket and clapped his hands. At this time, the phantom of the demon god had turned into dots of starlight and disappeared. He smiled and laughed at himself and said, That's right. But he has nothing to do with me. Help is paid. And I provide him with sacrifices so that he can send down power and blessings. Maybe because I am not a devout believer. Then what is this? Selina asked. What kind of blessing can I give myself? The divine blessed body can give you endless energy all over your body. 
Serdak replied. After the two rested for a while, they continued to head up the mountain. There was no way to find the cave by sight at night, so they could only rely on the location in their memory to constantly explore. The two of them walked along the lava river towards the mountain for most of the night, and finally found the mine before dawn. Standing in front of the cave entrance, they discovered that the cave was indeed as Delina said, with hot water flowing from the cave entrance. The lava comes, but it is a little different from what Selina said. This river of lava is more like a crack, with not much exposed part, and the scorching heat is more like unbearable heat, not that an unbearably hot temperature. The two of them stood at the entrance of the cave hesitating, but in the end, it was Serdak who made the decision, go in and have a look first, and then withdraw if it doesn't work. Just as the two of them approached the cave, they discovered that a hot wind was blowing out of the cave. It was this wind that made breathing easier. There was a thin layer of sulfur or growing next to the lava fissure at the entrance of the cave. The smell is also a bit pungent. Serdak led the horse and walked in. A wave of heat hit his face. Chapter 311 Battle At night, except for a little light from the lava river, the light around the cave is very dim. Serdak originally wanted to hide with Selina at the entrance of the cave. No one knew what kind of dangers there would be in a cave halfway up an active volcano with hot magma flowing. If the lava pools are connected, it is likely that magma will erupt periodically. Serdak carefully searched for traces of lava eruption. It seemed that the cave should be considered safe. But the volcanic ash traces at the entrance of the cave were messy. And it was impossible to tell whether the footprints were left by humans or beasts. The crack at the entrance of the cave is like a dry river of lava. Only in the center of the crack does the rock show signs of melting into magma. It is like a narrow strip of light. Serdak discovered that there is actually something hidden in this rock crack. There is a trace of light yellow crystals. And countless small sulfur crystals are scattered in the cracks of the rock wall. These are sulfur ores. Moreover, there are crystal clear sulfur or crystals on the rock wall at the entrance of the cave. The temperature at the entrance of the cave is not too high. From time to time, hot wind blows out from inside, carrying a spicy and pungent odor. It can be clearly seen through the mask. Smell. Selina followed Serdek. There was a red mark on her calf, facing the red light of the lava river. The scar looked extremely eye-catching on the snow-white skin. The two walked less than ten meters from the entrance of the cave against the stone wall, and found a stone platform covered with volcanic ash inside the cave. The interior space of the cave is very wide and the stone platform is about 7 or 8 meters away from the lava river. In addition to having to endure the hot wind blowing from the depths of the cave, the temperature here is not high. At least it is bearable. Serdak first checked the surroundings. It seemed that this cave should not be a beast's den. There were no furs, feces, or bones of beasts. He walked to the door of the cave and took a look outside, except for some lava rivers that lit up dark red veins on the hillside. The rest of the place was dark. Serdak took out a wolf skin mattress from his magic waste bag and spread it on a strip of long stone, and sat down to rest with Selina. There was no need to set up a tent in the cave. Serdak took out some dry food and water. There was no need for a fire gathering scroll here. He only needed to fill the iron pot with some water, place it on the hot stone slab next to the lava river, and then put it at a few pieces of dried meat. And after the water boils, you can throw some toasted wheat cakes into the pot. The food cooked in this way is not delicious but it is rich in nutrients and easy to cook. Especially this cooking method is the most popular in military camps. The two ancient bolai horses seemed a little restless in the cave. They gradually calmed down under Soldak's comfort. Soldak took out some beans and water to feed the horses. Selina took off the saddle and shaved the sweat off the two horses. She was as strong as a weed named Never Die of Thirst in Bago Pasture in the face of adversity. She squatted next to Soldak. Selina chased Serdak's back with some obsession and said to Serdak, the god you believe in is really powerful. Serdak didn't even look back. Only said, But the price is also high. Every time I start the sacrifice ceremony, I need to offer a sacrifice. The worst of these sacrifices are the heads of monsters. Soldak cut a lizard claw fruit with a peeling knife and handed it to Selina. Selina didn't reach out to pick it up. She directly put her mouth to Soldak's hand, bit into the nut kernel of the lizard claw fruit. Her soft lips touched Soldak's thumb and index finger. Her green eyes were bold, she walked towards Soldak. Serdak covered her eyes with his hands and said, Have a good rest. We don't know what we will encounter tomorrow. Serdak deliberately refused to look at those seductive eyes and said to Selina, If that construct knight can still find us like this, I will have absolutely no choice. 
I will inevitably have to fight him desperately. Can your dark goddess help us one more time? Selena smiled foolishly and said, Maybe. She rested her head on Serdak's shoulder, closed her eyes slightly, and whispered, When the goddess descended into the dark mist, I seem to have heard some oracles. She told me that as long as I can spread the gospel of the goddess, I can find some people who are willing to do so. Only those who believe in the dark goddess can gain stronger power. Having said that, if you want to develop believers of the dark goddess, perhaps the heretics from the black magic monastery may be better persuaded. The green empire is full of believers of the goddess of liberty, but it is not easy to change their beliefs. Serdak is neither free, believers of the goddess, and not followers of the goddess of darkness except for some blasphemous words that cannot be said, do not have so many scruples about other things. And they are more bold when speaking these things. Selena, the people from the Black Magic Monastery are trying every possible means to find you. Could it be that they want to get the guidance of the Dark Goddess from you and become a believer of the Dark Goddess? Selena sat up straight, grabbed Soldek's hand, and said to him seriously, The Goddess told me that the people in the Black Magic Monastery believe in the God of Magic and the Demon King of Hell. You are looking for me just to get the shadow word from me. These monastic magicians are a group of lunatics who advocate black magic in order to pursue powerful magical power. They even do not hesitate to make a contract with the demons of age, L. They are on the road to self-destruction. On the edge. Asking me to stay far away from them. Serdek did not expect that Selena, as the envoy of the dark goddess, would actually communicate with the dark goddess quite frequently. Selena frowned and said to Soldek, that construct night smells like a devil. The night was fading little by little, and a dazzling white line lit up on the horizon. A beam of light refracted into the cave from the outside. The edge of the cave close to the lava river was actually covered with light yellow sulfur crystals. Seeing that there were also some sulfur crystals hanging on the top of the cave, Serdak looked into the cave. After walking only a few steps, he saw large sulfur crystals growing on the wall of the cave. Like a hard sh. L of crystals condensed on the rock wall. Serdak walked deeper into the cave, getting deeper and deeper. The pungent smell gets worse as you walk inside. He drew out his Roman sword and dug out a piece of sulfur, or on the rock wall. The sulfur fell off the cave wall, revealing the original magma rock inside. The cave was filled with scorching heat, and streams of hot wind were still blowing from the depths of the cave. The hot wind was filled with a strong smell of sulfur. Serdak's consciousness became clearer, and he had realized what exactly the sulfur on the cave wall was where it came from. It was brought by these hot winds coming out of the depths of the cave. The air was filled with sulfur. This sulfur was deposited over the years, and slowly condensed into a thick layer on the cave walls. He stared with wide eyes, as he saw that the surrounding stone walls were covered with sulfur deposits, extending along the cave into the heart of the mountain. Unexpectedly, this cave contained a large amount of natural sulfur deposits. Soldek held Selena's hand, and his voice full of excitement. Selena, this seems to be a sulfur mine. There seems to be a lot of sulfur stored in this cave. At least more than the rocky area on the southern slope of Pudu Mountain. Selina followed Serdek, looking at the sulfur in the cave with a shocked face, covering her mouth. If his assumption is true, it means that there will be more sulfur mines in this cave. He wants to take Selina deeper into the cave to explore the situation inside. His mood at the moment somewhat extremely impatient. Just when Serdak became a little excited because of the sulfur mines in front of him, Selena suddenly pulled Soldak hard and reminded him. I have a feeling that he is getting closer to us. Coming after me. Soldak was walking deeper into the cave. He stopped and asked Selena. Can you feel him? Selena nodded with certainty and replied. I can feel that I have cast the secret word pain on him. And I can even hear the surging sound of blood in his body. It seems that this battle between us is inevitable. Serdak rubbed his forehead in distress. Unexpectedly, he hid in a cave but was still found by the dark red night. Soldak pulled Selina and walked quickly into the cave. At this moment, a tall figure appeared at the entrance of the cave. He stood at the entrance of the cave and roared loudly, Soldak. Serdak ignored the call of the dark red night and did not respond. Instead, he restaged the sacrificial ceremony behind a raised sulfur stalagmite in the cave. Selina stood aside. She carefully watched every step of Serdak, watching him ignite the fire of his soul one by one. Under his prayer, the demon statue appeared again. It was very tall, with its head on the top of the cave. The solemn and peaceful face of the statue faced Serdak. Without any hesitation this time, Serdak took out three sand wolf heads from his pocket, 
half of which were sacrificed to the statue. And the other one, half of the sacrifice was given to the demon on the other side. The incantations of the natives of the Warsaw Plain were recited from Soldek's mouth. Then, three bright, three dark, and four beams of light were seen frequently falling on Soldek. Blessed body, shield of blessing, the eye of truth, life burns, death and decay, the whisper of death. For some reason, Selina had a feeling that after the three dark beams of light fell on Serdek, the demon statue in front of Serdek actually rotated a little, and the demon statue that originally had its back completely turned to Serdek was revealed. The face of the statue is tilted to the other side, and only half of the face of the statue can be seen from the direction of Serdek. Tassimat, Tassimat, Tassimat. There was that distant whisper in my heart again, like a call from the gods. At this time, a black flame burst out from the palm of Serdek's left hand and the black flame continuously transmitted a kind of power to Serdek's body. Serdek was very clearly aware that this was the effect of life burning. It's just that the black flame is sucking the life force from his body so that it can continue to burn. Black flames burned in the palm of his hand, and Serdak's body was filled with restlessness and desire to fight. He hammered his chest hard with his fist, and the black flame also circled around Serdak's body and disappeared into his body. Soldak, are you okay? Selina saw Soldak's face turning extremely rosy and asked worriedly as she stood aside. Don't worry. I'm fine. Serdak suppressed the restlessness in his heart and walked towards the entrance of the cave with his Roman sword. Selina bit her lip and followed closely. When Serdak and Selina saw the dark red knight again, his tall body was blocked at the entrance of the cave. Most of the scarlet cloak behind him was burned by the fire, and the original magic halo of the magic pattern armor was also destroyed. It became dim and looked a little embarrassed. The moment he saw Serdak, he waved the double-edged broadsword in his hand desperately and turned into an afterimage and rushed towards Serdak. The next moment, the shadow of the demon lord of punishment appeared behind the dark red knight, holding a long-handled axe in both hands. When the dark red knight raised his broadsword with both hands, the shadow of the lord of punishment behind him also lifted the long sword in his hand. The axe was raised high and right in front of Serdak. The shadows of the dark red knight and the demon lord of punishment merged into one. And then, they struck down the sword sharply. Serdak, who walked out of the cave, could not avoid it at this time. Behind him was Selina, who was following him. Serdak could only hold up his shield to meet him. And the demon phantom immediately emerged from Serdak. Dark appears behind him. With the eye of truth, he could predict the trajectory of the dark red knight's broadsword with great clarity. When he raised his shield, Serdak took a step to the left. The iris shield was a little tilted, and the dark red knight's broadsword fell. A silver light burst out from the shield, but the shield of blessing failed to block the attack of the dark red knight like before. The dark red knight's sword actually cut off a large piece of the iris shield in Serdak's hand. If Serdak hadn't expected it and turned sideways to avoid it, I'm afraid that this sword would have opened a big hole in Serdak's chest. Even so, Serdak only felt that his right arm was sore and numb and he was completely unable to block the dark red knight's sword, let alone raise his Roman sword to fight back. Unexpectedly, the dark red knight released his power. The sword is so terrifying. Soldak did not hesitate to throw the death and decay to his feet. A pattern full of dark colors spread out from Hibuchiang's feet. The dark patterns on the ground were like a huge chrysanthemum, with each stamen being a string. The complicated runes. At the moment, the dark red knight stepped into the black circle. Those black flames also burned with a whoosh in the black circle. An incredible scene appeared again, and dark magic patterns appeared under his feet. Those patterns released a faint death energy. The dark red knight's feet were swallowed up by those black flames. Even the phantom of the demon lord of punishment merged with him. At this moment, he also let out a painful roar at the same time. At the same time, Serdak felt a faint breath of life steaming up from under his feet. Those breaths of life were absorbed by the black flames. And then the life burning no longer absorbed Serdak's life, but disappeared here and there. For a long time, Serdak stabbed the dark red knight in the heart with a sword. The dark red knight suffered a big loss. But it didn't mean that he had no power to fight back. He quickly used his broad sword to hold Soldak's Roman sword. The dark red knight only felt that Serdak's power was actually much stronger than two days ago. If he hadn't released his power, he might have been unable to suppress Serdak. Just as the Dark Red Knight was secretly surprised, the two of them exchanged sword-sword fights several times in succession. The Dark Red Knight only felt that the Roman sword in Soldak's hand was getting heavier and heavier. 
Chapter 3 12 Fusion The blade of the Roman sword shattered like a jagged Roman sword and struck the magic pattern armor, bursting out a string of sparks. The dark red knight took half a step back, barely blocking the next diagonal stab from the Roman sword with the double-edged broadsword in his hand, but was kicked in the abdomen by Soldek. He staggered back a few steps and leaned against the stone wall. The full-covered magic pattern armor on his body made the stone wall behind him full of cracks. A thin layer of sulfur or peeled off on the wall. And the armor made of black iron, there were obvious dents on the skirt. If he hadn't been wearing a full-covering magic pattern structure, the dark red knight, who had been kicked by Serdak, would have fallen to the ground at this moment. The magic light was shining on the dark armor. The halo has long since become dim. The dark red knight clearly remembered that just two days ago, he had completely suppressed the Serdak knight in front of him in terms of strength. But now he met him again. And even after he had released his potential, he had completely suppressed the power of the Serdak knight in front of him. On the contrary, he did not have any advantage in terms of sword skills. He was obviously superior in sword skills. But every sword he struck was blocked by Serdak in advance. And every move was seen through by Serdak in advance. A kind of feeling arose in his heart. Feeling of powerlessness. He secretly thought that even if his physical strength had declined in the past two days, he should not be in this situation. The dark red knight felt that something was wrong with his state. His will to fight and his belief in winning had been shaken. Which was why his state had declined so seriously. He decided to regroup. Took a deep breath. Lowered his center of gravity. And he took a breath to calm his impetuous heart. Holding the sword in both hands and regaining his fighting posture. The full covered magic pattern structure once again circulated a faint magical aura. And the shadow of the demon lord behind the dark red knight became much more solid again. He was still standing in the aura of death and decay. As if there was someone there. Countless sharp needles hit his leg bones. But the entrance of the cave was only so big. Unless he could retreat from the entrance to the outside. It would be difficult to step out of the aura of death and decay. Murmurs appeared in the dark red knight's ears again. As if someone was placing a hypnotic spell on him against his ears. A woman's voice kept calling him with obscure and evil demonic language. Those voices made he was a little distracted. He felt a little groggy. The strength in his body was being deprived bit by bit. And the double-edged sword in his hand became awkward. He has used this sword for more than ten years. And it can almost be regarded as a part of his body. Unexpectedly. Holding it in his hand now. It feels extremely heavy. It feels like he is seriously ill. And every joint in his body seems to be rusty. He kept beating his chest. Trying to cheer himself up again. There was no time when he needed strength more than now. He resisted Soldak's sword attack and pressed his back heavily against the stone wall again. He thought of the demon punisher lord in the summoning ceremony. With the aura of decadence and destruction. The shadow behind him once again let out an unwilling roar. As if it was about to break free from the shadow in the next moment. A layer of dark runes appeared on his hands. These runes were obtained by him during the summoning ceremony. He probably never thought in his life that one day he would be forced to such a point that he would need to demonize his body to defeat his opponent. There was a strange swallowing sound in his throat. And the black hands with a depraved aura magic pattern spread all over his body from his hands. Fortunately, he was wearing a full body magic pattern structure. Otherwise, he would not look any better than an evil ghost at the moment. There was a dark purple aura coming out of his whole body. Which was a kind of demonic aura that came from H. L. This demonic aura spread all over his body. Like a burning black fire. The phantom of the Shing demon lord behind him seemed to feel some kind of call. Those demonic auras were continuously poured into the tall phantom. And then the tall body of the Shing Demon Lord became extremely solid. And the Shing Demon Lord the Demon Lord's shadow became clearer. It was a monster with thick four legs and a huge tail. However, the upper body was still a clear half-human figure. And the face looked more like some long extinct ogres. He it has six arms. Each of which can hold a weapon. The phantom of the torture Demon Lord completely overlapped with a dark red knight covered in dark patterns. The two people's movements were in unison. The dark red knight suddenly felt that all the power returned to his body. Not only that, he even felt that he is dominating an unprecedented power. He leaned against the stone wall and took a step forward with his left foot. Spiderweb-like cracks suddenly appeared on the hard lava ground. The demonic energy on his body spread to the double-edged broadsword. And the entire broadsword was like a burning fire. With black flames burning, he swung his sword towards Serdek. With the blessing of the Eye of Truth, Serdak could see with incomparable clarity that although the dark red knight's body still maintained the human outline, 
The soul in the body had turned into a legion with four legs and six arms. The giant-tailed monster. Maybe the dark red knight himself hasn't realized this yet. Or maybe he has completely merged with the terrifying shadow behind him. When the broadsword burning with black flame struck at Serdak, Serdak took half a step back without hesitation. Raised the iris shield in his hand that had almost turned into scrap metal. And waved a silver holy shield containing a sacred aura appeared on the surface of the iris shield. And the blessing shield burst out with extremely dazzling light. Serdak felt that the broad sword was striking the shield like a huge hammer. He hit it and was so shocked that his arm almost broke. Serdak's body suddenly became a little shorter. And his feet stepped into the rocky floor of the cave. Serdak was shocked by the huge force. Causing blood to bleed from all his orifices. At this time, the dark red knight was not having a good time either. The moment the dazzling light erupted from the blessing shield came into contact with the phantom of the torture lord. The monster turned out to be like Chushua meeting the sunshine. Interacting with the dark red knight. Most of the fused shadows quickly melted away. The dark red knight held his head in his hands and let out a hysterical howl. Serdak's whole body exudes a sacred aura. The shadow that has just merged with the dark red knight seems to have an autonomous consciousness. It seems to be particularly sensitive to the sacred aura. When it feels the sacred aura exuding from Serdak's body. Actually struggled and broke away from the dark red knight's body. When the remaining shadow of the tortured demon lord completely broke away from the dark red knight's body. It turned into a puff of blue smoke and disappeared without a trace in the air. At this moment, the dark red knight was like a deflated rubber ball. Kneeling on one knee completely exhausted. He held a broad sword in one hand to prevent his body from falling down. The black magic patterns on his body fading away bit by bit. The dark red knight's consciousness was slowly waking up. He suddenly realized that in pursuit of power, he had embarked on a path of no return. Light from outside shines into the cave. The eyes of the dark red knight, hidden under the visor, seemed to see the blue sky outside the cave entrance for the first time. The dazzling sunlight and the cotton candy-like clouds. It had been a long time since I had experienced these. He pulled out the broadsword stuck in the rocky ground. And at the moment Soldak felt that he still wanted to continue fighting. He pierced the sharp edge of the sword into his heart. Chapter 313 Return to Camp Those who sacrifice their souls to the devil will fall into the fiery age. L after death. Black purple flames burst out from the dark red knight's body until his body was completely reduced to ashes. And the full covered magic pattern structure was scattered in the ashes and became dim. Many magic patterns carved on the armor the patterns were all melted away. And the gemstone base also collapsed in the fire. This full cover armor made of magic black iron failed to withstand the burning of the magic flames and died together with the dark red knight. Serdak sat down on the stone floor of the cave. At this moment, all the joints in his body seemed to be falling apart. Although the divine blessed body had not disappeared, the body's recovery speed was far from being able to relieve the dark red knight. The damage caused to his body by the sword just now. At that time, Serdak felt that the person standing in front of him was no longer the dark red knight but a weak demon. For Serdak, this battle revealed the specific effect of the gain magic taught to him by Anoyatila. Simply sum up life burning in one sentence. That is to burn your own life and improve yourself in a short period of time. Combat Effectiveness The lighted nodes in the body release the weak power of holy light like stars. And the injuries heal quickly under the influence of the power of holy light. Although the life burning effect has been eliminated, the negative effects caused by it made Serdak feel as heavy as lead. It seemed unnecessary. So he should avoid sacrificing sacrifices to the golem as much as possible. My body is really overwhelmed. Selina came up from behind, squatted next to Soldek, and looked at him with worry. Soldek stretched out his hand to pinch her smooth cheeks and kissed her forehead. Don't worry. I'm just a little tired. I just need to rest for a while. I don't know what this construct knight has been through in the past two days. What? His strength is much worse than when we first met. Selina stared at Soldak in astonishment. Her eyes seemed a little strange. But she quickly changed her mind, lowered her eyelids and whispered to Soldak. Not everyone can adapt to this desolate land. Land. At this moment, with the benefit of the Eye of Truth, Serdak actually saw the shadow of the Dark Goddess behind Selina completely overlapping with Selina's body. The huge shadow of the Dark Goddess squatted on the ground. Selina was like being held in her arms. The Selina under her soul closed her eyes tightly at this moment. The state was like the goddess of darkness, leaning over. Selina's blue eyes turned into pale gold. Serdak was attracted by the scene in front of him. Startled, he blurted out, Selina, 
The pair of pale golden eyes turned to look at Suldak suspiciously and asked in a nasal voice, Huh? In order to prevent the surprise in his eyes from being noticed by those golden eyes, Suldak suddenly hugged Selina into his arms. At this time, the shadow of the dark goddess attached to Selina seemed to have been severely frightened. It suddenly broke away from Selina's body and transformed into the statue of the dark goddess with her hands clasped in front of her chest. Standing motionless, behind Selina, feeling that the powerful dark power in Selina's body disappeared instantly, Suldak let out a sigh of relief. He gently patted Selina's back twice and said by the way, It's nothing. It seems like this is a sulfur mine. I want to go in and explore it. Would you like to wait for me at the entrance of the cave? Selina was still a little groggy. So she reluctantly responded. Oh, okay. Serdak let go of Selina and saw that she seemed a little listless. So he helped her to the stone platform covered with a wolf skin mattress and let her drink some water. Her face looked a little pale. But her eyes were her eyes had returned to green. Like two crystal and magnificent precious gems. Selina's eyes fell on the armor that was only a pile of broken copper and iron at the entrance of the cave and then said to Serdak, Then be careful. Serdak put on the mask again. This cotton mask can effectively block the pungent smell in the cave. And the most important thing is to prevent the volcanic ash from being inhaled into the lungs. There is not much volcanic ash floating in the cave. But that kind of the pungent smell of sulfur is very strong. Walking along the lava river into the cave, you can see the terrain of the cave clearly with the dark red light. Due to the hot wind blowing from time to time, the inside of the cave does not seem so stuffy but the temperature inside the cave is higher. The lava river passing by the corner of the cave suddenly turns into a huge magma pool, and the hot magma inside occasionally bulges out. Small bubbles exploded on the surface of the magma with a loud sound. The surrounding rock walls are covered with a thick layer of sulfur ore, and many stalagmites formed by the sulfur or hang like spears from the top of the cave. Serdak walked three to four hundred meters inside, and unexpectedly found that he hadn't reached the end of the cave yet. It looked much larger than Serdak had imagined. And the sulfur reserves in the cave far exceeded Soldak's. According to Erdak's imagination, Serdak wanted to continue walking inside. But the heat in the cave made him a little dizzy. So he decided to withdraw from the cave. After walking back to the entrance of the cave, Serdak found a long-lost coolness again. It is said that only the bearded men in the dwarf kingdom are not afraid of this scorching environment. Those dwarves even have the ability to divert underground magma to cast and refine steel. When I came back, I happened to see Selina feeding two Guba horses with water. It seemed that her mental state had recovered. The body of the dark red knight had been burned to ashes. And the remaining armors were of no use. Serdak chose to open up the thick volcanic ash outside the cave, put the remains of the dark red knight inside, and placed the double-edged broadsword, burned black by the magic flames, was stuck in front of the grave. Selina led the horse out from behind. The two of them did not stay on the north slope of Pudu Mountain. Instead, they rode horses from the foot of the mountain all the way to the campsite in the sulfur mining area of Wall Village. It was already evening when they arrived at the campsite. At this time, it was time to finish work. The large iron pot set up in the center of the camp was steaming out. The craftsmen in the village were returning from the rocky area one after another. A young man saw Serdak in the distance with sharp eyes and rushed to the camp, shouting, Charlie! Charlie Serdak is back! Charlie and Luke emerged from the tent one after the other. In just two days, Charlie and Luke have completely lost their patience at the temporary camp of the mine. If Soldak does not show up tonight, Charlie and Luke will prepare to recruit people and return to the mine along the original road, where Soldak left. Go there to find his whereabouts. Serdak simply said that the patrol team in the outer village found that the dark red knight was following the horse team, and sent the news to Wall Village. Selina caught up on horseback to deliver the message to everyone. As for the dark red knight, Serdak just said that it might be that the Gobi Desert in the desert is too vast. And he might have lost track of it for a while. In short, he just didn't see it. Chapter 314 Mining Camp The Sulphur Mining Camp has been established for more than a month. It has grown from two tents at the beginning to eight tents now. There are special tool racks and material piles. And specialized personnel are responsible for providing meals. Life here in the camp, I don't know how much better the conditions were than before but the environment here is still full of volcanic ash falling all over the sky, and new rivers of lava are always forming between the mountain walls. Fortunately, the process of forming rivers of lava is very slow, so everyone is not worried. When I woke up, this terrible situation no longer existed in the camp. 
The environment in the camp is very difficult. The most difficult thing is the draft. There is no good way to solve it. The transport horse team did not carry water from Wall Village. The villagers here almost completely rely on the water gathering scroll to survive. If they want to taking a bath here is simply a luxury. But there is no need to light a fire to cook here. You can see underground rivers of lava everywhere. You only need to peel away the volcanic ash and smash the hot rock formations to place the iron pot directly on it. The mined sulfur ore was put into linen bags by craftsmen and piled neatly next to the boulders. There is a stable next to the tent. The ancient bolai horses here also wear masks that can filter volcanic ash. The stable is surrounded by coarse gauze, and the roof is made of rawhide. Such a simple stable usually only has one its function is to isolate the volcanic ash from the outside world. The villagers in Wall Village didn't know about pneumoconiosis. Charlie and Luke were responsible for the specific affairs here. Therefore, before that, Soldak had repeatedly warned the two of them that they must ask the villagers to get out of their tents. Wear a mask. Have a dustproof gauze curtain at the entrance of the tent. And cover the inside of the tent with felt and straw mats. It seems that Charlie and Luke have done a very good job in this regard. Charlie came over and gave Soldak a big hug. He had been stationed here in the mining area for nearly a month and had become darker and thinner. His whole person seemed to have transformed. He smiled and said to Soldak, If you don't show up again, Luke and I will take people out to look for you. Suddenly disappearing without a word for three days is really scary. Serdak could only touch his nose and reply. I walked around Pussy Mountain. This mountain is surrounded by a dead land. Even the most drought-tolerant seed buckthorn grass and thirsty immortal grass cannot survive. You can't see anything alive for a long time. And there's nothing here except the sky full of volcanic ash. Charlie laughed and said, This is a deserted land. What else do you expect? Soldek glanced at the river of lava on the mountain and asked Charlie, Where are those two big guys? Charlie turned around and pointed to the side of the rocky area close to the pussy hill. He pointed with his finger and said, It's still over there in the rocky area. Almost all the sulfur mines here have been cleaned up by us. So they won't come. Come here. But recently they may have discovered that we are robbing them of sulfur mines. And they are full of hostility towards us. Luke stood beside Charlie and interjected. It's good that you're here. Everyone is hoping that you can get rid of these two big guys. I heard that this kind of behemoth can be sold for a lot of money in Alinsa. It's a fire attributed second level monster. And it's also a giant lizard. Whether it's leather or fresh meat. It's very popular in the market. After Soldak finished speaking, he remembered the Francis he met in the underground trading market. The magician said, If you don't eat it, remember to keep the heart and stomach pouch next time. These two materials are also very valuable. Seeing Soldak say this, Charlie began to stamp his feet and beat his chest again and scream. I still regret it now. Why did I believe you when I returned and took everyone to have such an expensive meal? I wish I had known that all the salamander meat could be transported to Holanza City and sold. Sardak chuckled and said, I've already eaten it all. What's the point of talking about it now? If the hunting is successful this time, I will take away the fresh meat and leather. If there are no demon bones, these bone sticks will be left behind. I'll make some soup for you. It's a great tonic. Everyone set up Sardak's tent in a hurry and then went to have dinner. After a hard day, what these villagers needed most was to drink a bowl of fat-rich broth and bake crispy wheat cakes. Break it into pieces and put it into hot soup. It is extremely delicious. Selina did not participate in the discussion here and went into Soldek's tent alone. Selina has always been an unlucky woman in Wall Village. Everyone thinks that anyone who comes close to Selina will have bad luck. She is almost completely isolated by the villagers of Wall Village. Selina was so beautiful that the women in the village were a little jealous. Seeing the way their men looked at Selina, they wanted to stare into her flesh. The men's behavior made Selina even more unwelcome to the village women. Lina, after Selina became a widow, the idle men in the village would inevitably want to join in and take advantage. When those village women met Selina in the village, they couldn't help but spit in her face. The craftsmen in the camp have been away from home for more than a week. Women are not usually seen in the camp. When they saw Selina wearing a linen dress, revealing a section of her snow-white legs, they were all absent-minded. The broth was poured through their noses. And these men were dominated by their body instincts. At this time, they could not even consider whether they were Serdex women. When the first snow falls in Paglo's mountain, the sulfur mine will stop working. And the villagers will return to Wall Village for the winter. Soldak told Charlie and Luke that in a few days, he would go to the Night Academy in Alinsa City for about half a year. Charlie would take care of the affairs of the sulfur mine. 
and Luke would act as Charlie's assistant. Deputy, if you need any supplies, you can send someone to deliver them to him. And then, they can be purchased in Holanza City. In the evening, Soldak returned to the tent. It was a rare opportunity to be alone with Selena. Selena was sitting in the tent, staring blankly at the blazing flames and billowing smoke on the top of Pussy Mountain. Soldak, he got into the tent and pressed up to Selena from behind. She had a nice soapy scent. He put his arms around her slender waist and put his head on her smooth shoulders, asking softly, Thinking about Zygna? Are you worried that she won't be able to eat dinner? Selena nodded slightly and said, As long as Uncle Brett is here in Wall Village, Zygna will definitely not be hungry. But she has never left me since she was a child. I don't know if she can sleep at night. She is usually very timid and always likes to hide in my skirt. Soldak remembered the first time he saw Zygna. She was really hiding under Selena's skirt, her aura-filled eyes blinking in the night. Selena hugged Soldak with her backhand, and her beautiful green eyes became fiery in the darkness. The next day, Charlie took Soldak to take a look at the two salamanders that were still eating sulfur mines in the rocky area. Chapter 315 Trap Serdak, Charlie and Luke hid behind a stalagmite. Among the rocks a hundred meters away from the three of them, two eight-meter-long salamanders were lying on the volcanic ash to bask in the sun. Many stalagmites were chewed to pieces by the two salamanders, and almost all of the sulfur or contained in them was swallowed by the two adult salamanders. Their fat bodies carry a strong aura of the fire element, and their mottled backs look like flames burning. A salamander is seen lazily crawling on the volcanic ash. Wherever it passes, its giant tail leaves behind it. Next deep ravine. Charlie retracted his head and sat down on the soft volcanic ash with his back against the stalagmites. He whispered to Soldak beside him. They have been here for almost ten days. They eat almost every day and then bask in the sun. They will return to the lava river on the hillside to lurk at night. These big guys can actually hide their bodies in the lava. You said that we roasted and ate this big lizard on the way back. Now think about it. It still feels a bit incredible when I wake up. It can take a bath in a magma pool. How could the salamander meat be cooked at that time? Serdak looked at the two salamanders eating their bellies. He guessed that they had eaten a lot of sulfur or in the rocky area in the past few days. So he smiled and said, Kill these two salamanders and leave some meat for you. The best way is to eat grilled salamander meat again. I guess it will help you remember. Charlie's face was full of helplessness. And he said to Soldak, Forget it. A piece of salamander meat as big as your fist can be exchanged for a bag of fine wheat flour. Let's take it to Helenza City and sell it. I can I can't eat such expensive ingredients. If the old man knew about this, he would definitely scold me. Besides, why don't we leave so many meaty bones for us? It would be the same if they were stewed without them. Or even better, turning around and scanning around, he found that there were piles of rocks here, which were not suitable for hunting salamanders. Serdak said to Charlie, This is not suitable for a battlefield. Let's go over there and have a look. The three of them ducked back from the hidden stalagmite and looked around the rocky area for a suitable place to hunt salamanders. Although Serdak left Wall Village in a hurry this time, he came prepared. After hunting the first salamander, Serdak thought about such a large volcanic area. Since salamanders appeared, it was inevitable that there would be a second and third salamander. For this reason, Serdak, when I was in Helanza City, I specifically asked someone for advice on how to hunt salamanders. Although the second level monster has primary intelligence, its intelligence is at most that of a six or seven year old child. To deal with monsters of this level of intelligence, some traps can still be caught easily as long as they are not reused. An adult fire monster the size of the lizard is at least seven or eight meters and the larger ones can even grow to about 10 meters. Although the movements of such a huge body are still very fast, they are not that flexible when turning around. Experienced hunters have designed a barbed armor-piercing needle specifically for this large lizard and python. In order to allow these needles to easily penetrate the tough leather, the tips of the needles are polished extremely sharp. This kind of stinging needles are specially arranged on the crawling roots of large lizards and pythons. They are arranged at an angle of 30 degrees along the crawling direction. And there are definitely not only one or two of these stinging needles. Usually at least a hundred. There are about ten of them. Once the lizards and pythons climb up, there will be nothing unusual at first. But they cannot go back the same way. Otherwise, they will be penetrated by countless armor-piercing needles. However, the disadvantages of using this kind of armor-piercing needle to set up traps are also very obvious. If the prey cannot be eliminated in time and is allowed to struggle wantonly, 
the worst result will be that it is difficult to save the high-grade leather. And it is likely to be pricked thousands of times by the needle. It is full of holes. You must know that the leather on a monster is usually the most precious thing. No experienced hunter will hunt in this way. Knight Saldak, come over here and take a look. Charlie's shout came from afar. Serdak heard the sound and ran over. After just one glance, he made a decision. The place to hunt the salamander was found. What appeared in front of me were two volcanic rocks close together. This big rock seemed to have been cut off with a sword. There was a long and narrow passage in the middle. The entrance was relatively loose. About two meters wide. But in addition the exit at one end is relatively narrow. Shaped like a trumpet. And the side walls of the boulder are high and steep. It would be difficult for the salamander to get in from the loose side. And it would be difficult to get out from the other side. After looking at the solidity of this volcanic rock, I felt that it would be difficult to find a better hunting spot than this one. Soldak took out bundles of black iron needles from his magic waste bag. What's going on here in the sulfur mine? They were all in short supply. But there was no shortage of masons. Charlie casually called over a few young masons. Following night Soldak's instructions, everyone worked hard to dig countless slanted holes into the two big rocks. And then Serdak inserted these needles into these sockets. The color of the pitch black rocks is almost the same as that of the needles. And the crevice between the rocks is in shadow. It is difficult to see clearly the needles lying on the rock wall without getting up close. Just in front of these two rocks. There is a large flat area of soft volcanic ash ground. Surrounded by jumbled rocks and no river of lava for the salamanders to escape. Soldak inserted these stinging needles into the stone wall and said to Charlie beside him. We have to find a way to lure the two big guys out. It is best to separate them. If the two salamanders get together, the difficulty of hunting will be. Leave it to me. I'll lure a salamander away on horseback. I'll take it in circles around the rocky area. When you take care of the first one, send me a signal. Then I'll lure it here. Come on over. Luke patted the alloy bow in his hand and said first. He has the best riding skills among these young people. And he is also an experienced young hunter. After hearing that he took the initiative to take on this dangerous task, Serdak patted him on the shoulder and said, Then be careful. Val, you follow Luke. If Luke is in danger, lead the salamander away. Charlie thought for a moment and shouted to Val behind him. Oh, okay. Val agreed without hesitation. It was almost noon when everything was arranged here. And finally everyone raised the volcanic ash on the ground to eliminate the footprints on the ground. Serdak took the lead in riding the ancient Boli horse. And young people such as Charlie, Luke, and Val mounted the horses respectively. These young people had hunted the first salamander with Serdak before. Although they were not the same. Not much hunting experience. But better than others. And the facts have also verified that these young people are very brave. When fighting the salamanders, no one gave up even if they encountered some dangers. The horses were wearing thick masks. Making it difficult to breathe and unable to run at full speed. But even at a canter, the horse's speed is faster than the salamander running at full speed. There are always people staring at the two salamanders. And it's okay not to keep an eye on them. There are more than 30 craftsmen scattered in the rocky area to collect sulfur ore. And it is impossible for everyone to always observe the movements of the salamanders. Someone is responsible for keeping an eye on the salamanders. No matter where they wander, they will notify the masons collecting rocks in that area in advance and ask them to retreat in advance. Although this will result in the loss of a lot of sulfur ore, it can ensure everyone's safety to the greatest extent. After the traps were set up here, Serdak led a few young people to find the two salamanders again in the rocky area. He saw them opening their bloody mouths, which were filled with fine and sharp teeth, biting on a stalagmite with sulfur ore. The huge head broke the stalagmite with just a flick of the head. Then, like chewing a crispy radish, the huge mouth easily chewed the stalagmite together with the sulfur ore. Go down. Every time they swallowed some sulfur ore, a new flame would ignite on the salamander's back and the two salamanders seemed to enjoy the process. Looking from a distance, the two salamanders looked lazy, and any movement was slow. Serdak and Charlie looked at each other. This time, Serdak drove his horse closer to the salamanders. He was in the distance. The salamander took the initiative to stop 60 meters away, took out an alloy bow from his arms, and under the vigilant eyes of the two salamanders, he blatantly aimed at one of them. Whoosh! An arrow came out of the string, and turned into a white light directly into the eye socket of one of the salamanders. The salamander that was eating the sulfur mine did not expect that the damn human dared to shoot. As if its dignity had been provoked, the two salamanders let out a low roar at the same moment, 
and the two adult salamanders turned around and moved their six short legs towards Serdak. Serdak calmly shot another arrow at the salamander that was hit by the arrow earlier. The accuracy of this arrow was pretty good, and it directly hit the forehead of the salamander running in front. This kind of ordinary feather arrow, if it can be shot onto the salamander without falling off immediately, it means it is sharp enough. Seeing the salamander rushing more than 20 meters away, Soldak steadily put away the alloy bow and swung the leather whip in his hand to hit the horse's buttocks. The ancient bolai horse neighed and spread its hooves. Run towards the chosen trap. When the two salamanders passed by a rock, another arrow flew out from an angle and shot into the other salamander. This arrow did not nail the salamander like Serdak's two arrows did. The arrow failed to penetrate the tough skin of the salamander and fell halfway with a clack. There was a sound in the distance. Val yelled angrily. Damn! This salamander's skin is really thick. The salamander ignored Val at all and continued to chase in the direction of Serdak. Then another arrow flew out. And the arrow shot by Luke accurately hit the eyelid of the salamander. This completely angered the salamander. And it suddenly turned around like a train. It made a heavy roar and rushed towards Luke. Luke was far less calm than Soldak. When he saw the salamander chasing him, he turned around and fled without hesitation, running far away to the outskirts of the rocky area. The round bellies and tails of the two salamanders left a deep groove in the volcanic ash. When they ran on the volcanic ash, the volcanic ash flew into the sky. Serdak quickly led one of the salamanders to the location where the trap was set. He stopped in front of the stone crevice and fired an arrow at the salamander with his fully loaded alloy bow. The salamander also spurted out not to be outdone. A fire bomb hit Serdak. At this time, Serdak was well prepared and slipped into the stone crevice. The salamander saw that the entrance to the stone crevice was about two meters wide. So it followed suit. Serdak Devin. The salamander only felt that the further it went, the narrower the passage in front of it, when it realized that it could not get out of the road ahead. Its huge body was completely stuck in the stone crevice. Serdak, who was riding out on horseback, had already stopped. He jumped off his horse and jumped directly onto the black rock. The salamander immediately felt the danger. It gathered the fire element in its belly without hesitation and sprayed out a stream of flames toward Serdak. The flames brushed across Serdak's back and Serdak was in danger, and narrowly avoided the flames. At this time, the salamander had realized that it was in danger. It watched Soldak fly up to the volcanic rocks above its head, and wanted to get out of the cracks in the rocks. Unfortunately, its round body was stuck in the cracks, and could not get out at all. After going out, the helpless salamander thought about going back along the original path. Its six short legs kicked hard on the rock walls on both sides at the same time. The body of the salamander only moved back less than a foot and the sharp weapon stabbed the sound of breaking tough leather could be heard constantly. I don't know how many stingers penetrated the body of the salamander. The next second, the salamander let out a shrill roar. Its body trembled violently in the cracks of the stone, almost shaking the two huge rocks. Serta Katsuya didn't want to give the salamander any chance to escape. He stood on the top of a rock more than seven meters high, holding the Roman sword with many gaps in his hand. The Roman sword glowed with a faint golden light. Serdak jumped directly into the crack from above. In the middle, he stepped firmly on the flaming back of the salamander, and the Roman sword in his hand was inserted into the spinal joint of the back of the salamander's head. Then, under the huge shock of the salamander's body, the Roman sword was like a saw, cutting off the head of the salamander. This salamander had its mouth open for the time being, and the flames it spewed out of its mouth had not died down for a long time. Its fleshy tail hit the rock wall, and in just a few blows, the rock wall was blown into pieces. But now the body of the decapitated salamander was just twitching violently in the crevices of the rocks, and bright red blood flowed all over the ground. However, the ground was covered with volcanic ash, and the blood was quickly absorbed by the dry volcanic ash, forming a large layer of blood on the ground. Dark Red Traces Chapter 316 Night Talk in the Camp There was no way to completely remove the body of the salamander from the cracks in the stone. We could only peel off the complete high-level monster skin on the back of the lizard, split the salamander into two along the backbone, and cut off the large pieces of lizard meat, put it into the magic pocket, even if the magic pocket is emptied. Due to the very limited subdimensional space opened up by the magic pocket, there is no way to pack the salamander's head, flesh, stomach, and heart. The remaining unimportant parts were packed into wooden boxes brought from the camp and large pieces of lizard bones with meat were also packed into wooden boxes respectively. 
This time we came prepared. So a large number of lizard bones were not thrown away like last time. It didn't take much time to hunt the salamanders. But it took a lot of effort to clean them up here. After waiting for eight young people from the sulfur mine to carry away the two large wooden boxes, Suldek sent a signal to Luke who was leading another salamander shopping in the distance. There was a burst of noise in the rocky area in the distance. The dust was flying. And it didn't take long for Luke to rush to the ambush site here. The furious salamander kept spitting out pumpkin-sized fireballs behind Luke. The fireballs continued behind Luke. The ground exploded. Fortunately, the ancient bolai horse that Luke rode ran faster than the salamander. Although the fireballs continued to explode, it did not pose much threat to Luke. This adult salamander, which is more than 8 meters long, has 6 lizard legs and runs like a steam train. As Luke crashed into the trumpet-shaped stone crevice, Serdak didn't even wait for the fire this time. The lizard reacted and jumped down from a high place. In the blazing fire, he cut off the salamander's huge head with a sword. Serdak did not expect that the process of hunting salamanders for the second time would go so smoothly. With the idea of defeating them one by one, he hunted and killed two precious second-level magic beasts, salamanders, and transported the harvested magic beast materials to the sea. Lanza City will also be sold at a good price. The only regret is that this hunting method greatly damages the most precious leather on the salamander. The leather on both sides of the salamander's body was almost riddled with holes from sharp needles. Only the lizard skin on the back, abdomen, and tail were still intact. Unfortunately, these two salamanders did not have magic marked spirit bones. After cleaning the battlefield and everyone moved all the hunting trophies to the sulfur mine camp, it was completely dark. The craftsmen in the camp who did not participate in this operation heard that Knight Serdek had killed two of the salamanders were also very happy. Of course, everyone was looking forward to the delicious salamander bone soup in the evening. Selena's cooking skills were recognized by all the villagers in Wall Village three years ago. So this feast was cooked by Selena herself as the chef. After the big iron pot is set up in the camp, linen awnings must be set up around the big iron pot. These arbors are to prevent the volcanic ash falling from the sky from falling directly into the iron pot. The old craftsman sitting on a magma rock next to him said, Faye said with emotion, I never dared to think that one day I would be able to eat salamander meat. I have lived in Wall Village for more than 40 years. When I was 12 years old, I followed my father and uncles to hunt gray rock iguanas in the wilderness. At that time, Everyone knew that gray rock iguana's meat was extremely delicious. But one gray rock iguana can be exchanged for two bags of fine powder. All in all, the number of times I've eaten gray rock iguanas in the past 40 years can be counted on one's fingers. Now, not to mention those gray rock iguanas. I even ate the more precious salamander meat twice in a row. The chatter of the old craftsmen spread far away. Under the setting sun, everyone likes to discuss the difficult life in the past. It seems that only in this way can we reflect how beautiful life is now. While chatting, the old craftsman will bury the baked wheat cakes in the hot volcanic ash and bake them like this. After a while, after the wheat cakes are pulled out of the volcanic ash, the wheat cakes will be baked to a crispy texture, and the rich wheat flavor will be stimulated to the greatest extent. Serdak, Charlie and Luke, the leaders of the mining camp, were also sitting together. Serdak told Charlie not to be careless and it was very necessary to take turns to watch every night. Although salamanders are rare, there are obviously still some. These salamanders are very destructive. But if they are discovered in time, it can still be done by riding a horse to lure these salamanders away. After all, there is goo bow in the camp. Horse. But you must not try to hunt. After all, salamanders are second-level monsters. They have strong vitality and can control fire magic. It is not something that young people like them can solve at the moment. Of course, as a hunter, Charlie also understands this. Even if he has these stingers, it is useless. Once he cannot kill the salamander in the trap in time, the salamander will break free from the stinging trap with its own powerful strength. Out! What awaits hunters is an absolute nightmare. Currently in Wall Village, except for Serdak, no one has the ability to rush up to the salamander and chop off its head with a sword. Therefore, the method of dealing with salamanders here is still based on prevention. Once a salamander is discovered, it must be responded to in time. Serdak took out two walnut-sized magic cores from the salamander's head. The magic cores of the second-level monsters must contain magic crystals. He took out a handkerchief, wiped his hands, and said to Charlie next to him, In a few days, I will go to the Night Academy in Halensa City for a half-year study. 
The sulfur mine must be evacuated from the Pussy Mountain in time before heavy snow closes the mountain. If you have any questions, you can send someone to me. Send a letter to the Knights Academy in Helensa City. Charlie knew that Suldak was going to Helensa City for further study. But he didn't expect it to come so soon. Charlie nodded slightly. Luke on the side asked with some confusion. Dak, why do you want to study at the Knight Academy? Luke's question was also what the young people here wanted to ask. And everyone focused their attention on Suldak's face. Surdak said frankly, This is a necessary process to become a formal knight. It is just going through the motions. My current identity is still a reserved knight. If I cannot get the status of an official knight, this reserved knight may be killed at any time. Revoked. Only after obtaining the knight certificate can I be eligible to obtain a fief. Don't worry. Duck. Let our brothers guard the sulfur mine. Charlie smiled confidently and promised Surdek. Luke said with envy, Yes, Wall Village will become your knight leader by then. The faces of other young people also showed envy. Who doesn't have a knight's dream? Surdak's current achievement is probably the biggest dream of the young people in the village who participated in the completion ceremony. Surdak rubbed his forehead with his hands. At this moment, he suddenly thought of the sulfur mine on the northern slope of Pudu Mountain. So he said, I haven't thought about this yet. Maybe I won't apply to classify Wall Village as a my knighthood. Do you have a better place? Val asked curiously. Surdak hesitated for a moment. But after all, he did not mention the matter of the sulfur mine. So he could only say vaguely, The matter of the fiefdom will have to be discussed in at least half a year. Then we will discuss it. Chapter 317 Return to the Village At dawn, Surdak and Selina left the sulfur mine camp with all the Warcraft materials obtained from hunting salamanders. Surdak rushed to report to the Knight Academy of the Lensa City and was worried that the salamander meat stored in the magic waste bag would go bad. Selina missed Signa, who was left alone in Wall Village. Both of them wanted to go as soon as possible, rushing back to Wall Village. The two of them would ride horses before dawn, and they would not camp until it was completely dark after sunset. In this way, it took three days for the two of them to cross the Gobi in the desolate land. When we reached Bago Grassland, we saw two carriages loaded with volcanic ash, heading towards Wall Village. The carriages which showed brand new with grain, which should have been made by the village's carpentry workshop. The driver waved his long whip at Serdak from a distance and shouted, Serdak Graham, when we meet outside, being able to shout each other's name from a distance is the greatest recognition. The reservoir construction site in the upper reaches of the valley in Wall Village was still busy. The two of them could see the crowds of people on the construction site from a distance on the mountain road outside the village. Even though it was already evening, the construction site was still in full swing. A group of children were playing under a dead tree at the entrance of the village. They were digging out an ant hole. Little Peter was sweating profusely and squatting among the children, holding a branch in his hand and playing with some immersion. Old Sheila was sitting under the tree root and watching these children. Signa was sitting close to Old Sheila. Although she was younger than Little Peter, she was obviously much more mature than Little Peter. She showed some disdain for the child. In the dusk, two black spots appeared in the distance of the mountain road. Old Sheila stood up with her waist bent holding on to the dead tree, her cloudy eyes looking into the distance, her vision blurry. Old Sheila couldn't see clearly the person on the horse in the distance, so she shouted to the little girl next to her, Zigna, Zigna, Grandma Sheila, what's wrong? Zigna raised her head and asked Old Sheila, you have good eyes, can you help Grandma find out who the two people are over there? Old Sheila said to Zigna, still looking into the distance. After hearing this, Signa looked where old Sheila was looking. It was still a little blurry at first. But then the voices of the two people became louder and louder in Signa's eyes. And Signa's big eyes became louder and louder. It was getting brighter and brighter. She stared with big eyes and shouted excitedly, Uh, it's night, Serdak and Mother. Mother. Mother is back. Serdak has brought Mother back. Following Signa's clear and loud shout, the little girl left the dead tree, spread her legs, and ran towards the two people. Old Sheila chased after Zigna and kept calling her. Zigna! Zigna! Run slowly. When little Peter heard Zigna shout, he stood up suddenly from the crowd. He also chased after his grandma and ran towards the two Guba horses that were galloping towards them. This was the first time Selina had been away from Zigna for so long. She saw a familiar voice running towards her from a distance. The corners of Selina's eyes became wet for a moment. She once again urged Guba to run faster. At one o'clock, 
It was not until she was about to run in front of Signa that she realized that she could not control the horse to stop. She watched in horror as the ancient horse stepped toward Signa, who was ten meters away. Suldek suddenly arrived from the side. He stretched out one hand and tightly grasped the reins of Selina's horse. With an angry roar and two neighs of Gubalai horses. The two horses almost at the same time. He raised his front hooves high and stood on the spot. Selina leaned back as the horse fell directly off the horse. Serdak then turned over and jumped off the horse. Holding Selina, who fell from the horse with both hands. And placed her firmly on the ground. At this time, Zigna passed over the two stopped Guba horses and threw herself into Selina's arms with a pale face. Selina was also frightened by this series of changes and could only hug her tightly. Zigna, her legs could no longer exert any strength, and she sat in a heap on the ground. Little Peter also rushed over, threw himself into Soldak's arms, and shouted heartlessly that Soldak would take him to ride a horse. In the end, it was Serdak who sent Selina and Zigna home. Only then did Soldak ride to the pool construction site with a bag of happy little Peter, seeing that the foundation at the construction site has been poured, and the gates on the east and west sides of the reservoir are now being built, and the bottom of the reservoir has been flattened for the first time. Soldak is preparing to lay a layer on the bottom of the pond. Thick cement. But before that, Soldak also planned to make the first waterproof layer for the reservoir according to the local methods here. The old village chief was at the scene urging the bricklayers on the construction site to brush the first layer of tree slurry on the limestone layer of the reservoir before dark. Rita and Natasha were also at the construction site. They were waiting for the work to end in the canteen. Stacks of wheat cakes were piled neatly on the dining shelf. In front of them was a large, steaming iron pot. It probably contained some vegetable soup or chestnut porridge. When the old village chief saw Serdek riding back on his horse, he immediately put down what he was doing and walked towards him. The old village chief looked at Suldek up and down, and saw that he was not injured. Then he felt relieved and asked, Has Selina come back with you? Serdak dismounted and saw Rita running from the dining hall, and simply replied, Yes. The old village chief wanted to say something, but he hesitated. When he saw Rita, he said nothing more. He just nodded and said to Soldak, It's good to come back. It's good to come back. Rita took little Peter off the horse and said to Soldak, I heard that someone was chasing your horse team into the mountains in the deserted land. Faced with Rita's inquiry, Soldak shook his head vigorously and firmly denied. I didn't find anyone chasing us. Maybe they were just adventurers passing by. In short, this trip to the mine was still it went very smoothly. Rhea smiled beautifully. She punched Soldak on the shoulder and said, I'm so glad you came back safely. Old Sheila and Natasha haven't had any appetite for food these past two days. They are both a little worried. You, you have to remember to comfort them. Then Rita jumped in front of the old village chief and asked directly, Uncle Bright, when can we finish the work? It's almost dark. The old village chief didn't even raise his eyelids and scolded. What's the rush? You have to be more careful with the first coat of grout. Whether this reservoir can hold water in the future depends on how well you apply the first coat of grout. Rita was scolded by the old village chief and was so frightened that she quickly ran back to the dining hall with little Peter in her arms where she and Natasha gathered together to murmur. Next to Ta. It can be seen that the relationship between them is very harmonious. Have those two big guys been dealt with? The old village chief asked Soldak again. Serdak turned around and took out two bones from the canvas bag next to Gubalai Ma and handed them to the old village chief. Then he replied, Everything has been solved. Chapter 318 Registration Halinsa Junior Knight Academy is located at number 9 Durandal Street in the north of Halinsa City in a large area between the aristocratic residential area and the magic district. From the entrance of the Knight Academy, you can clearly see the magic tower not far away. However, the deadline for registration for the academy has passed, and it has been more than a month since the school officially started. At this moment, the deserted appearance of the past has returned to the outside of the academy gate. The metal railings on both sides of the college gate are covered with lush ivy and lentil vines. Through the gaps in the railings, you can see several neat square formations on the college playground practicing formation in the sun. This group of young trainee knights wearing light leather armor, carrying a wooden knight's light shield and wooden sword behind his back. His blonde curly hair stood wet on his forehead. Under the scorching sun in autumn, it is still a bit hot near noon. In mountain towns like Alinsa, the temperature difference between day and night is very large in autumn, and it is very cold in the morning and evening. You even need to wear a sweater and a thick coat to go out. 
on a sunny day. You won't feel cold even if you run on the playground wearing a cut sleeve vest at noon. The leaves of the sycamore trees on the street have begun to turn yellow and fall quietly, laying a thick layer on the sidewalk, making a soft rustling sound when stepped on. And the ancient bull eye horse kept shaking its tail. Maybe it was recently. He has been living a hard life in the deserted Gobi with no grass to eat. After this ancient bow lie horse entered the city of Aranza. Its thick lips have been like a dog among the vines, leaves, and grass, sniffing around. Serdak pulled the reins, and Gubalai Ma turned his head to resist, stubbornly making his own silent protest. Fortunately, there were not many pedestrians on this street. Otherwise Serdak would be seen in the scene. A knight was actually having trouble with his mount. It would be a bit embarrassing to think about it. However, this ancient horse did not seem to have the consciousness to give up when it was good, after it won the privilege of running to the roadside lawn to eat a few bites. It then developed to eat the ivy on the wall of the Knights Academy. It was probably this kind of palm-shaped leaves is not very suitable to its appetite. The ancient bolai horse only chewed one leaf and did not take another bite. Serdak arrived in Haranza City last night and stayed in a hotel next to the plaza park for one night. This morning he sold all the salamander meat in the underground market. Although Haranza City is a city with only it is a small town with a population of less than 300,000. But the purchasing power of the people here is still very strong. Especially for this kind of precious ingredients. Those who can buy these are the noble lords and magician nobles who are not short of money. Their pockets seem to be there will always only be gold coins and magic crystals. However, according to the agreement between Serdak and magician Francis, Serdak still left a thick lizard tail. Two still pulsing salamander hearts and two sets of stomach pouches for the magician. Serdak originally wanted to go to the magic guild not far from here to personally deliver these Warcraft materials to Master Francis. But by chance, he passed by the Junior Knight Academy. Standing in front of the academy gate, Serdak touched the letter of recommendation in his hand. Seeing the young trainee knights in the academy who were undergoing basic tactical training on the playground, Serdak suddenly felt a sense of urgency. I thought to myself, now that I have arrived at the door of the Junior Knight Academy, I will see if there is still enough time. Or else I should sign up first. Serdak looked at the tall stone pillars and arched iron gates on both sides of the courtyard wall and walked to the gatehouse in front of the gate. In the gatehouse, a guard in black and blue uniform stuck his head out of the small window and asked Soldak, who was holding the horse. Knight, may I ask you a favor? The guard's eyes fell on Soldak's chest. And when he saw the knight's badge, his face was filled with a smile. He walked out of the concierge and stood in front of Soldak. Then he saw a piece of tobacco handed to him. The concierge quickly took it and put it into his pocket. I'm here to report, Soldak said. The guard wiped his hands and found that there was still a strong smell of tobacco in his hands. This tobacco was not a popular tobacco that had been soaked in pits and then exposed to fermentation. It should be genuine products from the big tobacco workshops. The joy in his heart naturally showed on his face. Go up. Oh. You want to apply to be an instructor at the college? Serdak wiped his nose and said directly, No, I am a student who came to study. After saying that, he took out the recommendation letter from the old knight of the knights. But it's been so long since school started. The guard just glanced at the gold-plated pattern on the recommendation letter and immediately changed his words in the middle of the sentence. Okay, since you have a recommendation letter from the knights, come with me. The guard opened the corner door next to the big iron gate and said to Soldak, Go along the main road to the teaching building. Next to the academic affairs office on the fourth floor is the registration office. You can go there to register first. Your horse will be there. You can tie it here first, and I will take care of it for you. After everything is settled, you can come and take the horse away. It seems that the last sentence should be the benefit brought by the piece of tobacco. Serdak nodded to the guard to express his gratitude, and then stepped into the gate of the college although it is only separated by an iron fence. Once you enter the college, you will feel that the noise outside the campus suddenly quiets down, and your whole heart feels settled. Looking at the lush hibiscus flowers on both sides of the college's main road, Serdak, I just feel that the air here is much cleaner than outside. Long leather boots stepped on the stone pavement, making crisp and rhythmic footsteps. Serdak took a deep breath, looked up and saw the huge sword and shield badge on the top of the main teaching building. He tightened his belt slightly, straightened his waist, and stepped forward. The doorman looked at the back of Soldak walking towards the teaching building. Just as he was feeling emotional, another young doorman came out of the doorman. 
He blinked his small eyes and said with disdain, You are so old. Why? You want to go to the Junior Knight Academy? You must be in the wrong place. Probably because he didn't get any benefits. He was so resentful. The previous guard reprimanded. What do you know? There may not be many real knights among the graduates of the previous academy. This person with the status of knight should have come to the academy to obtain knight certificates. He belongs to the Knights League Committee. This kind of student cannot be regarded as freshman in the true sense. As he spoke, he straightened a small collar in front of the only glass in the concierge and said to the young concierge, The training knights in the academy, one by one, are among hundreds of people competing to cross a single plank bridge. Who can the one who crosses the bridge first is the knight? And the one who doesn't get the slot will be left behind. Did you see the knight badge on his chest? He is different from these training knights. He is the kind who has already crossed the bridge, and now only it's just a matter of situation. There are so many explanations here. The young guard was dumbfounded. Of course. Stand your guard. I have to go out for inspection. Don't always be lazy and take a nap in the concierge. Looking at the young and immature faces on the playground, Soldak suddenly realized a problem. Although he didn't have a mirror to look at his face that was darkened by the sun, he only looked at his own pair of long hair. The big hands covered with calluses seemed to finally understand where he was incompatible with his college. Finally, I realized that this is the only junior night academy in Helensa City. The age for recruiting freshmen is only about 12 or 13 years old. And I am more than 10 years older than these older children. Even in Benna City a graduate of the senior night academy. He is probably not even his age. Thinking of this, Soldak couldn't help scratching his head in pain. If he were to sit in class with these big kids every day, Thinking about the disharmony of standing on the playground practicing formations together, Soldak's steps would change. There was some hesitation. Everyone in the Green Empire has the right to participate in the Magic Awakening ceremony once in their lifetime. Of course, the expiration date for this right is the age of 12. When they are 12 years old, they can sign up to take the National Magic Test. Once they pass the test, they can perform magic. In the Awakening Ceremony, as long as you awaken the magic pool during the Awakening Ceremony, it means that you are qualified to become a magician noble. This is also the most convenient way for the common people to advance to the nobles. Countless noble children are also flocking to this. At least this way, they don't have to fight for inheritance rights within the family. This move also indirectly affects the admission time of other academies. Usually, children will consider other paths after participating in the magic awakening ceremony and being deemed to have no connection with magic. Generally, they are Junior Warrior Academy, Junior Knight Academy and Junior Sword Academy. There are military academies, and some large cities also have more comprehensive war academies, with a full range of professions such as rangers, assassins, warriors, archers, etc. But you still have to face what you have to face. After all, this is the path you must take. Otherwise you can only be a reserve knight. With this identity, Count Mon Goss's mood. If one day, he returns from the battlefield to the sea lands of found that he was still standing on one of his knighthoods. But Baron Sidney was already lying in the cemetery. Once this knighthood was taken back, his status as a reserve knight would not be preserved. Only when you become an official knight and have your own thief can you firmly hold this knighthood in your own hands. Therefore, let alone let him study in the knight academy. Even if he was sent to the quarry to dig stones, Serdak could only hold his nose and admit it at this time. Knock on the door and walk into the room with the registration desk. There is a rest area on the left side of the outer room and a desk on the right side. Behind the door is a red-haired girl with beautifully made up. She is immersed in sorting out the information. When she sees the walk-in, it was a tall knight who came in. This knight wore a knight's badge on his chest and held a letter of recommendation in his hand. He was also a little confused. She confirmed Serdak's identity. Her eyes kept scanning Serdak's strong body. She smiled sweetly at him and said, Please wait a moment. Then, he took Soldak's letter of recommendation and walked into the office inside with his round hips. In fact, Serdak didn't have to wait long. Serdak sat in front of a desk at the registration desk. The red-haired girl even poured him a cup of black tea thoughtfully, and then left squirmingly. In the room, Soldak glanced at the director of the registration office, who was sitting at his desk and looking through the information seriously. He thought to himself that the director, with two deep nasolabial wrinkles on his face, must have some kind of relationship with the female secretary outside some special friendships. Just when Soldak was thinking about it, the director suddenly raised his eyelids, looked at Soldak from top to bottom, and then asked him, 
Are you a commissioned knight recommended by the knights? Soldek nodded honestly and said, I participated in the plane war in the Warsaw Plain before and became the 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment. So I was qualified to become a knight. Have you participated in the plane war in the Warsaw Plain? So what is your combat level? The director was curious about Soldek's true strength and couldn't help but ask. Serdek said with some embarrassment, I have never had the opportunity to be tested in the army. So I can't tell you yet. The director of the registration office clearly said, who would believe this on his face? The level test in the army is also free. It's obvious that the level is too low. I'm sorry to say it. But judging from the figure, it shouldn't be too bad. Obviously. Based on Serdek's answer, the director of the registration office identified him as a distant relative of a certain earl. And he probably came to this place through connections. In order to avoid another embarrassment in the conversation, the director of the registration office only I can read the recommendation letter hastily. Miss Mason, go call Pablo. The director of the registration office shouted to the female secretary outside. There was no response from outside. The director of the registration office could only be patient and shouted again, Miss Mason. After waiting for about a quarter of an hour, a night looking man walked in from outside and gave the director of the registration office a night salute. Only then did Soldak remember that he seemed to have forgotten to perform the night salute after entering the door. And he didn't know what the director of the registration office would think. The director of the registration office raised his head and ordered to his subordinates, Paplo, please take this reserve knight to class 11 of the second grade. Then he said with a serious face, Knight Serdak, you missed the level test in the opening season. There will be a midterm level test in the middle of next month. Your knight level can be measured then although it is only for half a year. However, if you fail the final exam, we will not be able to issue you a graduation certificate from the college. At that time, you can only complete the credits like freshmen from other colleges, so that your scores in all subjects can reach above the average. Only then can you successfully graduate from the academy. After saying that, he asked Soldak to leave. The director of the registration office motioned Pablo to stay behind with his eyes. After Soldak walked out of the registration office, the director of the registration office rubbed his forehead with his hands and gave the order with a look of helplessness. Said Pablo, It's really a headache. I guess this was brought in by some big shots connections. It is said that he just returned from the battlefield. And I don't know if he can adapt to college life. Remember to ask instructor Milano from class 11 watch him. The prostitutes who come down from the army always have some bad habits of one kind or another. Don't let him make the academy a mess. I understand director. Pablo nodded and replied. Chapter 319 Living on Campus. Pablo is an ordinary assistant teacher in the Junior Knight Academy. Although he has no rights, he is absolutely familiar with this Knight Academy. After walking out of the teaching building and standing in front of the marble paved stepping platform, Assistant Professor Pablo looked at Serdak, who was slightly younger than himself, and asked very enthusiastically, Knight Serdak, please bring your luggage. With your entourage? There are two rows of sycamore trees between the main teaching building and the playground in the college. Now the leaves of the sycamore trees have turned yellow and are spread on the grass. Several square teams on the playground are practicing square formations in an orderly manner. The instructor shouted slogans. Soldak set his sights on the school gate in the distance and said to Assistant Professor Pablo, My horse is parked at the school gate, facing the upcoming campus life. Soldak was still vaguely looking forward to it. He looked up at the knight's badge with a sword and shield intertwined on the top of the teaching building and looked at the gorgeous building full of Baroque style. There are actually several statues standing on both sides of the marble steps. Below these exquisite busts are corresponding black stone tablets. Each stone tablet is engraved with lines of text, probably introducing the life achievements of these statues. Each statue is a hero who walked out of the Helensa Knights Academy. Assistant Professor Pablo led Soldak through the corridor filled with statues. He did not want to introduce the glorious deeds of these heroes to him. As he walked, he said, There is a special stable in the college. The grooms are very professional. You can leave the horse to them to take care of it. Seeing that Serdak was listening carefully, he continued, However, this expense is not included in the tuition. You need to pay a miscellaneous fee, which is about 10 silver coins per month and 45 silver coins for half a semester. Of course, you can also store the horse outside the academy. But in that case, it will be somewhat inconvenient. You must prepare the horse in advance for each equestrian class. If it is convenient, it will be much more convenient to leave the horse in the academy. 
the three-piece set of horses, matching saddles, and knight's light armor is one of the most expensive aspects of the knight academy compared to other academies. Many apprentice knights will prepare horses, saddles, and leather armor at the beginning of school. Of course, some apprentice knights do not have the financial conditions. Every time they take riding lessons, they need to temporarily rent public horses in the academy. This the rental fee is not expensive, but it does not include practice outside the course. It is impossible to practice riding skills well just in a small amount of time in the class. The price of an ordinary horse in the market is more than three gold coins. And of course, this does not include the saddle. A leather saddle and supporting equipment such as pedals, whips, spurs, hanging gear, etc. If you want to buy them all, you will need at least two gold coins. In addition, if you want to ride a horse, you must also have a set of light leather armor, plus tuition fees. If these expenses are counted together, it will cost at least about 10 gold to support a training knight. For many ordinary families in Alinsa City, this is a huge expense. Usually freshmen do not buy horses in advance at the beginning of school. They rent public horses in the college at first and wait until they are in their second year. Later, after riding lessons become more frequent, students will consider buying a horse of their own. However, Serdak is a knight trained by the knights. Usually such knights have their own horses. And Serdak is no exception. What is a knight without riding a horse? Serdak thought for a while and found that he really had no other place to place this ancient bullion horse except fostering it in the academy. Moreover, since the academy could arrange a full-time groom, Serdak decided without even thinking, Then I will stay in the academy. Seeing that Soldak didn't hesitate, Assistant Pablo knew that he was also a wealthy owner. The smile in his eyes became much more friendly, and he said to Serdak, Then I will take you to handle the foster care of the horses first. Then I will take you to the place where you live. And finally the classroom where you take classes. You need a curriculum and prepare different courses every day. Let me see the major courses and elective courses for the second grade. Along the way, Assistant Professor Pablo told Soldak about the life in the college. The stables in the college are located next to the equestrian field at the back of the college. There are two rows of stables against the back wall. Soldak led the getting on his horse and following Assistant Pablo into the stable. He found that there were at least nearly a hundred strong horses in the stable most of which were the most common ancient horses in the Green Empire. There were actually two more horses in the innermost fence of the stable. A green-scaled horse. Seeing that Serdak was in a daze looking at the two precious green-scaled horses, assistant coach Pablo showed a hint of pride, popped up his chest and said to Serdak very proudly, Knight Serdak, I heard that you just returned from the plain battlefield. Haven't you seen the blue-scaled horse? Serdak withdrew his gaze from the scales on the green-scaled horse's legs. This kind of warhorse, with the blood of alien beasts is considered the best warhorse in the Green Empire. Unfortunately, after killing the Dark Red Knight, his black-scaled horse did not waiting outside the sulfur mine. Serdak also searched around the mine, but could not find the scaled horse. The knights of the constructed knights in our legion all ride black. I have never seen this kind of cyan, Soldak said to assistant coach Pablo. Pablo coughed twice. Ahem, the green-scaled horse is second only to the black-scaled horse. Usually only construct knights are qualified to ride it. When the two met the manager in charge of the stables, he was leading two grooms to cut grass for the horses next to the hay pile. Another young groom mixed the chopped grass and soaked beans. Serdak felt that the food for the horses here was really good. So it was at least worth the ten silver coins he paid for miscellaneous expenses every month. After Pablo explained his purpose, the stable manager took a familiar look at the mark on the horse's leg, wrote a new number next to the mark and asked the groom to lead the ancient bolai horse into the stable. The ancient bolan horse did not feel any discomfort in the unfamiliar environment. It walked slowly into the stable. The ancient bolan horse standing outside the stable grazing silently kicked its hooves uneasily, and its body he involuntarily hid inside, leaving a space for Serdak's horse. Seeing the arrogance displayed by his horse, Soldak could only say, It seems to be very adaptable to life here. Passing through the night training ground next to the stables, I happened to see dozens of trainee knights practicing using large wooden guns on the training ground. This kind of large wooden gun is a standard weapon for heavy cavalry on the battlefield. It is usually made of ironwood and indigo wood. The length is usually more than 5 meters. The tip of the wooden gun is usually covered with iron sheet. After the plain war begins, this kind of large wooden gun has been gradually eliminated from the battlefield. The main reason is that this kind of large wooden gun covered with iron cannot cause any harm to the Nakma people. Nibra people evil spirits, and faceless men of the Dark Legion. 
So this kind of large wooden gun has turned into a knight's lance with a black iron tip. But that kind of knight's lance has more stringent requirements on the arm strength of heavy cavalry. Ten training knights riding gubwa horses. Holding large wooden guns with various patterns in their hands. Looked very lively as they galloped side by side on the training ground. However, as a former member of the heavy armored infantry regiment, Soldak did not have any favorable impression of heavy cavalry. Although on the main battlefield in front of Mayun Rich, heavy cavalry was once the main force against the evil ghost army. But the battle of Mayun Ridge was like this. The retreat was like a wave, and finally reached the point where it was out of control. This had a lot to do with the collapse of the fighting will of the Moyenling Heavy Cavalry Regiment, compared with heavy cavalry. Serdak felt that light cavalry on the battlefield was more flexible. The combination of long swords and knight's light shields could at least cooperate with heavy armored infantry. The knight training ground in the academy is very large, occupying at least half of the area in the knight academy. When he was about to walk out of the training ground, Soldak saw the future young heavy cavalrymen flying their big wooden guns past the scarecrow at the end, and then cheered collectively, thinking of Augusta in the second team. C was a graduate of the Warrior Academy, but the training in the academy did not save the life of the hot-tempered man at the most critical moment. He died on the battlefield like other team members. The college's dormitory area is completely separated from the Knight Academy. Assistant Professor Pablo took Soldak downstairs in the second building. The main body of the building here is entirely made of square stone strips. And the wooden doors and windows are it has an exquisite round arch pattern design and is painted with white paint, making the dormitory look very bright. There are four buildings in the dormitory area. Each building is an independent grade. This building is a second year dormitory. The college provides these dormitories for free. Of course, the dormitory management is also extremely strict. Once the dormitory management regulations are not followed, the once you will be warned by the hostel, you will be expelled from the dormitory the second time. Of course, there are many houses for rent around the college, which are more comfortable to live in than the dormitory here. But one thing is that this place is close to the wealthy area. Rent is not cheap. Knight Soldak, are you sure you plan to live on campus? Assistant Professor Pablo stood at the door of the dormitory and asked Soldak again. Of course, living here is closer to the college and it is much more convenient to attend classes. Serdak answered without hesitation. Indeed, I still miss the student dormitory in the college very much. Although the management system is a bit harsh, it is better than renting a house outside. With that, Assistant Professor Pablo opened the door of the dormitory and walked towards the door. Dormitory administrators showed their identification badges. The registration procedure was not complicated. Soon Soldak received a nameplate for his accommodation. And then the dormitory administrator took Soldak to the corner room on the top floor. The dormitory administrator stood at the door and opened the door. There were two beds on the left and right sides of the wall. The ground was covered with a thick layer of dust and messy footprints. The door to the south terrace was open. And there were two dirty clothes hanging on the clothesline. The dirty linen shirt looked like no one had lived here for a long time. The dormitory administrator lowered his eyelids and said quickly, Each room has two beds. Currently, you are the only one in this dormitory. But this does not mean representative. You will always live alone. Once a transfer student like you comes, I will arrange him and you together. The room is not big and has the most basic bedding. But it is not ordinary dirty. The stone walls are painted with a layer of gray-white paint. And there is also an old parchment map with some messy graffiti on each sheet. There is a wooden table and wooden chair beside the bed. And there is a small cabinet near the wall. Next to the cabinet is a human-shaped wooden frame. Obviously, this wooden frame is used to hang armor. And there are also weapons and shields to hang. S position. Serdak walked into the dusty room and saw several flower pots on the stone railings of the balcony. The flowers and plants inside had not been watered for a long time. Several unknown plants had long since dried up. And all their leaves had disappeared. It looked bare and extremely depressed. The dormitory warden rolled his eyes and stared at Soldak with an indifferent expression. During your stay, you must strictly abide by the dormitory management regulations. Otherwise, I have the right to expel you. If you agree, I will sign your name here. Soldak. Serdak wrote his name casually. And the middle-aged dormitory administrator turned around and left. Assistant Professor Pablo stood at the door of the dormitory. He looked up at the spider webs on the door lintel and laughed dryly. He was probably a little embarrassed because he had just boasted about how good the dormitory was. He stood at the door and looked at the clean clothes he had wiped. Wearing bright sheepskin boots, 
He finally did not want to walk into the dusty dormitory. He said to Soldak. I guess you need some time to tidy up this place in the afternoon. I suggest you try the food in the college for lunch and dinner. The cafeteria. I love the cheese pie there. Then assistant coach Pablo stood at the door of the room, chatted casually with Soldak, and finally said, I will wait for you downstairs tomorrow morning. Seeing Serdak looking over in surprise, assistant coach Pablo said, Take you to see instructor Milono. He is the instructor of the night training class. After saying this, assistant professor Pablo left the dormitory with brisk steps. Serdak stood on the terrace and saw assistant professor Pablo leaving the dormitory building in a hurry. It was almost noon, and the top of the teaching building was not far away. The bell rang, and a moment later, the crowd rushing out of the teaching building spread out on the playground like a tide, and then split into several black lines, rushing towards the school gate, dormitories, and canteens respectively. Looking at the young faces, Soldak's heart was ups and downs. He never thought that he would be able to return to the academy one day. He turned to look at the worn parchment map on the wall. The center of this map was the city of Halanza. Serdak easily found the deserted land outside the mountain pass and the Paglos Mountains in the upper left corner of the map. In one corner of the map, circles were drawn with a charcoal pen. They looked like scribbles. Many places were painted black. And there were some incomprehensible symbols. Chapter 320 Visiting Carl The Magic Guild in Halanza City is around. Dark gray tower that looks like a birthday cake. The entire mage tower is divided into four floors. In addition to some exquisite stone sculptures on the top of the tower, for a series of elements stand vertically in four directions. There is a statue of a magician on the top of the tower. The magician holds a staff in one hand and a thick magic book in the other. The statue faces the southeast, and the staff occasionally has a there will be a flash of lightning. The mage tower is one of the few iconic buildings in the city of Alanza. The guard at the entrance of the magic tower carefully checks Erdak's night badge before reluctantly allowing him to enter the magic tower. The magic tower has a spiral internal corridor. It is difficult to clearly distinguish the floors from the inside. Some magic apprentices wearing magic robes are holding information or holding some experimental equipment and magic materials. They shuttle back and forth in the hall, allowing Serta to as soon as could walk in. He felt the strong learning atmosphere here. According to the address left by Francis Magician to Soldak, Soldak easily found the magician's laboratory. It happened that Francis Magician had just completed an experiment. After the assistant in the laboratory informed him, Francis Magic the teacher quickly walked out of the laboratory. Serdak explained the purpose of his visit and took out a specially reserved piece of salamander back meat, two salamander hearts, and stomach pouches from his magic waste bag. Only then did magician Francis remember what he said a month ago and what he had said and I bought some salamander meat at the underground market. Unexpectedly, just a month later, the other party actually delivered some salamander meat to my door. Magician Francis quickly asked his assistant to bring a glass container and put two salamander hearts into a petri dish. Middle. Then he asked his assistant to bring two cups of hot drinks that shimmered with light blue stars. He sat opposite Soldak and asked curiously, Are you a professional demon hunter? In fact, it's not true. I just found some sulfur mines on the Paglos Mountains. These big guys also like to eat sulfur mines. They run out of the mountains. If you don't find a way to hunt them down, the sulfur mines will be eaten by them. Light. So I prepared some traps. Serdak did not hide anything and said truthfully. Francis listened carefully to Soldak's story. At this time, a magic assistant took out a large map of Halensa City from the bookshelf and spread it on the coffee table. Magician Francis pointed his fingers all the way down the Paglos Mountains to the vicinity of the Pussy Mountains. He pointed here with his hand and said, I know that you can always find something outside the Pace Volcano deep in the Paglos Mountains the sulfur mine. But it's a bit far for us magicians. And it's full of dirty volcanic ash. And the environment is extremely harsh. Are you digging sulfur there? Serdak did not expect that magician Francis would immediately find out the approximate location of the sulfur mine. At this time, he could only say, there are some stalagmites accompanied by sulfur in the lava river at the foot of Paste Volcano. Seeing the hesitation on Serdak's face, magician Francis smiled heartily and said, don't worry, Although no one from the Magic Guild has set foot on Pace Volcano in recent years, it doesn't mean that we don't know where it is. What exactly is the situation? Generally speaking, as long as it is an active volcanic crater, there is a high probability of being accompanied by sulfur mines. I guess you won't climb to the top of that mountain to mine sulfur. 
The sulfur deposits you find at the foot of the mountain are mostly caused by the collapse of the magma pool in the crater or a small-scale eruption, causing lava to overflow into rivers from the top of the mountain. The lava washed some sulfur-contained gravel from the top of the mountain to the foot of the mountain, and the sulfur mine you described appeared. If you want to get richer sulfur, you can only find it in the craters close to the lava pools. However, I don't recommend that you go to the lava pools in Pace Mountain. It is very dangerous there. But I didn't expect that this sulfur mine could actually attract salamanders. This only shows that you are really lucky. Magician Francis did not hide anything and told Soldak what he knew. Do you know there is a sulfur mine over there at Kudima Mountain? Serdak asked in surprise. Magician Francis showed a matter-of-fact look and said bluntly, Of course, it's just that the cost of mining is too high. There are no professional alchemists in Halinsa City, and the demand for sulfur is not that big. Who is willing to go there and eat the ashes? It's not like the group of dwarves in the Western land. Just buy some of this stuff, and it's enough for daily magic experiments. But since you have sulfur in your hand, you can take it and trade it with me for the market price. Serdak smiled and said, That's no problem. Magician Francis. Magician Francis chatted with Serdak for about a quarter of an hour. This magician was knowledgeable and seemed to know everything about the city of Alenza, especially the distribution of magical beasts in some mountains. I heard that Serdak whose home is located on the edge of the deserted land. So he casually asked about the situation there. Hearing that Soldak said that there are occasionally groups of sand wolves in the deserted land. Magician Francis frowned and said, If it wasn't forced with no way out, those sand wolves probably won't set foot in the desolate land. Unexpectedly, the Magic Guild of Halensa City had known that there was a sulfur mine in Pudu Mountain for a long time. It was only because of the harsh environment that they gave up the plan to mine the sulfur mine. In the eyes of Magician Francis, the mine must be located in the crater of a volcano to be considered a serious sulfur mine. After walking out of the Magic Guild and seeing that it was still early, Soldak decided to visit Carl at Casement Mansion. This time Serdak was lucky. He happened to catch up with Carl Casement at home. Hearing that Serdak was visiting, he quickly came to the door to greet him. He saw that Serdak was still wearing the Warcraft leather armor. Carl smiled and asked, Did you report to the Knight Academy when you came to Alensa City this time? He just came over there, Soldak said. The two walked through the courtyard, and Carl invited Soldak into a living room. It seemed that this should be the place where Carl usually entertained guests. Without waiting for Carl's instructions, the housekeeper brought a set of afternoon tea with the maid, and the two sitting on the soft leather sofa. Carl said to Soldak, If you need me in Halensa City, just come to me. Nothing bad, Serdak replied, seeing Soldak glance at the butler next to him. Carl said to the butler, Butler Kingsley, could you please see if there are any delicious muffins or hazelnut cakes in the kitchen? I want my friends to try them. Okay, Master Carl, I'll prepare it for you now. The butler saluted gracefully, then left with the maid next to him, and closed the door to the living room. The housekeeper was also very discerning, and actually took away the maids in the living room. There was no need for Carl to find any more reasons to send them away. What's wrong? What happened? Carl asked Soldak. Serdak hesitated for a moment, but decided to tell Carl about it. So he said, A week ago, a construct knight entered the deserted land, and investigated some information about the bandit groups in several villages near Wall Village. I think he seems to have some relationship with those bandit groups. He didn't directly say that the Dark Red Knight was a member of the Black Magic Monastery, mainly because he couldn't produce any strong evidence, and the people had been reduced to ashes in the sulfur mines. Now Serdak just wanted to know about him. Origin. When Carl heard what Serdak said, he also put away the smile on his face, and said with a serious expression, Construction Knight? Can you tell me his characteristics? Soldak thought about the attire of the Dark Red Knight, and then said, He rides a black scale horse, wears a full black iron magic pattern structure, and wears a dark red cloak. After Soldak revealed the characteristics of his attire, Carl said directly, You said this is the Dark Red Knight, a follower of Baron Grinfell. However, he is really a bit mysterious. He usually lives in seclusion and has few friends. No one in Halanza knows his true strength. Anyway, no one has seen him take action. However, some people say that his strength is unfathomable. You also know that after the plane war broke out, most of the construct knights in Halanza City set off with a legion to participate in the plane war in the Warsaw Plain. There are very few construct knights still in the city. Almost none. Through investigation, Carl determined his identity at a glance. 
Zaldek secretly wrote down the name of Baron Grinfell. You said he has something to do with the bandits? Carl asked Zaldek. Zaldek nodded and said, It seems that he is not inquiring about the whereabouts of those bandit groups, but more like investigating the patrol teams of the villages involved in nearby bandit groups. Carl lowered his voice and said to Zaldek, The Dark Red Knight is related to the reputation of Baron Grinfell. Although he is just a baron, he has many friends in Helensa City and is very influential. He is a powerful nobleman and is also a member of the Council of Halanza City. His identity is somewhat sensitive. Unless conclusive evidence can be produced, any speculation will have little impact on him. Then Carl said, Even if the information about the patrol team is investigated, it must be related to the bandit group. Maybe it is for the reward mission on the notice board. Seeing Soldek frowning, obviously disapproving of his conjecture, Carl quickly said, Okay, I will investigate. Carl spoke a little perfunctorily, obviously not believing that the Dark Red Knight colluded with the bandits. Seeing that he failed to convince Carl, Serdak could only sigh softly in his heart. He couldn't produce any evidence, nor could he act too eager. After all, the Dark Red Knight died at his hands. In the Dark Red Knight, before the crime is exposed, for Serdak, killing a construct knight will mean that he will be sent to the trial court. After eating the hazelnut cake and drinking two cups of black tea, Soldak said goodbye to Carl. Then Serdak went to a grocery store and bought some daily necessities. After all, there was almost nothing in the dormitory except a bed and a desk. The dormitory also needed to be cleaned carefully. But Serdak Duck didn't even have a rag in his hand. All these things needed to be bought from the grocery store. When he entered the Junior Knight Academy again, Serdak stopped at the gate for a moment, chatted with the guard, and then walked into the gate of the Academy. In the afternoon, there were obviously a lot more training knights on the playground. Many people gathered together in twos and threes to communicate, and some simply practiced with wooden swords on the playground. Most of these teenagers did not seem to have participated in the coming-of-age ceremony. Sue Erdek walked through this group of young people as if walking in a chest-high reed pond. In his eyes, those thin little bodies were not much different from the chickens in the henhouse. Many trainee knights saw the knight's badge on Serdak's chest and thought he was an instructor in the academy. They stood up straight and bowed to him in a somewhat restrained manner. Looking at those young faces, Soldak had no choice but to quickly walk across the playground and back to the dormitory area. Under the sycamore tree in the dormitory area, a group of teenagers aged 13 or 14 were gathering together. They were probably watching the light leather armor on a young man. When they walked into the dormitory, two faces walked out, delicate girls, seeing that they were also wearing the robes of apprentice knights from the Knight Academy. Serdak was still guessing why the female students actually came to this dormitory building. When he climbed to the third floor, he passed by the long corridor. At that time, from the half-open door of the room, he actually saw two girls talking casually in the room, and there were some small decorations hanging in the room. Serdak finally realized that this dormitory building was full of two girls. Dormitories for first-year students. These dormitories are mixed-sex dormitories. Serdak slapped his forehead hard and once again doubted whether it was a mistake for him to choose to study in the junior college. Maybe he should choose to go to the Advanced Knight Academy. Maybe in the Advanced Knight Academy, the age gap between himself and other students it won't be so obvious. But the matter has come to this. Regretting is of no use. For the sake of that piece of paper, no matter what hardships and hardships, we have to grit our teeth and persevere. Fortunately, it is said that it only lasts for half a year, which is one winter, and it will be over after enduring it. Soldak has never been a pampered person. It is not difficult to clean up the room. When he returned to the dormitory, he started cleaning the room. He swept it inside and outside and wiped it several times. The oak floor in the room was only after the original dark red paint was revealed. The tables and chairs were wiped clean, and the beds were replaced with new sheets. Did this dormitory look like it was lived in? Afterwards, Serdak threw the rag in his hand into a wooden basin, then sat on the single bed placed against the wall took off his Warcraft leather armor, hung it on the shelf, and only wore a pair of clothes. A linen shirt and trousers went out to the terrace to deal with the withered flower pots on the railing. Chapter 321 The First Day in the Night Academy While tidying up the terrace, Serdek discovered that the terrace of this dormitory happened to be connected to the terrace of the dormitory next door. They just built a waist-high low wall to divide the terrace into two, and there were simple erected erections on top of the low wall. There are several wooden railings, the terrace of the dormitory next door is filled with lush flower pots. And there are some small items such as underwear and white socks hanging on the clothesline. 
It seems that the dormitory next door should be a female dormitory. After cleaning the terrace, a chair was moved out and placed on the terrace. Standing on the terrace, you could just see the main teaching building and the playground blocked by the plane trees. At this time, there were some energetic teenagers on the playground. They are running wantonly, wearing wooden swords on their waists. When running, they are accustomed to holding the hilt of the sword with one hand to prevent the wooden sword from scratching others. Some people are also doing offensive and defensive exercises with each other. The afterglow of the setting sun covered the entire academy with a layer of gold. And even the mountains and forests in the distance seem to have a layer of gold. The senior training knights on the night training field are still lining up, holding large wooden guns in their hands and charging at the straw man at the end of the field. After dinner, Serdek returned to the dormitory and sat alone on a chair on the terrace. He took out the Roman sword with a blade that was broken like a saw. The gaps created by the double-edged broadsword were even cracked in some gaps. This Roman sword had no repair value. Serdek decided to find time to go to the blacksmith shop to buy a new knight's sword. The Roman sword is a short heavy sword used by heavy armored infantry. For knights, knight sabers and elf long swords are more comfortable to use. Correspondingly, the combat skills have changed. Serdak is more accustomed to fighting on foot with sword and shield. But he feels constrained while riding on horseback. The whetstone in his hand was a gift given to him by the businessman Larkin. The whetstone, which was as big as the palm of his hand, had already grinded out a groove that fit the Roman sword blade. The whetstone made a cha sound when it rubbed against the sword edge. There is a clicking sound. After the sword blade is polished and sharpened, it must be backlit with a whetstone. Finally, a layer of animal grease is applied to complete the daily maintenance of the long sword. Then, Serdak took out the blue-skinned iris shield that had been with him for nearly three months. However, the main frame and the front of the iris shield had been cut into pieces by the dark red knight's double-edged broadsword. Obviously this shield that resisted evil spirits on the battlefield was also destroyed by the dark red knight in the battle. Serdak also has his own ideas about purchasing a new shield. The iris shield is still a bit too light for him. Perhaps the thicker dwarf chain shield is suitable for him. It wasn't until it was almost completely dark and the night watchman started to light up the street lamps that the students on campus returned to their dormitories. As the dormitory lights turned on one by one, the night silently infiltrated the campus. The sound of chaotic footsteps and the chatter of girls came from the corridor. It seemed that there were still people walking and playing. The light next door was on, and it was a little quieter in the corridor at this time. Soldak placed the worn-out iris shield on the wall of the terrace and heard a clear and sweet voice coming from the dormitory next door. Lena, it's actually going to happen tomorrow. There are basic training classes. During the last running training, I felt like my intestines were about to break. I had to find a way to escape. If this continues, I feel like I am going crazy. Forget it. What can we do? Another girl named Lena said coquettishly. Serdak could even feel the girl sighing. What do you think of pretending to be sick? The clear and sweet voice continued. Lena's voice came again. Last time we was caught pretending to be sick. Do you know how he got here this month? The clear and sweet voice did not speak. Lena said, Every day before dawn, I have to run laps on the playground. And I have lost a lot of weight. The dormitory room became quiet. And for a while, there was a soft whisper. As if someone was changing clothes. Then the door to the terrace next door was suddenly pushed open and a little girl in a nightgown walked to the terrace and reached for it. The clothes were hanging on the clothesline on the terrace. But suddenly, she saw a chair on the terrace next door, and a person was sitting there quietly in the dusk, which shocked the little girl. Her face became a little pale, but she did not scream. Instead, she covered her chest with her hands and looked here carefully. She saw clearly the side of Saldak's resolute face with vicissitudes or scars. After that, he asked with some uncertainty, are you the new instructor? This question made her feel a little embarrassed. How could an instructor live in a student dormitory? The instructor's dormitory, which was only separated by a wall, was a row of lofts. The accommodation environment there was many times better than here. Soldak didn't expect that the little girl next door would be so bold and actually strike up a conversation with him. So he turned to her and said, No, I'm here for class. Through the wooden grill, Serdak could clearly see a blonde girl who was only 13 or 14 years old with unusually fair skin opposite her. Her big lake blue eyes fell on Serdak's knight's badge. With the last hint of panic in her eyes, he also disappeared without a trace, showed a sweet smile to Soldak, and said, Hi, new classmate, H. Lo. My name is Lena. 
While talking, another short-haired girl looked over from the terrace of the dormitory next door. The girl named Lena introduced to Soldek. This is my roommate Nedra. We are second year training nights. You shouldn't I also be studying second year courses? In fact, Serdak didn't know how he was going to study. After all, he was only going to receive six months of training at the Knight Academy. It probably couldn't be taught in the same way as these young students. So he said, I still want to learn. Not sure. Probably. I know that there are commission knights like you in our academy every year. Lena said with a smile. But it was obvious that she was not prepared to discuss the matter with Soldak in depth. She just nodded slightly to him and pushed her roommate into the dormitory. The wooden door on the terrace slammed shut. The next morning, Serdak was practicing slashing and blocking with his sword on the balcony. This was a habit he had developed in the forest camp. He got up early every day to do these basic trainings. Every time he swung, Serdak did it meticulously. In the morning of Helensa City, the mountains, fields, and streets and alleys of the city are filled with morning fog, and a ray of sunlight shines into the city through the morning fog. The door to the balcony next door was pushed open, and the short-haired girl named Nedra ran to the balcony to water several flower pots. When she turned around with a watering can, she happened to see what was being done. Serdak in slashing action. Nedra has a pair of light blue eyes and looks particularly healthy with her wheat-colored skin. She asked Soldak curiously, Do you have to practice these basic movements every day? The instructor also requires us to do some basic movements every morning. Practice. But no one wants to get up early. Soldak said, Did I wake you up by practicing here? Sorry. I should be practicing in the garden downstairs of the dormitory. Nedra quickly shook her head vigorously and said, No. She just feels that there is really no need to practice such basic movements. Even the worst students in the class did such simple movements very standardly in the first grade. After all, this is the content of the final assessment of the first grade. Only those only untalented trainee knights need to practice. Nedra is one of the talented trainee knights. Every time the instructor teaches some new techniques in the class, she is the first to master them. People, Sardak nodded politely to his new neighbor, and then swung the Roman sword seriously again, doing it meticulously every time. When Nedra and Lena were washing up in the dormitory room, they heard someone shouting to Serdak from the downstairs of the dormitory outside. Night, Serdak. Have you had breakfast? Do you want to go together? Assistant coach Pablo stood under the grape trellis, raising his head to greet Soldak on the terrace. He was wearing a white linen shirt, a sheepskin vest, breeches, and a thin sword on his waist. Very energetic. Soldak supported the terrace with both hands stuck his head out, and said to assistant coach Pablo, Okay, come down right away. Assistant professor Pablo was standing downstairs waiting for Soldak. When he saw him walking quickly from the dormitory door, he took him to a path in the dormitory garden and said with a smile, The breakfast in the college cafeteria is quite rich, but if you want to eat the most popular honey bread and milk oatmeal here, you have to order it again. Not every breakfast can be sold to the end. Standing on the terrace, Nedra happened to see assistant professor Pablo introducing some details of life in the college to Soldak with a smile. She couldn't help but curse in her heart. Flattery Pablo. Flattery Pablo. Of course. Assistant coach Pablo couldn't hear Nedra's internal murmurings from the trainee female knight on the terrace. He took advantage of this time in the morning to take Soldak around in the cafeteria. The two of them bought something that assistant Pablo highly recommended. Honey bread is a kind of bread that is rolled up like a croissant. It is baked and full of milky aroma and sweetness of honey. The color also looks quite attractive. In fact, Serdak doesn't like sweets very much. Instead of eating this, he might as well sell a crispy scone, tear it up and soak it in the broth. All kinds of food in the college cafeteria basically cost a few copper coins. For one portion, it doesn't cost much to have a full meal here. Assistant Professor Pablo had an obvious double chin on his somewhat round face. He pinched a piece of honey bread in his hand and stuffed it into his mouth. He took a big mouthful of hot oatmeal and swallowed the food with a grunt. Go down. After casually taking a few bites, Assistant Professor Pablo swallowed the food in front of him. Then he took out a handkerchief and wiped his mouth before saying, Night, Serdak. You have just participated in the plane war. I think that in the academy, you probably don't need to take basic training classes and physical training classes again. Although you need to major in second year courses. You can actually use the free class hours to study Chinese history and chivalry etiquette, history and culture, moral beliefs, astronomy, geography, mathematics, 
during the six-month training period, you must complete at least other subjects that the training knights have studied for three years. And you need to pass the qualifications to successfully obtain the knight certificate. I think fighting skills, writing skills, etc. If necessary, you can also just take the final exam. And you can get the corresponding credits as long as you pass the test. Serdak felt a little overwhelmed just after hearing it. With so many subjects, he had to pass the exam and pass within half a year. It seemed that this knight certificate was not as easy as he thought. Moreover, he originally planned to enter the knight academy, which was to be systematic, learn some knight fighting skills and writing skills. When Pablo saw that Soldak was very talkative, he quickly took out more than a dozen course schedules from his pocket. These were the schedules for each grade in the college. Assistant teacher Pablo first found the curriculum for class 11 of year 2 from these curriculums, then took out a carving knife in his hand, crossed out all the physical training classes on the curriculum, and left it on he exposed the empty cells one by one, and then skillfully took out the curriculum schedules of other grades and placed them below, so that new courses would appear in those empty cells. Assistant teacher Pablo compared them and listed the ones with the most cultural courses in the empty cells. I left the course schedule and crossed out the corresponding physical training classes. The proportion of cultural courses in Helensa City Night Academy was originally a bit small, until the entire curriculum was filled with cultural courses. The cultural courses that Serdak asked to learn actually covered a huge part of the subjects from first to third grade. This series of operations also made Serdak dizzy. In fact, the various subject examinations in the Junior Night Academy are not as strict as Assistant Pablo said. Assistant Pablo arranged so many subjects for Serdak to study, just because he was worried that he would be too idle and would use the Night Academy. It was such a mess. It's not like this kind of thing has never happened before. In the end, the knight who was appointed to the training with his profound background left after six months, leaving a lot of mess behind, and the academy was responsible for wiping it. Then that's the worst. Then Pablo took Saldak directly to the notice board of the main teaching building. Here is where the corresponding courses are taught. Saldak's courses run through three grades. If you are confused about the class, in the end, Assistant Pablo's efforts were in vain. So Assistant Pablo patiently explained to Soldak for nearly a whole morning. Finally, he personally led Soldak to the instructor in charge of Class 11, Migno, and handed Soldak into the hands of Instructor Migno. Only then could he completely complete his mission, looking at Serdak who was brought into the classroom by Instructor Milano with a dead face, and placed in a corner of the classroom under the watchful eyes of a group of young training knights. Then he breathed a sigh of relief and hurried to the registration office to resume his life. Instructor Milano also believed that Soldak was a relative of a certain noble in Helensa City, and he probably came here to get night certificates. He arranged the seats casually and didn't pay much attention to it. He even omitted the step of self-introduction. Chapter 322 Life in the Night Academy The bright sunshine shines into the classroom from the window, leaving patches of light on the floor. The classroom seems very quiet. Serdak sat in the last row of the classroom near the window. All the young faces were attracted by Instructor Milano on the podium. Everyone listened attentively to Instructor Milano's account of the Fourth All-Race War. One of the battles was the famous Battle of Constantinople in the province of Bena. Instructor Milano was standing on the podium and talking about what kind of role the regiment mainly composed of heavy cavalry could play. Instructor Milano hung up a map of the Bena province on the blackboard, with various cities and mountains and rivers on it. The markings were very clear. Instructor Milano used red and blue pencils to draw two large arrows and drew some battlefields around the two arrows. 800 years ago, the coalition of humans, orcs, elves, and dwarves gathered together and defeated in one fell swoop the powerful dark forces of the demons, undead, and abyssal tribes that came from the three realms of the flame hell, the underworld, and the dark abyss. It is said that the archangels of the sky city and the dragons of the Kingdom of Dragons also participated in this war. Instructor Milono described the fierce battle between the Bena Mad Swordsman Legion and the Undead Zombie Legion along the Paglos Mountains. It is said that the Bena Province is the only way to enter the Mazaro Mountains from the southern part of the Green Empire. The South Road Army of the Undead has assembled nearly a million zombies. Almost the mountains and plains of the Bena Province are full of undead zombies. And the Bena Province Heavy Cavalry Regiment there were several outstanding performances in this battle. But this is not 800 years ago after all. Now the main force of the Green Empire has long been transformed into the more well-equipped, constructed knights. If the current plane war only relies on the heavy cavalry regiment, Serdak can't help but after some guessing. 
I am afraid that the Warsaw Plain will be fully occupied by the evil ghost army within three months. There was a large field of golden sunflowers planted in the flower pond outside the window. While Instructor Milono turned around, Soldek secretly stretched himself. He was sitting among a group of young apprentice knights. The tables and chairs here were obviously designed for those young people. They were a bit small. He was almost huddled in the corner. He saw the shadows left by his arms on the light brown floor. His hand was raised unconsciously, chasing the ray of sunshine. The sun shone on the back of his hand, which was very warm. Knight Serdak, do you have any questions to ask? Instructor Milano asked in a deep voice as he waited for Serdak in the corner with a dark face. A cold wind seemed to blow in the classroom. Serdak didn't expect that he would slip away. His arms chased the shadows on the floor, and he raised his hands unconsciously. He had only listened to half of the class and had nothing yet. I understand. But there is nothing to ask. He wanted to stand up from his seat, but found that the space was unusually small. The young faces around him looked at him in surprise. Then he moved the table, stood up, hesitated for a while, and then turned to Instructor Milono. Asked, Um, Instructor Milono, which area was the heavy cavalry regiment guarding at that time? Located west of Constantinople. Instructor Milono gave the answer without thinking. He pointed to a place on the map and continued. It's right here. At that time, almost 50,000 heavy cavalry and cavalry were gathered here. 120,000 imperial swordsmen. He stared at Soldak and said to him unceremoniously. Next time. Please don't interrupt my story. If you have any questions, leave them to the last question and answer time. I will answer your questions in a unified manner. Otherwise, it will affect this matter. The continuity of historical events. Okay. Instructor Milono. Soldak breathed a sigh of relief and sat down again. Before I could fully adapt to the pace of life in the college or integrate into the rich learning atmosphere, the lunch break bell rang melodiously. Mrs. Meredith on the podium calmly put down the chalk in her hand, arranged the books in her hand, and said to the expectant students in the audience, Everyone, get out of class is over. The sound of moving chairs was mixed with the sound of running. All the students rushed to the door, forming a river with the army in the corridor after class, and poured out of the teaching building. Soldak sat in the corner, waiting for only a few people to be left in the classroom before walking out with the course schedule. He would go to the library to borrow some books at noon, including books on most cultural classes from first grade to third grade, so as not to be empty-handed during class and look like he was not studying at all. He blended into the crowd, and was two feet taller than the surrounding students. Several bold boys in the class approached him and asked him variously, You were recommended by the knights. Knight? Have you participated in a planar war? How old are you? Can I call you uncle? Do you want to join our wilderness experience group? Our group is still short of one spot. You're really tall. Can I see your knight's badge? All kinds of questions came one after another, including enthusiastic invitations, full of curiosity, and superficial temptations. These young people have not yet learned how to hide their inner thoughts. Serdak dealt with these curious teenagers all the way. Everyone walked out of the teaching building together. What followed was intensive cultural class study. The four classes in the morning and four classes in the afternoon were full of photos. So there was a scene like this in the Hellenza Night Academy. A knight was holding a thick stack of books and going around to study cultural classes every day. He also studied cultural classes covering all subjects in the academy. In his courses, there are no basic training and physical training. Equestrian, fencing, and other courses on the table. Serdak didn't know much about the history of the Grim Empire. So whenever he had time, he would go to the library and read books about the history of the Grim Empire. Nedra and Lena discovered that their new neighbor next door seemed to have morning classes every day. And he always held a stack of thick books in his arms. He could be seen across the terrace at his desk almost every night. On Finn by Jishu. He seemed to have few friends and was always alone, either sitting in the classroom or on the way to the classroom. Some training knights around him felt that he might not like physical training classes. He probably couldn't ride a horse, and he couldn't even hold a long sword. The so-called return from the plain battlefield was just to avoid going to those boring physical training classes. There were even some busybodies who secretly gave Soldak a nickname, Clerical Knight. During the recent period, Serdak, in addition to his busy studies, would also occasionally inquire about the Dark Red Knight. Only on weekends, Soldak would take some time to practice swordsmanship in the Academy Sword Hall. In the evening, he would go to a tavern with Carl for a drink. Three weeks passed in a flash. So far, 
dark red news of the knight's disappearance has not yet spread. And Carl's investigation has made no progress. Chapter 323, Encounter in the Sword Hall Serdek originally planned to come to the Knight Academy to systematically learn advanced shield blocking and sword skills, and at least learn some decent knight skills. However, when he came to Alensa Junior Magic Academy, he realized that this was not the case at all. The thing is, the heavy cultural knowledge every day makes me breathless. These days, let alone the practice of swordsmanship and shield blocking, even walking the horse every day can barely squeeze out a little time. These heavy cultural classes are not only boring and difficult to understand. Sometimes you have to go to the library to look up information before taking the geography class. The only thing he wanted to do was learn ballroom dancing in class. Looking at the group of young faces around him, Soldak really didn't have the courage to invite a dance partner from among them. There is such a big difference in height. Are they hugging each other's neck or somewhere else? Put it on your waist? That's impossible. It's simply out of reach. Mrs. Fuller who was responsible for teaching knight etiquette, had to personally teach Serdak the most basic dance steps. Unfortunately, Serdak had no talent in dancing. Every time he danced, he was so nervous that he was sweating profusely. His limbs were stiff and without any sense of rhythm. Seeing Soldak's clumsy appearance on the dance floor further confirmed the statement that he had no athletic talent. The title of clerical knight is more widely spread in this small junior knight academy and has even reached the ears of instructor Milono. Among these courses, only mathematics is the easiest for Serdek. Only the most basic four arithmetic operations are taught in the Knight Academy. These mathematical problems are almost at the level of some fifth-year elementary school students. Sitting with Serdak, the trainee knights he was with were so young, which prevented him from feeling any sense of superiority. In math class, he spent most of his time huddled in a corner in a low-key manner, silently flipping through other books. The math teacher felt that the student who had been trained as a knight really had no talent for math. In order to maintain his dignity, the math teacher never asked Serdak any math questions in class. For Soldak, hiding in the sword hall to practice swordsmanship every weekend is the most relaxed and leisure time. Every weekend, the sword hall in the academy will become very deserted. After a week of training in the academy, knights will never stay in the sword hall on weekends. So the practice rooms in the sword hall are almost always free. Only at this time will Serdak go to the sword hall and occupy a separate practice room by himself. Start practicing from the most basic ten bloody fighting styles. The Beta province is known as the hometown of swordsmen. Almost all the best swordsmen in the Green Empire come from the Beta province. Therefore, even the Knight Academy does not lack the latest swordsmanship books. Since there is no one to guide him in swordsmanship, you can only explore on your own. Even if you spend all day in the practice room, you won't feel bored. The only regret is that the quality of the wooden figures in the practice room is a bit too poor. Even if you practice hard with a wooden sword, you will cut the wooden figures with scars at the end of the day. Maybe there will be wooden arms and wooden legs in the end. Falling off the shelf. Soldak's troubles have recently become Darcy Christie's troubles as well. Ever since Darcy Christie completed that not-so-good experience from the Warsaw Plain, she successfully graduated from the Bena City Advanced Swordsman Academy. After graduation, Darcy was unable to stay in Bena City due to various reasons. Instead, he returned to Alinsa and relied on his connections at home to become a swordsmanship instructor at the Junior Knight Academy. Originally, this was a very easy job. There were only three days of swordsmanship lessons a week, and the rest of the time was very free. However, recently, the training wooden figures in her swordsmanship practice room were damaged a bit too frequently. It breaks almost once a week. Every Monday when the damaged teaching aids were replaced. The resentful look in the director's eyes made Darcy Christie extremely upset. Isn't he just a broken wooden man? When it's worn out, he just replaces it with a new one. What's the big deal? Is it as painful as cutting his flesh? Darcy Christie returned to the practice room with a brand new wooden man. Reinstalled it on the wooden frame. Then held a wooden sword and vented at the wooden man. Then she took a few deep breaths. Adjusted her emotions and let he turn into the sweet and gentle instructor Darcy again. And then he opened the door to the practice room and let the trainee knights waiting outside file in. Although she was dismissive of the director of the logistics department, Darcy had recently been paying attention to who was actually able to chop down the wooden man in her practice room with a light wooden sword. Unfortunately, she did not find that person for three consecutive weeks. The wretched culprit, unknowingly, Soldak still went to the sword gym every weekend and chose the familiar swordsmanship practice room. Only this practice room would replace new practice figures every week. It was great. Serdak, 
who has understood the sure. When practicing swordsmanship, all nodes of the body will unconsciously emit sacred aura. These sacred auras are injected into the wooden sword. Even if it is very weak, it is not the most elementary level. The wooden figures in the training room can withstand it. And it is precisely because of this that the wooden figures in the training room always break for no reason. Another quiet weekend. Soldak, who had practiced the ten blood fighting styles extremely proficiently, walked out of the swordsmanship practice room. While wiping his sweat with a towel, he looked at the free basic swordsmanship on the wooden stand to see if there was any swordsmanship suitable for him. Just like the ten styles of bloody fighting that he focused on was obviously not very suitable for him. Serdak felt that he should learn a swordsmanship with a slower attack rhythm, which was suitable for injecting sacred aura into the long sword. It's a pity that these swordsmanship books that can be placed on the bookshelf outside the practice room for free are all basic swordsmanship. Soldak searched beside the bookshelf for a long time, but couldn't find one that suits him. He thought of making an appointment with Carl at the edge of the garden square in the evening. We met at the bar, and after calculating the time, it was almost time to set off. So Serdak put the light wooden sword in his hand back on the weapon rack. There were only a few people in the hall of the sword hall in the afternoon and the female administrators in the sword hall had already begun to clear the tables and prepare to close the hall. At this moment, someone saw the door of the sword hall being pushed open violently, and a young girl wearing a palace-style low-cut dress rushed in from outside. Legs walked into the sword hall and rushed directly to the swordsmanship practice room that Serdak just walked out of. The female administrator in the sword hall looked at the young girl in astonishment and asked with confusion, Darcy, why are you here? Today is the weekend. Didn't you say you were going to the dance tonight? What? The carriage happened to be on the way. I came over to take a look. Darcy Christie said without looking back. Cernak only felt that the profile of the young lady in the dress looked familiar. But he didn't pay much attention to it and turned around and walked out of the sword hall. Chapter 324 Opera House Not long after Cernak walked out of the sword gym, a piercing scream came from the practice room where he was. Oh, someone broke my wooden man. Darcy Christie walked to the front desk with a sullen face and angrily and asked the female administrator at the front desk who was using her practice room. The female administrator opened the registration book full of names with a grimace on her face. She couldn't remember exactly who was using the practice room number seven. She was usually the only one in the sword gym on weekends. Although there were very few people in the sword gym on weekends, she still couldn't care less. Darcy, don't get angry. I will definitely help you find the troublemaker next week. If he still dares to come, you should enjoy some weekends now. The female administrator said to Darcy Christie. She felt that he must it was some restless trainee knight in the academy who secretly broke it. Otherwise, the training wooden figures are all made of the strongest hardwood. So they wouldn't be so easy to break. It's so hateful. I've changed my practice wooden figures three times this month. The female administrator looked at Darcy Christie with sympathy on her face. Fortunately, it was Miss Darcy. If she had changed the teaching aids three times in a month, I am afraid that the stingy director of the logistics department would not give her a good look. But Darcy, the young lady, is related to the dean. So that stingy man shouldn't say too harsh words. Darcy didn't get the result she wanted and left the sword hall with a look of resentment. The sycamore leaves on the sidewalk were falling down one after another, and Darcy wrapped a knitted shawl around her exposed shoulders. She crossed her arms around her chest and walked towards the college gate step by step. The delicate dancing shoes made a series of crisp sounds as they walked on the stone road. The young trainee knights who saw her around would take the initiative to say H, low to her and call her. Miss Darcy! The afterglow of the setting sun made the forest road with red leaves like fire complement each other with the sunset glow. As she walked, she was reminded of the life in the Advanced Swordsman Academy of Bena Province. At that time, everyone's relationship was still very good. Her family was the most famous noble in Helensa City. It was easy to join the upper class circle when she came to Bena Swordsman Academy. And she made many friends through it. Hathaway is a friend I met when I first started school. If it weren't for the appearance of Senior Cole Norton, maybe the two of them would still be best friends who talk about everything. Darcy pursed her lips. No one of the instructors in the academy often said that the battlefield is a touchstone. She thought that Senior Norton, who was highly respected in the Swordsman Academy, would be so outstanding. But when he went to the Warsaw Plain, except for his performance in addition to all the misfortunes, he also forged an irresolvable feud with his former best friend Hathaway. But at that moment, of course, 
the first thing that comes to mind is to protect yourself. How stupid would that be to face a powerful and fierce evil spirit? How can you know you are outmatched but still stand up to fight? Just because you, Hathaway, can do it, doesn't mean that I, Darcy Christie, must do the same. Returning to the Bena Advanced Swordsman Academy from the Warsaw Plain, Hathaway and Beatrice became heroes in the eyes of this class of swordsmen. After all, they broke out from the war zone surrounded by evil spirits with their swords. Such a story is easy make the young swordsmen in those academies excited. What is this? This is completely moral kidnapping. If you Hathaway and Beatrice want to fight the evil devil, you don't need to take me with you. I just want to survive the battlefield. What's wrong with that? Darcy felt a little aggrieved. It was like a stain in her life. The reason why she left Bena City was because she didn't want to be pointed out at the dance. It's all the fault of Baron Sidney, who is lying in the grave. If he hadn't sent a guardian knight to run over, maybe this matter would have ended completely differently. Darcy clutched her knitted wool shawl tightly with one hand and held the skirt of her dance skirt with the other hand. The cold wind made the blush on her face fade away. But she still felt a little resentful in her heart. Walking to the gate of the college, a gorgeous magic caravan was waiting by the road. An attendant stood outside the carriage and opened the door for Darcy Christie. Darcy Christie stopped her body for a second before stepping into the carriage and turned to face the carriage. An attendant said, Is there any news about the night you asked to inquire about a few days ago? The attendant quickly said, Miss Darcy, it seems that he only stayed in Helensa City for a short time and then left quickly. So far, I haven't been able to find any news about the night. Darcy Christie raised her delicate eyebrows and said coldly, since he is a knight under Sydney, he must be from Alensa. Follow this clue and check again. As you command. Miss Darcy. The attendant replied immediately. Darcy Christie boarded the magic caravan. The attendant closed the door. And the magic caravan slowly merged into the traffic on the street. The magic caravan in which Darcy was riding had just turned at the crossroads. Soldak was standing next to the street lamp. And the magic caravan that Darcy Christie was riding passed by. He looked at a magic caravan parked on the street and considered whether to rent a carriage to go to the appointment. When he met Carl in the evening, he was destined to drink some beer or golden cider. He didn't want to fall off the horse. Come down. Alinsa City is not that big, but it takes at least an hour to walk from the Knights Academy to the Garden Square. In the end, Serdak took a carriage and rushed to the appointment. When he saw Carl, this guy was sitting in a carriage at the entrance of the tavern. He pulled Serdak in as he got out of the car and pulled Serdak directly. Kate came to a gorgeously decorated opera house opposite the city hall square. Carl took out two tickets and handed them to the waiter at the door, and then took Soldak into this magnificent opera house. Walking into the lobby on the first floor of the grand opera house, Serdak saw that many nobles in formal attire were already waiting in the hall. Carl and Serdak could only stand in the corner and slowly queue up to wait for admission. Soldak leaned close to Carl's ear and asked him in a low voice, If you want to listen to the opera, Shouldn't you ask Mrs. Christie to go with you? Why did you come to me? I don't understand this thing. Recently in the academy, those imperial histories will make my head explode. Carl stood at the entrance of the turning staircase, turned back with a proud look, and said to Soldak with a smile, Who said I didn't have an appointment? She is waiting for us inside. Let's leave quickly. Do you need me to find a female companion for you? Serdak was also speechless for a while. He couldn't understand why Carl insisted on letting himself listen to such an opera. This was a high-grade life that only nobles could enjoy. However, Serdak had time and would rather have a drink in the bar and watch. Those wine girls who could hold silver coins in their breast cavities. Now that he had paid the ticket, Soldek said nothing more and followed Carl to the second floor. It is said that tickets in the opera house are notoriously expensive. A ticket here costs at least a dozen silver coins. For example, a private room on the second floor may cost even more. Hearing Carl patting his chest and asking to help him find a female companion, Soldak quickly refused and said, Forget it. I don't want to meet the second Miss Brenda again. Carl smiled very disdainfully and said, Brenda is young and beautiful. Isn't she? Probably she is not your type. Otherwise you would care about Llewellyn. Soldak followed Carl, passed through an internal corridor, and walked into a private room on the second floor of the opera house. Mrs. Christie and her maid had been waiting in the private room early. When they saw Carl walking in, they complained about him. I was late, but I didn't forget to say H, low to Soldak politely. Carl didn't pay attention to Soldak beside him, gave Mrs. Christie a big hug, and then whispered a few words in her ear. 
Mrs. Christie herself was not angry and was amused by Carl's few whispers. Seeing the leather chair set up on the terrace in front, Soldak walked to the semi-arc-shaped terrace in front of the private room with a discerning eye. He carefully looked at the luxurious interior decoration of the opera house. The private room was located a bit to the left. The stage of the theater is at the bottom right. Watching the opera from a high position gives you a sense of deja vu. And Serdak can also see part of the audience in the hall on the first floor. It was time to enter the theater. And the first floor hall was filled with nobles waiting to enjoy the opera. The stage in front was covered by two gorgeous velvet curtains. Before the opera started, Carl got rid of Mrs. Christie, came to Soldak and put one arm around his shoulder. With a smile on his face, he pointed to a person in the front row of the hall on the first floor who was wearing a dress and his hair was combed meticulously. He kept talking to other people. The nobleman who greeted the person said, He is Baron Grenfell. He likes to come here to listen to opera after having a drink. He is very humble when communicating with others. And he is also very generous when tipping. He is very popular with the waiters here. Welcome. So don't ask for information about him here. It's very likely that someone will sell you for a good price as soon as you leave. Soldak didn't expect that Carl would bring him to the opera and actually take him to see Baron Grinfell. Looking down from the box on the second floor, he felt that Baron Grinfell's hairline was a little back. However, his eyes were very bright and his skin was a little too pale, as if caused by a decadent and luxurious life and alcohol. He had an innate aura of decadence and arrogant eyes, which was very aristocratic. Soldak withdrew his gaze. He was worried that staring at Baron Grinfell for too long would make him alert. Looks very young, Serdak judged, and then asked, By the way, have you found any clues? Apparently Carl found some clues, so he found an opportunity to ask Soldak to come over and take a look at Baron Grinfell. Carl put his arm around Soldak's shoulders and returned from the terrace. Under Mrs. Christie's burning eyes, he sat on the sofa and drank a glass of golden cider. Then he said unhurriedly, In order to investigate Dark Red to find out the true identity of the knight, I sent my men to guard outside the manor of Baron Grinfell for two weeks. Although I could not wait for the Dark Red Knight, I discovered another very strange thing. Everyone in the manor of Baron Grinfell's special carriages delivering wheat flour, meat, vegetables, and fodder come in every week. And my men made a rough estimate that the food and fodder consumed was about 200 people. Do you think there aren't that many people in his manor? Soldak did not expect that Carl would send people to squat outside Baron Grinfell's manor. Apparently, the smart subordinate smelled something unusual. Carl glanced at Mrs. Christie beside him, who immediately responded with a gentle and sweet smile. Carl continued, In order to find out the number of maids, servants and farmers in his manor, I specially asked Mrs. Christie to visit the mistress of that manor and find out how many maids, servants and farmers there were in Baron Grenfell's manor. There will never be more than 70 people together. Soldak's eyes lit up and he asked, So? I can boldly assume that it doesn't matter if you stock up on food and other things. You can't stock up on fresh meat, vegetables, and fodder. So I guess there is probably a group of people hiding in that manner. And they are a group of shady people, Carl said arbitrarily, with a kind of enthusiasm in his eyes that was eager to reveal the truth. He paused, and then added, But if you want to search Baron Greenfield's private estate, this alone is not enough. There must be some more concrete evidence before I can report this matter to above. Did you bring me here just to let me take a look at Baron Grenfell from a distance and then tell me this? Soldak glanced at the luxurious box and said with some exaggeration. That's really the case. I think we can wait for him to come out in the carriage opposite the opera house. And there is no need to come here. Carl personally poured him another glass of golden cider, looked at each other with Mrs. Christie, and said with a smile, Soldak, you have been in Helensa City for so long. You must also learn to enjoy the aristocratic style properly. Life. Hey, you really don't need me to help you find a female companion? Mrs. Christie on the side also quickly promised. I promise that this time I will not find a noble lady with such a character. I know many good girls. Serdak quickly raised his hands in surrender and repeatedly begged for mercy. Please, don't mention this matter again. Carl sat up straight and said to Soldak. The other thing I want to say is that the Dark Red Knight seems to have really disappeared. No one knows where he went. The explanation given by Baron Greenfield is that the Dark Red Knight has disappeared. The Red Knight is out for training. But his return date has not yet been determined. At this time, a burst of melodious music came from the stage. And the originally chaotic opera house hall suddenly became quiet. 
The nobles who were still chatting eagerly stopped at the same time. After everyone sat down in their seats, their eyes fell one after another. Under the curtain that was open on the stage, a group of dancers were seen running neatly onto the gorgeous stage with light steps. Their light bodies seemed like they might fly at any time. The prelude to an opera began in this way. Carl and Mrs. Christie were tired of being together. Regardless of Soldak's feelings, the melodious singing sounded from the edge of the stage. And the sound was like clear spring water, making Soldak slightly absent-minded. Chapter 325 Audience on the Wall Without hearing an opera with your own ears, it is impossible to imagine the powerful rendering power. What this opera shows is the story of Pagatia, the Silver Moon Elf King, leading the Elven Coalition through the Evernight Forest, crossing the Endless Sea, and entering the Wild Swamp to educate the barbaric lizard tribesmen to resist the demons of H.L. All the performers on the entire stage were wearing heavy costumes, especially the dancers who played the lizard people, who also wore thick headgear and made exaggerated movements. It was as if without the words and deeds of the Silver Moon Elf. These lizard people could not perform the dance. Same as walking upright. The rumored lizard man trainers are definitely powerful beings. The lizard man warriors are good at jungle hunting. Their archery skills can only be most powerful in dense forests. It is said that these lizard man warriors ride flying dragons and can fly freely across the jungle swamps. They are cruel and cold-blooded and occupy a large area of wild swamps in the southern part of the Roland continent. At the end of an opera, Mrs. Christie was so moved by the plot that her eyes were red. Although the opera was over, Mrs. Christie was immersed in the plot and couldn't extricate herself. She leaned in Carl's arms and kept wiping her tears with a handkerchief. As the performers reappeared on stage for the curtain call, warm applause spread throughout the opera house. And the audience in the hall stood up and applauded to show respect for these performers. The audience in the private room on the second floor also walked to the front of the terrace and then everyone began to leave one after another. The group leaves the opera house, and Serdek rejects Carl's offer to send him back to the Night Academy. You're just kidding. I've been putting up with you two all night. With a smile on his face, Soldek stood on the street and waved goodbye to Carl. The street in front of the opera house was full of magic caravans, and nobles boarded their carriages. Then these magic caravans left the opera house in an orderly manner. Serdek wanted to rent a carriage back to the Night Academy but found that waiting for him was waiting for him. The carriages at the entrance of the opera house are all private. After waiting for a long time, I couldn't find a carriage. After waiting for a while, there was still no empty rental carriage. Soldak felt that he could not wait any longer. He looked around, identified the direction, and walked along the long street towards the night academy. But after walking out for a few hundred meters, I was a little embarrassed to find that the direction seemed to be reversed. Although this mountain city was not too big, the layout of the buildings in the city was extremely messy. Serdak originally wanted to find some buildings in the city. Iconic buildings serve as road signs, such as the Magic Tower of the Mages Guild near the Knights Academy. After walking a few hundred meters, Serdak discovered that he had mistaken the clock tower on the municipal square for the Wizard's Tower. Serdak had to go back along the original road and saw a narrow road between the Opera House and the Trading House. The alley looked like it led to a back street. So Soldak decided to take a shortcut along this narrow alley and tried to pass through the opera house. The alley was very dark inside, and there were some debris piled up against the wall, making the originally narrow alley even more difficult to navigate. Serdak regretted that he got into such a dark alley in order to save a few steps. In the alley, he prayed in his heart that the end of this alley was not a dead end. But the more worried about something, the more it would happen. Halfway out, a huge iron fence appeared in the alley in front. This iron fence divided the alley into two sections, making the way forward blocked. Through the iron fence, he could easily see the busy traffic on the other street. Soldak looked back and saw how far he had come, and did not want to go back the same way. He looked up and saw that although the fence was a bit high, it was not difficult to climb over. So he rubbed his hands, looked around and saw that no one seemed to be around, then climbed up the fence nimbly. There were tall square walls on both sides of the railing. Serdak put his hands on the wall stacks, turned over and rode on the square wall stacks. Superior. He was about to jump off the three-meter-high wall when someone pushed open the back door of the opera house, and a figure flashed out from inside. The delicate figure first stuck out his head and looked warily to the left and right sides. I looked around and saw that there seemed to be no one in the alley behind, and then walked out of the opera house. The man looked extremely cautious, looking around vigilantly. 
keeping his body hidden in the shadow of the corner, and walked quickly out of the alley. Just when the figure walked to the entrance of the alley, a magic caravan suddenly stopped at the entrance, and the door of the carriage opened. Baron Grinfell poked his head out of the carriage and took the initiative to pull the man into the carriage. The carriage door quickly closed, and the magic caravan merged into the traffic flow. At this time, Soldek happened to be riding on the top of the door stack. He blended perfectly into the dark night and just saw the pale profile of Baron Grinfell. But that figure was wearing a cloak and a hood. She was wearing a hood. So her face couldn't be seen clearly. Judging from her figure, she was a lady. The moment she boarded the caravan, Soldek happened to see the loose sleeves on her arm slipping down, revealing a section of white lotus root. The same arm. And that arm was printed with black magic patterns like eyes. Unexpectedly, he accidentally stumbled into a private meeting between Baron Grinfell and the opera dancer. No wonder Carl said that Baron Grinfell liked to listen to opera. It turned out that he had a deeper understanding of a certain dancer in the opera house. Soldak thought, the next time he goes to the pub to drink, he can mention it to Carl. Maybe the investigation of Baron Grinfell can start from the opera house. Serdak sat on the wall, thinking about whether to tell Carl the news as soon as possible. At this time, a knight's guard unexpectedly walked in from the entrance of the alley. He walked quickly to the iron fence and made sure there was no one around to return the way he came. Obviously this knight's retinue should be Grinfell's subordinate. He returned again, probably to confirm whether there were any followers behind him. Serdak squatted speechlessly on the top of the wall, worried that the knight's retinue would come back. He waited for a long time before jumping down. Then he quickly walked out of the alley. And when he came to the street, the magic caravans gathered around the opera house had completely dispersed. And the magic caravans on the street returned to normal. Not long after he walked out, a magic caravan slowly stopped. Beside him, the coachman cautiously asked Serdak if he wanted to ride in the carriage. Serdak boarded the carriage without any hesitation. If I rely on my own legs to walk back to the academy, I'm afraid it will take until midnight. It was estimated that the door to the dormitory had been closed at that time. Soldak said to the coachman, Go to the night academy. The dim street lights on both sides of the street swept back quickly, leaving streaks of light on the window glass. The shops on both sides of the street had begun to close at this time. Soldak opened the glass window and let the cold night breeze blow into the car. In the late autumn night, the night wind is a bit cold. Chapter 326 Shushua Then snowflakes fell flyingly, covering the beautiful city of Alanza with a thin layer of gauze. The sky is gray, and the street trees on both sides of the street have shed their last few leaves. A full month after leaving the village of Wall, the city of Alinsa has finally received its first snow. This snow means the sulfur mines and reservoirs. Everything will enter a shutdown stage. Especially at the sulfur mine, the village craftsmen will withdraw as soon as possible and the reservoir side will also enter a semi-stagnant state, which means that the pouring of the main body of the reservoir has come to an end for the time being. Volcanic ash and limestone grind but never stop. The old village chief plans to continue to store volcanic ash throughout the winter, as long as the roads are not blocked by heavy snow. Once the ground thaws next spring, finishing work will be done on the first level reservoir, and then the second level reservoir will be expanded. According to according to the design on Soldak's drawings, the reservoir in Wall Village is divided into five levels in a stepped arrangement. Soldek plans to rush to repair the second level next spring. It is best to renovate the third level before the rainy season. The steps have also been completed to ensure that all works will be completed during the dry season next autumn. Only in this way can we ensure that during the rainy season next summer, we can reclaim the tidal flats of the river bend and dig a drainage ditch in the center of the river bend. During the recent period, Serdak, in addition to running around in various classrooms in the academy, also plunged into the library to study the history and culture of the Green Empire. This was the only thing Serdak discovered in the library of the Knight Academy. Some history books are basically about the records after the Fourth All-Race War. The history books before that are almost blank in the library of Knight Academy. We can only learn from some fragments of Ranger biographies that there was a period of Hex era when goblins ruled the continent of Roland. As for the so-called angels in the Cloud City, and the giant dragons in the kingdom of dragons. They are even more illusory things. The legendary dragon knights are now just strongmen riding some dragons or dragons or flying dragons. There are some records about dragon knights in Helensa Junior Knight Academy. But from a literal point of view, every true dragon knight will become the commander-in-chief of a party and is a legendary powerhouse. Only then did Serdak realize that those black-scaled horses that looked extremely powerful could only be regarded as scum even in front of low-level dragons. 
let alone the dragon family. Serdak was sitting in the library. In front of him was a biography of a knight errant. On the page of the illustration, there was a flying dragon king spreading his wings and flying in the sky. A knight holding a spear stood on the dragon's back. Look majestic. The author of this biography is Angus. Bradbury is said to be a very famous adventurer in the history of the Green Empire. He spent his whole life traveling to Roland and the Eastern Continent, as well as the Seven Seas. What I have to mention here is this great adventurer. The adventurer's wife was originally a female animal trainer of the Lizard Tribe. Later, for unknown reasons, she actually fused herself with a llama sea beast. This was also Angus. The main reason Bradbury was able to swim the Seven Seas. Carl has been absent from Helensa City recently. He is probably busy tracking down Baron Grenfell and personally keeping an eye on the manor outside the city. Because the stories recorded in this night errant biography are so attractive. Especially those about dragon knights. Serdak was even more envious. Originally, Serdak would spend time in the Sword Hall every weekend. But in order to be able to breathe in one breath after finishing reading the biography of the ranger, Serdak spent the whole morning in the library on this snowy weekend. He never expected that Darcy Christie would be guarding the Sword Hall this weekend in order to catch the trainee knight who destroyed the practice wooden figure. Unfortunately, Darcy Christie had been waiting all morning and did not see anyone who had the ability to use the wooden figure. The apprentice knight whose sword left marks on the training wooden figure. Soldak closed the knight's biography, closed his eyes, and pinched the sore corners of his eyes with his hands. There were still phantoms of flying dragons flying through his mind. He sighed softly, thinking that he was in Warsaw. I've been hanging around for nearly half a year, but I haven't heard of any dragon knights in the Bena Legion. If there were, they would probably have become the subject of everyone's talk. Putting the book back on the bookshelf with some reluctance, Serdak was about to leave the library. He would first go to the cafeteria to have lunch, and then go to the sword hall to spend the afternoon. When he walked out of the library, he saw one of Carl's followers standing at the door of the library like a penguin against the falling snowflakes. It wasn't until Soldak walked out of the library that he suddenly came to life. He ran toward Serdak and said to Serdak, Night, Serdak. The master has returned from outside the city and wants to invite you to the tavern for a drink. Really? I happen to have something to ask him for. Soldak's eyes lit up, and he said to the follower. With that said, Serdak did not bother to have lunch, and hurriedly left the night academy with his entourage, got on Carl's magic caravan, and went directly to the tavern next to the square garden. When he entered the tavern, he found that Carl was talking to Llewellyn and Llewellyn. A group of friends, including Jonah and Brooke, were chatting. There were some nuts, lemons, fried fish and several large glasses of ale on the table. Everyone was chatting lively, seeing Serdak walking in. Carl quickly raised his hand to greet him. Everyone knew that Serdak was Carl's close friend. The two had been very close to each other recently. When they saw Serdak walking over, they all took the initiative to say H, low and say H, low to him. Soldak conveyed his kindness. Serdak also responded quickly and in a low-key manner. Everyone then moved their chairs to make room for Serdak and everyone huddled together to drink. All the ale on the table was ordered by Carl's friend Brooke, because he fell in love with a wine girl in this pub. He didn't like drinking wine, just to be able to drink the girl's plump pussy, with a silver coin tucked into his chest. He took the trouble to light up the ale again and again. Brooke has a carefree personality, and is completely unafraid of other people's teasing. Her eager eyes pursue the red-haired girl in the pub without any scruples. For a group of young aristocratic men, the most lively topic at the wine table is talking about women. Carl bumped Serdak with his elbow, smiled mysteriously at him, and then leaned toward Serdak. Bien said, Hey, I encountered a very wonderful thing recently. Just the day before yesterday, I met a beautiful lady. I plan to let you meet her. Her friends are all dancers. Maybe you like her. That kind of. Serdak looked at Carl speechlessly, feeling that his hobby was really weird. Soldak immediately changed the subject and asked Carl, why don't you tell me? What have you gained this week? Chapter 327 Alumni When it snows every year, Carl likes to have a drink with a few friends in Helensa City, waiting for the coming of winter with the snowflakes falling outside the window. There are not many customers in the bar, mainly because this bar does not accept civilian customers, and the price of wine is slightly expensive. Only some young nobles will come here to have a drink. Two dancers were leaning against the bar, playing dice with the half-elf owner in the bar. The dice spun rapidly in the cup, making a crisp sound. When the dice stopped, someone would cheer from time to time. 
no matter you win or lose. You have to drink. The half-elf owner in the tavern likes to drink a fruit wine with a strong sweetness mixed with tree sap. Carl invited Soldak to have a drink. And it felt like it had a hint of alcohol. The sugar water is not difficult to drink. But it is definitely not delicious. However, this blended sweet wine is the specialty of this tavern. Of course, the wine-selling girls with both faces and figures are also a feature here. As long as they are willing to pay for a drink, the wine girls won't mind taking advantage of it. Soldak liked to drink ale and would eat a few nuts with salt grains while drinking. He was a little confused as to why Carl was so keen on introducing him to female companions. Just like Miss Brenda, who looked down on him a little bit before. Serdak still has a headache when he thinks of her now. Carl did not talk about what he had gained this week, but only told Soldak in a low voice that in order to collect evidence of Baron Grenfell's crime, Mrs. Christie and Baron Grenfell's wife got very close and went there again this week. During the conversation, Baron Grenfell also inquired about Miss Hoyle. Only then did Soldak think of the poor noble lady and asked, So, Hoyle Matter is completely abandoned now. Absolutely. Miss Hoyle doesn't want to return to the manor no matter what. There are many terrible past events there that she doesn't want to recall. She has been living in Lord Consul Christie's house recently. But it is hers after all. The territory, no matter what, is still waiting for her to rebuild. I hope she can get back on her feet after this winter. Carl raised the wine glass in his hand and couldn't help but sigh when he mentioned Miss Hoyle. For this noble lady who grew up in a greenhouse, she now needs a capable knight to step forward and save her. Recently, many outstanding young people have visited Christie's consul's mansion, hoping to win the favor of Miss Hoyle. But Miss Hoyle was said to be so critical that she rejected almost all the young men who pursued her. Hey, do you have any idea? As long as you marry this Miss Hoyle, it is equivalent to inheriting a barren title, allowing you to leap from a knight to a noble in one step. This is what almost all knights dream of. Carl put his arm around Soldak's shoulder, put his head to his ear and whispered. Soldak couldn't help but roll his eyes. This guy actually suggested that he should be a soft-boiled man. And he said it so confidently, before completely solving the black magic monastery hidden in the city of Alinsa. Let alone pursuing Miss Hoyle. Serdak did not even want to get close to anything related to Miss Hoyle. So he shook his head repeatedly. Tell Carl that he has no such intention at all. Carl said to Soldak with some regret. You must know that there are very few knights in the Green Empire who can complete this step even if they have outstanding meritorious service. If they want to obtain a noble medal, I don't know how big the punishment will be. Obstacle. Take you as an example. After you are canonized as a knight, if you want to be promoted to a baron through normal channels, you need at least a proposal from the council hall of Alinsa City. And then you must win over half of the Bena province. Only when the members of parliament support you and pass the vote in parliament can you officially become a noble. At this time, Llewellyn was holding a glass of ale and squeezed in between Carl and Soldak. He smiled and asked Carl and Serdak, What are you two discussing? Carl, you seem to be very busy recently. Didn't the bandit group disappear? Why are you always leaving the city? After chasing Miss Brenda, Baron Llewellyn's eyes became much kinder every time he looked at Soldak. He even felt that Soldak was his defeat and was ruthlessly abandoned by Miss Brenda. Soldak was a little pitiful, and he didn't mind expressing his goodwill to Soldak from the perspective of a winner. He clinked wine glasses with Soldak and Carl, with an aristocratic arrogance on his face, which made people feel a little uncomfortable. The three of them took a sip of ale each, and Carl complained to Baron Llewellyn, What's the use of hiding? Once the news is over, this gang of robbers will come out again and cause chaos everywhere. They left all kinds of crimes in Helensa, enough to send them all to the guillotine. Llewellyn, Jonah and Brooke were Carl's best friends. This time when the bandits were causing trouble outside the city of Valenza, the three of them really helped Carl a lot. They had always been he led his knight retinue to search for news about the bandit group in the south of the city. Seeing that Carl still didn't intend to let go of the bandit group, Llewellyn reminded him sensibly, You should also be careful. It is said that this group of bandits is famous for their cruel methods. You killed 23 of them in one go. Members, be careful they seek revenge on you. Hearing Llewellyn mention this achievement, Carl felt a little guilty. After all, he took the credit from Soldak. He glanced at Serdak. And when he saw that Serdak had no reaction, and even looked at him very cooperatively, and even cast an admiring look, Carl said bravely, I have been very low-key recently. Don't worry. I made a lot of preparations. Llewellyn did not expect that the person who gave Carl the task of completing this feat 
was none other than Knight Soldek. He showed a kind smile. Approached Serdek and said, Soldek, I heard Carl said that you are currently studying at the Knight Academy. Yes, I want to get a graduation certificate from the Knight Academy. This medal is only a reserved knight, and you may lose your knighthood at any time. Serdek said frankly. Llewellyn said kindly. You don't need to have such worries. If you are just a civilian, maybe we don't have any good way to help you obtain knighthood for the time being. But since you have become a reserve knight, if anyone wants to take away this power, and we can still help, he whispered to Soldek somewhat mysteriously, and we will be alumni from now on. Let me tell you a secret. I also graduated from Helensa Knight Academy. What's there to show off? Serdek looked at Baron Llewellyn beside him, and was speechless for a while. Chapter 328 Black Eyes Carl, I heard that you recently met a beautiful lady from the Opera House. When will you let us meet her? Maybe we can also be favored by this beauty, and then be willing to introduce her good sisters to us. After all, she is a dancer in an Opera House. Just thinking about it, I think it would be great. It was Carl's friend Brooke who spoke. This young man with a beard just looked away from the wine girl and asked Carl with a smile. Llewellyn next to him showed a faint smile acted very experienced, and said to Brooke, Brooke, I think you should drive your family's golden carriage with the family emblem. Park it directly at the door of the opera house. And then put it on, standing at the door of the car in your gold leaf dress. Opening the door and giving an inviting look to every dancer passing by, waiting there when the opera house is about to end. You will definitely catch something in just one night. This is a good idea. Brooke's eyes lit up after hearing this, and he showed full enthusiasm and asked, Llewellyn, are you sure this trick will work? Whether it's useful or not. You'll know if you try it. Anyway, you won't lose anything. Llewellyn said lightly. But he looked confident. Serdak was not prepared to engage in such boring topics. And he did not own a golden carriage bearing the family emblem. But when he heard the words opera dancer, his heart suddenly moved slightly. And he asked Carl curiously. You said you know that beautiful girl who is a dancer at the opera house? Carl was about to drink. Seeing that Soldak had finally become interested in this matter, he quickly put down the glass and said, That's right. Then he gave her an ambiguous look and whispered, If you want to see her, come with me later. I know you will be moved. Then Carl began to talk endlessly about his affair to Soldak, and sat in the bar with Carl's friends all afternoon. Brooke and Llewellyn became more and more speculative as they talked, and they decisively rejected Carl's proposal, inviting them to have dinner together. They were about to pull out the family's golden carriage. The two of them were blushing and discussing excitedly on such a snowy night. Maybe someone would be willing to ride in their magic caravan. So, Llewellyn and Brooke couldn't wait to leave the tavern, followed by Jonah, who was about to go home. He was not as free as Brooke and Llewellyn. He was from a small aristocratic family, with his handsome appearance and good looks. With his skill, he successfully gained the admiration of a young lady from an earl's family. Now that the two of them have reached the point of discussing marriage, it is naturally impossible to mess around at this juncture. Carl motioned to Soldak to wait for a short while. Not long after, the attendant beside Carl walked in from outside the tavern and stood at the door of the tavern and nodded to Carl. Carl threw a few silver coins on the table. The wine was paid to the bartender in advance. So what was left on the table was just a tip. Carl and Soldak walked out of the tavern together. A magic caravan stopped at the entrance of the tavern. The attendant quickly stood at the door of the carriage and took the initiative to open the door. Carl was the first to board the carriage. Serdak stood outside and saw a petite young girl sitting in the car through the window glass. He followed Carl and boarded the magic caravan. Only then did Serdak clearly see the appearance of the young girl sitting in the magic caravan. There was a faint smile on her beautiful face, and her pair of amber eyes made her look extremely pure. She may not have a straight nose, sexy, lips, but the combination of the facial features makes people feel a charm that comes from the bones. Perhaps it is because of her long-term practice of dancing. Her figure is maintained perfectly, especially after wearing a corset. Appears to be forward and backward. Carl sat next to the young girl, hugged her slender waist, looked at Soldak very proudly, and introduced to him. This is my new lover, Miss Samoa Hylon. Dancers at the Saxony Opera House. Samoa, this is my friend. Night, Serdak. Serdak tried his best to make his smile as natural as possible. Looking at Samoa's charming eyes, he put his hands on his chest and took the initiative to perform the night salute in the carriage. According to formal etiquette, if Samoa wants to express cordiality, 
he must extend his hand for Serdak to kiss his hand. If the relationship is normal, and he does not want to have any contact with him, and keeps a certain distance, he only needs to nod reservedly. For this friend, who Carl took the initiative to take him into the car, Samoa showed a very friendly smile, leaned forward, and stretched out his white lotus-like arms towards Soldak. Soldak held up his slender and soft hand, raised it slightly, and lowered his head actively. If he hadn't bowed his head in advance, the shock in his eyes would have been difficult to conceal. He could very clearly see the magic pattern of a black eye tattooed on Samoa's arm. There was a trace of magic flowing in the extremely thin lines. It looked like the black eye was the emblem of a certain family. Soldak was extremely sure that the Samoa in front of him must be the pretty figure he saw on the street behind the opera house that night. And she had some unknown relationship with Baron Grenfell. It seems that while Carl was investigating Baron Grenfell, Baron Grenfell also placed a black eye next to Carl. Ahem! Perhaps because he felt that Serdak held Samoa's hand for a long time. Carl had no choice but to cough slightly. And then took the initiative to signal with his eyes to ask Serdak to behave more like a gentleman. The silent words in his eyes were clearly, how is it? Now you also think that I have a good taste. Serdak let go of Samoa's hand and sat across from the two of them, lowering his eyes and deliberately not looking at Samoa. Night, Serdak. Do you like opera? Samoa's voice was very sweet. Sorry. I don't know anything about opera, Soldak said, now that it was confirmed that Samoa was related to Baron Grinfeld. Soldak decided to talk less and find an opportunity to tell Carl about it. Why do you know nothing about it? At least you have some exposure. Did you forget that you went to the opera house with me last week? Carl patted his forehead to smooth things over for Soldak. Carl leaned against the soft leather sofa in the carriage and said to Samoa affectionately, It's just that I didn't know you at that time. I will take him to watch your opera with me next time. Samoa said with a cute face. Okay, then you must keep your word. Soldak pretended to be drunk, rubbed his forehead sleepily with his hands, and leaned on the soft leather sofa. The carriage drove all the way to the night academy. At this time, Soldak raised his head and said to Carl, Carl, I have a headache. Let's not go to the Magic Guild. You can take me back to the hotel in Garden Square first. Huh? Carl looked at Soldak in astonishment. He paused, and then opened his mouth and said, I have already made an appointment with the magician Nathaniel. Do you know how difficult it is to make an appointment with this inscription master? Otherwise, just hold on a little longer and I'll take you back to the hotel in Garden Plaza first. Chapter 329 Lure the Enemy The magic caravan traveled through the long street. The street was covered with a thin layer of snow. Several black ruts and countless messy horse hoof prints were like graffiti on a piece of white paper. The ridges of the houses and the courtyard walls in the distance were also covered with snow. A layer of snow fell, and pedestrians on both sides of the road wrapped their clothes tightly in the cold wind and walked quickly towards their homes with their heads lowered. A light layer of water vapor condensed on the windows of some shops on the street, and warm and soft light shone from the houses. Carl stretched out his hand and knocked on the window. The coachman in front of the magic caravan whispered to Guboy to stop the horse. Then the magic caravan began to slow down and stopped on the side of the road. The coachman jumped down from the driver's seat, stood at the door of the carriage and respectfully asked Carl, Master Carl, what are your orders? Carl opened the window and the crisp air outside floated in with snowflakes. Carl ordered the coachman, Let's turn around and go to the Garden Plaza Hotel. The coachman was very familiar with various locations in Helensa City and said respectfully, Okay, Master Carl. After saying that, he sat back on the driver's seat, faced the falling snowflakes, turned around at the street intersection, and drove the carriage towards the Garden Square in the center of the city. Samoa sat next to Carl with a strange color flashing in her amber eyes. She reached out to hold Carl's arm, rested her head on Carl's shoulder, and took the opportunity to look up and down at Sue with a pair of clear big eyes. Erdak's thin lips were slightly raised in a seductive arc. Serdak took advantage of his drunkenness, supported his forehead with his hands, leaned on the soft sofa, and said to Carl, This snow will probably last all night, and I plan to leave Helensa City tomorrow morning. Carl looked surprised. He knew that Serdak must be lying. It was impossible for him to leave Helensa City casually at this time, unless he gave up his further studies at the Knight Academy. But this was almost impossible. Carl wanted to ask him, Are you drunk and talking nonsense? Obviously Serdak didn't, because he only drank a little bit of ale. And he just took the opportunity to pretend to be drunk. Although Carl couldn't figure out why, he still tried his best to cooperate. 
Why are you in a hurry to leave Halensa City? Haven't the things here been settled yet? Serdak twisted his body to make himself more comfortable on the sofa. And then said vaguely, After the first snowfall, it means winter is coming. I'm worried about the mountain road in a few days. It will be difficult to pass. Since you have decided to leave, let's get out of here as soon as possible before the snow starts. Carl asked again, If you leave this time, when can you come back? Serdak reluctantly opened his eyes and replied, Next spring. At least that's my plan for now. If there is someone who needs me, remember to send someone to deliver a letter to me. After a while, Carl said, Okay, then be careful on the road. The hotel is to the south of the Garden Square, just opposite the pub. The distance between the two places is actually not too far. The magic caravan just turned around in the street and arrived at this warmly decorated hotel. The door of the hotel, the glass door, was wiped clean and transparent, and the snow on the steps at the door was swept very clean. Needless to say, this must have been swept by the hotel owner himself. As he is always so diligent, the lights were lit inside the hotel, and the carriage slowly stopped at the door of the hotel. Carl kissed Summer apologetically on her fair face, and whispered to her, My dear, Soldek seems drunk. I don't feel comfortable letting him walk back to the hotel by himself. I have to send him back to his room. Do you want to go to the hotel with me? Or just wait for me in the carriage? Samoa blinked her big eyes and replied, I'll wait for you in the car. I will be right back. After saying that, Carl stretched out his hand to push open the car door, waved to the entourage outside the car, and asked him to help Serdak, who was staggering a little. He also lifted up Serdak's other arm, and the two of them lifted Soldak Erdak, helped him into this hotel. The proprietress at the front desk of the hotel lobby knew Carl and Soldak. When she saw Carl carrying Soldak in almost like a puddle of mud, she quickly stepped forward to help herself and shouted to the hotel owner, who was clearing the snow in the yard behind, asked him to rush over to help, and kept complaining loudly, saying that he had never seen Knight Soldak drink so much and be so drunk. Carl calmly asked the hotel proprietress for a room on the third floor, and helped Soldak into the room and let him lie on the bed. The hotel owner was also busy preparing hot soup to sober up, when only Carl was left in the room. Serdak suddenly opened his eyes, seeing that he was still a little drunk. He said to Carl, You can find any reason to get rid of Miss Samoa, and I'll do it again. Tell me why. Okay. Carl didn't ask any more questions, turned around and left with his entourage. Soldak only waited in the hotel room for about two quarters of an hour before he saw Carl returning to the hotel with his entourage. He walked quickly into the hotel despite the snowflakes and told his entourage to wait at the door. At this time, Soldak, there was even lemon tea ready in the room. Carl sat on the armchair opposite the bed and asked Soldak, What is going on? Soldak sat on the bedside and said to Carl, Remember when you took me to the opera house last week? Then you and Mrs. Christie left first, and I was going to go back to the Night Academy through the alley behind the opera house. In fact, yes, I have always wanted to talk to you about this. At that time, the alley behind the opera house was actually separated by an iron fence. He told Carl in detail what he saw that night. Carl asked solemnly, So, you saw Samoa boarding Baron Grinfell's magic caravan? That's it. Soldak nodded. Carl stretched out his hands, rubbed his cheeks vigorously, and said with a depressed look, Baby Samoa is not what you think. Even though Soldak said so much, he was still a little reluctant to believe that Samoa had any connection with Baron Grinfell. This was tantamount to denying his personal charm and saying that the opera dancer was purely for a certain purpose. They approached him for some ulterior motives. Soldak held a cup of lemon tea and said to Carl, We don't have to sit here and guess what kind of person Miss Samoa is. Maybe we will have the answer tonight. You mean they will take action tonight? Carl thought for a moment before asking. Serdak nodded and said, I guess they already know about my existence. And they don't want to let me leave Alensa City like this. They will even worry about not being able to catch me outside the city. If they want to do anything to me, if we take action, tonight will definitely be the best time. Then he added, Of course, these are just speculations and may not happen at all. But no matter what, I have to make some preparations. Carl took a deep breath and said to Soldek, I will also make some preparations. It is best to catch all the rats hiding in the city's sewers this time. Chapter 330 Assassin Serdak couldn't figure out how many knights of the guard camp were hiding outside the hotel. At least, he saw a middle-aged couple sitting on a bench in the garden square opposite the hotel. The snow on their shoulders had already fallen. A thick layer has fallen. But there is still no intention to leave. 
it seems that they must be the manpower arranged by the guard camp. After stepping back from the curtains by the window, there was no light in the room. Instead, the street could be seen in the distance under the streetlights. The street was a little deserted. There were not many pedestrians at this late hour, and occasionally a carriage passed by in a hurry. Serdak sat on the bed. He took out a square iron shield from his magic belt bag. The surface of this shield was covered with diamond-shaped iron thorns. It was very heavy in his hand. It had a cold metal texture. You could imagine how to make something by swinging the shield. When shielding, what effect will those iron spikes on the shield surface have when they hit the enemy? Zerdek rubbed his forehead in distress. Who would have thought that you couldn't even buy a dwarf chain shield in Helensis City? The variety of weapons and shields was not even as complete as the temporary market in the forest camp. But fortunately for him, the power of time has increased a lot. And I can easily lift this bulky tower shield. I finally bought this bulky thing in a weapon store. Except that it is not convenient to carry. Everything else is fine. His old Roman sword was also replaced by a knight's long sword with a silver guard. There is nothing special about this sword except that the steel edge of the blade is better. In terms of weight, this sword the knight's long sword is much lighter than his Roman sword. But it is about the same weight as the wooden sword in the sword hall practice room of the knight academy. It is the first time to use this kind of knight's long sword with a slightly narrow blade. Serdica sat on the chair with his eyes closed, silently feeling the knight's sword. Knowing that the other party would not come too early, Serdak lay on the bed and squinted for a while. When he woke up, he first moved his body, then became familiar with the weapon in his hand, and leaned his shield against the bed, holding the knight's sword and getting dressed. He lay on the bed and covered himself with a thick quilt. During this month at the Knight Academy, Serdak only felt that the nodes in his body were still awakening little by little. After each node was lit, the sacred aura in his body would become thicker. And this it's like some kind of power has been awakened in the body. Except that the progress was a bit slow at the beginning. Now like a wildfire. The lit nodes have spread to the entire shoulders and towards the back. Even when eating and sleeping. The sacred breath has been slowly spreading outwards. When he looked at his body. His consciousness seemed to have penetrated into a vast starry sky. Countless stars were slowly rotating around a certain point in this space. There was a soft sound at the window. And he woke up from his meditative state. Then the curtain shook slightly. But he didn't see anyone walking in. Serdak only felt a murderous intention gradually approaching from the window. And his eyes opened a crack. But he did not notice the intruder in the room. Seeing the danger approaching. Serdak seemed to be immersed in a dream at this moment. Countless black tentacles stretched out from the shadows. And quickly tied his body to the bed. No matter how hard his body struggled. He could not he moved and opened his mouth. But no sound came out of his throat. His whole body seemed to be tightly bound by invisible black belts. And his throat seemed to be blocked by a piece of rag. The breath of death enveloped his whole body. And cold sweat suddenly broke out on his forehead. Just when Suldak was hesitant. He suddenly found a black and dull dagger hanging above his head. A man wearing black tight-fitting leather armor made a vague outline from the corner. At the same time, the dagger made no sound. The ground slit Serdak's throat. At the same time, the nodes on the shoulders lit up one after another, and a sacred breath came out from the body. The ice and snow that bound the darkness quickly melted. Just when the black silhouette said softly, Serdaka narrowly held the dagger with the knight's sword in his hand. He kicked off the quilt covering his body, jumped up from the bed, picked up the heavy tower shield and faced the black figure in the darkness. Swing it hard. Shield bash. The heavy shield hit the wall, and the entire wall was suddenly covered with spider web-like cracks. However, the erratic black figure escaped from the gap in the shield at the last moment. And the black figure quickly retracted into the corner of the wall. Disappeared. And Serdak rushed to the window first and blocked the half-open window. The black shadow happened to reappear from the side of Serdak. And the black dagger in his hand stabbed Serdak's left rib. Serdak moved the tower shield in his hand. And the dagger struck the surface of the shield covered with barbs. Making a crisp sound. The black figure wanted to hide in the shadows again but the escape route was blocked by the knight's sword in Suldak's hand. In desperation, the black figure rushed towards Serdak like a panther. As time passed, the space behind the black figure became pitch black, and half of the room suddenly disappeared from Suldak's eyes. Then Serdak lost control of his body again, feeling entangled with countless ropes, and the figure in the darkness rushed out again. This time the dagger in the black shadow's hand pierced Serdak's heart, and a light golden, a shallow light shone from Serdak's body and the sacred aura in his body completely dissipated these black shadows. 
he raised his sword and struck the black figure. The figure did not expect that Serdak could break free. The long sword made a cut on the shadow's arm, and the black dagger fell to the ground. The black shadow no longer had any courage to fight, and turned into a black carp and jumped out through the window. The crisp sound of breaking the window glass was particularly clear at night. Serdak did not expect that the other party was as slippery as a fish, and hurriedly following the black shadow, he jumped out of the window onto the deserted street. At this time, the people dressed as a couple on the bench in the square park across the street heard the sound of fighting and had already surrounded them from the square garden. The black figure could only change its direction, turn around and fled westward along the long street. Serdak will he put the bulky tower shield into his magic pocket and chased after him desperately. But the black shadow's body was unusually nimble, and sometimes it would disappear in the shadow of the corner for a few seconds, and then emerge from further away, getting farther and farther away from Serdak and the square garden was long. The two people on the chairs were about to run away when they saw the black shadow. So they whistled loudly around them. At the same time, some knights from the guard camp appeared on the rooftops and high walls along the street in the square garden. Chapter 331 Execution Snowy Night Dozens of long bowmen stood on the roofs covered with a thick layer of snow around the garden square of Alinsa City. Several arrows silently passed through the snowy streets and were nailed to the walls one after another. The assassin nimbly jumped and dodged several arrows while running. Occasionally, he would disappear in the shadow of a corner for a short while. And when he appeared again, he would run a long distance away. There was a rumble of horse hooves on the street. And Carl led a group of knights to emerge from various street corners. These knights were wearing metal armor and holding knight's swords. They all gathered around the assassin without waiting. As the knight approached, the assassin adjusted his direction and rushed straight towards the garden square. Amidst the falling arrows, the assassin crossed a low bush wall and faced the two guard battalion swordsmen pretending to be lovers. The assassin's blood-stained arm suddenly pointed like a knife and stabbed one of the swordsmen. Scholar. The swordsman held a thin sword in his hand and drew a Z in front of his body, trying to stop the assassin. But the assassin's body was as flexible as a loach fish. He took the opportunity to get close to the swordsman, and the arm guard on his wrist sealed the rapier, making a soft ding sound. The two guard battalion swordsmen attacked from left and right, and their rapiers pointed at the assassin's hands and feet. They didn't even intend to kill the assassin. They just wanted to stop him. Just when the two thin swords were about to hit the assassin, a black shadow suddenly exploded behind the assassin. Several tentacles stretched out from the black shadow, instantly holding the two guard battalion swordsmen firmly. Tangled. The two guard battalion swordsmen were frozen in place as if they had been cast a restraining spell. The two people looked horrified. Their bodies were a little distorted by the black tentacles, and some joints of their bodies even deformed in reverse. Although they continued to struggle in the restraints, the phantom tentacles tightly entangled the two of them, preventing them from letting go. There is any abnormality in them. Serdak, who was chasing behind the assassin, finally saw it clearly this time. These tentacles were the illusion of the phantom behind the assassin, and that phantom should be his power. In such a short period of time, he releasing the power of Sher twice in a row must have put a huge burden on the assassin's body. The assassin inserted his knife into the throat of a swordsman from the guard camp. Serdak could hear the cracking sound of his Adam's apple in the distance. Then, he took the sword from the swordsman's hand and stabbed it, pierced the swordsman's chest. The assassin's eyes were pure black at this time, and when he opened his mouth to reveal a strange smile, it showed a mouth full of fangs. Another female swordsman let out a miserable scream, with a look of extreme horror in her eyes. Unfortunately, she was restrained by the black tentacles and could only watch the assassin pierce her throat with a thin sword. The feeling of waiting for death was almost she completely collapsed. At this moment, no one noticed that the water under the female swordsman's leather armor skirt was wet, but it was not blood. The assassin then passed over the two swordsmen and rushed towards the fountain in the center of the garden square with a snatched rapier. The black shadows on the two swordsmen suddenly disappeared. Their bodies were stained red with blood and they fell straight on the snow. Their chests were pierced by thin swords, and blood was pouring out. Serdak followed the assassin, and when he rushed to the two swordsmen, their pupils had begun to dilate, and there was only air coming out of their mouths, but no air coming in. Bloody chests were heaving with bloody foam. Police whistles sounded all around the garden square, and a group of knights from the guard camp quickly came to support from all directions. Carl rode his horse and rushed to the two swordsmen. The members of the guard camp behind him immediately started treating the two swordsmen. Just seeing this, the bodies of the two swordsmen had already begun to turn cold. 
and the guard camp knight stopped, held the magic healing scroll in his hand, and cursed, damn it, it's a lackey of the black magic priory. Catch him! Life or death! An armored knight beside Carl rushed out of the crowd and rushed forward on his horse at a faster speed. A group of knights behind him also followed this knight, speeding up to chase the assassin who fled towards the center of the garden square. Two horses rushed out from the alley opposite the garden square. On one of the horses was a ranger wearing leather armor. He carried a hunting bow behind him and a dagger on his waist. He struggled to join the assassin. The horse rushed to the assassin's side without any intention of slowing down. Just when the strong horse was about to hit the assassin, the assassin jumped onto the horse's back and prepared to rush out of the garden square. Unexpectedly, the assassin actually had someone to respond to him. And the security battalion personnel guarding the outermost area could not stop him. So he rushed into the garden square, leading only arrows along the way. And the horses there were also a few arrows stuck in the hindquarters. But this did not seem to affect the horse's running speed. Seeing the assassin trying to escape, the knight rushing at the front let out a cold snort, like a muffled thunder exploding beside him, and then saw a magical halo emerging from the ordinary armor on the knight, and a stream of magical power. The pattern of the armor was flowing, and a six-pointed star array appeared under the feet of the war horse. When the war horse neighed, the knight and the war horse turned into a white light. Charge. Sirdak saw many heavy cavalry members collectively using this skill on the evil spirits on the battlefield. It's just that he didn't expect that this ordinary-looking armored knight would actually be a construct knight. He and his horse quickly rammed into the assassin. And the horse covered in a layer of armor bumped into the assassin without any fancy. There was only a dull collision sound heard from the war horse riding under him. The war horse under the assassin fell sideways. But the assassin on the horse took the opportunity to jump off the horse and rolled on the snow in an extremely embarrassed manner. After two laps, he staggered up from the ground and threw himself behind the bush wall nearby. The assassin fled in a panic, and Serdak happened to catch up from here. When the assassin saw Serdak running, holding a tower shield as heavy as a door panel, his heart almost completely collapsed at this moment. He didn't want to face a shield-wielding warrior at this time, so he could only escape in another direction along the bushes. But a group of knights from the guard camp came up from around the garden square, and further away stood a row of long archers. The long archers lined up neatly, aiming their bows and arrows at the assassin from a distance under the snowy night. Although the assassin's body can disappear briefly in the shadows, he cannot remain invisible forever. He will reveal his body after sneaking for a period of time. The assassin could not outrun the knights on horseback with his feet alone. He wanted to escape into residential buildings and use the complex terrain to avoid the pursuit of these knights. However, his companion ran ahead and saw him being framed. The charge of the pretending knight was intercepted, and he rode his horse to rush back to meet him but was stopped by a group of knights led by Carl. Now he was unable to save himself. The assassin reluctantly wanted to sneak into the shadows again. But unfortunately a knight's spear suddenly stuck out from the bushes on the left. A knight broke through the bushes and pointed at the assassin with a large wooden spear more than five meters long. The assassin was horrified. His body flipped up in the air like a carp. And he just managed to avoid being hit by the big wooden gun. There was only a short pause before the construct knight behind him caught up again. Almost without saying a word, he slashed at the assassin's back with a long sword in his hand. The sword flashed. The sharp sword cut a wound on the back of the assassin, who couldn't dodge. The assassin seemed to have lost his balance and threw himself on the snow. He hurriedly tried to get up from the ground, but was chased from behind. The arriving construct knight cut off his head with a sword, and the head with half a mask flew into the air and rolled to the ground filled with hot blood. The construct knight didn't even look at the assassin. He pulled the reins of the warhorse, turned the horse's head, and rushed towards another responder. The responder obviously didn't have as good a skill as the assassin. He was beaten by Carl and other knights. Surrounded in the middle, there were still two feather arrows stuck in their bodies, and the remaining horses were also bleeding. Carl took advantage of his companions to put a long sword on the neck of the responder, and hit the responder hard on the back of the head with the hilt of the sword. Go up and knock him off his horse. Someone immediately dismounted and tied the responder tightly with an oil-soaked rope. Carl hit him a little hard, and the responder fell hard and is still unconscious. Take it back to the guard camp. Pull the torture team out of bed and let them examine it overnight. The construct knight rode on horseback and took out a rag to wipe off the blood stains on the long sword in his hand. Then he put the sword back into its scabbard and gave instructions to the men around him. The guard camp knight, holding the magic scroll caught up from behind, 
and said to the Construct Knight, Boss, I'm afraid Coastlin and Guy can't be saved. The Construct Knight had a gloomy face, and then said, Take them back to the guard camp first, and notify their families tomorrow morning. Now we have to quickly find these rats hiding in the sewers. Carl, you go to the Magic Guild to enforce the law. Let the regiment inform us that we killed an assassin from the Black Magic Monastery in the Garden Square. And the assassin can darkly bind Dot. Oh! The guard camp knight quickly led people to deal with the bodies of his dead companions. Okay. Boss. Carl agreed. And without stopping for a moment, he left with a team of knights. Before leaving, he winked at Serdak, who was standing at the outermost edge and watching the excitement. Unfortunately, Serdak didn't understand what his eyes meant. Later, Serdak accepted a routine interrogation from the guard camp and showed his reserve knight medal to show his identity. Hearing that Serdak had just retired from the plain battlefield, the construct knight's face changed. Seize he calmed down a lot. And then he heard that Serdak said that he was registered in the knights and was currently studying at the Helensa Junior Knight Academy. The last doubt on his face disappeared. Serdak brought several knights from the guard camp who were conducting on-site inspections to the hotel room where the assassination occurred. The hotel owner and his wife were awakened by the sound of fighting in the room. They were standing in their pajamas in the messy room, crying without tears. A big hole was cut out in one wall of this room, and most of the wooden bed collapsed. All the windows in the whole room were rotten. Cold wind and residual snow blew in from the outside, making the boss lady wearing a bright red silk nightgown shivering with cold. The knight from the guard camp night said to the hotel owner, Go to the guard camp tomorrow morning to register the damage to the hotel. Don't clean up this room for the time being. Maybe the magic union will come to the scene here tomorrow to take a look. We must protect the scene. The hotel owner nodded in agreement. After the knights of the guard camp checked the situation at the scene, they ordered Soldak not to publicize the incident tonight and left the hotel. The hotel owner, his wife, and Soldak were sitting on the sofa in the lounge area of the lobby. At this time, the wife found a blanket and wrapped it around her body, and poked the hotel owner next to her with her hand. The hotel owner forced a smile and greeted Serdak. Night, Serdak. Are you not injured? I saw a lot of blood in the room. Serdak touched his nose and said something against his will. No. Fortunately, the assassin didn't seem to be interested in me. Maybe he felt that I was not the person he was looking for. He didn't want everyone in the hotel to know that an assassin wanted to kill him tomorrow morning and the hotel owner's big mouth would definitely spread the word about it. The room you stayed in was smashed. The hotel proprietress complained in a low voice. Serdak took out a black dagger from his arms and pushed it in front of the hotel owner. Serdak said to the couple, Don't worry about any losses. I think this one fell in the room. The daggers in it should be enough to cover the cost of repairing your room. Even if you replace the wooden bed, floor, doors and windows with brand new ones, you may still have a surplus which can be considered as the assassin's compensation to you. After saying that, he took out a gold coin from his wallet, put it on the coffee table in front of the sofa, and said to the hotel owner, I compensate you for this gold coin. You can also hire a bricklayer to repair the wall and replace the whole set. Bedding and curtains. The hotel owner immediately blushed. He picked up the more expensive-looking jet black dagger, pushed the gold coin to Soldak, and said repeatedly, This dagger left by the assassin is enough. Why? I have the nerve to take your money. When the proprietor saw that not only would the hotel suffer no loss, but she would probably make a small profit, she immediately stopped crying and said to Serdak eagerly, Night, Serdak. I'll change it for you again. A room where you can sleep a little longer before dawn. If you can still sleep. Looking at her blazing eyes. If the hotel owner hadn't been there, he might have said otherwise. Go to my room and sleep for a while. If you can still sleep, Serdak had to rush back to the academy for class tomorrow morning. So he naturally hoped to sleep again. He smiled and said, On the plain battlefield, things more dangerous than this happen almost every day. Even if you are sleeping with an evil ghost on your head. Even if my bones are broken. I can still sleep. Chapter 332 The New Neighbor's Problem Serdak returned to the Knight Academy dormitory and saw a group of training knights laughing and playing in the snow in the garden below the dormitory. A group of students were also fighting on the balcony, seeming to want to join in. After all, it was the beginning of winter. The first snow made these young people a little excited. He turned his head to avoid a snowball flying from nowhere and looked up just in time to see his new neighbors Lena and Nedra standing on the balcony of the dormitory. 
The morning sun shone on the fair faces of the two young girls. Their faces were filled with youthful smiles, and they seemed to be watching the excitement upstairs. Lena supported the balcony railing with one hand, leaned most of her body out of the balcony, waved her hand to Serdak, and greeted loudly. Good morning. Night, Serdak. This made Soldak feel in a trance under the dazzling sunlight, and he felt like he was back to the time when he was in school. It's just that friends in that world don't call themselves knights. Standing in the snow, Serdak looked at the two young girls on the balcony. He raised the paper bag in his hand and said politely to the two new neighbors, Good morning, Miss Lina and Miss Nedra. Do you want to have breakfast together? I bought some white bread and fried fish. Serdak originally just wanted to be polite. After all, in the past month, he could count the number of times he had met these two new neighbors on one hand. He thought that these two girls from the Knight Academy would be more reserved. He should probably refuse it. Okay, we just happen to have prepared hot milk oatmeal porridge. Please come up and have a drink. Lena agreed with a smile. Her smile was very bright. These two girls, who are only 13 or 14 years old, are obviously used to life in the Academy. They are like other young students in the Knight Academy. Many young people in Helensa City and surrounding noble manors and villages will choose to go to the War Academy after they reach the age of 12. Generally speaking, most of the families who can send their girls to night academies are aristocrats and wealthy families. They want their daughters to be exposed to outstanding peers. Moreover, the family conditions of these girls are also better than those of boys. Even more advantageous, ordinary families will not spend an extra amount of tuition to send their daughters to a riding academy. With this money, they might as well prepare a dowry. Some of the boys in the Knight Academy come from noble families, while many come from ordinary families. Since the Green Empire's decree on universal military recruitment was promulgated, His Majesty the Emperor has required all male citizens to undergo a four-year military life. Only young people who can survive on the battlefield will have a bright future. Plain wars have broken out continuously in recent years, and the death rate of soldiers has continued to rise year by year. It is in this cruel situation that as long as families can afford tuition, they must find ways to send their boys to school even if they can borrow a little. Entering the Jean Jean Academy just to have some means of protecting yourself on the battlefield. The province of Bina is the hometown of swordsmen. The citizens of Valencia prefer to send their children to the Swordsman Academy. In addition to the high tuition fees, the Knight Academy also requires a horse and expensive saddle. Sets invisibly set a threshold for civilians so young people who can come to the Knight Academy actually have a certain financial foundation in their families. It would be great for Lena and Nedra's family to join. Breakfast like milk and oatmeal is a bit luxurious, and ordinary families in Helensa City cannot afford it. The breakfast in Serdek seems a bit strange. White bread is very common on the morning table. But is it really necessary to eat fried fish so early in the morning? Not an elf. After Soldak walked upstairs, Lena had quickly tidied up their room again putting all the things they shouldn't have seen into the closet. There were three regular knocks on the door, and she opened the door. It was Nadila with a shy face. She was wearing a white lanskin vest and looked a little reserved. She looked like a little girl. When she saw Saldak standing at the door, she didn't know how to invite him into the room. Serdak was holding a paper bag at the door and stood awkwardly facing Nedra for a while. Only then did Lena realize that Nedra had not invited Serdak in yet. Night, Serdak. Please come in. Lena pulled away her best friend and invited Serdak into the dormitory room. The room was filled with a scent of toilet water. The dormitory looked very tidy. There were two wooden beds on the left and right sides against the wall. Between the wooden beds, there was a wooden table by the window with some books and a few animals on it. Glass bottle. Serdak took out a long loaf of white bread and a bag of fried fish from the paper bag and placed them on the table. Lena asked Serdak to sit on the only chair in the dormitory while she and Nedra squeezed in together. Sitting on the wooden bed opposite, Lena was a little weird and said to Serdak with a smile, Night, Serdak. Every time I meet you in the morning, you are always in a hurry. She placed a bowl in front of Soldak, put fried fish and white bread on the plate, and prepared a piece of milk oatmeal for herself and Nedra. The three of them gathered around the table and started to eat breakfast. Soldak took a piece of fried fish and handed it to Lena, and then handed another piece to Nedra, and said, these fried fish were given to me by the owner of the tavern in the garden square. Try them. They are very unique. Flavor. I usually walk my horse in the morning every day. I have an ancient horse that is fostered in the stables of the college. Lena and Nedra both tasted a little. 
But obviously the two girls didn't like eating anything too greasy in the morning. I heard that you are a knight who has returned from the battlefield. Lena asked proactively. Serdak nodded and said simply, Just when I had completed my four-year military service, the infantry regiment I belonged to was completely defeated by the evil ghost legion on the battlefield. So I took the opportunity to retire and return to my hometown. Lena continued to ask, then what are you usually responsible for in the army? You must have achieved great military honors in the army. And you are an official in the logistics department. So you were awarded the reserve knight by a certain earl. She seemed to be very interested in Cernak's identity. The little girl's thoughts were obvious. And she must have wanted something from such attentive hospitality. Cernak burst into laughter. It seemed that there were already many rumors about him in the academy. So he could only tell himself. I am just an ordinary soldier in a combat team not an official in the logistics department. Besides, military merit. After experiencing more battles, you will naturally accumulate some military merits. I am just luckier than others. My comrades in the same team as me did not come back alive on that battlefield. After listening to this, Lena couldn't hide her disappointment. She curled her lips and said, I thought you were an excellent skinning master in the logistics department. Why do you think so? Sardak asked curiously, Lena knocked on her forehead and said to Soldak, It's just my guess. Our class has organized an adventure team. Every year, the college has some experienced tasks. Our team wants to sign up. But currently there is a lack of a member with skinning skills. Without a skinner, the skins of the prey we hunt will not be processed. None of these guys in the academy are willing to learn skinning skills. It is really a headache. Sardak drank the oatmeal and ate all the crispy fried fish. He smiled at Lena and said, Actually, there is no shortage of skinners among the members of the combat team. If it were not for high-level Warcraft, maybe I can barely handle it. Lena's fair face showed a touch of excitement, and her lake blue eyes blinked. She was about to invite Soldak to join their team, but she heard Soldak say again, It's just that I am a student here at the academy. There is only half a year of study period, and the college basically does not arrange physical training classes, let alone going out for training. Hearing what Soldak said, the little girl hesitated again. She said honestly, No wonder you haven't participated in physical training classes since you came to the academy. Nedra, however, seemed a little reserved and secretly pushed her best friend next to her, causing Lena to shut up immediately. Lena was silent for a while and then said to Nedra, It seems we need to find members from other grades who are good at skinning. Nedra hesitated for a moment. She glanced at Soldak shyly and said to her friend, Maybe I can too. Do you know how to skin skin? Lena didn't know that her best friend knew this skill. If Nedra really knew how to skin skin, they wouldn't go to such great lengths to find outsiders. Nedra said to Lena, Although I don't know how to do it yet, I would like to ask Knight Serdak to teach me. Of course, in return, we can tutor Knight Serdak in cultural classes and etiquette for second graders and below. History and geography are what we are best at. Lena's eyes lit up. She clapped her hands vigorously and said excitedly, Yes, Nedra, why didn't I think of that? Lena, this matter still depends on Knight Serdak's thoughts. Nedra reminded her best friend as she nudged her. Then the two girls looked at Soldak expectantly. Serdak didn't expect that a bowl of simple oatmeal would actually be replaced by his half-skilled peeling skills. However, in turn, he thought that the courses he had worked hard to catch up with during the day would be replaced by a bowl of oatmeal porridge at night. If you can conduct systematic review, it will probably be much easier in class in the future. So Soldak only hesitated slightly before agreeing. He said to Lena, If I can learn more about this part of knowledge before going to sleep at night to cope with the next exam. Of course I would love it. Lena hurriedly said, That's great, Knight Serdak. Then it's settled. Let's start tonight. After the three of them finalized the matter, Soldak went to his dormitory, took out the textbooks he needed today according to the curriculum and rushed to the classroom in the teaching building before the bell rang. On his desk were three grade textbooks. It seems that there are more textbooks than Lena and Nedra combined. In the evening, according to the agreement, after dinner, we will go back to the dormitory to learn from each other. However, practicing skinning must be practiced from the ground up. First, you need a sharp thin skin knife, and preferably a sheath inlaid with oilstone. The thin skin knife needs to be kept sharp. And because of this, Every skinner is a very good knife sharpener. Originally, Serdak wanted to explain some common sense to the two girls when skinning, and then asked Nedra to prepare a skinning knife tomorrow. Unexpectedly, 
Nedra and Lena actually took out an exquisite silver-handled skinning knife from their waists. Soldak glanced at the exquisite gemstones on the fish skin scabbard of Lena's dagger and only said, If there are no gems in late here, you can stick a better whetstone here. The first lesson in peeling is to teach you how to sharpen the knife correctly. As he spoke, he pulled out his wooden-handled skinning knife. Only a short edge of the skinning knife was left, but the edge was polished very smoothly. He skillfully took out the whetstone and rubbed it. After preparing the blade twice, he said to Lena and Nedra, who were studying hard with their eyes wide open, Many people like to use the peeling knife as a portable table knife. What I want to say is, if conditions permit, please use the two as much as possible. Separate the knives, because peeling knives require very high sharpness. And table knives are often inserted into the campfire with food to heat in the wild. The burning of the flame will cause the peeling knife to lose its sharpness. So this method is also the best way. Not advisable. Serdak basically just talked about whatever came to his mind. He remembered that when he was learning the skinning technique in the 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment, everyone gathered around the corpse of a huge evil ghost, learned from it, and put it into practice. The skin of evil spirits is far tougher than the leather armor of Warcraft. An ordinary skinning knife cannot cut through the black skin on evil spirits. Only then will you have a deep understanding of the quality of the steel mouth of the skinning knife itself. Of course, if you are just cutting potatoes, it is not necessary to be sharp enough. In order to let the two girls feel the importance of the sharpness of the skinning knife itself, Sardak took out a salamander claw from the magic waste bag and used the skinning knife to cut a small circle of tough leather from the lizard claw. Lena was cheerful and outgoing, but she had no interest in skinning. She seemed drowsy after listening for only a short while. But Nedra was very patient and listened attentively to Soldak's story. Soldak is not an excellent skinner, and his description of skinning techniques is not coherent. But he has rich experience in surviving in the wild, and he can explain it vividly. The next night, the two girls gave Sernak a good lesson in aristocratic etiquette. Lina, who was born in an aristocratic family, was far more proficient in these aristocratic etiquette than Nedra. Perhaps those were what she needed in her daily life. When Lena told this, it was Soldak's turn to have a headache again. However, Lena and Nedra cooperated with each other. Nedra needed to simulate nobles with different identities, and then meet, visit, and even. He turned his back on the spot, threw down his white gloves, and started a duel, all of which were explained in detail. Sardak's campus life suddenly felt less difficult because of these two young neighbors. Chapter 333 Quarrel Opposite the Night Academy and near the Magic Tower. There are many shops. Many of the shops here are dedicated to providing services to magicians, including some magic materials, magic scrolls, books, magic robes, staffs, etc., and a wide variety of shops. There are also hotels and restaurants. It is close to the wealthy area, so the consumption level is one of the highest in Helensa City. A magic caravan was parked next to the sycamore tree that had lost all its leaves. There was still some snow on the grass on the roadside. Carl was sitting on a bench wearing a thick coat. He raised his eyes and looked at the man who was walking quickly. Serdak smiled helplessly at Serdak and said, I really want to know. If I didn't come to see you, would you have been able to remain calm and not ask about the outcome of this matter? Soldak was wearing some old Warcraft leather armor and sat casually next to Carl. Sitting on the bench, he could see a magic shop called Oriana across the street. He asked Carl, You can't wait until the weekend to come back and tell me what happened in the past two days? Don't you know how serious this assassination is? Carl asked Soldak. He stood up, stared at Soldak seriously and said, That is not an ordinary assassin. He is an assassin who specializes in performing special tasks in the Black Magic Monastery. He killed two swordsmen in the guard camp in one encounter. Soldiers, those two are the best swordsmen in the guard camp. So? Serdak asked with a smile. Seeing Soldak's lackluster reaction, Carl approached and asked, I want to know how you escaped the assassin's assassination. Soldak sat up straight and said to Carl, I made full preparations in advance. And of course, there was a little bit of luck involved. You may not know that I used to be a shield warrior in the infantry regiment. In order to cope with the possibility that night, I even bought a shield for the assassination that happened. With that said, he pulled out a door panel-like tower shield from his magic belt bag and stood on the ground with a clang. Carl stared at Soldak with his eyes wide open and said, You are exaggerating. You can actually lift such a heavy tower shield. Sardak put his arm through the sheath on the north side of the shield. 
lifted up the tower shield effortlessly, and then demonstrated to Carl. This shield is tied to the forearm. Although it is big and bulky, but you don't need to move frequently during battle. Just stay in front of you. Carl touched the surface of the shield. The neatly arranged four-sided spikes had a cold touch, and there were some dried blood stains on the surface. Seeing Carl looking at the tower shield in a daze, Serdak was not in a hurry to put away the tower shield. He put a hand on Carl's shoulder and asked him, What's so good about this ordinary heavy shield? Whatever you can buy it from a blacksmith shop in Helensa City. By the way, have you caught Miss Samoa? She slipped away, Carl said with an embarrassed look on his face. Soldak felt that he might have heard wrongly. But seeing Carl's constipated expression, he asked Carl with a headache, Can this still allow her to run away? Carl explained to Soldak apologetically. At the beginning, the higher-ups in the camp had a negative attitude towards arresting Samoa. She is a well-known performer in the opera. They thought that my speculation was not valid. On any basis, they wouldn't even want to spy on Samoa if I hadn't brought it up in the meeting. But later on, no one expected that she was actually a puppet warlock. Although we set out monitors, she actually used puppetry to lure the monitors away, and then killed five guards who were chasing her along the way. The knight just ran away while being chased and intercepted by the guard camp. But our people didn't see her leaving the city. She should still be staying in Halanza. Serdak's face was a little dark. There were probably only two possibilities for Samoa not leaving Halensa city. The first one was that she had a very safe hiding place in the city, where she could avoid being hunted by the black dogs of the guard camp. And the second one is that she hid in a certain residence in Halensa city, just waiting for the assassination to be successful before leaving quietly. Serdak only hoped that it would not be the second type, because he was very likely to be one of Samoa's targets. He asked Carl, Then what are you going to do? Carl rubbed his hands and said to Soldak, we analyze that Samoa's target is probably you. The above intention is to use you to come forward to lure them out. You mean the members of the Black Magic Monastery will take the initiative to look for me? Serdak frowned. This was the scene he least wanted to see. But the matter had reached this point, And it was useless to blame anyone. We could only make up for it by working together. And Soldak asked Carl again. Then what do you need me to do? Seeing that Soldak didn't get angry or say any harsh words, Carl quickly said. We will arrange for you to leave the city. They may plan an interception on your way home. This time, they will send constructor knights to protect you. For your safety. The camp will also mobilize a large number of manpower this time. And will also notify the magicians in the Magic Guild Law Enforcement Group. This time, it will be absolutely foolproof. If this trouble is not dealt with, everyone will not be able to sleep every night in the future. A good night's sleep. Soldak was a little hesitant. Of course. He also knew that Carl was telling the truth. If the Black Magic Hermitage does not solve the problem, trouble will come to his door sooner or later. But here at the Knight Academy, Soldak thought of the arduous cultural classes every day. No matter what, he had to get the graduation certificate from the Knight Academy. Carl waved his hand casually and said, I'll help you with this. Coming here to study is actually just a formality for us. There's no need to be so serious. You have to give me some time to think about it. Soldak said, Later, seeing Carl staring at him intently, Soldak sighed softly and could only bite the bullet and agree and asked, Okay, what's in it for me? After getting the desired result, Carl smiled, as if he was ready to say directly, We will invite you to join the guard camp nights. Sardak sat back on the bench feebly and asked Carl, Can this be considered a reward? In fact, the knights of the guard camp are just like the night watchmen in the city. In the eyes of the people of the Green Empire, they are a group of stinky turds with low ability to do things and only exploit ordinary citizens. They are a group of hooligans who receive government subsidies. This group of knights, who usually roam the streets on horseback and show off their power, are always the last to arrive when an emergency arises. Serdak really doesn't want to wear this layer of black skin unless necessary. Carl smiled proudly and said to Soldak, When you enter the guard camp, you will find that there are many benefits to becoming an official knight. Believe me, you will not be wrong in making this decision. Although the guard camp in Helensa City is unpopular, it is still considered an official department of the Green Empire. Soldak asked again. By the way, how is the situation at Baron Grenfell's manor? Carl's smile froze, and his originally somewhat arrogant expression suddenly weakened. And he only said, The superiors are planning to use Samoa as a breakthrough point. As long as I can find something from Samoa, I can apply for a search warrant. All right. 
The implication of this sentence is that Baron Grenfell is still under the protection of the Green Empire's noble decree. And the guard camp currently has no right to infringe on Baron Grenfell's personal privacy. Serdek put the large tower shield next to him back into his magic belt bag. Apart from being a bit bulky to carry, this shield had no other shortcomings. The weather is a bit cold, and pedestrians passing by on the street are all wearing windbreakers. Occasionally, you can see magic apprentices wearing magic robes. In Helensa City, this is probably the only place where you can see magicians. Carl rubbed his cheeks, which were numb from the cold, and looked around. Sure enough, there was a tavern sign not far ahead. He pointed at the tavern and asked Soldek, Would you like to find a tavern and have another drink? Serdak looked at the sky and saw that it was just noon. He shook his head and refused. Forget it. Who knows when Samo will come out? Seeing that Serdak was unwilling to go into the tavern for a drink, Carl had no choice but to give up and said to Serdak, Oh, by the way, if there is nothing else to do in the afternoon, come to the guard camp with me to register and it will be considered a formal joining. Serdak shrugged helplessly and said, I have four more cultural classes to attend in the afternoon. Okay, I'll go to the Nye Academy with you first and take care of the Academy's affairs first. Carl put his arm around Soldak's shoulders and said with a smile to him. As he spoke, he waved to the magic caravan parked on the roadside and was about to take the carriage with Soldak to the Nye Academy. Suddenly he felt Soldak stop and Carl asked strangely, What's wrong? Serdak stopped and looked at the door of Oriana's puppet magic store. Through the glass window, he could vaguely see that there seemed to be a lot of people gathered inside. There were even people standing inside arguing. Serdak said, I saw some acquaintances, new classmates in the Night Academy. Do you want to go say H, low to them? Carl asked. Serdak withdrew his gaze, waved his hand nonchalantly, and said, Forget it. There is at least two generation gaps between them and me. We don't have much in common but it seems like they have encountered some trouble. While talking, the door of Oriana's puppet magic shop was suddenly knocked open. Two teenagers were pushed out of the shop in embarrassment, followed by a dozen young people wearing leather armor and swords hanging on their waists. The emblem on the chest is not the sword and shield that represents the knight, but the double-edged sword inserted among the roses that symbolizes the swordsman. The group of teenagers had a proud look on their faces, just in front of the Oriana puppet shop. A dozen trainee swordsmen surrounded two trainee knights. Lena, Nedra and three other girls, whom Serdak didn't know chased out of Oriana's puppet shop. Lena ran at the front and shouted at the trainee swordsmen. Thick! You stop! A blonde boy stood out among these trainee swordsmen. He approached Lena and preached to Lena. Lena! How many times have I told you? You have to go out to practice and be with us. We have already prepared everything for forming an adventure team. Why do we need to organize another one? Even if it is an organization, we cannot just find some rabble. Although there are no powerful monsters in that demi-plane. After all, there are still some dangers lurking. Lena stood at the door of Oriana's puppet shop. Her big lake blue eyes widened. And she said to Vic, You have no right to interfere with what I want to do. If you dare to hurt my classmates, I will definitely kill them. You look good. Then, Lena waved to the distance and the two guards waiting beside a magic caravan quickly ran towards Lena. Soldak knew that Lena's family was wealthy, but he did not expect that she would be accompanied by two guards, who were obviously from a noble family in the city of Valenza. The young man Vic said with a playful smile, I'm just helping you train their adaptability. A group of his companions surrounded the two trainee knights in the middle. A group of people stared at the two trainee knights back to back. You fart! One of the trainee knights yelled angrily but was slapped hard by a trainee swordsman in the crowd. The two guards who ran over did not come forward. They just protected Lena behind them and said with serious expressions, Master Vic, you can't do this. Whatever I do, it's not your turn to teach me a lesson. Young Vic angrily shouted with arrogance. The two guards blushed for a moment, but they did not dare to really teach the young man in front of them. Seeing a dozen trainee swordsmen blocking the entrance of Oriana's puppet shop, pushing and shoving the two trainee swordsmen in the crowd, but no one really dared to rush forward to rescue Lena, who was blocked at the door of the store, stepping out and pushing Vic away. She tried to break into the group of trainee swordsmen and pull out her two companions. Nedra followed closely behind, but the two girls were powerless against this group of apprentice swordsmen who were stronger than themselves. The other three female companions stood aside and did not dare to make a move. Seeing that she could not break into the crowd, Lena quickly chased after the young Vic, pointed her finger at his face and said to him in the most stern tone, Vic, 
You better let them go quickly. Otherwise, I will let others do it. The two guards who followed Lena closely also took off the shields on their backs, stood up from Lena, and put pressure on Vic. After all, this group of trainee swordsmen are only teenagers of 13 or 14 years old, facing the guards who are already adults. They still feel very oppressive. For a moment, this group of trainee swordsmen retreated one after another, and the two trainee knights looked embarrassed, escaped from the crowd. But that young man Vic refused to suffer, saying, Shake people. Right. He picked up the whistle hanging around his neck and blew it hard. A sharp sound sounded. Immediately there was the neighing of war horses in the distance. A burst of horse hoofbeats sounded. A group of knights quickly came from Serdak and Carl, speeding past in front of him. He rushed directly to the young Vic. The five ancient horses and the sturdy armored knights on the horses suddenly escalated this little incident that was just a matter of jealousy. Chapter 334 Side Effects of Demon Summoning Technique there were not many pedestrians on the street of Oriana's puppet magic shop. A group of teenagers had a dispute in front of the shop, attracting some onlookers. Serdic and Carl stood on the outermost edge. Seeing that the strong chests of the two guards were about to hit each other, they were about to fight. However, the strength comparison between the two sides was very different. Young Vic had five knights on his side. However, there were only two guards on Lena's side. Once they started taking action, the two guards on Lena's side would inevitably be beaten up. Obviously, the young man named Vic came prepared this time. There are some good-hearted people among the onlookers, standing in the crowd and shouting madly, Beat him! Beat him! Don't be afraid! Beat him quickly! The three girls at the end of the team retreated to Oriana's puppet magic shop, standing at the door and calling on Nedra and Lena to hide in quickly. At least in the shop, no one dared to do anything. It was said that Oriana, the backstage of the puppet magic shop, is a certain Grand Duke of the Green Empire. And his magic puppet shops are spread throughout the Green Empire. Nedra glanced back, secretly pulled Lena next to her, and motioned for her to hide in the store together and avoid it for the time being. Soldak wanted to go over to rescue him. But Carl held him back. Carl said to Soldak, That boy's name is Vic Emmett. He is the nephew of Viscount Emmett. He is spoiled rotten at home. Don't get involved in these fights between nobles. Once you are resented by him, it will be like brown candy stuck to your body. Sometimes it will be really annoying. Let me deal with this. With that said, Carl winked at the attendant waiting next to the magic caravan. The attendant immediately walked up and separated the crowd to open a way for Carl to walk in. Some onlookers were pushed away by the attendant and just wanted to turn around. He cursed a few words. But when he saw Carl walking into the crowd with a dark face, some sharp-eyed people saw the badge on Carl's chest and immediately cautiously reminded his companions. Some of the people who were behind the fire also lost their voices. Carl walked up to the young man and asked, Vic, what are you doing here? The young Vic frowned and stared at Carl with an unhappy face, his face full of bad luck. But then he smiled nervously and said to Carl, Uncle Carl, why are you here? Vic turned his head and looked at Lena and Nedra who were standing at the door of Oriana's puppet magic store. He looked like a scoundrel spread his hands and smiled at Carl and said, I didn't do anything. I just wanted to invite two people. A friend joining my adventure group is a very formal invitation. And I can swear to the goddess that I am serious this time. Carl said with a cold face, Let the knights under you disperse quickly and don't gather together to make trouble. Otherwise, I will report this matter to Viscount Emmett. Vic raised his eyebrows and his eyes became a little sharp. Like a cub with bared teeth. He contradicted Carl and said, They are free to be wherever they want. Carl took a step forward. His forehead just touched Vic's forehead and said coldly to him, Are you rejecting me? Seeing Carl getting angry, Vic's face turned livid. But he did not dare to resist in any way for fear of irritating Carl. His smile was almost distorted and he felt guilty. The expression on his face was complicated. In the end, he could only take a few steps back and said, How is it possible? Uncle Carl, I will do as you say. I hope you will come to my house often when you are free. Let's go. After saying that, he quickly left the entrance of the magic store with his friends. And the five knights also looked at Carl warily and left quickly behind Vic, Lena, Nedra, three female classmates and two male classmates. When they saw someone standing up to help them, they all looked at Carl gratefully and the two guards standing at the front were also relieved. Once they take action, the two of them are destined to suffer. Carl glanced at the people watching around him, before Lena could step forward to say thank you. 
Carl, escorted by his entourage, turned around and walked out of the crowd with a cold look on his face and boarded the magic caravan parked on the roadside. Watching the magic caravan slowly driving out of the long street, Nedra asked Lena curiously, Who is he? Lena, your friend? Three other female classmates and two male classmates who had been slapped several times also came to Lena's side. Their faces also full of curiosity. Lena touched her smooth forehead with her hand and said to her friends beside her, I don't know him either. The crowd of onlookers had dispersed. When Lena and her group saw that Vic and his group had completely left, they hurriedly returned to the Night Academy. The group of people walked back to the gate of the Night Academy and happened to see another magic caravan. A male classmate with red handprints on his face reminded Lena. Lena, look at it. It's still the same magic caravan just now. At this time, Lena and Nedra also noticed the magic caravan at the school gate. But Lena was still a little unsure. So she had to ask the male classmate, Are you sure? That's the one. I remember the emblem on the carriage and the color of the curtains. The young male classmate said with certainty. Lena stopped, pushed her best friend next to her, and whispered, Nedra, I want to wait at the door for a while and say thank you to them in person. Nedra squinted her eyes and thought for a while, then said, Then I'll wait with you for a while. He parked the magic caravan at the entrance of the academy. He shouldn't stay in the academy for too long. There is an administrative building behind the night academy and next to the riding training ground. Soldak has almost never been here. The office of the dean of the night academy is in this building. Carl led Soldak through the riding training ground strode into the administration building and walked directly to the top floor along the zigzag stairs. The view here is very good and you can see the entire riding training ground. Carl took his Soldak walk to the door of the dean's office in a familiar manner. He first walked into the secretary's room, walked up to a young female secretary in uniform and asked with a smile, Miss Lily, is the dean here? The female secretary was writing something like a work diary at her desk. The V-shaped neckline of her uniform revealed a large area of whiteness and depth. She raised her head when she heard the sound of opening the door. She was a little unhappy at first. But when she saw Carl's, he opened his face. And the expression on his face immediately changed. And he said with some surprise, Carl, why are you here? Then she sat up straight, gathered her long red hair, stood up from her seat, and said kindly to Carl, You wait here for a while. I'll go see if he has time to see you. Miss Lily twisted her round hips, pushed the door open, and walked into the back room. Carl sat directly in front of Miss Lily's desk. Cernak looked around at the furnishings in the room. Here was a desk and a row of file cabinets. There was a coat rack at the door. On the other side was the tea room. The small stove inside was still puffing. There was a small fire, and a silver teapot was boiling on it. It seemed that there was some tea in it, and a faint fragrance floated in the room. Not long after, the door to the dean's office opened, and Miss Lily stood at the door and signaled that Carl could go in. Carl pointed to the rolled silver kettle, then made a very grateful expression to Miss Lily, and then led Soldak into the dean's office. Dean. Carl walked in with a smile on his face. Soldak followed Carl. This office didn't look big, but it occupied the best position in the administrative building. The room was decorated in a very retro style, with precious indigo with furniture everywhere. There are some display racks filled with some Warcraft materials and weapons that seem to have a lot of origin, in addition to a few oil paintings hanging on the wall. There are also specimens made of a crystal lion head and a magic antelope head. Behind a desk painted with bronze paint, an old man sat. His face was covered with wrinkles, and he was wearing a set of magic antelope leather armor. Sitting on the chair, he felt like the knight has a spear, and although his eyes are not sharp, he has an air of calmness and authority. Seeing Carl walk into the room, he pointed to the chair opposite the desk, asked him to sit down, and asked Carl with a straight face, Carl, why are you here? I heard that you have performed well in the guard camp recently. Carl sat in front of the dean and talked about the recent crimes committed by the bandits in Helensis City in the past two months. Finally, he said that the tracking target fell on Samoa and the roundup a week ago. Operation. In the end, Samoa managed to escape under heavy siege and the guard camp could only end with regret. The dean looked at Carl with a calm expression and waited quietly for him to finish. Carl finally said, This is Knight Serdek, a reserve. He is currently studying in your college. He participated in the training with me last week, the roundup that night. The dean then looked at Soldak and asked in a gentle tone, 
Are you a training knight? Serdak replied somewhat cautiously. Yes, Mr. Dean. At this time, Carl explained his purpose and said with a smile to the Dean. Dean, our security battalion is chasing the bandit group recently and needs the assistance of Knight Serdak. So you can see if the college can be accommodating and learn from it. Is there any way around the course? The Dean was obviously very familiar with Soldak. He waved his hand to Soldak and said impatiently, I know. Then he asked Soldak, Soldak, who is the assistant coach in charge of you? Assistant Pablo. Soldak replied, The Dean pulled a rope hanging down beside him. And then the door was pushed open. And Miss Lily stood at the door. The Dean ordered Miss Lily, Lily, go and call Pablo over. Okay, Dean. Miss Lily agreed. Assistant teacher Pablo ran to the door of the Dean's office out of breath tried hard to breathe evenly, and then followed Ms. Lily into the dean's office. Then he saw Soldak sitting with Carl, his face a little pale. Bye. Applying nervously in front of the dean, asked cautiously, Dean, are you looking for me? Pablo wiped the sweat from his forehead again. He never expected that Serdak was actually related to the dean. If he had known this, how could he dare to arrange such a full cultural class for Serdak? Assistant Professor Pablo secretly slandered some directors of the registration office and some of Soldak, saying that if you have such a relationship, you should have said it earlier. Why do we need to meet in the dean's office? Pablo, take a look at what literary classes Soldak has recently taken that he must learn. You might as well adjust them first. Until Pablo walked out of the dean's office. He was still so dizzy that he couldn't remember what he had agreed to in the dean's office. In short, it was to give Knight Serdak a certain degree of freedom. After all, he is a commissioned knight sent by the knights. As long as he studies in the academy for half a year, he can obtain the graduation certificate of the knight academy. Thinking of this, Pablo also sighed softly, secretly complaining in his heart, these worms who got the title of knights based on their family background and connections are really hateful. Lena and Nedra, who were hiding far behind the college wall, watched with shock as Serdak sent Carl to the magic caravan. Only then did I realize that the scene that happened at the entrance of Oriana's puppet magic shop at noon was caused by friends of Knight Serdak, who came to the rescue. Lena hid behind the fence and waved her white fist, shouting excitedly, Ah! It's Knight Serdak! No wonder he came forward to rescue us! It must be Knight Serdak who is helping us! Nedra stood quietly beside Lena, smiling and saying nothing. The next morning, Serdak could finally put aside the heavy books in the academy. After breakfast, he took a magic caravan at the entrance of the academy and went directly to the guard camp next to the Hellanza City Hall. At the gate, Carl was seen from a distance wearing a knight's light armor, waiting at the gate of the guard camp. He and Carl made an appointment to meet here. Carl was going to take Soldak to register in the guard camp and officially join the army. Serdak stood at the door of the guard camp. Before he could say H, low to Carl, he saw groups of knights from the guard camp leaving the guard camp on horseback and quickly disappearing into the streets. Saldakmo counted, and ten teams of cavalry walked out in front of him. He asked Carl in surprise. What happened? The guard camp actually mobilized all its troops? Carl waved to the guard at the gate of the guard camp, pulled Saldak into the guard camp, and said as he walked, Do you remember Vic yesterday? Saldak nodded and said, Remember? We met at Oriana's puppet magic store, the nephew of Viscount Emmett. Carl pulled Saldak to the corner and whispered to him, That's him. I heard that he locked himself in the room when he got home last night. This morning, the servants came in to clean up his room and found out that he was actually dead. On the bed, his head and internal organs were gone, and his body covered with blood was actually covered with black magic runes. It seemed that some kind of demon summoning spell had been performed in the room. And judging from the traces on the scene, it was obvious that Vic actually succeeded in summoning a torture demon. I don't know whether he had good luck or bad luck. The summon torture demon probably didn't get enough sacrifices and ate Vic before returning to the H, L world. Serdak looked at Carl speechlessly. Chapter 335 on boarding. The Hellenza City Guard Battalion is not a city defense force. The Guard Battalion is mainly responsible for public security and profiteering events inside and outside the city. It is like the police station in another world in Soldak's memory. But it has better management than the police station. Gotta be a little more. The headquarters of the Hellanza City Guard Battalion is located in a large yard next to the city hall. A very spacious stable was built on the west side of the yard. And on the east side is an L-shaped building. It is divided into four floors. Just above the city hall. Separated by a wall. 
In the courtyard in front of this building stands a seven or eight meter high sculpture of a sword, shield and scepter carved from obsidian. Below the sculpture, there is a circle of reliefs on the base. A group of knights, the group of figures of warriors, swordsmen, and archers make this relief appear majestic. There was originally a shallow pool in front of the statue, probably as winter was approaching. The pool had completely dried up and was covered with fallen leaves. Carl took Serdak into the main building. A woman wearing a black light leather uniform walked out of the building quickly holding a document bag. When she saw Serdak, she smiled and said H. Lo. Captain Carl, your squadron didn't go out to look for clues today? Carl stopped and took the initiative to explain to the lady. Everyone else has gone out. Our jurisdiction is outside the city and is on the fringe of this mission. We are here today to bring new people on board. Although the lady looks ordinary, her figure is indeed very well proportioned. She wears a tight-fitting light leather armor and looks very elegant. She always has a faint smile on her face when she speaks, making people feel very easy to get along with. The lady looked at Suldak briefly, nodded to him in a friendly manner, and then said to Carl, Miss Flora happens to be here. She will come to me after completing the entry formalities at her place. Carl readily agreed. Okay. After the lady holding the document bag walked out of the main building, Carl said to Suldak, She is Gwendolyn from the logistics equipment section. She is an internal staff member of the security battalion and is responsible for distributing standard weapons and equipment. After completing the onboarding procedures, I will take you to find her to collect the items distributed by the guard camp. This is also one of the benefits here. As long as you use it carefully, even if it is damaged, you can report it for repair as long as you can explain the reason. If it cannot be repaired, if this kind of problem arises, it can be replaced with a new one. It turned out that he was responsible for the distribution of logistics equipment. No wonder Carl took the initiative to stop and talk, climbing up the zigzag oak stairs to the second floor of the building. Soldat couldn't help but chase after Carl and continue the previous topic. So, this thick is secretly learning black magic? Carl lowered his voice a lot and said to Soldak, The problem lies here. A young noble actually learned the forbidden magic demon summoning technique in black magic. The law enforcement team of the magic union is currently in AI Viscount Mitt is investigating this matter in his manner. Once any clues are found, I am afraid that Viscount Emmett will not be able to escape the blame. No one can say to what extent the black magic priory is in Helensa city. Clear. Walking along the corridor, toward the innermost room. Carl continued. Last night, the torture department got some information from the responder. Almost all the 30 teams of the guard battalion were mobilized. The guard battalion was dispatched this time just to be able to dig out the black magic monastery from the city of Helensa as soon as possible to avoid involving more nobles. At this point, Carl stopped talking. He stopped in front of a wooden door. He straightened his collar, cuffs, and hem, then stood up straight. Then he knocked gently on the door. There was a sound coming from inside. A calm voice. Come in! The office is not big, but it is very warmly decorated. A set of magic patterned armor with a magical halo hanging on the wooden frame near the window. There is also a pair of weapons engraved with magic patterns on the table. There are two bookshelves against the wall. There are only a few books on the bookshelves but there are some collectibles. There was a desk in the front of the room, and a middle-aged swordsman sat behind the desk. His eyes were as sharp as the double-edged sword. He first glanced at Carl lightly, and then turned his gaze to Serdak felt as if a ferocious beast was staring at him, and the dangerous aura on the opponent's body made him breathless. Carl took the lead to take half a step, puffed out his chest, and said seriously to the middle-aged swordsman, Captain Sauron, Carl Casement is here to report with the new member of the support team. Soldak. This Count Sauron Aldington looked at Soldak and asked him, Tell me about your origins. Serdak straightened his back and said loudly to the middle-aged swordsman in front of him, Soldak came from Wall Village in Helensa City and served as the 4th Battalion of the 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment, Captain of the 6th Squadron. Regarding the origin of Soldak, this Count Sauron Aldington raised his eyes, looked at Soldak twice in surprise, and asked, Are you in the infantry regiment of Count Mon Goss? Have you ever held a position? Yes. Sir. My reserve knight status occupies one of the places of Earl Goss. Serdak replied. This Count Sauron Aldington nodded slightly and said suddenly. No wonder he returned to Helanza City from the front line. Okay. Carl. Take Knight Serdak to find Flora. I have already told her okay. When you register there, let him follow you in the support squadron for a while. Carl's face was filled with joy. He puffed up his chest gave a knight salute, 
and said loudly, Okay, Captain Sauron. The two people walked out of Captain Sol and Aldington's office. Carl led Soldak to the office next door and met Miss Flora, who was in charge of personnel in the guard camp. As expected, she was just like Soren Aldington, as Viscount Erdington said. Regarding Soldak's entry into the job, he had already given a greeting, so the entry process was extremely smooth. He just simply filled out a form and then left with a note, walking out of the office of the personnel department. The material warehouse of the logistics department is located on the basement floor of the main building. Carl took Soldak along the stairs of the main building directly to the door of the material warehouse. As expected, he saw Ms. Wingdolen from the equipment department again at the registration desk. She saw when Carl walked in with Serdak. He first checked the note in Carl's hand and then said to Carl and Serdak, Wait a moment. I'm going to get the guard camp badge. After speaking, he walked into the secret room with the note. Carl seemed to be very familiar with this process. So he and Soldak stood outside, chatting and waiting. Not long after, Ms. Wingdolen walked out of the secret room holding an ironwood box. In front of Soldak, she took out a Silver Guard Battalion badge from the box. This badge was printed. It was a miniature version of the sword, shield, and scepter statue in the yard of the guard camp. And there was a number secretly engraved on the back of the badge. Ms. Wingdolen copied the number on the badge onto a note and put the note into a wooden box. Then he handed the badge to Serdak. And the wooden box containing the notes was put back into the secret room, seeing Soldak wearing the badge on his chest. Ms. Wingdolen smiled lightly and said, this guard camp badge is a certificate to prove your identity. You must keep it well. Now I will take you to collect your uniform and leather armor. The suit here is quite standard for you. The largest size should be very suitable for you. There are few people in Helensa City who are as strong as you. If you didn't explain your identity, I would have thought you were from the north. Then she turned to Carl next to her and asked, Carl, are the saddles and horses of Knight Soldak included in the subsidy? Or are they received from the logistics department? Carl knew that Soldak had horses, so he directly said, Convert it into the subsidy. Wingolin nodded, crossed out these two items in the supplies column, and then reminded Soldak, You can also bring your old saddle here to be repaired later. The leather guard at the guard camp is here. Routine maintenance of the tools is free. Chapter 336 Guard Camp Gwendolyn held a sheepskin account book and led Carl and Soldak through the corridor on the first floor of the basement. The corridor was dimly lit with a moonstone wick wall lamp only about five meters apart. The basement was surrounded by mottled stone walls, and the ground was fairly flat. The underground corridor was not damp, and there was a layer of black velvet growing in the gaps in the stone walls. Moss, you can smell a faint fishy smell when you are close to the stone wall. Miss Gwendolyn wore corn-colored lambskin boots, which made a crisp sound when she stepped on the stone floor. The three of them walked through a long corridor of more than 20 meters and came to the door of a stone room. The basement was well ventilated. It's nice. The vents in the ceiling above your head actually allow cool breeze to blow in, making people not feel stuffy at all. The door was covered in a thick layer of paint. Very heavy. After Ms. Gwendolyn opened the copper lock, Soldak and Carl quickly stepped forward to help push the door. They thought that the nearly three meter high wooden door would be very heavy, but the two of them easily installed it on the slide rails. The heavy wooden door was pushed aside and the room was dark. Miss Gwendolyn lit an oil lamp on the wall by the door, held the oil lamp in her hand, and walked into the warehouse with Carl and Soldak. Every time she walked to a wooden frame, Miss Gwendolyn lit the oil lamp in front of the wooden frame, and soon the warehouse became bright. There are more than a dozen neat rows of oak shelves in the warehouse. On the front shelf are some weapons wrapped in oil paper. Judging from the outer outline, they should be weapons such as long swords. But Miss Gwendolyn did not continue. During this stop, he just introduced. These night long swords are ordinary standard weapons, and some of them are more sophisticated. Walking inside, I found that many shelves had some notes on them, but the shelves were empty. When I reached the eighth column of shelves, Ms. Wingolin hung the oil lamp in her hand next to it and lit it again, looking at the two oil lamps on both sides of the shelf. Serdak saw clearly that the shelf was filled with long and narrow wooden boxes. The ends of these wooden boxes were covered with craft paper labels and they were piled up layer by layer on the entire shelf. Ms. Gwendolyn asked Serdak, Knight Serdak, what is the most convenient weapon you usually use? Roman sword. Oh, but recently I am using a knight's long sword. Soldak said honestly, the Roman sword is the standard weapon of the infantry regiment. Generally speaking, 
No knight will use this short sword. Ms. Gwendolyn's expression froze for a moment. And then she said tactfully to Soldek, We have better sabers. A pays. Knight swords. Vertebrae swords and craftsman swords here. These weapons are all SH. LS. The standard weapons produced by the Nanchung Sword Forging Workshop are of excellent craftsmanship and are much better than the groceries found in weapon shops outside. Miss Gwendolyn randomly pulled out a wooden box from the shelf. She seemed to be struggling. She wiped off the floating dust on the surface of the wooden box and opened the lid of the wooden box, revealing a saber wrapped in a layer of oil paper inside. This saber was slightly the curvature of the blade was only two fingers wide, and the streamlined blood groove could be clearly seen under the oil paper. Seeing that Soldak had no intention of opening the oil paper, Miss Gwendolyn found another one from this row of shelves. Wooden box. This time Gwendolyn asked Serdak to help pull out the wooden box placed high on the shelf. Serdak only felt that the wooden box was heavy to handle. He placed the wooden box on the table and placed it on the table. Miss Gwendolyn looked at her and opened the lid of the box. Lying inside the wooden box was a very heavy long sword. Serdak reached out and peeled off the oil paper wrapped around the blade. On top of the black blade it is covered with layers of stripes. Only through folding and forging can the weapon have such exquisite stripes. This is a craftsman's sword. It belongs to the category of heavy swords. This is a forging process passed down from the Dwarf Kingdom. The only drawback is that it is mixed with some black iron. The only drawback of this sword is that it is too heavy. It is lighter than it. There is a heavy sword. Before Miss Gwendolyn could finish speaking, Soldak held a hilt and picked up the craftsman's sword. He turned over a sword flower in his hand and then smiled at Miss Gwendolyn. Asked, Is it okay if I choose this craftsman's sword? Of course. Miss Gwendolyn did not expect Soldak to make a decision so quickly. She thought that Serdak would look at the ape and the vertebral sword again. So she asked tentatively, Knight Serdak, are you going to take a look at the vertebral sword? That sword actually has more characteristics. Serdak cast his gaze on the honest craftsman's sword and replied, No need. This one is just fine. Okay. Gwendolyn wrote down the Soldak guard camp badge on a piece of brown paper and put it into the wooden box. Then she put the empty wooden box in another area of the shelf and Sid Serdak said, You can regularly bring the craftsman's sword back to the guard camp for repair. If the craftsman's sword is damaged or lost, as long as the reason is reasonable and a written report is made, a new one can be issued to you. Understand? Soldak nodded to express his understanding. Then Ms. Gwendolyn smiled at Soldak with satisfaction and said, Next, I will take you to choose a dagger. There was no choice when it came to daggers. Ms. Gwendolyn took Soldak to the back shelf and took out a short dagger with a red blade. This dagger had an exaggerated forehead protector, which was more noticeable when held backwards. It is comfortable and comes with a well-made leather scabbard that can be worn around the waist or leg. By the way, Soldak, what kind of shield do you like? Ms. Gwendolyn then asked Soldak. I guess it won't be the most common knight's light shield. The three of them left the warehouse and came to the opposite warehouse. They saw that the warehouse was filled with shields. Small bucklers, big bucklers, light shields, iris shields, tower shields, and various spiked shields. Alien shield. Serdak stood in front of a row of light blue iris shields. It seemed that the iris shields he had worn out before should also be well-made standard armor. Serdak said with a smile. I have been using the iris shield before. But that shield was damaged in a previous battle. Now I have replaced it with a tower shield. Ms. Gwendolyn understood Soldak's preferences. He didn't care much about whether the shield was too bulky. Everything was practical. She patted her forehead and said with a smile, It's really all the same. You're a powerful guy. But are you sure your horse can handle it if you use a tower shield? Besides, you'll need to get a set of armor later. I think between metal armor and leather armor. You wouldn't want to choose leather armor. Right? Of course. Serdak replied, Gwendolyn pointed to the various shields between the walls and on the shelves and said to Soldak, So Knight, please make your choice. Serdak said without thinking, I hope to have a dwarf chain shield. He had not been able to buy it in the Helensa weapon store before. So he had the choice here. So he picked up this shield that was strong enough and flexible enough. The dwarf chain shield is completely a thickened version of the iris shield. Dwarves have extraordinary arm strength. So this dwarf chain shield is thicker limited by their height. This shield is not too big. The dwarves place it between the shield and their arms. Connect them together with chains. And if necessary, you can throw the shield to attack the enemy. Gwendolyn said with some emotion. Well, 
Your preferences are exactly the same as those of the Northerners. As she spoke, she took Serdak to the shelf where three thick dwarf chain shields were hung, and continued, It is said that these three dwarf chain shields have been hanging here since the weapons arsenal was established. You can take them away now. Just one side. After Serdak took off a dwarf chain shield, Miss Gwendolyn posted a piece of brown paper with Serdak's number on the wall where the shield was hung. Then he pointed to another shelf and said, That's where the armor is stored. Knight Serdak, all the metal armors you like are placed there. The full-covered black iron armor is the standard armor in the Hellanza guard camp. Serdak only needs to report the size. And Gwendolyn finds the corresponding wooden box from the shelf. The boxes are all brand new. Black iron armor. According to Carl, not all knights in the guard camp can wear this bulky full-coverage armor. Swordsmen and rangers cannot wear it. They usually choose lighter and more flexible leather armor. Seeing Soldak looking around in the armor warehouse. Ms. Gwendolyn asked him curiously, What are you looking for? Serdak also said very matter-of-factly, I'm curious if there is that kind of magic pattern structure here. Carl put his arm around Soldak's shoulders and joked to him with a smile. The magic pattern armor will not be stored here. Everything related to magic is priceless. Wait until you become Sauron of the guard camp one day. A person like the captain will naturally have a set of magic pattern armor. The three of them left the armor warehouse talking and laughing all the way. And then Ms. Gwendolyn took Soldak to receive a lunch box, a kettle, ordinary uniforms, and a pair of leather shoes. Perhaps because of Carl's good relationship with Ms. Gwendolyn. All the military items Soldak received were brand new, according to the system in the guard camp warehouse. Weapons and armor can be used repeatedly. But Sue only with Carl's relationship can Erdak receive a brand new one. When leaving the logistics department, Carl asked Ms. Gwendolyn to play cards with her when she had time. Gwendolyn smiled and said, Let's talk about it another day. Then the two returned to the lobby on the first floor of the guard camp. Carl smiled and said to Soldak, Okay, I will take you around the guard camp. Carl took Soldak to the other side of the building, pointed to the separate side door, and said to Soldak, this is a dormitory. I can help you apply for one if needed. Soldak thought about his pretty good living environment at the Knight Academy and shook his head decisively. After all, he had mainly been attending classes at the Knight Academy in the past six months. Then Carl pointed to a stone castle next to the stable, which was almost half hidden underground, and said to Soldak, That's the temporary prison of the guard camp. Usually the prisoners captured temporarily are detained here. And that's the it's usually best not to go there where the people from the torture department belong. As they have weird tempers and are not easy to deal with. We are considered an out-of-city support squadron. We spend most of our time out of the city. We don't have to sit in the guard camp. We don't have a dedicated office area here. Usually when we return to the guard camp to report on our duties. We wait for a break. This side of the room. With that said, Carl led Soldak to the third floor of the building. It was a large room. It looked more like a chess and card room with many tables and chairs. But at this time, the lounge seemed it was quiet, with no one around. Apparently, the death of young Vic had made the entire guard camp busy. Carl found a chair and sat down casually and said, This is the lounge. In our free time, everyone gathers here to play cards. But now everyone is on a mission. This is usually the busiest place. At the other end of this corridor is in the training room. Only some energetic young people will spend all day in it. After walking around in the guard camp, it turned out that the people staying in the guard camp were all internal staff. When the two of them walked out of the gate of the guard camp, next door to the guard camp is the city hall, which belongs to the administrative center of Helensa City. Opposite the city hall is a very wide square. There is a 20 meter high double-edged sword statue on the square. The Bena province is the swordsman. Hometown. So in every city in the Bena province, there are many statues highlighting swordsmen. The two walked through the broad streets and arrived at the municipal square. Soldak asked Carl, When will we implement our plan? Carl said with some embarrassment. Let's prepare first. At least we need to get to know the members of the rescue team. I also need to apply for support from Captain Sauron. You also saw that night. The assassin of the Black Magic Hermitage. It is simply not something we can deal with. And the city is now in a mess. The application has been submitted. But there is no approval yet. It is estimated that there will be no reply for the time being. Those guys above just want to wipe their butts clean before the Magic Union Law Enforcement Team finds any clues. Carl looked a little helpless and a little resentful. Carl's carriage stopped not far from the street, and the attendant stood where Carl could see him at any time, making sure not to hear the conversation between the two. 
How about I go out of the city for a while and test it out? Maybe there will be some unexpected gains. Serdak said to Carl. Serdak thought that he had received all the equipment and there was no reason to work hard anymore. Carl hesitated and did not agree immediately. He just said to Soldak, Okay, I will arrange a party in the evening. Let's get to know each other first and discuss tomorrow's actions. Soldak nodded in agreement. Okay, it depends on your arrangements. Carl waved to his entourage in the distance, who immediately drove the magic caravan over. Carl and Soldak boarded the carriage together. And then Carl said, I'll take you back to the Night Academy first. I'll gather the team members in the afternoon and pick you up at the entrance of the Academy in the evening. Chapter 337 Failed Fishing Operation I was planning on telling them to the two girls next door that night. I might not have time to teach them the skinning technique recently. The day before yesterday, Soldak also bought two rabbits to prepare for an on-site teaching. After being brought into the dormitory, the two girls, Lena and Nedra, were filled with love and found an iron cage to raise the gray rex rabbit. Serdak couldn't understand this. He had eaten rabbit and chicken stew happily the night before. But why was he unwilling to kill these two rabbits that were also used for meat just one day later? The explanation given by Lena and Nedra was that they could not see living rabbits being killed for no reason. But hunting rabbits for survival in the wild was fine. But dead rabbits will become hard in the winter. With Soldak's half-baked skinning skills, he couldn't peel off the rabbit's skin completely. So the matter could only be shelved. Serdak walked into the gate of the Night Academy, and the guard greeted him familiarly. Serdak walked into the academy with a smile, and walked along the corridor of the low shrub wall outside the playground towards the dormitory. Seeing Soldak's figure appearing in the Night Academy, Darcy Christie thought her eyes were dazzled. She couldn't help but chase a few steps away and determined that the figure was the one who had rescued Hathaway and Beatrice on the hilly grasslands of Handanar County in the Warsaw Plain, and then brutally attacked Handanar City. The knight who taught Cole Norton and Trollope a harsh lesson actually showed up at the Knight Academy. Could it be that he also serves in the Academy? Later, Darcy Christie fell into that not-so-good memory. Serdak gave them a lesson in the city of Handanar. A group of outstanding graduates from the Advanced Swordsman Academy. Practical lessons but also made them clearly realize that the fancy sword skills learned in the academy are more like juggling on the stage to the veterans who have come off the battlefield. When Darcy woke up, she realized that the figure had disappeared at the end of the low shrub wall. Darcy clenched her fists angrily. If it hadn't been for his appearance, she might have been detained in school, even as a student at the Bena Advanced Swordsmanship Academy. Being an assistant teacher is much better than being an instructor at Alensa Junior Knight Academy. The current difficult situation is entirely due to the Serdek. Darcy, are you okay? The female companion called from a distance. Darcy scratched her hair in disgust. Even though she hated the aristocratic ball in Helensa City so much, the ball held here was like a harvest festival in the countryside. Without the exquisite magic lights and delicious roasted basilisk meat, there was no high-end golden cider, and there were no outstanding single aristocrats. But she couldn't refuse if she didn't marry herself when she was most beautiful. Perhaps only those fat-bellied, bald aristocrats would be waiting for her. All this was thanks to that night, Darcy Christie thought angrily. Anyway, he couldn't run away right away. We'll find out tomorrow when we go to the college's logistics department to check the staff list. Then she saw her companion standing at the entrance of the college in a low-cut evening dress, shivering in the cold wind and not forgetting to wave to her. Darcy Christie quickly lifted up her long skirt and took a few steps to run quickly with her long legs. In the early winter season, the skirt of this kind of dress is very thick. When running, it looks like a stretched out sun umbrella, and the cold wind flows in from the bottom of the skirt. There is a short tail bear barbecue restaurant on the central street of Alinsa City. The huge sign on the door is a bear with its butt sticking out. This restaurant is considered the largest barbecue restaurant in Alinsa City, and can accommodate nearly 500 people at the same time. When dining in, the menu of this restaurant is full of various secret roasted meats. The main dishes and soups are very simple. There are always only baked wheat cakes and tomato soup. Many people are willing to eat here every day because the barbecue here is of high quality and low price. And it is even cheaper than buying meat and cooking it at home. As a result, the people of Alanza gradually develop this habit. If they want to eat barbecue, they usually go out to eat together as a family. Carl chose this restaurant as the place for dinner in the evening. When Soldak got out of the carriage, he found that this place was more popular than he expected. There was a long queue at the door of the restaurant, and people walked into the restaurant in an endless stream. 
The aroma of meat wafted far away on the street. A group of young people were already waiting at the door of the restaurant. When they saw Carl getting off the carriage, they quickly came forward to say H, Lo, except for the four teams who were out on duty. All 36 members of the rescue squadron were present. The manager of the barbecue restaurant was waiting at the door. When he saw Carl getting off the carriage, he walked over with a charming smile and took the guards with him. Members of the battalion support squadron walked into the restaurant from a special passage on the side. The design of this restaurant is very special. Upon entering, all guests need to visit the nearly 20-meter-long barbecue kitchen. The barbecue stove faces the guests who come to dine. Guests need to choose the barbecue they want to eat here. More than 20 barbecue chefs stood in front of the stove. Each chef was only responsible for roasting a single type of barbecue. They placed the cut beef on the stove grate, poured some fruit wine on it, sprinkled some black pepper and coarse salt, and almost using the same steps and the same time to roast the beef and put it on the plate. There will naturally be no difference in the taste of the barbecue. Almost all the young people in the support squadron chose double portions of medium-rare pan-fried bone-in ribs. Everyone ordered while walking. Grilled wheat cakes and vegetable soup are always indispensable on the Helensa people's dining table. They took advantage of the time to order. Later, Carl introduced the six captains of the support squadron to Soldek. These young people from the support squadron gathered into two small groups. Carl's cronies came to his side and greeted Soldek. There was also a small group of more than a dozen people. When they looked at Soldek, their eyes were obviously scrutinizing. Carl stared at the young man who was the leader of the small group and said, He is Jasper. The first time Soldek heard the name Jasper was when Carl's friend Baron Llewellyn mentioned it. He said that there was a young nobleman named Jasper in the support squadron who was Carl's rival. In this case, the squad leader in the assessment. Carl successfully defeated Jasper and successfully obtained the position of captain of the support squadron under the leadership of the restaurant manager. Everyone went directly to a large private room on the second floor of the restaurant. There was a long table in this room. Carl sat at the head of the long table, chatting with Serdak next to him from time to time. Serdak also ordered medium-rare pan-fried ribs. He cut the bone and ribs with a knife and blood oozed out when he poked them gently. It was still a bit too raw after eating the pan-fried meat for so long. Still unable to enjoy this delicious food. Serdak was glad that he only ordered a single portion. Suddenly, he felt that someone was staring at him with strange eyes. When he looked up, he saw the young nobleman named Jasper raising his glass to him. Soldak quickly raised his glass in return. He was wearing a suit. He was wearing very decent aristocratic clothing. And he looked very energetic. The smile on his face had a hint of scorn. Seeing that everyone had almost finished eating, Soldak clapped his hands vigorously. And everyone stopped talking and turned to look at Carl. Carl coughed twice softly. And then said, Tell me about tomorrow's plan. I'm going to let Knight Serdak go wandering outside the city tomorrow to see if there is any chance to lure Samoa out. Boss, I missed the best opportunity to capture her last time. Can she still throw herself into a trap this time? The person who spoke was Bob, the captain of the second team. Obviously other team members had the same idea. Carl said, Since Samoa is hiding in the dark, I think she must be hiding somewhere to secretly observe us. We are looking for her. And she is also looking for Serdak everywhere. We must seize this opportunity. This time teams 1, 2, 5, and 6 will go out of the city with me. Jasper, you lead the 3rd and 4th teams to stay in the city and cooperate with Master Sauron in conducting a citywide search operation. Okay. The young nobleman gently snapped his fingers. And then said, If you need reinforcements, send us a signal. I will find a way to adjust the location of the search near the city gate and prepare the horses. As long as there are we need immediate support. Okay. Lord Sauron can't go with us this time. So as before, be sure to pay attention to safety. Everyone go back and rest early. Members of teams 1, 2, 5 and 6 will gather outside the city tomorrow morning. As Carl conveyed the orders one by one, the team captains nodded to express their understanding. The dinner party ended in a hurry. When they walked out of the Bobbier barbecue restaurant, the young nobleman named Jasper deliberately approached Serdak and stretched out a hand to shake Serdak's hand, smiled and said to Soldek, If you have time, let's go have a drink together. Soldek lowered his head and thought for a moment, then refused. I have to go back tonight to prepare. Let's wait another day. There will be many opportunities to drink like this in the future. Jasper smiled reservedly and said, Okay, but don't make me wait too long. Otherwise you won't know what you missed. The next day, 
Serdak rode out of the city of Aranza alone. Although he knew in advance that Carl and the four support teams were hiding in the dark. No trace of them was found when they walked outside the city. The leaves of the oak trees in the mountains have fallen. And there are bare branches everywhere. The forest floor is covered with a thick layer of leaves. And some golden acorns are buried under the leaves. The mountain roads are also piled with leaves. And horseshoes. It makes a rustling sound when you step on it. The snow from the past few days has completely melted. Only the remaining snow can be seen on the north slope. The temperature has not completely dropped. The first snow failed to hold. But the melted snow water is also there. A layer of frozen soil has formed under the leaves. When the next heavy snow falls, it will not melt so easily. Serdak rode the Gubalai horse on the mountain road leading to Wall Village until noon. His intuition told him that no one was following him. So he walked forward for a while, but still gained nothing. Serdak himself is also considering this matter. If the opponent were replaced by himself, he would probably not fall for such an obvious trap. If he could still rush out stupidly, unless the opponent was strong enough to defeat these people aided up in one gulp, or they were forced to do so, to the point where they couldn't sleep well without killing themselves. A member of the support group then appeared on the top of a distant mountain. He held a flag in his hand and waved it vigorously toward Serdak on his way back. It was like this for three days in a row. I wandered on the mountain road until noon and had to go back the same way, so that I could return to the city of Alanza before the city gate closed. I didn't gain anything in these three days, and I didn't even find any clues. Look, it turns out that the other party is not as stupid as he expected, and the action plan of the support squadron is likely to fall directly into the opponent's eyes. At the beginning, the young people in the rescue team were very motivated, but after not even finding a hare for three consecutive days, these team members inevitably became a little slack. When they returned to Alanza City in the evening of the third day, the members of the support squadron seemed a little listless. Anyone who had been blowing cold wind in the mountains for three consecutive days and still found nothing would probably not be in a good mood. After entering the city gate, Carl ordered everyone to disperse where they were and ordered everyone to rest for two days. Serdak also stayed at the night academy to continue classes. Because Carl wanted to arrange for the four teams that were monitoring Baron Grenfell's estate to return to the city of Alanza and send new teams to take turns. Moreover, Mrs. Christie also brought back some new news from Grenfell Manor. Carl wanted to know if there was enough evidence to prove that Baron Grenfell was related to the Black Magic Hermitage. Once it could be proved, he could apply the noble search warrant was used to arrest the gang of robbers lurking in the manor. During the past three days, Jasper led the remaining members of the rescue team to launch a large-scale search operation in the city of Valenza along with the guard camp. However, he found out that some noble teenagers were secretly in contact with the sorcerers of the Black Magic Monastery. Many teenagers secretly learned black magic while eager to gain power. After learning these black magic, they are not visible at ordinary times. They just leave the mark of the dark devil on their body, which will only appear when they are used. Apparently, the black magic hermitage had already put its hands into the circle of Halanza nobles. The black magic communicator had gone into hiding long ago after hearing the news. Only some noble children who studied black magic were found in the guard camp. At the same time, the magicians from the law enforcement group of the Magic Union of Alensa City came to the door and asked the guard camp to hand over these noble children who had learned black magic to the Magic Union. However, the guard camp also had its own concerns. After all, this there are too many nobles involved in this matter. I am afraid that it is impossible to suppress this matter quietly now. But I cannot let the magicians take these noble boys away directly. There have always been many conflicts between the old noble forces of the Green Empire and the new forces of the magician nobles. Although they have not been intensified, it is not a secret that the old nobles and the magician nobles are not in harmony. Once the magicians are allowed to control these nobles, the boys taking away was also a big blow to the established aristocratic forces. So the city has been very lively in the past few days. And this matter even reached the Hellanza City Council. Chapter 338 Bait and Prey How can it not be found? Darcy Christie couldn't figure out why there was no information about Knight Serdak in the list of Knight Academy instructors. Could it be that he changed his name after returning to Alensa City? She stood a little irritably under the sycamore tree with its fallen leaves, staring at the passers by coming in and out of the campus gate with a somewhat gloomy look. The wind was a bit cold, so she tightened her knitted shawl tightly. Her nose was a little red from the cold, and her eyes were still looking at the gate of the college stubbornly. In the past few days, Darcy Christie has been lingering at the gate of Knight Academy 
until dusk almost every day before reluctantly taking a carriage home. No information about Suldak can be found in the college staff files. She is at the gate of the college. When Serdak appeared again, it was already the third day, in order to find this hated knight. She even turned down two dances. She touched the sword at her waist, and the cold touch on the silver hilt made her sober. Don't let hatred cloud your eyes. Darcy, you have to calm down. Calm down. She kept warning herself in her heart. But she was unwilling to move her steps no matter what. There seemed to be a voice whispering to her in her subconscious. Wait a little longer. And you will see her if you wait a little longer. Go up. Slap him hard twice. And pierce his body with a sword. If he dares to resist. Send him to the prison in Alenza City. And let him squat there for several months. Since you dared to come to the city of Alenza. No matter what you do. Darcy Christie has the final say. Darcy. Do you want to go to the dance at Insta's house tonight? The voice of her colleague Shalia woke Darcy out of her gibbering. She looked along the sound and saw Shalia standing next to her, looking at her expectantly. Although Darcy knew that Miss Shalia really hoped that she could go to the dance with her, she could only lower her head slightly, avoid her expectant eyes, and said, Sorry, Kathy, I have an appointment with friends tonight. That's fine. I wish you a good night. I'm leaving first. I hope I can meet someone who doesn't look like a scumbag at this dance. Shalia said to Darcy Christie with a smile, and then said as she shook her hand, turned around and walked out of the academy alone. The sky gradually darkened, and the number of people in front of the college gate gradually decreased. By the time Darcy Christie was about to go home, there were no more pedestrians at the gate. Darcy Christie tightened her grip on the sword at her waist, thinking secretly in her heart inside it swore, Watch, I will definitely find you. Serdak rode his horse into an alley, and the afterglow of the setting sun cast long oblique shadows on many buildings in the alley. The clothes-drying pole on the roof protrudes from the wall, and the snow-white sheets hung on the clothesline are like flags fluttering in the wind. The pigeon cage wooden houses growing out of the windows reveal dim lights, floating in the alley, with a faint smell of fried meat. Everything here is full of life. When Gubolai Ma stepped into a puddle, the splash sewage fell on the dirty wall, making this somewhat quiet alley make a strange noise. Serdak's heart suddenly tightened for no reason. As if being held tightly by an invisible big hand, Suldak covered his heart with his hand and almost fell off his horse in pain. Almost at the same time, he realized that something was wrong. He thought that he had returned to the Night Academy through this road for three consecutive days and that he might have fallen into the eyes of the stalker. Those stalkers knew that their departure from the city was a trap set by the rescue squadron. After entering the city every night, the guards were the most lax. The guard battalion organized a large-scale manhunt in Alenta City in the past few days. The city was full of people chasing gangsters. No one among the knights from the guard camp of the Magical Priory expected that they would dare to take action in the city, and they would set up an ambush in this remote and quiet alley. From the corner of his eye, Serdak saw a figure suddenly grow out of the shadows on the left side of his body near the corner. The figure rushed towards Serdak with its claws and teeth. At this time, Serdak felt that his body was shaking again being restrained, or the situation this time was worse than last time. His limbs seemed to be frozen, and he fell from the horse while holding his heart in his hand. It's the damn dark binding magic again. Those assassins of the Black Magic Monastery are really like maggots on the tarsal bones, and they can't get rid of them completely no matter what. The bright black dagger and the black shadow gradually became solid, seeing that figure as agile as a cheetah. Serdak's face was a little ferocious. He was not prepared to bury himself in this alley. Even though he did not have any blessings, but he still had the sacred aura in his body. He opened his eyes wide and concentrated on lighting up the various nodes in his body. Then his body suddenly became shiny, and a faint golden light came out from his shoulders, getting brighter and brighter. The darkness that imprisoned his body melted away like ice and snow at this moment, and the shadows retracted into the darkness again. The black figure that rushed toward him seemed to feel the sacred aura on Suldak's body. He made a sharp and piercing whistle, and the black shadows on his body evaporated bit by bit under the sacred aura. But the black figure still moved towards Sue. Erdak stabbed a black dagger into his heart. Serdak's stiff body was finally able to move at this moment. He tried his best to twist his body in midair, but he reached the black figure too fast, and the sharp dagger still penetrated his left rib. Sticking to him, a cut was made in his belly. If he hadn't tightened his abdomen and inhaled at the critical moment, I'm afraid that his abdomen would have been cut open by the black shadow at this moment. The Warcraft leather armor on his body was as fragile 
as a piece of paper under the edge of the black dagger. The black shadow met the golden light on Serdek's body and seemed to have been inexplicably hurt. His materialized figure was constantly emitting black energy. It was not the shadow of a human being. Serdak took out his waist the craftsman's sword in the room, knocked away the black dagger that stabbed him again at the critical moment. His body fell heavily on the stone floor in the alley, and his head happened to hit a raised stone step, which hit Serdak's eyes. Risk the stars. But at this time, he could only grit his teeth and keep himself awake. The craftsman's sword in his hand burst out with a faint golden light, facing the black figure that rushed towards him again. At this time, he saw that the black figure had a clear long head on its head, with two long horns like an antelope. The face was like an aged goat. The dead fish-like eyes were full of malice and hatred, and the neat teeth seemed to be smiling, but the smile was clearly frozen. On the face, it's very scary. Black Shadow's body is humanoid, but he is stronger than the Green Empire people. His legs are a pair of hooves, which not only makes him full of explosive power, but also possesses amazing jumping ability. Serdak stabbed the air with his sword. The sheep-faced devil's legs were like springs, making his body bounce high, almost reaching the roof with this jump. The sheep-faced devil smiled strangely at Serdak, and then returned to the shadows again. Serdak struggled to stand up from the ground, and the blood flowing from the wound on his waist dyed his trousers red. Serdak the palm of his left hand emitted a faint light, covering the wound on his abdomen, and quickly ran towards the exit of the alley with the craftsman's sword in hand. At this time, Alinsa City was definitely the city with the best security. Thanks to the noble young men who practiced black magic, the guard camp launched a large-scale manhunt against the black magic monastery. Serdak knew that he had escaped. If you leave this alley, you may be able to summon the knights from the nearby guard camp. At this time, when he stepped out and stepped into the shadow, it seemed as if countless arms stretched out from the shadow, trying to pull his feet. Serdak's feet also glowed with a faint golden glow and as soon as the arms in the shadows came into contact with the power of the holy light, they turned into black mist and disappeared again. There was another wave of fluctuations in the shadow beside him. The sheep-faced devil seemed to suddenly step out of the void. The dagger in his hand stabbed Serdak's back silently. The black shadow's body shrank into a ball and spread out. At that moment, it was like a titan clockwork suddenly exploded, and the whole figure ejected from the darkness. Serdak was already prepared. He put the dwarf chain shield in the magic belt bag on his arm and firmly blocked the sheep faced devil with a backstab. Serdak swung his sword towards the goat faced devil, but the goat faced devil suddenly exploded into a ball of black mist and disappeared into the shadows again. Gubalama was waiting a dozen steps ahead. Soldak ran towards Gubalima. Regardless of the danger of his abdominal wound being torn open, he quickly ran to Gubalima's side, turned over, and got on his horse, riding a Guba horse. He rushed towards the entrance of the alley. Fortunately, Serdak had experience in fighting evil spirits and had twice neutralized the attacks of the sheep-faced devil. However, the wound on his abdomen had become a little numb at this time. And due to the blood loss, he felt that his body was it was getting colder and colder. And he knew that the sheep-faced devil was hiding in the shadows, watching him eagerly. However, the sheep-faced devil has never understood one thing. He is actually just a heavy armored and shielded warrior who can ride a horse not a heavy cavalry in the true sense. His mastery of the shield also gives him a stronger ability to resist assassination. Just when Gubalama was about to rush to the entrance of the alley, the shackles in the darkness tightly entangled Soldak again. And this time, the shackles of darkness were no longer entangled shadow bands. Instead, a dark vine emerged from the shadows. It continued to grow in the darkness. Those vines continued to wrap around Serdak's body. At the same time, he heard the whispering spell coming from midair. At this moment, Serdak finally saw a magician in a black robe standing on a high terrace in the alley behind him. His eyes were like two obsidians in the night, frantically absorbing there is endless darkness. And the magic spell in his mouth is the source of the power of the black vine growing in the shadow. The ebony staff in his hand exudes the halo of black magic. Serdak's intuition tell him that the sheep-faced evil spirit lurking in the shadows is also a servant he summoned. He is a real black magician in the black magic monastery. In his low spell, the black vines tied Soldak like a cocoon. At this time, the sheep-faced devil also at the same time. He appeared behind Serdak. Almost at the same moment, a two-faced and four-armed demonic figure appeared behind Serdak. Finally, at the critical moment, he released his power, and a cloud of energy erupted from the eyes of the demonic figure and the holy face. 
The dazzling holy light instantly evaporated the vines full of dark aura surrounding Serdek. Serdek was free from the restraints, and then used the shield in his hand to block the dagger in the hand of the sheep-faced devil. Releasing the sure, both strength and physical strength were improved at this moment. The craftsman's sword in Serdak's hand burst out with a foot-long golden light. He cut off the black sword in the hand of the sheep-faced devil with one sword. The dagger, and the craftsman's sword in his hand, was pierced into the body of the sheep-faced devil. But the black magician standing on the terrace in the alley raised his head at this moment and looked towards Soldak from afar. He was still murmuring, Syndicate's crime. Just like life is born. In his indifferent eyes, he saw that the sheep-faced devil summoned from the flaming H. I was killed by the knight with the power of holy light with a sword, completely turning into black mist and dispersing in the evening air. And the black magic the summoning circle arranged around the master exploded one after another. And seven black magic crystals exploded one after another, turning into black powder. Damn it! This stupid woman Samoa has gotten into such big trouble. No wonder the Varungal assassination operation failed. The black magician cursed angrily, but casually took out a magic weapon from his pocket. He mounted on the magic weapon, holding the magic wand in his hand, and rushed towards Serdak at the entrance of the alley. Serdak turned his head and saw the black magician flying out of the alley. But a demon servant summoned by him almost killed him. How could he dare to stay where he was and fight the black magician head on? And quickly patted the horse's buttocks of the ancient horse. This old horse had also experienced several life and death battles with Serdak. It immediately raised its four hooves and ran from the alley to the street. He ran towards the Knight Academy. The direction where Serdak was running was not only the Knight Academy. It was also on the edge of the wealthy area of Alinsa City. The security was originally very good, and you could often run into patrolling guard battalion knights. In addition, that street there is a magic tower on it, which can be regarded as the residence of the Magic Guild of Holanza City. The Black Magician saw the direction in which Serdak was escaping, and followed closely behind him on a magic harpoon. This alley was only two streets away from the Knight Academy. Serdak rode his horse and fled all the way to the gate of the Knight Academy. He originally wanted to continue escaping in the direction of the Magic Union. But the Black Magician's magic the handle was just a hair faster than his horse. And he flew around in front of Soldak in a short flight. He landed on the roof of a two-story building opposite the Knight Academy. And a black smoke emitted from the wand in his hand. Angry Fireball. As the Magician finished reciting the spell, the fireball hit Serdak directly a hundred meters away. Serdak looked at the rolling fireball and could only restrain Gubalai's horse. He jumped off the horse and rushed into the gate of the Knight Academy covered in blood. A familiar figure flashed in Darcy Christie's eyes. Under the cover of night, she didn't even notice that Serdak's lower body was covered in blood. She just saw him running into the Knight Academy in a panic with a pale face. Sigh. Christie's eyes widened and she stared at Soldak, who looked extremely tired. She ran to Soldak desperately, ready to rush up and slap him hard in the face. If he dares to resist, let the guard camp knights patrolling outside arrest him. Thinking of this, Darcy Christie felt a little relieved. Chapter 339 Sleeping Cloud Boom! A black flame fireball exploded from behind Serdak. As if an invisible big hand pushed behind Serdak. Serdak's body involuntarily threw forward, followed by a heat wave. Wrapping his whole body, he fell to the ground. A certain sealed door in his mind was also blown open by a wave of fire at this moment. The tide of memory surged out with countless broken pictures. Serdak felt that many vague things he had remembered suddenly became clear. In his memory, he was struggling helplessly in a sea of fire. But those eyes were looking at the north with determination. Covered in flames, Serdak quickly rolled twice on the ground and struggled to stand up. His whole body was covered with dust. And the cuffs and collar of his shirt were on fire. He slapped his hands twice to put out the fire on his body. The fire was not completely extinguished. Black smoke was still rising from the Warcraft leather armor on his body. Sparks were flying. And he looked as embarrassed as he wanted. At exactly this moment, a female swordsman rushed out of the academy gate. She rushed towards Soldak almost straight away. Looking from a distance, people around them thought it was an instructor from the academy rushing to help. The black magician who was standing on the roof across the street from the Knight Academy saw a female swordsman rushing out from the Knight Academy. His heart sank. He thought that Serdak must be looking for help when he came here. He was worried that if he continued to delay, he might it was even more difficult to kill Serdak. So he waved his staff again and chanted a strange spell in his mouth. The dark six-pointed star formation under his feet opened a black crack, and a black flame emerged from the crack. 
The flame carried a terrifying aura of destruction. The black magician condensed three black flame fireballs around him. After he finished reciting the spell, the three black smoke fireballs rushed towards Serdak in a row. Darcy Christie rushed out from under the sycamore tree of the college and rushed in front of Soldak. She was about to slap him twice. But she didn't expect that the magician on the roof across the street actually took action first and hit Soldak with a fireball. Erdak exploded. Just when her face showed an expression of gloating, she saw three fireballs with black smoke flying towards her from the opposite roof. The fireballs kept rolling in the air, hitting them with a billowing heat wave, which was frightening. She quickly jumped aside. Three fireballs exploded at Soldak's feet one after another. Darcy Christie didn't get far in time and was also affected by the black flame fireball. Falling to the lawn in a very embarrassed state, a group of trainee knights from the academy happened to be running behind them. They all helped Darcy up in a hurry. And one brainless student actually shouted loudly, It's Instructor Darcy. There are people from the Magic Academy sneaking up at the entrance of the academy. Instructor Darcy, go and call someone. Darcy Christie wanted to gag this student at this moment. This matter had nothing to do with her. Instructor Darcy, are you okay? The training knights asked with concern on their faces. Darcy Christie's face turned pale. She shook her head vigorously and stood up straight. She raised her head and glanced at the rooftop across the street, wanting to know who was chasing Soldak. She knew several young magicians in the Magic Guild. But not only was this magician's face unfamiliar, but the magic robe he wore had no magic at all. The emblem of the Union. A trace of doubt appeared on her face. Isn't that the clerk knight of our college? I'm going to help. Such a brainless student shouted and ran towards Soldak. Dasseldak climbed up from the lawn, covered in black smoke. He looked like he had experienced a fire. Fortunately, he was carrying a dwarf chain shield in his hand, which could always protect his body's vital points when the black flame fireball exploded. Soldak didn't expect that at this time. Someone would take the risk to rush up to help him. He looked at Darcy Christie. The person looked familiar, but for a moment, he couldn't remember where he had seen him. The black magician wanted to cast more powerful magic, but found that in just a short time, many people had gathered at the gate of the academy. Moreover, the two guards at the gate of the college were standing in front of the gate and blowing their whistles desperately. The young trainee knights who had gathered on the college playground gathered at the gate of the college. There were several instructors from the college among the crowd, and they rushed towards them like a tide. There was a rush of people at the gate, and there were people in the crowd who kept asking, who is causing trouble at the gate of the college? Someone said, A magician? These magician nobles are really getting more and more presumptuous. There was also a sharp whistle on the street, which was the whistle of the knights in the guard camp, and a series of horse hooves could be heard in the distance. At the same time, a magic flare exploded in the sky in front of the street in front of the knight academy. The dark red halo was particularly eye-catching at dusk. In the direction of the magic tower, Magicians from the law enforcement group were already flying towards them on magic harpoons. Come on! Looking at the black shadows flying from the top of the magic tower in the distance. At this moment, the black magician standing on the roof of the night academy couldn't help but have a headache. He took out a bottle of black powder from his arms with some distress and sprinkled it on the black six-pointed star ray around his body as quickly as possible. The black six-pointed star ray burst out into a ball of black flames and these flames formed in front of the black magician. A terrifying demon face. Then the black magician recited a spell, stretched out his withered arm, and cut it with a black demon horn. Drops of dark red blood dripped on this huge demon face. On top, dripping with blood, the blood seemed to be alive, flowing through the demon's face, leaving behind a series of bloody runes. Black magician. That's a black magician. Someone shouted in panic around him. When the blood of the black magician finally painted the demon's face with runes, the demon's face suddenly opened its eyes. It was a pair of extremely empty eyes. A smile appeared on the thick lips, and two sharp fangs emerged from the mouth of the devil's face was exposed, and the black magician made a loud curse sound. Human joy surrenders before pain. Truth is buried in the shroud of lies. O ruler of H. L. Please open your eyes, and let down the clouds of sleep. All the mana in the body was drained and the black magician's haggard old face showed a sickly flush. A black cloud spread out from under the black magician's feet. The black cloud was like an ever-expanding ring. Wherever the cloud passed, no one could escape, just like a strong hypnotic potion. Those who rushed towards the black magician at the entrance of the night academy kept falling in the black cloud. Not death, but sleep. The black magician turned his head 
and glanced at the magician of the law enforcement group, who was getting closer. He rode the magic harpoon toward Soldak. His magic power had been exhausted. The magic harpoon rushed down crookedly in the air, and he lay on the ground sleeping. Soldak picked up the magic handle, and was about to ride away on the magic handle. Then he turned and glanced at Darcy Christie not far away. The magic handle drifted to Darcy, and carried her on the magic handle. Bar. Just before the magician from the Magic Guild Law Enforcement Group arrived, the black magician rode a magic weapon into a narrow alley and disappeared in the blink of an eye. Chapter 340 Falling into the Forest A beam of light in the darkness made Serdak's body look like a transparent empty bottle suspended in the quiet void. That beam of light caused countless nodes in Serdak's body to release traces of sacred breath. The sacred breath connected into a nebula in the nodes, slowly rotating around a certain point in Serdak's body. The sacred breath gradually it nourishes Serdak's body and dispels the dark atmosphere in his body. Until the last trace of darkness was expelled from his body, Serdak felt that his consciousness returned to his body. Although he was still bound by an invisible force, as if he was trapped in a nightmare and could not wake up, the five senses of his body were changing, returning to the body little by little. Something was pressing on me, making me breathless. The wind outside was very strong, and I felt like I was hanging on a swaying branch. The violent north wind almost froze my body. Serdak opened his eyes and saw darkness in front of him. The black mountains were beneath him. Serdak finally realized that he was lying on the handle of a magic pot, and his body was pressed by a soft body. His face was almost touching the thigh of the black magician, who was flying in the mountains and fields on the handle of a magic harpoon. The black magician's flying height is only slightly higher than the tree canopy, and he does not dare to fly too fast at night constantly undulating according to the terrain. Serdak could feel that the black magician's breathing was very disordered. And from time to time, there would be a violent cough. Every time the black magician coughed, the magic handle would shake violently, as if it was falling from the air at any time. The black magician was in very poor health. And under the cover of the night, he didn't even notice that Serdak was awake. Serdak did not dare to sit still and wait for the black magician to return to his territory. By then, he might not even have the chance to escape. He did not dare to move too much. He would move a little every time there was a bump. Until his, his hand touched the dagger tied to his thigh. Serdak silently pulled out the dagger. Pointed it at the black magician's lower back. And stabbed it in. Ah! The black magician screamed. And he frantically tried to throw Serdak off the handle of the magic sword. Serdak took the opportunity to pierce the dagger into the black magician's heart. How is it possible? How could you wake up under the cloud of sleep? The black magician shouted these words with almost the last bit of his strength. And then the handle of the magic pot fell from the air. Serdak only felt the whistling wind in his ears. And the black shadow of the forest continued to expand in front of his eyes. And his body after breaking away from the magic shackle. He continued to fall into the forest below. And the guy on top of him also fell out. At the most critical moment, Serdak easily picked up the body in his hand. And threw the dwarf chain shield in his hand towards a huge shadow under the body. There was a thumb-thick chain attached to the back of the shield. After flying out, it seemed like he was entangled in something. Serdak held on to the chain tightly. The moment his falling body fell into the woods, he flew out sideways under the pull of the iron chain. Then his body crashed into a dense group of branches. He could only curl up his body as much as possible and let his back hit the bushes. The branches of the fir tree scratched Soldak again and again, and countless collisions made him, the wound on his abdomen tore open again and under the burst of severe pain. Serdak could hardly hold on to the unconscious body. Serdak's body was like a pendulum, swinging along with the chain on the dwarf's chain shield for a few times before finally stopping. It felt like his body was falling apart. The arm connected to the dwarf chain shield had almost no feeling at all. After everything stopped, Serdak realized that he was hanging on a tree. The dwarf the chain shield happened to be wrapped around the top of the tree. He was only a few meters above the ground at this time and there was a dark forest below. He tried to twist his body, let himself swing, and then used the inertia of the swing to hang the limp body in his hand on the branch of the tree. Then there was himself. He could not retract the dwarf chain shield, so he had to untie the buckle at the end of the chain, and sat on the horizontal branch of the fir tree. He ignored the severe pain that felt like his whole body was falling apart, and quickly moved his body. The sacred breath accelerated the healing of his body, and he found a band from the magic waist bag and tightly tightened the wound on his waist and abdomen. I don't know where the craftsman's sword was lost, 
Serdek put the short dagger back into the scabbard and glanced at the female swordsman hanging on the horizontal branch. She was still unconscious. The temperature in the mountain forest is a little low. And the wind blowing makes people feel like their joints are being frozen through. The power of holy light revealed in the palm of his hand had a very miraculous self-healing ability. Serdak felt that his body could barely move. So he put the unconscious female swordsman into a sleeping bag and let him go. Hanging on the horizontal branch of the tree like this. At least she would not freeze to death for the time being. After doing this, he climbed down the big tree. This is a mountain forest full of leaves. And the ground under his feet is very soft. Serdak felt a little more at ease when he stepped on the ground with his feet. He still has a knight's long sword in his magic waist bag. Which is an ordinary item he bought from the blacksmith shop. Without the craftsman's sword, he could only hold it in his hand. And then kick it deep and shallow. Groping in the dark woods. He walked forward nearly a hundred meters in the direction where the black magician fell. And finally saw the broken magic urn handle. And the place where the black magician fell. It is further away. The black magician's body was leaning against the roots of a big tree. There was a pool of blood on the ground. At this time, his body was already cold. One arm and one leg were at a twisted angle. He should have fallen from the sky. It broke when it came down. But it seems that the black magician did not die immediately when he fell. He even insisted on climbing to the root of the tree. And leaned against the root to take out a magic scroll from the magic pocket. However, this magic scroll could not be opened after all. The most fatal injury was the knife that Soldak stabbed from the lower back to the ventricle. The dagger cut open the black magician's heart with almost no obstruction and also caused him to lose everything. A chance to live. Seeing that the black magician was dead, Serdak breathed a sigh of relief. He sat down next to the black magician and took out a roll of linen bandage from his magic pocket and then bandaged it again. Touched the wound. The black magician who died next to him looked old and his skin was pale after excessive blood loss. His exposed neck and arms were covered with magic lines, and the wand in his hand fell like a fire stick. On the side, Soldak reached out and picked up the wand. It was an unknown wooden wand with a magic crystal inlaid on one end. There was a trace of magic flowing in the magic crystal. This thing is probably worth some money. Thinking of this, Serdak put his wand into the magic belt bag and searched the black magician's cold body again in addition to the magic belt bag and wallet on his body. Serdak even put the clothes worn by the black magician on his body. All the magic robes were taken off. Chapter 341 Struggle Under Dilemma Serdak took off the magic robe from the black magician, only to find that the black magician's body was actually engraved with magic patterns, which looked a bit like the black magic skin on an evil ghost. He remembered what Swordsman Baikal had said at the beginning, in order to gain powerful power. Most intermediate magicians and high-level warriors would often use magic pattern arrays to strengthen themselves, and the skin all over his body had experienced serious damage. Burns. So even if you become a high-level warrior, you will not be able to obtain inscriptions, which will have a great impact on your strength. These magic patterns on this black mage's body are probably the kind of magic patterns tattooed on the body that Swordsman Baikal mentioned at the beginning. It is said that asking a senior inscription master to tattoo such a magic pattern structure is also very expensive. If the black magician's body is discarded in the woods, it may be eaten clean by the little beasts in this forest within a few days. Serdak stood up and walked back and found the broken magic harpoon handle. It seemed to be of little repair value. Serdak only removed the magic crystal from the gem base of the magic harpoon handle. Come down and let the magic harpoon hang on the tree. The injury on his body seemed to be less painful. Serdak groped in the dark forest and returned to the fir tree. A cold snowflake fell on his face and melted quickly. Serdak raised his head and looked at the night sky. No wonder he couldn't see the stars. Unexpectedly, light snow would fall at this time. And more snow particles fell on his face. Soldak couldn't help but raise his collar to prevent the cold snow particles from getting into his neck. The temperature in the forest became even colder. Originally, Serdak planned to leave this area overnight. He knew that it was not safe here. But it was snowing lightly and it was pitch black all around. It would obviously be very dangerous to walk through the mountains and forests. This kind of weather was the most dangerous. The best thing is to wait for dawn. Soldag dragged his scarred body back to the fir tree. He first set up a simple tent, worried that hungry beasts would come and cause trouble. He took out a small bottle of Euron excrement from his arms and sprinkled it around the tent. Euron excrement can be bought in the explorer store, and the price is not high. It is a very practical necessity for survival in the wild. 
Then Soldak took the unconscious Darcy Christie down from the tree. Her breathing was a little disordered, and her body was shaking constantly in her sleep. In such a cold weather, her forehead was covered with cold sweat, and her golden hair was her long hair was wet and stuck to her forehead, and there was a trace of struggle on her face, as if she was having a nightmare. Soldak carried her into the tent. She was lying in the sleeping bag, and her condition was not very good. The temperature in the mountain forest was very low, and it started to snow again. The sweat that came out absorbed the heat from Darcy's body. She had been falling asleep and could not be woken up no matter what. Her lips were blue from the cold, and her whole body was curled up into a ball, shivering constantly. I touched the female swordsman's forehead. It was a little hot, and she seemed to have a high fever. Serdak took off the water bag from his waist, handed the mouth of the water bag to her mouth, fed her a few drinks, and then unfolded a magic scroll of fire gathering in the tent. And a stream of flames came from the scroll. It emerged from the top, bringing a touch of warmth to the tent. Her face looked familiar. It was a heroic face, with slightly pursed lips and slender eyebrows, seeing that she not only had a swordsman badge on her chest, but also a badge from the Bena Advanced Swordsman Academy. Soldak suddenly remembered who this female swordsman was. Darcy Christie. Soldak had met her when he rescued Hathaway and Beatrice in the hilly pastures of Hannanar County. It was she and several classmates who abandoned Hathaway and Beatrice at the critical moment. Liz sneaked away and later participated in the action to stop her in Hendonar City. At that time, she took action and severely taught the graduates of the Swordsman Academy. Unexpectedly, she was actually from Melensa, and she was also a female instructor at the Knight Academy. Serdak forcefully patted her cheek, which had a hint of redness. But unfortunately, there was no response. She had a high fever for some unknown reason. Serdak frowned, and followed the emergency measures in the military camp, and wiped off her body. She took off her tight leather armor and lay in the sleeping bag wearing only her underwear. He injected a ray of holy light power into her body through the sleeping bag. Seeing that her condition became more stable, Serdak dragged his tired body and put on his clothes. Spent one night sleeping in the tent. At daybreak, Serdak got out of the tent. The outside of the forest turned into a silvery white. Serdak's body recovered well. He climbed to the fir tree and retrieved the dwarf chain shield hanging on the top of the tree. Magic there happened to be two rabbits in the waste bag. They were originally intended for Lena and Nedra to practice skinning. But now they were taken out and made into breakfast. Serdak picked up some fir tree branches, lit a bonfire at the entrance of the tent, skinned a fat rabbit and threaded it on a wooden frame, then put it on the fire and started roasting it. After the snow stopped, a thick layer accumulated on the ground. When Darcy Christie woke up, she only felt that the light outside was a bit dazzling. She first looked at the roof of the tent in a daze, then recalled that she fainted on the ground under the ring of black fog last night, and then saw that she was lying on the ground, only in a sleeping bag and wearing only a thin linen shirt. Darcy Christie's eyes widened, and she sat up suddenly. She got out of the sleeping bag and immediately felt the cold wind in the tent, which made her shrink back into the sleeping bag. She saw the leather armor she was originally wearing hanging next to the tent. Darcy quickly lowered her head and checked the shirt on her body. She was still dressed neatly, which made her feel a little relieved. She felt that her body was as weak as falling apart. Thinking of her insomnia for the past few days, she didn't expect to fall ill at such a critical moment. There was a faint scent of meat floating in the crisp air. His hands and feet were not chained, and neither was his body. He must have been saved by someone. Perhaps a strong man. Darcy Christie was heartbroken. Darcy quickly got dressed in the tent, and then got out of the tent. As soon as she got out of the tent, she saw Serdak sitting next to the campfire roasting rabbits. In an instant, all the good things were shattered. Darcy. Christie glared at Soldak with wide eyes, and said angrily with disgust, How could it be you? Serdak sat on the wooden pier, stared at Darcy and asked, Aren't you going to say thank you to me? Darcy Christie's long simmering emotion suddenly burst out. Perhaps these words had been held in her heart for too long. She just opened her mouth, and the words couldn't wait to come out of her throat. My bad life now is nothing more than worship. You gave me a prayer to Lady Liberty every night before I went to sleep, praying that you would lose your freedom forever and be imprisoned somewhere, stuck there for the rest of your life. Serdak did not expect that Darcy Christie would be so resentful towards him, and said to her in a mocking tone, The Statue of Liberty has abandoned all the people of the Green Empire. Belief in the Statue of Liberty is of no use. It's better to believe in the Dark Goddess. 
It is an indisputable fact that the priests and combat priests in the temple have withdrawn from the plain war. And the goddess of liberty has abandoned the green empire people. Soldat carefully savored what Darcy Christie just said. And it was very close to his current situation. Thinking that he was really trapped in this world full of fantasy. He felt slightly depressed. And he only said, If you just want me to be stuck somewhere, you don't need to pray to Lady Liberty because your wish has already come true. No matter what. I'm very happy to see you crawling out of the tent alive and kicking. Soldak then added, You? Darcy Christie was so angry that she didn't know what to say. I'm afraid she would be at a disadvantage in the fight. So she could only sit aside in silence. Serdak was not aggressive and continued to sarcastically mock her. After all, the two of them were still in a difficult situation. If they wanted to leave safely, at least they could not fight among themselves. So he pointed at the brown and oily rabbit on the shelf and said nothing to her. Darcy Christie asked, Would you like some breakfast? You look very weak. Do you know where this place is? Darcy held her knees with her hands and sat opposite Soldek. She stretched her neck and looked around. She was surrounded by a sea of forest that could not be seen to the edge. Within her field of vision, there were endless mountains. And now it was raining again. There was a heavy snowfall. And there was a snowy silver world everywhere. There was no eye-catching reference at all. Darcy looked through the gap between the trees above her head at the clear blue sky after the heavy snowfall. The sunlight shined through the trees into the forest. And it was unexpectedly extraordinary. Beauty. Soldak saw her raising her pointed chin and had no intention of talking to him at all. So he could only say, It seems that you don't know either. I will start from here later and climb over this mountain first to go there. Looking for a way out to a higher place. Do you want to come with me? The other party still didn't say a word. Serdak stretched out his hand and tore off a steaming piece of rabbit leg, dipped it in a little salt, and stuffed it into his mouth. It tasted good in its original flavor, but the thick part of the meat was not well roasted. Darcy didn't speak or eat the rabbit that Serdak roasted. After Serdak silently finished the rabbit, he started to pack up the tent, carried everything on his back, and set the campfire extinguish it and bury it in snow. He ignored Darcy Christie and walked directly towards the slope of the mountain forest. This forest was covered with snow, and there was a thick layer of leaves under the snow. When he stepped in, his knees could sometimes be submerged, and it was on the way down the mountain. It is easy to lose your balance and fall over. Fortunately, the hillside in this woodland is not too steep. After identifying the direction, Serdak walked towards the south. He planned to stay away from here and find a place. On higher ground, see where this is. After several months of training in the military camp, this kind of wild survival is not a problem for him at all. And Serdak calculated that this should be the outskirts of Alensis City. A place with such dense mountains and forests must not be far from the sea. Lanza is too far. In his impression, places too far away from the city of Alensa were all desolate places like Wall Village. As long as he can confirm the direction of Alensa City, he can walk back with his own legs. The wound on his abdomen has begun to heal. Although the wound will be involved when walking, this injury will not cause him much trouble. He picked up a handful of snow from the snow and wiped his face hard to wake himself up. He didn't expect that Darcy Christie would be so stubborn. She didn't give in at all in such adversity. Even if she left alone, she would remain stubborn without saying a word and let herself walk away step by step. Soldak secretly convinced himself that no matter what grievances he had with her in the past, now was not the time to discuss those things. Not to mention that she was still sick. It would be difficult for her to leave the forest on her own. He was about to turn around and look for her. Darcy Christie heard a sudden plop sound coming from behind him. When he turned around, he realized that the girl who had been pointing at his nose and scolding him just now had fallen down on the hillside with her whole face covered, buried in the snow. He deserved his hard work. Soldak secretly laughed at himself. He ran over and fished Darcy Christie out of the snow urn and found that Darcy Christie fell into a coma again. Unexpectedly, she was so ill this time. Is this the female swordsman who graduated from Benna Senior Academy? Cernak laughed in his heart. He was about to carry the female swordsman behind his back. He felt a dull pain in his abdomen when he exerted a little force. He remembered that he was also injured. With his own physical strength, he might not be able to carry a person out of this mountain. Cernak bit him, gritting his teeth. He took out the four familiar pottery bowls from the magic waste bag, lit the blue flame, and then took out the sand wolf head to sacrifice to the gods and demons. Blessed body. At this time, 
Both Serdak and Darcy Christie need such a powerful recovery aura. Serdak even regrets a little. If he had known this, he might as well have held a sacrifice ceremony last night to give her thanks to the effect of the divine blessed body. Her body might recover as soon as she wakes up. It's better now. I still have to carry her all the way. The road in the mountains and forests is not easy to walk. And it's snowing so heavily. Soldak patted Darcy Christie's fair face hard to wake her up from her drowsiness. And then asked coldly, Hey, wake up quickly. Stop sleeping. Can you still walk by yourself? Darcy Christie reluctantly opened her eyes in a daze. The dazzling sunlight and the person she least wanted to see in front of her. That person slapped her face hard. Made the female swordsman fall asleep again. Seeing Darcy Christie fainting again. Soldak had no choice but to admit that she was unlucky. He was worried that she would get frostbite in the mountains and forests because she was only wearing thin leather armor. He took out a rope and tied her tightly, and then tied her behind with another length of rope, worried that members of the Black Magic Monastery would find this place. Soldak left the forest with Darcy Christie on his back. He didn't know where the city of Halanza was, so he just walked southward along the valley. A heavy snow completely covered the entire valley. After the heavy snow, some little beasts ran out of their nests to look for food. From a distance, they saw two pheasants with colorful tail feathers flying from here to there on the hillside, and then plunged into the snowdrifts. Chapter 342 Vigil When it first snowed, the snow grids fell on the ground and melted quickly, forming a thin layer of ice on the ground. The snow that fell later stopped melting and spread a thick layer on the ground. Therefore, the road in the valley is very difficult. The road between the valleys was completely covered with snow, and he could only walk one foot deep and one foot shallow through the seemingly flat snow. He didn't even dare to step on the flat snow. So he could only look for places with dead grass and leaves exposed. If you step into such a place, you can at least ensure that your body will not completely sink into it, leaving only a series of footprints. Serdak's archery skills are terrible, but hunting pheasants in the snow does not require a bow and arrow at all. Experienced hunters only need to drive away the pheasants that are looking for food in the snow and wait until they are tired and hungry after flying. Sometimes, they will plunge into the snow urn. At this time, the hunter takes the opportunity to walk over and pull the pheasant out of the snow pit like a carrot. The harvest is not too easy. So it didn't take long for Serdak to have a string of flower-tailed pheasants hanging on his waist. He was carrying the unconscious female swordsman on his back. From a distance, she looked extremely bloated. He also held a wooden stick in his hand to avoid falling while walking. Every time he breathed, a stream of white water vapor would be sprayed out from his nostrils. Every step seemed to take twice as much effort from him. And every step he took was so slow. Easy. Serdak cursed in his heart. God. It happened to be snowing at this time. He really knew how to catch the opportunity. And he didn't know if Carl would send people to look for him after receiving such news. Two white rump deer ran out of the forest. Their live bodies jumped back and forth in the snow. When they discovered Serdak in the valley... They blinked their innocent eyes and blinked, as if some were curious about this guest in the valley. They even followed Serdak for several hundred meters. They gradually lost interest in Serdak and then jumped into the pine forest in the valley. Serdak was not prepared to hunt these two white rump deer. There were several birds in the sky that were constantly circling over the valley. At first, Serdak was worried that they were the night harriers that the dark red knight had been around before. He stopped and said, Instead of continuing forward, I dove into the forest and found that the birds had not left. They continued to hover above the valley until a fat gray guinea pig appeared in the snow in the valley. After clumsily digging at the plant roots, the birds swooped down from high altitude like bombers, scrambling to kill the gray guinea pig in the snow. Seeing that the birds that hunted gray squirrels were just the most common short-beaked vultures, Soldak breathed a sigh of relief. This kind of bird is greedy, cunning and cunning, and difficult to tame. It should not be a black magic hermit. The reconnaissance sentry said over there. Although he thought so, he did not emerge from the forest. Under the cover of the red pine forest, Soldak moved forward cautiously. After walking out of the valley, he planned to find a higher place to observe the situation. Where to go? But before his hanging heart dropped, he felt a thin whispering sound coming from the depths of the pine forest. Before he could feel alert, several forest gray wolves came from the depths of the pine forest. A bush emerged from it. These forest wolves still had the down of some unknown animals hanging from their mouths. At this moment, they were staring greedily at the pheasants behind Serdek and cooed from their throats. The sound of cooing, seeing their skinny bodies and shriveled abdomens, 
Serdak knew that it would be difficult for him to get rid of them. They were a group of hungry wolves who had been hungry for who knows how long. Although I can't figure out how they got mixed up like this. They don't have many natural enemies in the forest. Brown bears and tigers, which are more powerful than them, don't like to eat the sour meat of forest gray wolves. After they die, there are only those carrion birds in the sky. They will regard them as a delicious meal. So the only enemy of these forest gray wolves is themselves. Maybe they have just migrated from areas with scarce resources. Seeing the forest wolf chasing behind him, Soldak took out the alloy bow he carried with him from his magic waste bag. This standard hunting bow issued by the army is actually very powerful and has a long range. Far superior to other hunting bows. He hid behind a pine tree. Just waiting for the forest gray wolves to slowly approach him until they were only 20 steps away and then aimed at the strongest wolf in the pack. Shoot an arrow. Serdak's archery skills were average, but he could at least avoid missing the target within a distance of 20 meters. The feather arrow almost turned into a white light in the air. It was obvious that the speed had reached the extreme. With a swish sound, the feather arrow almost turned into a white light in the air. The arrow flew over a distance of more than 20 meters, penetrated deeply through the wolf's waist and abdomen, and nailed it to a pine tree. The forest wolf let out a whimpering cry, but it couldn't get rid of the barbed arrow. When the other forest gray wolves saw that the first wolf had been hunted, they quickly fled and disappeared into the pine forest in the blink of an eye. Serdak breathed a sigh of relief and walked away from the wolf. It was nailed to the tree by the feather arrow and still issued a low roar to warn Serdak. Naturally, Serdak did not he would care about the forest wolf's counterattack before it died and stabbed the forest wolf to death with a knight's sword in his hand. The color of this gray wolf's fur was like withered grass and it was very prickly. There were no human-made leather shops at all. Being willing to buy such low-quality wolf skin, Serdak was not in the mood to peel it off and take it away. Serdak also thought that if Lena and Nedra were here, maybe the wolf would be a good teaching prop and they wouldn't mind skinning the wolf. But after Serdak continued to walk forward for a few hundred meters, a group of forest gray wolves appeared again in the pine forest. This time, the gray wolves that appeared were not the few before, but more than thirty. They they came from three directions in the forest. They were probably afraid of Serdak and did not dare to get too close. But they followed him all the time. As Serdak moved forward, they followed silently. It was as if he was waiting for Serdak to let down his guard. And then, he would immediately pounce on him and tear him apart completely. Two hours later, Serdak couldn't help but have a headache when he saw more and more forest gray wolves gathering behind him. These forest gray wolves had slowly expanded from the first few to forty or fifty. And they all showed extraordinary performance. With all his endurance, he just followed Serdak and was not in any hurry to get closer. Serdak tried leaving the pheasants behind, making them into traps, luring the forest wolves to come for food, and then taking the opportunity to hunt them down. As expected, a few extremely hungry forest gray wolves couldn't resist this temptation. When they saw the pheasant hanging in the air, they pounced on it like crazy. Several hungry wolves competed for the pheasant at the same time. Serdak killed it with an alloy bow. Several forest gray wolves died, but found that their situation had not improved at all. It was not that those forest gray wolves were not afraid of death, but that more forest gray wolves emerged from the pine forest. They seemed to know that Serdak was not easy to mess with and did not dare to get too close. But they followed him closely. This group of forest gray wolves followed Soldak all day long and did not leave until dark. At noon, Serdak also lit a fire and roasted a pheasant in the pine forest. This time, he did not have the luxury to roast the chicken directly with the magic flame on the magic scroll. Instead, he used the fire gathering technique magic scroll to attract he burned some pine feathers and pine tree towers, built a bonfire in the forest, roasted the skin pheasant carefully, put half of it into his stomach, and gave the other half to Darcy Christie, who had just woken up. A roasted pheasant, which is not a big one, is not enough to fill the stomachs of two adults. But Serdak did not roast the second one. Since the group of forest gray wolves followed him, Serdak has not encountered any prey along the way. He doesn't know how long it will take to get out of this mountain forest. Look at these the forest wolf looks so unscrupulous. It must be far away from the city of Helensa. At least this mountain forest is deserted. He didn't know how long it would take to hunt for food again. If he didn't want to eat the sour and smelly wolf meat, Serdak had to be careful about the food he had. When Darcy Christie woke up this time, she calmed down. She lay obediently on Soldak's back. Naturally, she saw the wolves following behind her. 
she did not forcefully ask Serdak to take her away. Put it down, he was probably very hungry and never refused the food handed over by Soldak. Her condition was still very bad. In the afternoon, Serdak continued walking along the valley with her on his back, and she fell asleep again. When it was almost dark, Serdak found a rock crevice next to the rock wall. This rock crevice had no roof and was just a crack between the rock walls. But the advantage was that the exit was narrow. If the exit was blocked, there would be a safe place will be formed. But the cold wind is constantly pouring in from the top of the crack. And there are even a series of ice skates as sharp as spears hanging above the crack. No matter how you look at it, this place is a bit dangerous. Soldak built a tent in the crevice, put Darcy Christie inside the tent, got some pine branches, and built a bonfire at the crevice. Then he sat at the entrance of the tent and put the eye rummaged through my magic fanny pack and the black magician's fanny pack and found out what I could eat. All in all, there were only three pheasants, a rabbit, three packs of marching rations, and a thick arm. White bread? Obviously the black magician is not a frequent traveler, nor does he have the habit of preparing rations with him. Serdak thought that he should be more economical, but he didn't care too much. In the worst case, he would just eat these forest wolves. Although the meat was a bit sour, who would care about it if he was really hungry? Seeing Soldak sitting at the entrance of the tent rummaging for food, Darcy Christie also realized the difficult situation the two of them were in. Lost in this mountain forest, and being stared at by a group of forest wolves, it seemed that they were helpless. After hunting other food, these should be all they can eat when placed in front of Soldak. Looking at this pitiful amount of food, Darcy Christie felt a little worried. The two of them still had a roast chicken for dinner. But this time Serdak also cooked half of the marching rations. This kind of wheat flour with salt and meat powder can be boiled into a paste like gruel. Although during these marches, food rations are definitely the most difficult thing to swallow in normal times. But now the two of them eat all the food in perfect harmony. After dinner, Darcy Christie drank some hot porridge and sweated a little. Her body obviously improved a lot. She wrapped her sleeping bag and sat curled up at the door of the tent. Although she never said anything to Soldak. Thank you. But at least the hostile look was gone. Her blonde hair was wet and dried several times. And then it was stuck on Darcy Christie's head in a very awkward manner. Her face was still a little sallow. Apart from being stubborn, her face no longer had the pride of aristocratic status. Her face her face had the typical outline of a Helanza person. With somewhat long cheeks, she was also secretly looking at Serdak's profile under the bonfire. As night fell, a pair of green greedy eyes appeared in the pine forest not far away. The forest gray wolves were a little afraid of the flames, but they still did not leave. After thinking about it for a long time, Darcy Christie finally said to Soldak, who was sitting by the fire, You can take a rest first. I have been sleeping for so long and can't sleep now. Let's watch the bonfire here first. These forests the gray wolves will not leave easily. They are afraid of fire. And as long as the bonfire is not extinguished, they will not rush towards us. Soldek looked at Darcy in surprise and said, I thought you would never speak. Seeing that Darcy Christie didn't want to pay attention to him anymore, she hurriedly said, Okay, then I'll go take a nap. If you're sleepy, just call me. Don't put out the fire. Soldek was also very straightforward. After speaking, he piled the prepared pine branches next to Dashy Christie, then got into the tent and fell asleep. Soldek fell asleep quickly. Darcy Christie looked away from the dagger tied to her leg and looked away. She never thought that she would have such an embarrassing day. And she was obviously very weak after a serious illness. But he also took the initiative to keep vigil. The young knights who had surrounded him before could not count on him at this time. They obviously hated the man lying in the tent. But they had to rely on others. This dilemma made Darcy, there was an inexplicable embarrassment in my heart. Perhaps because she had been sweating. Her body was a little sticky which was definitely the most unbearable thing for Darcy Christie, who was a little bit of a germaphobe. Seeing the iron pot for cooking porridge next to the campfire, she had a bold idea. She wanted to use the iron pot to melt some snow water, and after heating it, she secretly wiped her body. However, when she took action, she found that the idea was simple and easy to operate. It's not easy. You need to constantly add new snow to the iron pot. But the boiled snow water is still not much. She was exhausted and sweating. And when the cold wind blew, she shivered twice in a row. She added some pine branches to the bonfire and then quietly waited for the snow water in the iron pot to heat up. And the mountain breeze blew by. When climbing into the rock crevice, 
There was a strange, whooshing sound at night. It was eerily quiet outside. And even the forest gray wolves had disappeared. Darcy Christie couldn't help but yawned. She stared drowsily at the dancing firelight in front of her. She felt sleepy and fell asleep again. With only the last few embers left in the campfire, the group of timber wolves waiting in the pine forest sneaked around. Chapter 343 Reconciliation In the darkness, the coldness began to spread infinitely. Serdak curled up, feeling a little cold on his back. But his sleepiness was like countless tentacles pressing tightly against his eyes, preventing him from opening them. But suddenly a feeling came over him. A feeling that danger was approaching. He wanted to raise his hand to grab the knight's sword beside him. But that hand came up empty. He suddenly opened his eyes. Saw that the knight's sword was still standing upright next to the tent. He turned over and climbed out of the tent. And found that the bonfire at the door was dying. And the cold wind poured into the tent. Making him shiver. And saw Darcy Christie actually sitting. She was soundly asleep in front of the campfire. Surrounded by wolves. But she was still able to sleep. The next second. Serdak saw a group of wolves slowly approaching from the darkness. Without the blazing bonfire, the last fear in their hearts also dissipated in the darkness. Countless pairs of green eyes appeared in the woods. Serdak broke out in a cold sweat. This scene reminded him of the tragic scene when he faced the red-eyed hyena in the forest camp. At least at that time, the 4th Brigade had 300 heavy armored infantry, and they had strong armor and sharp swords. But under those crazy the red-eyed hyena still faced heavy losses. The wolves at night were far more ferocious than during the day. Serdak leaned forward to pick up a few pieces of firewood and threw them into the fire with only a few embers left, causing sparks to fly everywhere. The slowly approaching pack of wolves let out a low roar. Soldak leaned over and patted the sleeping Darcy Christie and found that she had no reaction at all. He quickly reached out and touched her forehead. She was still having a fever. Her face was red. And her forehead was hot. It seemed that she was seriously ill this time. Even if she was blessed with a blessed body, her condition still could not improve. These hungry and skinny forest gray wolves are slender. Adult gray wolves can be at least two meters long. They hunched their bodies, got in from the cracks in the rocks, and surrounded Serdak in a fan shape. The leading male wolves were as big as huge. After a brief howling sound, a dozen gray wolves in front of Serdak pounced on Serdak almost simultaneously. In such a narrow stone crevice, there was no way to dodge. Serdak assumed a defensive posture of lunging, and the dwarf chain shield in his hand slammed outward. The three hungry wolves that rushed towards him were immediately hit by the shield in Serdak's hand. The one on the far left the gray wolf received a solid blow from Serdak. The gray wolf's skull was immediately shattered, and the protruding corridors on both sides took the opportunity to bite Serdak's legs and arms with quick eyes and quick hands. Soldak stabbed a gray wolf into the mouth with a knight's sword in his hand. The smelly wolf blood splashed onto Soldak's leather armor as he drew the sword. The two gray wolves took the opportunity to bite Serdak's thigh, but their sharp teeth could not bite through Serdak's Warcraft leather armor immediately. They could only squeeze and deform the Warcraft leather armor. Serdak who didn't feel the expected pain. At this time, he had already freed his hand and chopped off the head of a forest gray wolf with his sword. The other gray wolf was thrown out by him, and the shield in his hand took the opportunity to attack the forest wolf. The gray wolf let out a whimpering scream. The wolf was like an old dog whose legs had been broken. He laid down and kept wailing. However, this tragic situation did not make the other forest gray wolves want to retreat. They were still lying aside, waiting for an opportunity. As long as there is a slight gap, they will pounce on it without hesitation. Fortunately, this knight's sword was quite thick. Even after killing more than a dozen gray wolves, the blade did not bend. However, the sword was covered in wolf blood, and the blood stained the sword's handle, making it sticky and slippery. There were more than a dozen wolf corpses lying on the ground. Serdak's arms were also a little numb, and his gauntlets and leather pants were covered with bite marks from gray wolves. These forest gray wolves are not Warcraft. They are just ordinary beasts in the forest. They are usually invincible in this forest and rely on their huge numbers. There are no ferocious beasts nearby that can resist them. Because of this, the number of gray wolves will become larger and larger. They gradually cannot find enough food. Most gray wolves are so hungry that they are as thin as a stick. Even after praying, he refuses to give up easily. The strength of this group of gray wolves is far less than that of the red-eyed hyenas in the mountains and forests of Handanar County in the Warsaw Plain. Although Soldak was a little tired, he firmly blocked the wolves from the rock crevices with his Warcraft leather armor and shield and sword. 
He was like a solid shield wall, resisting all the ferocious attacks of the forest wolf from the front, at least ensuring that Darcy Christie, who was lying next to the bonfire, was safe for the time being. He stepped on a wolf corpse and almost fell to the ground. His center of gravity was a little unstable. Two gray wolves took the opportunity to bite the wrist holding the sword. And then the two gray wolves dragged him backwards. Serdak was pulled forward by the gray wolf. He knew that once he fell, more forest wolves would pounce on him. And he could not get up from the ground again. So Serdak concentrated his mind and released the phantom of the devil in the sea of consciousness with great concentration. A huge five meter tall phantom appeared behind Serdak. The god's face looked like Serdak's. And he had four phantom arms instantly materialized, for huge fists fell down instantly, smashing the gray wolf biting Serdak's arm until his brains exploded. The moment the demon god shadow appeared, Serdak's body was instantly infused with powerful power. He took the opportunity to stand firm and continuously swung his shield at the wolves in front of him, knocking several gray wolves flying out. The sword was also used to chop several forest wolves in succession and directly drive them out of the rock gap. At this time, the newly added firewood in the bonfire behind Serdak burned again. The fire dispelled the coldness of the night and illuminated the stone gaps in front of the tent. In the jumping firelight, the group of forest gray wolves remained more than 20 gray wolf carcasses were dropped, and they retreated into the dark forest with unwilling wailing sounds. Looking at the wolves receding like a sea tide, the momentum behind Serdak gradually disappeared. A wave of fatigue hit him, and Serdak sat back next to the campfire. He rested for a while silently wiping the blood from the knight's sword, and then wiped the wolf blood from his hands. Both hands were almost stained red with wolf blood, and the wrist guards on both arms there were even several cuts. The leather armor on Serdak's body was also stained with wolf blood, and his clothes were torn into strands. He looked very embarrassed, but the wounds on his body were very limited, and they were still in the holy state. Heels quickly in the light. Seeing that this set of leather armor was almost unusable, Serdak remembered that he still had a set of standard armor from the guard camp in his magic waste bag, but it had been used as a bait in the past few days. So he never had it. Opportunity to wear. Now he is no longer bait. Thinking of this, he couldn't help but laugh to himself. I planned to lure Samo out. But unexpectedly I caught the big fish from the black magic hermitage. And the big fish almost swallowed his bait in one gulp. If the guy wasn't too confident and thought he wouldn't after waking up from the sleeping cloud. I am afraid that I have been taken back to the secret stronghold of the Black Magic Monastery. I will inevitably be tortured by those guys. They probably want to extract information from me about the whereabouts of the Dark Red Knight. He took off his Warcraft leather armor, casually wiped the blood on his body, and then put on the full coverage armor mixed with black iron. This set of armor is not considered heavy armor, but the metal SH. L covers almost the entire body. If the forest wolves can't bite through the leather armor of Warcraft, then I'm afraid they won't even be interested in biting this set of metal armor. In particular, there are some iron spikes at some movable joints, which are probably prepared for these beasts. Serdak put the helmet aside, and after putting on the armor, he moved around for a while and found that the design of this Grim Empire standard armor was very mature, and there was no inconvenience at all. And there were also holes near the belt there are special buckles for hanging swords. This type of standard armor is better than that of the 57th Heavy Armor Infantry Regiment. He dragged Darcy Christie back to the tent, took off her leather armor, and put her into the sleeping bag again, until her breathing became steady. Soldak breathed out gently. As a senior swordsman from the Bena Academy, a female swordsman whose physical fitness is so poor, Serdak really has nothing to say. Early the next morning, Darcy Christie woke up slowly and found that she was lying on Soldak's back again and continued to walk along the woods. Her head was still dizzy and Darcy Christie even suspected that Soldak had hit her on the head with a sap, causing her to lose her memory of last night. Moreover, she also had such a splitting headache that she found herself being hit again. Bundling up in his sleeping bag, he asked weakly, What happened last night? Why do I only have half of my memory? Serdak was walking along the hillside towards the heights of the mountain. He was wearing a set of standard armor from the guard camp, and he actually looked a little bit heroic. He heard Darcy's first question after she woke up and decided to tell her the truth. You passed out again, right next to the bonfire. If I hadn't woken up in time, I'm afraid you would have been buried in the belly of a wolf. And then maybe I would he was bitten by these wolves and then escaped with injuries. At this time, Darcy finally remembered some things from last night. And there was a scene in her memory where she fainted. 
She had the kind of straight-tempered attitude of standing upright after being beaten. And said to Soldak, I'm sorry. I didn't expect that. Can you walk by yourself? Soldak asked. Seeing that Darcy Christie didn't say anything. He said, Forget it. Wait until we climb to the top of the mountain. I have to see how to get out. By the way, you are you familiar with the suburbs of Alensis City? This time, Darcy Christie finally said, It should be possible. There is a sand table in the Helensa City area in my father's study. As long as it is near Helensa City, I will definitely be able to identify the sand table in the Helensa City area. Approximate direction. Being able to set up a sand table of Helensa City in his home study. Soldak felt that Darcy's family must be a big noble in Helensa City. Neither of them spoke. They were silent for a while. And the forest was extremely quiet. Only Serdak's feet stepped on the snow. Making a crunching sound. Although there were more than a dozen forest gray wolves following behind him, it seemed that Serdak didn't take them to heart at all. Overnight, the number of wolves decreased by half, and Darcy guessed that Serdak had done something to deal with the wolves. She hesitated for a moment and then said, Night, Serdak. If I can return to the city of Holanza this time, in addition to erasing the grudge between us, I will owe you a favor. Soldak slapped his forehead and thought of Darcy Christie rushing up to her in a fierce manner when she walked into the academy gate looking like she was going to have a fight with him. He felt that he needed to have a serious discussion with Darcy Christie. He did not want to make enemies with an aristocratic lady for no reason, especially if her name was suffixed with Christie. So Serdak said, I don't remember any grudges between us. Darcy Christie snorted lightly. Serdak told her, I have never had any intentions against you young Benna swordsman, but you did not forget to trouble me when you were in hand in our county. I am just a soldier from the battlefield. The soldiers who survived were rewarded by Count Mon Goss and had the honor to become a knight. Now I just want to be able to claim a small fiefdom in the city of Valencia and then build a knight territory properly. Darcy Christie originally wanted to control her temper, but finally she couldn't help it. She said angrily, Huh? She also said that I will never forget that it was you who ruined my life in Benna City. Serdak felt a little baffled. Darcy Christie said angrily, Is it wrong to give up two stupid guys who don't know their own abilities in a desperate situation and escape from the evil ghost with a few partners who are willing to survive together? Hathaway is wrong? And Beatrice wants to be a hero. That's their business. It doesn't mean I have to do the same. In that situation, I just want to survive. Serdak asked speechlessly, But I don't understand. What does this have to do with me? Hathaway and Beatrice became heroes in everyone's eyes. While I became a coward on the battlefield and was laughed at by everyone. Isn't it because of you that they are respected? Darcy Christie said out of reasons. Cernak didn't expect that her resentment came from this. If she hadn't encountered such a dilemma, it would have been really difficult to resolve. That's your own choice. But as you said, I don't think you are a coward. Like you, I escaped from the battlefield. The Battle of Moyenling failed. And almost all my friends died. I am the only one who came back alive. Saldak said. Darcy Christie snorted twice and said bluntly, no wonder Hathaway and Beatrice still miss you after returning to Benna's city. You really know how to say nice things. Then he smiled at Soldak and said, I would suggest you find a time to go to Benna's city to meet them. You may get some unexpected gains. Neither of them are stingy people. Serdak recalled the scene when he passed by the Benna Advanced Swordsman Academy and said, I have never thought about this. And I don't want to disturb their lives. My life is pretty good now. Darcy Christie stared at him in surprise and said, Night Soldak. Has anyone ever told you that you are a little special? Chapter 344 Direction Serdak gasped and stood in the snow. He looked back at the pack of wolves that were quietly approaching. The gray wolves immediately stopped and kept a certain distance from Serdak. But they did not want to leave. The meaning of Special? I don't feel any different from other people. Soldak said to Darcy. As he spoke, he also adjusted the rope tied outside the sleeping bag to prevent Darcy from being strangled by the rope for too long and causing poor blood circulation. Darcy Christie only felt her body jolt twice, and the soft flesh on her chest hit Soldak's solid back hard. She wanted to stretch her hands out of the sleeping bag so that she could be freer. She tried twice, but failed to break free from the shackles of the sleeping bag, wondering whether this guy did it on purpose. Soldak held a wooden stick with one hand and continued to climb up hard. The slope of the hillside was not large, but it was very slippery. He took every step carefully, and he had to look at the wolves following him from time to time. Being able to carry him all the way this far was a testament to his character. Darcy Christie felt a little blushing for a moment 
when she had such thoughts about herself. Darcy Christie continued, If it were other knights who rescued beauties like Hathaway and Beatrice on the battlefield, even if they didn't want any reward, they would at least keep in touch with them. They were born in Benna, the city's noble families. Getting to know them will be of great help to you in your future life. But you just returned to Helensa's city without saying a word. If I hadn't accidentally bumped into you, maybe no one would have known that you were back. Hathaway is the fiancé of Baron Sidney. And Soldak is also considered a knight of Baron Sidney. Because of this relationship, Soldak does not want to get entangled with Hathaway. After all, Sidney the Baron's sister is also the wife of Count Mont Goss. It is sad enough that his brother died in the Plain War. In any case, he will not tolerate any contact between his men and his fiancée. And he had no impression of Beatrice at all. In his impression, Beatrice was just an injured young sword woman. Serdak did not think that she also came from a noble family. Now that Darcy Christie had spoken out, Soldak figured out how in such a circle of friends, their backgrounds could be too ordinary. Of course Soldak would not say that. But now that they were talking about them, Serdak remembered the grudge between Darcy Christie and Hathaway, and asked curiously, Ahem, I heard that you and Hathaway's Sebi was a good friend before. But the reason for their turning against each other was that they met the young nobleman named Cole Norton. I thought Darcy Christie would be a little embarrassed. But instead of avoiding the conversation, the female swordsman also talked about her life in the Bena Advanced Swordsman Academy in detail. She seemed to still miss the life in the academy, and there was nothing embarrassing in his words. I heard her say with resentment, When I was in the academy, every time I attended a party, I would see Cole Norton and a group of friends chatting together. They were all a group of swordsmen with more radical ideas in the academy. The academy has its own club, which is usually known for its warlike nature. That club is an existence that ordinary students of the Swordsman Academy look up to. Many swordsmen hope to join that club. They often get together to discuss plain wars, probably because these remarks made Cole Norton famous in the Academy, and many people in the Academy admired him, including me, of course. Every time we get together, he and some friends like to review the battles of the plain war. They review some failed battles on the plain battlefield. At that time, I also thought about joining their small group, so they would try their best to attend their gatherings. At that time, they put forward an argument in the academy, believing that they could win the plain war as quickly as possible by relying only on the elite legions of the constructed knights and swordsmen to pierce through the main camp of the Dark Legion. Even many instructors in the Swordsman Academy were convinced by them. They have always been very vocal in the Swordsman Academy. I liked him very much at the time and thought that he and his friends might become a brand new team in the Bena Legion. As a new force, I approached him, hoping that he would notice me. In order for us to have a common language, I usually practice swordsmanship diligently, and I also study classic plain war battles, Darcy Christie said with some reluctance. The most unacceptable thing is that that guy obviously knew me first, but he only wants to pursue Hathaway. The topic he talks to me every day is how to get close to Hathaway. Hathaway. And I was the stepping stone for him to get close to Hathaway. At that time, my relationship with Hathaway was not so bad. He was blinded by Hathaway's beauty. I have always thought so. When Darcy Christie said these words, she gritted her teeth. Her mood was a little complicated. And she added, Hathaway's eyes and the noble blood flowing through her body makes her the flower of the Swordsman Academy and also attracts the attention of Cole Norton and a group of young swordsmen around him. I have told him countless times that Hathaway is engaged and her fiancé is Baron Sidney of the 57th Legion of Alensis City. Sydney and I have known each other for a long time. He is very popular in Helensis City. Although Baron Sidney was of ordinary origin, he was a young noble recognized by Count Mon Goss. He believed that Sidney had a very good commanding talent, so he often took him to the dances in Helensis City. It is probably because of Count Mon Goss that Sidney came into the sight of the old nobles in Benna City. But Norton thought it didn't matter at all. The same was true for Hathaway in the college at that time. She was probably dissatisfied with the marriage contract made by the family. She was already engaged, but she still wanted to have an ambiguous relationship with Norton. If there was no Hathaway, Sevi, Norton should be more proactive. But now it seems that not being able to go further with Norton is not a bad thing. Who would have thought that he is a complete dreamer? Serdak soon had a picture in his mind of two beautiful female swordsmen competing for an outstanding male swordsman in the academy. The beautiful female swordsman with a pair of green eyes both in face and figure. They are all better than Darcy Christie. Darcy Christie looks more heroic, taller. Her facial lines look a bit tougher, and her eyes are sharper. 
Saldek said with some sigh. Is this the reason why you and Hathaway turned against each other? Darcy Christie asked. What else can we do? In Saldek's view, just because of their competitive nature, they may be destined to be lifelong enemies. Then do you still have contact with Norton? Saldek asked. He was about to climb to the top of the mountain. He straightened up and took a breath. There were beads of sweat on his forehead. He wanted to find a place with a wide view. Only that kind of place could more easily observe the surrounding terrain. Darcy Christie smiled and said, Why should I contact him? Everyone chose the Warsaw plane for graduation experience. When we were in the academy, in order to get such a spot, I don't know how many people fought over it. But when everyone arrived after Epsom City, that guy Cole Norton started to make all kinds of excuses and refused to step into the front line. At first, I didn't realize there was anything wrong with it. Later I realized that that guy was simply a coward. Hell, there was a great battle going on in Handenar County at that time. And he didn't even dare to leave Handenar City. She didn't have any mood swings when she said this. And she seemed to have given up completely on Cole Norton. For young nobles like Cole Norton, Soldak could understand their difficulties. Because even Baron Sidney, who Darcy Christie said sounded outstanding, did not perform so satisfactorily on the battlefield. When he was in the forest camp, he led the 4th Brigade into the forest area to encircle and suppress the local indigenous people, and almost half of them were killed or injured by the traps set by the indigenous people. After Cole Norton entered the Warsaw Plain and felt the cruelty of the plain battlefield, many of the ideas he had built up in his heart were shattered like bubbles. All his confidence was shattered by reality. How could he still have the courage to enter the battlefield at that time? Front. Serdak comforted him. The knowledge learned in the academy may not be completely transferable to the battlefield. Sometimes you have to give him a growth process. Why are you speaking for him? Darcy Christie asked in surprise. You must know that in the city of Hindenar, Cole Norton often caused trouble for Serdak. Normally, the two should be enemies on opposite sides. Did I? I'm just discussing the matter. Soldak felt that his bowl of chicken soup for the soul seemed to have no effect on Darcy Christie. Climbing to the top of the mountain, Serdak found a large raised rock, but the rock was covered with a thick layer of snow, making it somewhat difficult to climb. After making some preparations, Soldak used his hands and feet to carry Darcy Christie up the shale rock that was more than three meters high. He had a panoramic view of the rolling hills nearby. Soldak was incomparable. He could clearly see the valley he had just walked through and he happened to be walking out from that direction. As for the group of forest gray wolves, they are still following from a distance. It is said that wolves are very vengeful beasts. Although they are unwilling to pounce on them, they are not willing to give up like this. They will even howl a few times and kill them. The small beasts in this mountain forest were scared away, leaving Serdak unable to hunt. They seem to have used this tactic to drive away many opponents who were stronger than them. Because of the snow, the mountain scenery in the distance was a bit dazzling. Many iconic mountains were covered with ice and snow. It seemed a little difficult to identify them. Darcy Christie looked at Saldak's back for a long time. But she couldn't tell what was here. Specific location. Unable to see the city of Aranza, Saldak looked for any villages within sight. He squinted and looked around. But everything was covered under the white snow. And there were only pine forests in his eyes. After a while, Darcy Christie said a little discouraged. The mountains are covered with snow. It's impossible to identify them. It seemed that she had talked too much before. And now she couldn't recognize it. Which made Darcy Christie a little embarrassed to say it. However, the two of them had been blowing the cold wind on the shale for so long. And Darcy Christie felt that there was no point in continuing to read. Then she told Soldak with some frustration that she couldn't recognize where this place was. Soldak scratched his hair helplessly. Feeling that Darcy Christie was really a big-breasted and brainless woman. After looking at it for so long. He just wanted to find some special mountains around and identify the specific location. But he neglected to use the elimination method to determine the general location here based on environmental factors. He tried his best to climb up and couldn't leave without gaining anything. At this time, he could only say in a seductive manner, I'm afraid there aren't many mountains with such gentle slopes around the city of Alanza. Right. Darcy Christie shook her head and told Soldak that there were mountains with this kind of terrain all over the outskirts of Alanza. Serdak said bluntly. I don't think the terrain is like this at least in the northwest area of Valencia City. It's a barren land close to the Paglos Mountains. The further you go out, the more sparse the forest land becomes. To the north, there are stretches of forest in the mountainous area. Even in the suburbs, most of the vast mountain forests are oak forests. 
and gold and silver acorns are the biggest specialty of Valencia City. Maybe you should know that the noble leader of Valencia City owns such a large red pine forest. After changing her thinking angle, Darcy Christie's eyes instantly lit up. She said loudly, I know where this is. This is the red pine forest on the eastern outskirts of Valencia City. It is the territory of Baron Grenfell. This is his forest farm. If you go further east, you will reach Constantine. Fort, if we want to go back to Alanza City, we have to go west. Baron Grenfell. Serdak didn't expect such an answer. He should have thought of it a long time ago. After all, he had known for a long time that Baron Grenfell was colluding with the Black Magic Priory. The Black Magic Priory built its secret stronghold in Glenfell. It is not difficult to understand in Baron Eyre's domain. Once you know the general location and determine the direction of Holanza City, everything becomes much simpler. Then the two came down from the shale and found a shelter. Soldak began to prepare lunch, and Darcy Christie relied on her own memory to draw a rough regional topographic map on the snow, and even marked it. The location of Baron Grenfell's manor indicates that Baron Grenfell is a very hospitable nobleman. They first went to Baron Grenfell's manor to seek help. After hearing this, Soldak quickly shook his head and rejected Darcy Christie's proposal. Joke. Wouldn't that mean that you have fallen into a trap and walked into a den of thieves? I guess those guys from the Black Magic Monastery can't find us. So they will inevitably look for us along the way. Perhaps Baron Grenfell's manor will be their key surveillance area. No matter what the purpose of the Black Magic Monastery is. In short, we it is safer to rush back to Helensa City as soon as possible. Soldek explained to Darcy Christie. Although Darcy Christie still wanted to go to Grenfell Manor. Seeing Soldak's resolute attitude, she didn't say anything more after a few arguments. The two had a simple lunch on the top of the mountain. Serdak had already begun to consider whether to hunt a forest gray wolf. Although the wolf meat was not very tasty. At least it could fill his stomach. Chapter 345 Village The sunset at dusk shows an orange-red color on the horizon. After being shrouded by the spider-like gray clouds on the side of the mountain, it became even darker. A wisp of smoke curled up from the valley in front, and was then blown away by the cold wind. Seeing the wisp of smoke, Serdak felt happy, thinking that he could finally see the breath of life. Where there is smoke, there is means inhabited. He carried Darcy Christie on his back and walked in the mountains for nearly three days. When he saw the smoke, he breathed a sigh of relief, ran a few steps higher, and looked at the place where the smoke was coming from. Sure enough, I saw a low wooden house in a mountain call not far away. Next to the wooden house was a dense red pine forest. The roof was piled with snow. The windows of the wooden house were very small, and there was no light. The whole house, it is almost closely connected with the snow. If it were not for the smoke column, Serdak might not be able to find this house. Serdak walked a few dozen meters further, and the mountain call in front of him became wider. More than a dozen wooden houses were scattered in this mountain call, forming a small natural village. It looked like a forest farm. The village there are piles of round timber next to it. And behind the village is a continuous forest of red pine trees. Soldak reached out and patted the sleeping bag. And said to Darcy Christie, who was hiding inside. Hey, wake up. There is a village ahead. Maybe we can stay here for one night instead of camping in the snow and freezing. Darcy Christie opened her eyes and got her head out of the sleeping bag. She looked much better than before. She glanced at the small mountain village in the distance and said with some expectation. Maybe we can have a bowl of hot food at night. Steaming bowls of oatmeal and sleeping in a warm, soft bed. She put her head on Soldak's back through the sleeping bag. She closed her eyes and quietly felt the rare silence. I don't know when it started. A strange emotion arose in Darcy's heart, like a strong sense of dependence. She felt that she might be really sick. How could she miss such a life of running away? Is it really that life in Helensa City has been too peaceful these days? Or I just like this kind of adventure? No one of the great adventurer Angus. Bradbury could swim in the seven seas. She is also a swordsmanship instructor at the Knight Academy. As a female swordsman, her physical fitness is much better than that of ordinary people. In fact, in her current state, she can walk on her own, but she would rather be tied up in a sleeping bag. Here, lying on Soldak's back, it was not that she was too lazy to walk, but that she had an inexplicable emotion in her heart and wanted to stay behind him for a while longer. The barking of hunting dogs came from the village, and the forest gray wolf following Soldak finally disappeared silently into the red pine forest. Serdak walked into the pine forest nearby, untied the rope on the sleeping bag, 
and let Darcy sit under the tree to rest. After making sure that the forest wolves would not come to the door at this time, he explained to Darcy, who looked confused. Road, I will hide you here first, and then go check the situation in that village. If there is no problem, I will come back to pick you up. After all, this is the territory of Baron Grinfell, and we have been suspecting him in connection with the attack on Alinsa. There is collusion among the gangsters in the noble manor outside the city. Now there are various signs that the secret stronghold of the Black Magic Monastery is also located in his barony. Maybe when we return to Hellanza City this time, Carl can apply for a noble search. Make. Darcy Christie said nervously, otherwise we should sleep outside. As long as we walk in this direction, it won't take long for us to return to Alinsa City. The two of them have enough food for at least one day. As long as the forest wolves don't follow them, they should be able to catch some small animals in the forest and come back. Serdak shook his head and said, If there are no problems in this village, we can stay in a warm house for one night. This is worth taking a little risk. Seeing that Soldak had already made up his mind, Darcy had no choice but to say, Then be careful. Serdak made a victory gesture to Darcy, smiled at her and said, It's not Darcy at all. You should say, Go ahead. Night. Darcy Christie reached out of her sleeping bag and shook her fist at him. Soldak hid Darcy Christie in the red pine forest outside the village, walked to the entrance of the village alone, and walked out of the village several hunters carrying hardwood hunting bows. They were wearing thick fur coats. This gray-white color of the fur coats allowed them to blend in with the snowy scenery outdoors. They looked at Soldak with vigilance, knowing that they could clearly see the full cover armor and the front guard battalion badge on his chest. And their expressions were tense somewhat relaxed. It was a small village. Most of the houses were wooden houses, covered with thick snow. Several hounds followed the hunters and barked twice at Serdak. But as Sue Erdak kept walking in, and the hunting dogs became quiet, the burly man standing at the front was probably the most powerful person in the village. He saluted Soldak without being humble or condescending, and asked very politely, Master Knight, where do you come from? When Serdak got closer, he realized that these hunters were followed by some older children with curious eyes. They were also wearing thick fur coats. It seemed that the life of the villagers here was much more comfortable than that of the villagers in Wall Village. After all, they are surrounded by a forest. Serdak performed a standard nightly ceremony. Seeing that Serdak was so humble, the villagers' expressions obviously softened a lot. Serdak said, I came from the city of Alanza. In this mountain, I'm lost. Do you know the way back to Alanza City? The burly hunter nodded slightly and said, Of course, but now I think you need to sit by the fireplace, drink some hot soup, and have a good night's rest. Our best hunter will take you out tomorrow morning. This place is not far from Halanza City, but the mountains are blocked by heavy snow, and the road to Halanza City is not easy to walk, especially at night. Seeing that the burly hunter was very hospitable and frank, Soldek smiled and said, This is exactly what I need. I want to stay here for one night. Is it convenient? Of course. Please come in. I've just filled the fireplace with firewood. The burly hunter quickly invited. Serdak said, I still have a companion outside the village. She was slightly injured. I will bring her over. After Soldak carried Darcy Christie back from outside the village, the burly hunter and an older child invited the two of them into a small wooden house. This wooden house was very solidly built, with smoke coming from the chimney next to it smoke green smoke. When they walked to the door of the wooden house, the door of the wooden house was pushed open, and a middle-aged woman poked her head out from inside, looking at Soldak and Darcy Christie curiously. Chapter 346 Return Serdak and Darcy Christie had a pot of pheasant stewed with mushrooms for dinner. Regarding this delicious dinner, the ingredients were provided by the Agra family, and it was Serdak who cooked the delicious dinner. It was paired with a few pieces of chestnut cake baked by Agra's wife and was thoroughly eaten by Serdak, Darcy Christie, and the Agra family. Although the Agra family often eats this kind of pheasant, and the pine forests outside are full of red mushrooms, and the family often cooks mushroom soup, this is the first time for the son of Agra to taste this kind of stew. Holding his round belly, he whispered to his mother, It turns out that pheasant and dried mushrooms can actually make such a delicious soup. Judging from his age, he probably hasn't participated in the coming-of-age ceremony yet but he has an obvious Adam's apple under his neck and a thick layer of down on his lips. He looks to be at least 14 or 15 years old, and his face is almost the same as that of Agra. He was carved out of the same mold, 
sitting quietly next to his wife and Agra, looking a little shy. He would occasionally look at Darcy Christie's sword with envy, and he couldn't hide the curiosity in his heart. After Darcy Christie drank some hot soup, she became much more energetic. She was no longer as sickly as before. Her lips became rosy, and she looked very energetic. The Agra family regarded them as an eloping couple. When arranging a place to stay, Agra said, Night, Soldak. You and Darcy will stay in Jacques's room tonight. Jacques will squeeze in with us. One night, I will help you borrow a carriage to come back tomorrow morning, and we will set off after dawn. If the journey goes smoothly, we only need to walk for one day to get back to Alanza City. In fact, there are only two rooms in this wooden house, and the room allocated to the two of them only has a narrow single wooden bed. However, the conditions here are like this. Serdak can only smile and say, in this case, then thank you so much. Darcy Christie leaned against the fireplace, her face turning slightly red under the warmth of the fire. Nothing happened at night. Darcy Christie was lying on the wooden bed of her son in Agra. Serdak built a simple bed with a few wooden boards in the room, and then lay down silently. In the sleeping bag, he had not had a solid sleep in the past few days, and fell asleep quickly as soon as he lay down. Darcy Christie slept too much during the day, so she couldn't sleep at night, especially when she was lying on a strange bed. She didn't recognize the bed. The wooden boards on this wooden bed were very hard, and the bed underneath the cushions were not as soft as velvet at home and the linen quilt was far less comfortable than Soldak's sleeping bag. She lay on the bed and turned over gently. The room was dark, but she could still find it accurately. The position where Serdak lay. She tossed and turned for a while, and vaguely heard dogs barking again outside the village. Then she dreamed that she was sleeping in a sleeping bag, with her face pressed against Soldak's broad back. In the golden sunshine, Serdak tied her up tightly, carried her on his shoulders arrogantly and took her to an unknown place. Just under the dazzling sunlight, she woke up on the wooden bed and found that it was broad daylight. The wooden bed set up in the room had been put away by Serdak, and no one else was in the room. There was the sound of him and Agra outside the room. There were voices, followed by the neighing of horses. She put the smelly linen quilt over her head in annoyance. After a night's rest in the mountain village, Darcy Christie's fever subsided after drinking chicken soup, and her whole body became obviously energetic. After eating a bowl of rough chestnut porridge, Agra took the only carriage in the village and drove following Soldak and Darcy Christie. They left this mountain village and rushed to the city of Halinsa along a mountain road with basically no footprints. Although Serdak never mentioned expressing his gratitude to the Agra family, Darcy Christie knew that he secretly hid an old Roman sword and an old Roman sword under the mattress of his son's bed in Agra. A brand new dagger and an alloy bow. Only when Agra returns to the village will he discover Serdak's gratitude. Darcy Christie was sitting in the carriage. She was also wearing a thick black cloak. This was the winter coat issued by the knights in the guard camp. It also smelled of fabric batik. She turned over three passes in succession against the north wind. On the hill, the outline of Alensa City slowly appeared in the field of vision. And Darcy Christie felt a little disappointed in her heart. Soldak stood at the gate of the guard camp wearing full armor his dirty face covered with stubble, looking at Carl with a smile as he walked out of the guard camp leading his horse and gave him a familiar smile. Say H, lo. Carl could hardly believe that Serdak could actually come back alive under such circumstances because the black magician from the Black Magic Monastery took away Darcy Christie. No one noticed the black magician. The division's initial motive was actually to capture Knight Serdak. The fact that Darcy Christie was abducted by the black magician of the Black Magic Priory at the gate of the Knights Academy made the governor of Valencia City, Marquis Christie, furious, thinking that this was the Black Magic Priory plotting against Valencia City. Imagine if the Black Magic Priory really develops all the young nobles in Valencia into members of the Priory. And 10 or 20 years later, these young nobles truly take control of Valencia. Then this city will probably will be under the control of the Black Magic Priory, which is terrifying if you think about it. As a result, the death of the noble boy Vic triggered a strong resistance among the nobles against the Black Magic Monastery, and a new round of purges began in the city of Valenza. For a long time, the traditional aristocratic forces in the city of Valenza had not actually resisted the Black Magic Priory. They only think that the people in the Black Magic Priory are just betrayers in the Magic Union who betrayed the Magic Oath. He studied Black Magic in pursuit of more powerful power, and among them were some madmen and some paranoid people but the harm to the city of Halanza was never shown. 
It has always been the responsibility of the Magic Union Law Enforcement Group to eliminate members of the Black Magic Monastery. In addition, there are still some disputes over interests between the old nobles and the new magician nobles in Helensa City. This is why the traditional nobles of Helensa City have never the main reason for providing this information to the Magic Guild Law Enforcement Group. In the past few days, the city of Aranza was almost searched by the knights from the guard camp and the mages from the Magic Union Law Enforcement Group. Unfortunately, Samoa could not be found from the city. But Carl has already obtained a search warrant for the nobles. Baron Grinfell has been controlled by the Magic Union Law Enforcement Group in Helensa City. Carl wants to go out with a group of men so late at night. In fact, he is preparing to go to Grinfell. Phil Manor went to capture the gang of bandits hiding in the manor. This time it was a joint operation between the security battalion and the law enforcement group. The Magic Union would also send a team of magicians. Unexpectedly, Serdak could catch up with the search operation. Carl did not wait for Serdak to explain how he returned to Alinsa City. It seemed that he had no injuries on his body and was still wearing a full coverage suit. Standing upright in armor at the gate of the guard camp, he immediately ordered his men to go to the stables, bring out Serdak's ancient horse, and take him directly with him on the road. After all, things like wiping out noble estates and arresting gangs of robbers might not happen every few years. The rest doesn't matter, but there are only a few ways to obtain meritorious service in the guard camp. If you miss it, you really have missed it. Chapter 347 The Night Before Under the night, a group of cavalry walked through the gate of Alinsa into the snow-capped mountains. Carl led ten squads of the rescue squadron, a total of sixty knights, as the advance army and rushed to Grinfell Manor. During this time, Carl had been quietly investigating Baron Grinfell. He had four teams squatting outside the manor day and night to monitor the actions inside. The four teams that serve as monitors rotate every week. And until now, there are knights from the support group still standing outside Grinfell Manor. And Sauron Aldington will lead the knights of the guard battalion to Grinfell Manor at noon tomorrow. For the knights in the support group, this collective merit can be said to be within easy reach. Carl ignored Serdak's exhausted body and forced him to act together, just to let him get this meritorious service. The two rode ancient Bolai horses on the mountain road side by side. Serdak told Carl about his encounter with the black magician. Serdak said, When I woke up, I found myself lying behind the handle of the magic pot. The black magician was flying at night on the magic harpoon and didn't notice me waking up. I took the opportunity to pull out the dagger and hit him on the black magician's vest. As a result, we fell off the magic harpoon. Did you bring Darcy back safely? Carl heard the news about Darcy Christie and excitedly pulled the reins. The ancient horse under him suddenly raised its front hooves and stood on the spot. Let out a neighing sound. He excitedly said to Soldak, When Mrs. Christie met me this morning, she also cried to me that her niece Darcy was kidnapped by the black magician of the black magic monastery. She asked me to do more investigation, and we will provide support. The group will set off overnight tonight just to investigate the clues to the Black Magic Hermitage as early as possible. Then Carl complained about Serdak's luck, and said to Serdak with some envy, Sometimes I have to admire your courage and luck. Just imagine that in the dark night, a black magician rushes across the sky, flying. But you actually killed him without knowing your life or death. And you didn't even get hurt when you fell from the air? Serdak chuckled banged the shield on his arm hard, and said, Fortunately, my dwarf chain shield was hung on a fir tree at that time. So you didn't see these scratches on my face? Hurt? No. Carl stopped where he was, and looked at Soldak's face seriously. His face was covered with messy stubble. The two of them rode a few steps forward before Carl said, No matter what, Consul Christie owes you a favor this time. Serdak touched the soft mane of the ancient bolai horse and asked Carl, By the way, how did you find my horse? Carl told Soldak. Later, someone found your horse in an alley, and we took it back to the guard camp. As for the craftsman's sword, you left it in the night academy. Fortunately, it was then everyone present fell into a deep sleep, and there were many people lying at the door of the swordsman academy. When the knights from the guard camp and the Magic Union law enforcement team entered, your craftsman's sword had not been picked up yet. After Carl finished speaking, he began to urge the knights who were lagging behind urging them to follow the team closely. It was not until he saw Jasper who was falling at the back of the team that he ordered him. Captain Jasper, stay behind and urge them. The straggler knights followed up. The mountain road at night was already difficult to walk, but we didn't expect it to catch up with the snow. Don't worry. I'll be standing behind 
and I'll make sure no one is missing. Jasper lifted up his helmet visor, revealing a gloomy and heroic face. Although the two of them are considered competitors, when the support group takes action, everything must follow the rules. At this time, everyone is definitely on the same page. It was completely dark. The knights and the team lit torches and lined up a long fire dragon on the mountain road. At this time, the knight walking at the front suddenly stopped, and the entire support squadron stopped on the mountain road. Carl led Suldak from the side and rushed to the front of the team. As Carl rode on horseback, he explained to Suldak, This search of Grenfell Manor is a joint operation between the security battalion and the Magic Union Law Enforcement Group. We will meet up with the arrogant guys from the Law Enforcement Group later. Then go to Grenfell Park together. From a distance, I saw three magicians wearing magic robes waiting at the fork in the road with stern faces and looking very unhappy, seeing Carl riding a horse and catching up from behind in a hurry. The magician guarding the middle of the intersection raised his chin high and said to Carl impatiently, Carl, your guard camp is still as slow as ever. We have been waiting for you here for a long time. I am afraid you will never understand how precious a magician's time is. Before departure, I was still conducting an academic research in the laboratory of the Magic Guild and you actually asked me to have been waiting for you here for two quarters of an hour. Carl rode up to the young magician on horseback, looked at him condescendingly, but said to him kindly, Lance, long time no see. He looks pretty good lately. The magician named Lance was not riding a magic harpoon. He had three horses tied to a big tree on the roadside. Seeing the knights from the guard camp coming over, the three magicians also got on their horses one after another. Lance was still chattering to Carl. Our law enforcement team is running around for the remnants of the Black Magic Monastery every day. If your guard camp had taken such action earlier, the situation in Helensa City would never have deteriorated to this point. Kind of degree. Carl glanced at Lance and only said, Now is not the time to talk about this. Lance, instead of wasting time here, it is better to hurry up and hurry up. And maybe you can find some clues you are looking for in Grenfell Manor. After hearing what Carl said, the young magician Lance just snorted softly in his nasal voice and stopped talking. Carl smiled and nodded slightly to the two magicians beside Lance, saying a simple H, low, and said, It's really not the right time to snow this time. Lance obviously just wanted to vent to Carl, but now he didn't want to say another word. He only said to his two companions, Humph! Let's go! The two magicians looked at each other and gave Carl a slightly apologetic and awkward smile. Carl fell behind and whispered to Soldek. Lance and I have known each other since childhood. This guy has become a bit arrogant and rude since the magician awakened. Everyone is used to his way of speaking. He is currently a member of the law enforcement team of the Magic Guild of Helensa City. The support group led by Carl opened the way in front, protecting the three magicians in the middle, and the group rushed to Grenfell Manor overnight. The first half of the mountain road happened to be the road that the hunter Agra walked during the day. Serdak was sitting in the carriage at that time. And now, he is almost returning the same way. Serdak is extremely familiar with this section of the road. But halfway through the journey, Carl led the knights onto another mountain road. Finally, at midnight, nearly 40 knights from the rescue squadron and three magicians from the law enforcement team arrived at Grenfell Manor and met with the guards. The other three teams of the rescue squadron gathered outside the manor, in a camp about two kilometers away from Grenfell Manor. Carl set up a temporary camp here. In addition to Carl, and the three magicians from the law enforcement team. The ten captains of the support squadron and Suldek were also crowded in this camp. Inside the not-so-big tent, the cold wind blew in and made the charcoal brazier inside the tent pop. The temperature inside the tent was not much higher than outside. The metal armors on the knights were covered with a light layer of white frost. Everyone surrounded Carl. Without much nonsense, Carl directly laid out a detailed map of Grenfell Manor on the ground. With detailed markings on it, the various building layouts inside and outside the manor, and the manor guards were drawn very neatly on the map. And the handwriting on it was also very beautiful. It looked more like it was written by a woman. Soldak knew that Mrs. Christie had gone to Grenfell Manor in person to find out what was going on here a few days ago, and thought that perhaps it was Carl's bedfellow who contributed such a detailed map of the manor. In any case, this was enough to prove that Carl be fully prepared for this operation. Carl said to everyone with a serious face, Recently, through our series of investigations, multiple sources of evidence indicate that the bandits who looted Bragg Manor, Ochilek Manor, and Hoyle Manor are hiding in Grenfell Manor. Now we have obtained with the authorization of the Hellanza Council, 
as long as we wait until noon tomorrow. This Count Sauron Aldington will lead a large force of the Guard Battalion over, and by then, we will conduct a comprehensive search of the manor. Only then did Soldak know that it turned out that tonight was just to prevent any emergencies at Grenfell Manor. So he rushed over earlier to strengthen the supervision force. The real action will be carried out tomorrow. Carl glanced around with a cold face and said in a deep voice, What we have to do now is to block all the roads here. The magicians of the law enforcement group will cooperate with us to block the sky. The magician headed by Lance stood up and nodded implicitly to the captains of the guard camp. In the eyes of the knights, these stinky magicians always had dead faces wherever they went. They were very unhappy. It's pleasant, but I have to admit that their existence greatly ensures the safety of the knights in the support squadron. The young magician Lance took out a magic treasure box from his magic pocket and opened the lid. Inside was a whole box of specially made magic flares. He distributed these magic flares to the team captains and warned, Any of the situation cannot be solved. Send out magic flares to request reinforcements and I will send people to support depending on the situation. These magic flares can only be used in critical moments. Once used, we will be completely exposed to the eyes of our opponents. Now let me arrange the guard tasks. Carl ordered the ten team captains. Every team, pay attention. First, teams three and four are responsible for blocking the gate of Grenfell Manor. Be careful to stay hidden and try not to be noticed by people in the manor. You must intercept all messengers whether they are entering from the outside or coming out of the manor. Give us control. Then, he looked at Jasper again, paused before saying, Captain Jasper, you are responsible for leading teams 5 and 6 to guard the west side of Grenfell Manor. Pay attention to the side door there, the path leading to the vineyard. Jasper breathed white, nodded to Carl and said, Okay, I will pay special attention. The rescue squadron made very detailed arrangements. On such a cold snowy night, Sixty knights stood guard outside Grenfell Manor. It was not until the next morning that the leading knights of the guard battalion arrived one after another. When Captain Sauron Aldington led three hundred knights from the guard battalion to stop in front of the gate outside the manor. Grenfell Manor was finally aware of the trends outside. The gate of the manor was closed tightly. And as if like a formidable enemy, the lookout behind the manor gate was crowded with archers. The guard battalion dispatched nearly three hundred knights from the guard battalion this time. Carl led sixty knights from the support group as the main executor to enter the manor to search. Captain Sauron Aldington was wearing an exquisite set of constructed armor and stood in front of the gate of Grenfell Manor. Next to him were the squadron captains who came with him. It is said that there were fifteen more people traveling with him this time. There are magicians from the law enforcement corps, but they have not appeared yet. A group of people walked out of the manor, headed by a dignified lady. Behind her stood several young people, both men and women, all dressed in gorgeous aristocratic clothes, and they all looked like this lady. There are some similarities. They should be the children of this noble lady. Soldak guessed that she should be the mistress of Grenfell Manor. Now Baron Grenfell has been secretly controlled in the city of Valenza, and the man of the person in charge is naturally Mrs. Grenfell. Everyone, it is extremely rude for you to break into Grenfell Manor like this. Mrs. Grenfell stared at Viscount Sauron and the group of knights behind him with a frosty face, and said sternly, this Count Sauron did not speak, but Carl on the side took two steps forward, took out a parchment scroll in his hand, unfolded it in front of Mrs. Grenfell, and said, Madam, we have obtained a search warrant signed by the Parliament. We have evidence that there are three gangs of robbers involved in the robbery of the noble manor lurking in your manor. After the unanimous decision of the Hellanza Council, the guard camp has the right to search your manor. Please cooperate accordingly. This is simply a big joke. How can Grenfell Manor hide a gang of robbers? This is a slander against the Grenfell family. I will write to Archduke Newman to expose the unreasonable actions of your guard camp in Helensa City. Action. Mrs. Grenfell's face turned pale with anger, but she counterattacked without any weakness. It was a bit cold outside the manor, and several teenagers and children who had hurriedly walked out of the manor in noble clothes were shivering with cold, and some even had runny noses. Chapter 348 The Meat Case in the Storage Room the knights of the rescue squadron ignored the obstruction of the manor guards, knocked over two guards with their sword hilts, and forced their way into Grenfell Manor. Mrs. Grenfell turned pale with anger. She could barely stand up with the help of the housekeeper and maid. A group of guards in the manor were pushed away by the knights of the guard camp. A burly captain of the guard came from Mrs. Grenfell. Standing up from behind, he rushed directly in front of the knights in the guard camp, knocking the knights in metal armor off their feet like a wild bull. 
The two squadron captains in the guard camp immediately pulled out their crimson swords from their waists and ran towards the captain of the guard in the manor. The knights outside the manor drew the long bows in their hands to full strings and the cold arrows aiming at the guards in the manor. They were just waiting for Captain Sauron's order to shoot the guards, who dared to resist. That's enough. Edgar, stand down. Mrs. Grenfell yelled at the captain of the guard. Stop letting innocent people bleed. Upon hearing Lady Grenfell's order, the captain of the guard immediately stopped, dropped the short stick in his hand on the ground, and spread his hands. The knights of the guard camp, who had been knocked to the ground, got up angrily from the ground. One of them skillfully took out a rope from his arms, and several of them rushed up together to tie up the guard captain named Edgar. Really tied up. Captain Sauron waved his hand and asked the knights surrounding the manor to put away their alloy bows. When the danger was lifted, some manor guards emerged from the bushes. They raised their hands to express that they would not will make any resistance. On the other hand, the strong bodyguard captain, even though he was tied up with ropes, was still a little dishonest. He was knocked to the ground by four knights from the guard camp with hammers, and his forehead and left arm were bruised by the hammers. When Carl came to Mrs. Grenfell's side, he expressed his apology to her, and then waved to his knights. The knights in the rescue squadron walked into Grenfell Manor and started searching. Since the knights of the support squadron have been guarding outside Grenfell Manor for nearly more than a month, the most talked about is the speculation about the use of many buildings in the manor. Now that there is a chance to reveal the answer, these knights of the support squadron can't wait. Ran over and looked at those buildings. The children in Grenfell Manor were very sensible. They were shivering in the cold wind and their faces turned blue. But they still said nothing. Angrily, Mrs. Grenfell was helped by the housekeeper and made to rest in the lobby on the first floor of the villa. Eleven aristocratic children followed Mrs. Grenfell into the hall with dull expressions. Like wooden sculptures. Standing behind Mrs. Grenfell, there was neither anger nor sadness on their faces as if someone had cast a spell of silence. Mrs. Grenfell showed no concern for these children. Instead, her eyes frequently fell on the bruised and bruised captain of the guard. Serdak noticed that her hands were clenched tightly into fists. Her long nails were embedded in her palms. And some of her fingernails had turned bright red. Carl went straight to the kitchen of the manor villa and found the entrance to a basement. A group of knights holding swords and shields surrounded the door. Carl ordered the pale butler, Open this basement. The housekeeper did not dare to disobey Carl's order. Without saying a word, he took out a bunch of copper keys from his waist and opened the large wooden door of the basement. A dark corridor was revealed from the door. Carl made a gesture to the knights around him. With a wink, a knight first threw a torch inside. The flickering torch was thrown into the basement, and a clear sound of landing was heard. The basement was very quiet. A bold knight held up a shield with both hands and bravely walked in through the door. After a while, the knight's voice came from the basement. My lord, there is nothing in there. Carl's expression changed slightly. He looked at Soldak, and then led the people into the basement. The basement of Grenfell Manor is actually empty. In the huge basement, not only is there no sign of a robber, but there are also no sundries or supplies. The slate floor has been cleaned cleanly, and you can even hear sound while walking in the basement. Echo. In this basement, Carl could not find any trace of habitation. He walked up from the basement without saying a word. The night captains of other teams came over one after another. Beside Carl? Carl asked. Storage room? Water prison? How about the stables and animal pens? Nothing was found. Several night commanders replied one after another. The search warrant issued by the Hellanza Council was based on the clue that the bandits were hiding in Grenfell Manor. If the bandits were not found in the manor, not only would Carl be in big trouble, but even the guard camp would be changed. They were extremely passive. This search operation was requested by Carl. And many strong evidences were also produced by Carl. Originally, everyone was just waiting to rush into the manor and pull these robbers out of the basement. But now it seems that things are not that simple. Carl glanced at the night captains. Even Jasper's face looked very ugly at this moment. Carl said in a deep voice, Follow me to the upper floor of the castle to take a look. The knights in the guard camp wanted to search the upper floors of the castle and drove a group of maids and servants in the castle to the hall on the first floor. Except for the captain of the guard, who was beaten to a black and bruised face. None of these servants were too conspicuous. There are no scars. There is no murderous intent in his eyes. And there are no calluses on the inside of his legs from riding horses for a long time. It is impossible for him to be a robber who has been hiding and changing his identity. 
This Count Sauron was sitting in the hall of Zhuang Yuan Castle. And the atmosphere in the hall was freezing cold. Mrs. Grinfell stared coldly at the knights in the guard camp in the hall without saying a word. The eleven children behind her simply lowered their heads. A row of maids and a row of servants including cooks, gardeners, grooms, and gardeners. After separating the left and right sides. Not long after, the knights from the support squadron ran down from upstairs and said to Carl, Lieutenant Carl, no suspicious robbers were found upstairs. Carl frowned slightly. Grinfell Manor had been searched inside and outside, but not even a robber was seen. Probably all the knights in the rescue squadron were filled with question marks. Why? Will this happen? At this time, Mrs. Grinfell, who had been sitting in the castle hall, suddenly raised her head. With a sly look in her eyes, and an extremely resentful look on her face, and screamed at Captain Sauron. I, I will go to Consul Christie to complain about your atrocities, and I will sue you bastards. Captain Sauron raised his head and glanced at Mrs. Grinfell disdainfully, and then looked at Carl sternly. He told him, Since there is no room for change. Carl, why are you still standing here? Search again carefully for me. Today I will dig down three feet to find these bandits. Yes, Captain Sauron. Carl said a knight salute and immediately strode out of the castle hall. Soldak followed Carl, turned around and walked outside with Carl. At this time, Mrs. Grinfell was staring at the magic belt on Soldak's waist. The moment Soldak turned around, the hatred in his eyes was difficult to conceal. Soldak stopped as if he was aware of it. He turned back to look at Mrs. Grinfell and found that she was sitting upright on the sofa, looking straight ahead, as if she had not moved at all. Carl, and the ten captains of the support squadron came outside the castle and carefully searched the buildings around the castle inside and out again. However, it seemed that the bandits had never appeared in the manor at all. At this time, everyone realized the seriousness of the matter. The expressions on their faces were not very good looking, and there was a strong smell of gunpowder when they spoke to their men. Carl sat on the stone platform beside the pool in the manor square, patted his forehead vigorously, and said to everyone, Maybe our thinking is not right. After all, there are so many robbers, and they cannot disappear into thin air. In the past month, Jasper has been keeping an eye on Greenfield Manor for most of the month, and he has provided several pieces of strong evidence. At this time, he also knew that if these bandits could not be found, what serious consequences would be waiting for them? And his face became increasingly gloomy. Do you have a detailed delivery list for Grinfell Manor? Soldek suddenly asked. Here I am. One of the captains quickly took out a sheepskin book from his arms and handed it to Soldak. Soldak carefully flipped through the parchment book. When he first started monitoring Grinfell Manor, the data on the parchment book had almost no change, but it gradually decreased later on. Soldak frowned and said, I think we have overlooked an issue. The demand for food at Grinfell Manor seems to have been decreasing recently. It seems that no more supplies have been delivered to the castle in the past few days. So those bandits should have been gradually transferred out. Hearing what Soldek said, several team leaders in the support squadron were a little embarrassed. They hurriedly patted their chests and said, Our people have been staring at this place. Unless we chop them into pieces, they will be like this. There is no way they can escape our sight. Carl's eyes suddenly widened at this time. As if he remembered something, he waved his hands and said to the team leaders around him, Wait, chop it into pieces. Maybe the answer is here. These bandits are probably dead. And it was chopped into pieces of meat. Just now I thought why there were so many blood stains on the butcher table in the kitchen storage room. It was like a slaughterhouse. All the meat at Grinfell Manor was supplied by outside farms. There is no need to slaughter on sight. So so much blood is probably from those robbers. We should go there to look for it again. Jasper continued beside him. Carl said to a team leader, Go outside the manor and bring in two hunting dogs. Maybe they will tell us the answer. A group of knights from the support squadron hurriedly walked in from outside the hall with two hunting dogs, and walked straight towards the kitchen behind the castle. The knight's steps were very firm, causing the maids and servants to look at these knights frequently. When he was just searching, Soldak didn't come to the kitchen. He just stood at the basement entrance outside the kitchen for a short time. At this time, after he walked into the kitchen, he already discovered something was wrong, because the kitchen of the castle was actually filled with the smell of human blood. Serdak had experienced this familiar smell on the battlefield in Moyen Ridge, and those unpleasant memories left a deep impression on him. He blocked his uncomfortable nose with the back of his hand and walked into the blood-stained storage room. He saw a row of pork hanging on the meat hooks on the shelves in the storage room. 
and some pork on the meat table next to it. Wagyu beef. The meat table and the floor of the storage room were covered with blood stains. And even the surrounding walls were spattered with blood stains. Apparently the knights thought these blood stains were from the slaughtered animals. After Soldek sneezed hard, he immediately exited the storage room and whispered in Carl's ear, It's human blood. The two slender-waisted hunting dogs entered the storage room, sniffed around, and then took the knight holding the dog and ran towards the wooden door on the other side. They had just checked that side. It seemed to be a woodshed with piles of piles in the room. It was full of firewood. And the two hounds were barking outside the woodshed. Carl and the knights looked at each other. And immediately a knight escorted the frightened cook and servants into the woodshed and ordered them. Move these firewoods! Under the force of the sword, the firewood in the firewood room was quickly cleared out. In the room that was originally filled with firewood, there were still many bloody footprints that had not been cleaned in time. There was a black iron door on the wall on one side. The blood on the door had almost completely dried up. And when the cook saw the big iron door again, their bodies slumped down like mud. No matter how much the knights in the guard camp urged, they were unwilling to take a step closer to the door. To be cautious, Carl did not open the door without permission, but asked his knights to guard it. He walked directly to the castle hall, stood in front of Captain Soron, and said, Captain Soron, we are behind the kitchen. A hidden secret passage was discovered in the woodshed. There is something wrong with this secret passage. I want to invite you. Before Carl could finish speaking, Grenfell, who was originally a little pale, instantly became bloodless. Her eyes widened, and her azure eyes quickly turned black. She stood up from the sofa suddenly, and quickly held a hand in her hand. Unfolding a magic scroll, a brief magic spell inspired the scroll, and a huge magic pattern emerged from the scroll. And the scroll instantly turned into black aura, and then dissipated in the air. The Daffa binding. At this moment, everyone in the castle hall, including Captain Sauron, was tied up with a shadow ribbon, unable to move. The captain of the guard suddenly rose up on the spot and broke the ropes tied to his body. His body suddenly rose to nearly three meters high. He easily tore off the heads of the four knights who were guarding him, and then escaped from the castle. He got a door panel style shield on the wall of the hall, and instantly a large number of black magic patterns emerged from his body. And he strode to Mrs. Grenfell's side. Mrs. Grenfell took out a wand from her arms. There was a black eye tattooed on that arm. A black magic book floated in front of her. Her eyes were fixed on the pages of the book, and she was chanting with a ferocious face. Lengthy spell. Chapter 349 Fierce Battle. It was the familiar shadow magic again. Serdak only felt that his body was tied up by the belt coming out of the shadow. And many knights around him were also firmly trapped in place. The captain of the guard actually went completely berserk and turned into a giant more than three meters tall to protect Mrs. Grenfell. No one expected that Mrs. Grenfell was actually a member of the Black Magic Hermitage. And they were caught off guard. They were all tied in place by the advanced shadow magic scroll binding technique. Captain Sauron was the first to let out a loud shout. He held a double-edged sword tightly in both hands and jumped out of the sofa. The double-edged sword was pointed directly at Mrs. Greenfield. Those shadow belts were tied to him but they could not restrict his movements. It was just that the berserk captain of the guard was carrying a door shield. Like a thick stone wall blocking Mrs. Grenfell, he blocked Captain Sauron's sword with the shield in his hand, and everyone slashed on the shield with his double-edged sword. The captain of the guard was slashed by Captain Sauron's sword until he half knelt on the ground, and the stone slabs under his feet were broken into pieces like spider webs. It was cracked, and huge gaps were cut in the thick door panel and shield. A huge magic book page appeared in front of Mrs. Grenfell. This magic book turned into a black six-pointed star formation under Mrs. Grenfell's spell. A star appeared in the center of this six-pointed star formation. The demon head, which was more than one meter in diameter, was exactly the same as the one Soldak saw at the entrance of the Knight Academy. When the demon's head emerged from the magic circle, it had a ferocious face and closed its eyes tightly. Soldak noticed at this moment that Mrs. Grenfell slit her wrist with a dagger and poured her blood on the demon's head, trying to awaken the sleeping demon. Sleeping Cloud? Captain Sauron was not completely restrained by shadows at this moment, but his power completely suppressed the restraint power. There were several shadow belts wrapped around his body. He killed the guard commander three times in a row, but he was killed with his thick shield. Although the guard captain's eyes were red and his orifices were bleeding after being shocked by Captain Sauron's sword energy, he refused to retreat with a ferocious smile on his face. The captain of the guard held his shield like a wild bull and slammed into Captain Sauron. 
Instead, he knocked him back a few steps. The shadow of a crusader swordsman emerged from Sauron. Captain Sauron's retreat was stopped after the captain emerged from behind. The magic pattern armor on his body was flowing with magic glow. And a white cyclone was steaming from the double-edged sword. He struck the maddened man with a backhand sword. The captain of the personal guard cut off one of his thick arms from the side. The guard captain did not feel any pain. He glanced at his arm that fell to the ground. And with a ferocious expression, he slammed his shield against Captain Sauron again, preventing Captain Sauron from breaking through his defense line to deal with the people behind him. Mrs. Grenfell. Saldak knew that once the curse chanted by Mrs. Grenfell was completed, all the knights in the guard camp would fall into a deep sleep. By then, the knights would lose the power to resist and would naturally be at their mercy. He didn't want to wait until that moment when a beam of light with a holy aura burst out from his body. The shadow belts melted like ice and snow when encountering this power of holy light. Serdak regained his ability to move and quickly approached. Carl. A pale golden light emerged from his hands. And as soon as he touched the shadow belts on Carl's body, the shadow belts fell off one after another. Carl regained his mobility and did not join the battle immediately. Instead, he took out a magic flare from his arms, rushed to the door, and shot the magic flare into the sky. A dark red magic flare exploded in the sky outside Grenfell Manor. At this time, the blood on Mrs. Grenfell's wrist had flowed to the face of the demon's head, and the demon's closed eyes were shaking gently, as if they might open at any time. Soldak did not dare to delay, and before he could save the other knights of the guard camp, he took out the alloy bow from the magic waste bag and shot an arrow at Mrs. Grenfell. Under her eyes, the feathered arrow seemed to be cursed. It did not shoot into Mrs. Grenfell's throat as Soldak had hoped. Instead, it slightly changed its direction and inserted into Grenfell's throat. A handful of blood spurted out from Mrs. Fell's shoulder. Mrs. Grenfell's body swayed slightly, and the spell in her mouth paused for a moment. Her malicious eyes stared at Soldak, and the chant in her mouth ended at this moment. Then, the demon head opened its eyes in the magic circle. Black magic patterns were all over the demon's face. It showed a weird smile, opened its huge mouth, and spoke with Mrs. Grenfell at the same time. Start chanting the spell of Sleeping Cloud. Human joy surrenders before pain. Truth is buried in the Shroud of Lies. O ruler of H.L. Soldak watched with despair as a mass of black mist exploded from under Mrs. Grenfell's feet showing a black cloud even more terrifying than the ring of black mist seen at the entrance of the Night Academy, exploding in all directions. And all he could do at this moment was to raise the dwarf chain shield, cover his face, and release his power. And a two-faced, four-armed demonic figure emerged from behind. Carl, also holding a long sword in his hand, turned back from the door of the hall and happened to encounter the spreading cloud of sleep. Holy shit! Before Carl could utter an angry curse, he staggered and fell into the castle hall. The restrained knights of the guard camp around him were not spared either and fell to the ground one after another. Only Captain Sauron, who was fighting with the captain of the bodyguard, shook his body a few times. A flash of red light burst out from the magic pattern armor. Captain Sauron shouted again. Although he walked crookedly like a drunkard, he was he was not hypnotized. But the guard captain took advantage of Captain Sauron's trance and hit him hard with a door panel and shield in his hand causing Captain Sauron's body to fall backwards involuntarily. The captain of the guard followed closely behind. He only had one arm left at the moment. He completely ignored the broken arm and was still bleeding out crazily. He discarded the door-like shield in his hand and pulled out a dark red curved weapon from his waist. The knife was rounded and slashed towards Captain Sauron's head. On the contrary, Sardak did not fall into a deep sleep this time. The face of the demon shadow demon behind him was facing him. The shadow was in a half-crouched state, with four arms tightly protecting Serdak, actually letting him avoid the magic of Sleeping Cloud. Seeing Captain Sauron in crisis, Soldak threw out the dwarf chain shield in his hand without thinking. The chain on the shield was wrapped around the guard's neck several times, but it failed to stop the giant shield. It hit Captain Sauron. Captain Sauron's chest was hit by the huge shield, and a mouthful of blood spurted out. Pulled by the chains, Serdak's body flew towards the captain of the guard. Serdak took the opportunity to draw out the craftsman's sword. When his body was about to hit the captain of the guard, the craftsman's sword pierced the guard. Long back. Mrs. Grenfell's eyes were fixed on the two people who could still fight in the hall. When she saw the craftsman's sword piercing the back of the guard captain, she immediately screamed, No! 
You are the lackeys of the Magic Union, asshole. Chapter 350 Fierce Battle 2 There was a craftsman sword stuck in the back of the captain of the guard. Blood shot out more than two meters from the back of his heart. The bright red blood stained his whole body. In an instant, countless black runes lit up on his body. Those large and small twisted the tadpole runes were soaked in blood and turned into burning lines of fire on his flesh. The dwarf chain shield was wrapped around his neck, making him feel suffocated. He saw the chain between his neck and Serdak's hand and immediately rushed toward Serdak. He roared furiously like a wild beast and his body continued to expand as more and more blood flowed out. Spurting out, the flames on his body turned him into a burning man and the air was filled with the smell of burning. Serdak nimbly avoided the attack of the guard captain. He was like a reckless and mindless beast, relying on his wild instinct to kill the enemy in front of him. But then he found that his arm had turned into a piece of charcoal in the raging fire. Then he subconsciously looked at his body. He looked at the burning flames on his body with a look of despair. Margaret? He shouted in the direction of Mrs. Grenfell. But his voice was dry and hoarse. And sparks even spurted out from his mouth. And the flames from H. L. burned through his body instantly. The whole body looked like lit charcoal from a distance. When the wind blew, the skin turned into ashes. He walked towards Mrs. Grenfell, and as soon as he took a step, he fell into the castle hall. Hull, cried Mrs. Grenfell sadly, standing behind the sofa. The demon head at the center of the magic circle slowly disappeared. Serdak watched as the guard commander Hell collapsed at his feet. The black magic runes burned his body, turning him into a charred corpse. His body exuded waves of stench. Serdak regretted not pulling out the craftsman's sword from the back of the guard captain. Captain Sauron Aldington touched his forehead with his hand. He was still bound by the shadows. He was a little shaken by the influence of the sleeping cloud. His double-edged sword stood on the ground. He took out a bottle from his arms. After drinking the magic potion, he was still a little groggy. Mrs. Grenfell glared at Soldak and poured a bottle of magic potion that exuded light blue magic into her mouth. Then her eyes turned blue. An abundant magic aura overflowed from her body. Glenn Mrs. Phil quickly used a wand in her hand to draw a series of magic runes. These runes formed a magic pattern array in front of her. And a dark shadow arrow quickly formed from the magic pattern array. Then the shadow arrow turned into a stream of light and hit Serdak's chest instantly. Serdak felt as if his chest had been punched hard. And the shadow arrow dispersed into dozens of shadow energy. Rushed into Serdak's body. The moment the shadow energy rushed into Serdak's body, the sacred breath wandering in Serdak's body immediately formed a barrier, completely melting away the shadow energy. The power of the holy light penetrated Serdak's body, causing his breastplate to glow with pale golden light. Serdak pulled the dwarf chain shield back from the bodyguard captain and protected it on his chest. Mrs. Grinfeld did not expect that Serdak could resist a shadow arrow without any damage to his body. She stared at Serdak in shock and suspicion and a ball of fire burst out from the wand again, barely giving Serdak any time to react. The breath of fire element emerged from Serdak's head, and Serdak only had time to raise the dwarf chain shield in his hand, and a ball of fire exploded from Serdak's head. A wave of heat knocked Serdak to the ground, and he fell heavily to the ground. The fireball burned his hair to bits, and his face and arms were also burned. Even the dwarf chain shield was hot, and black smoke came out from some places where it was connected to the leather. This fireball gave Serdak some bad memories. He rolled over and got up from the ground. He glanced at the sleeping guard camp night in the castle hall, surrounded by some maids and servants from the manor. Glenn the eleven children behind Mrs. Phil also fell asleep, and even Captain Sauron was pushed to the wall by the fireball. Soldak picked up a knight sword from the fallen knight of the guard camp next to him, and leaned towards Mrs. Grinfell again, seeing that Soldak was about to rush forward in a few steps. Mrs. Grinfell showed a cruel sneer on her face. She took off a copper whistle from her neck. The shallow black magic pattern was engraved on the bronze whistle. Mrs. Grinfell poured a trace of magic into the bronze whistle. And a faint magic aura surrounded the bronze whistle. Grinfell the lady blew the whistle without hesitation. And the sharp whistle was heard far through the castle hall. Just when Saldak rushed to Mrs. Grinfell, she suddenly took out a magic scroll from her arms and unfolded it. A stream of age, fire emerged from Saldak's feet. Dak had no choice but to stop and avoid the age, fire. The flames of age, fire rubbed against Soldak's armor and rushed to the roof of the castle hall. When Soldak wanted to pursue Mrs. Grenfell again, he emerged from the kitchen, his body covered in black and burning with black flames. Here come the age, L dogs. 
These two H. L. dogs are as big as calves. They have big bloody mouths. One H. L. dog cuts through a black shadow and grabs at Serta with a fleshy claw. Graham. Serdak raised his shield to meet him. And the H. L. dog's claws hit the dwarf chain shield firmly. Serdak felt as if a heavy hammer hit it, making his whole arm numb. Three claw marks were scratched on the thick dwarf chain shield by sharp dog claws. Serdak's entire body was shorter, and the huge black dog head bit down on Serdak's throat. The knight sword in Serdak's hand stabbed one of the blood red eyes of the H. L. dog. The H. L. dog let out a howl, but did not move away. The huge mouth filled with hot black flames opened. Serdak had no way to avoid it, and it was too late to retract the dwarf chain shield in his hand. He could only stab the knight's long sword into the H. L dog's eye, and then into the evil dog's head. Seeing that the hell dog was about to bite Serdek, a double-edged sword pierced into the hell dog's mouth. The huge sword was extremely sharp. It penetrated from the hell dog's mouth, and the tip of the sword was directly through the back of the vicious dog's head, exposed from the nape of the vicious dog's neck. The vicious dog's thick lips almost touched Serdek's face, and the hot lava on the vicious dog's body quickly cooled down. Serdek was pinned down by the hell dog and thought he was dead. Captain Sauron kicked the hell dog aside and reached out to pull Serdak up from the ground. Before Captain Sauron could speak, a shadow arrow hit Captain Sauron's chest, and several shadow auras rushed into Captain Sauron's body. He covered his chest with his hands and fell on his back. The wand in Mrs. Grinfell's hand threw out a shadow arrow, but there was a sharp sound of breaking through the air outside the castle. A magician riding a magic weapon flew in from the door. He waved the wand in his hand, and a, a magic barrier appeared in front of Soldak just blocking the shadow arrow. It was Lance, the young magician, who had quarreled with Carl before. At this moment, he was seen rushing in on a magic wand. A fireball flew out of the wand in his hand and hit Mrs. Grinfell opposite. Grinfell Madam was well prepared. She nimbly dodged behind a stone pillar, and the fireball exploded in front of the sofa, completely igniting the soft leather sofa. Then two more magicians from the law enforcement group rode into the castle hall on magic cauldrons, and circled Mrs. Grinfell from the left and right sides. Another H. L. Dog jumped out from the darkness and pulled a magician out. The magic weapon pounced down and bit the magician's throat with its big bloody mouth. After the magician struggled hard, his body turned slightly to avoid the vital point, allowing the H. L. Dog to bite him on the shoulder. Just hearing a scream, the magician fell heavily to the floor. The magic potion hit the wall of the hall and fell apart and his shoulder was bitten to pieces by the H, L dogs. The young magician Lance chanted under the spell. A fireball exploded on the back of the H, L dog. The evil dog ignored the injury despite its body injury. It bit the magician's shoulder and refused to let go. The huge dog's head shook continuously. In a few moments, while the magician screamed pitifully, the H, L dog tore off the magician's entire arm. Another magician had torn apart a magic scroll and a bolt of lightning fell on the back of the H, L dog. The back, which had been bloody and bloody by the fireball, was burned by the arc again. The H, L dog he rushed towards the magician who released the lightning bolt, but was stopped by a barrier released by the young magician Lance. As the second bolt of lightning fell, the H, Lound was finally electrocuted behind the barrier and fell to the ground, letting out a series of whimpers. Lance chanted a magic spell again and three fireballs exploded one after another next to Lady Grinfell's stone pillar. Lady Grinfell held up a shadow shield and dodged left and right to avoid the three fireballs. Although she avoided the fireball was fired, but it was also affected by the exploding fireball. He looked very disheveled. The young magician Lance was not prepared to give him a chance to breathe. He waved his wand one after another and released a series of fireballs, forcing Mrs. Grinfell to retreat continuously. At this time, Another magician finally ran to the unlucky magician, whose shoulder was bitten to pieces, and whose entire arm was torn off by a vicious dog. He took out a bottle of life potion and poured it into the magician's mouth. After drawing the magic pattern array, magic continued to fall on the unlucky magician. Then, the magician took out a hemostatic bandage from his arms, and began to bandage the wound of the unlucky magician. The unlucky magician was seriously injured and was bleeding. All over the place. Soldak checked Captain Sauron's injuries and saw that he was unconscious with more than a dozen shadow auras running through his body. He then revealed a trace of sacred aura from his palm and quickly dispersed those shadow auras. Captain Sauron the captain's complexion recovered and his breathing became much more steady. He put Captain Sauron down. And Serdak ran to the injured magician again and helped bandage the wound. 
perhaps because of the life potion. Even though the magician lost his arm and lost so much blood, he didn't die immediately. He just fell into a coma. Seeing that his companion was quickly treated, the magician cast a grateful look and nodded kindly to Serdak. Mrs. Grenfell ran quickly to the castle kitchen, and the young magician Lance immediately chased after her. Mrs. Grenfell took out three magic scrolls from her arms and tore them apart one after another. Three H. Fires almost simultaneously came from Lance's feet. Appeared, forcing him to stop his pursuit. By the time Lance used his magic to dispel the H. Fire in front of him, Mrs. Grenfell had disappeared. And the H. L. dog that fell to the ground also took the opportunity to get up from the ground. Its back was hit by two lightning bolts and was scorched. The wound even exposed half of the bones. It took the opportunity to pick up the charred body of the bodyguard and chased Mrs. Greenfield in the direction in which she disappeared. The young magician Lance was not willing to give up easily, and he and another companion quickly chased in the direction where Mrs. Grenfell disappeared. Soldak saw the figure of the guard camp knight appearing outside the castle. Knowing that the reinforcements had arrived, he followed the young magician Lance. At this time, several magicians from the law enforcement group walked into the castle hall. One of the elderly magicians walked in from the outside first with a staff. When he saw the knight from the guard camp who had passed out on the ground, he frowned and said, I've been hit by the sleeping cloud. As he spoke, a middle-aged magician walked up quickly behind him, stood in the center of the hall, and used the wand in his hand to draw a magic array in the air in front of him. Following a series of spells, the magician's body rippled with circles of magic halo. These magic halos spread, and even Serdak felt much clearer. Almost at the same time that the magic halo dissipated, the sleeping people lying on the ground in the castle hall woke up one after another. The old magician noticed the magician lying on the ground next to Soldak, and quickly walked over. As he walked, he shouted, Monty, come and see how Lorenzo is doing. He seems to be injured. It's not a big deal. What about Lance and the others? He walked to the magician named Lorenzo, squatted down and checked the injury. When he saw the magician behind him, he ordered, hurry up and support him. He is no match for Margaret. A female magician quickly ran to the old magician and recited the magic spell quickly. And the light of the hydrotherapy fell on the unlucky magician. The old magician looked at the messy scene in the castle hall and glanced at the H, L dog next to him with a double-edged sword stuck in its huge mouth. His face was extremely ugly. He didn't expect that people like him were just one step slower. Such a big surprise happened. The magician who had cast the awakening spell came over, stopped next to Captain Sauron, checked his injuries, and saw that Captain Sauron had no serious injuries. So he used magic to wake him up. The old magician looked at Captain Sauron, who was lying on the ground, still a little weak, and frowned and asked him, Sauron, what happened here to make this place like this? Chapter 351 Cooperation 3H Fires gush out from the slate floor of the castle corridor. The hot flames ignite the fences next to the pillars. The entire corridor is immediately filled with billowing smoke. Serdak rushes into the hot castle corridor. And a heat wave hits his face. Serdak quickly put down his helmet and visor. Covered his face with a dwarf chain shield in his hand. And rushed into the corridor where the fire was burning. There was the sound of a fireball exploding from the kitchen not far away. Serdak followed the sound and rushed into a room. The arch blocked the flames in the corridor. Serdak found that he had chased into the castle kitchen and passed through the fire all over the place. The blood-stained storage room still feels like passing through a slaughterhouse. There are still traces of burnt fireballs at the entrance to the secret passage. And there is even A.H. L. Dog's burnt flesh and blood left at the dark hole. Obviously the magicians were fighting here. And they should have injured the H. L. Dog that stole the body of the bodyguard. Serdak stood at the door of the secret passage. Looked at the dark secret passage and hesitated for a moment. And then he I got into a somewhat cold secret passage. This secret passage was very narrow and could only accommodate one person to pass through. The main body of the secret passage was made of masonry. And there was a strong musty smell inside. The secret passage is a little dark inside. But fortunately the ground in the secret passage is fairly flat. So it's not difficult to walk. A little light could be seen dozens of meters ahead. Under the glimmer of magic. The figures of the two magicians flickered in and out of sight. Serdak chased behind the young magician Lance. After running about 500 meters, the exit of the tunnel was in a tree hole in the red pine forest. Serdak ran out of the secret passage and felt that he tripped on something. When he looked down, he found that it was an adhering particle. 
It was a skull of flesh and blood. But the back of the head was bitten open by the fangs. And the brain inside was licked clean. Serdak was startled by this skull. When he looked down at the skull at his feet, he discovered that there were not only skulls in the tree hole, but also the remains of some thigh bones and breast ribs in the smelly tree hole. The tree hole looks like a doghouse. Obviously, the two H, L dogs usually lurk here. The knights of the support group did not discover that there is a secret passage hidden in the woods behind the castle. There is nothing to say, but there are two such big dogs. The H, L dogs didn't even see it, which really made Serdak couldn't help but sigh inwardly. There were almost no footprints on the snow in the red pine forest, except for some huge dog paw prints. Fortunately, there were sounds of fireballs exploding in front of him from time to time. Soldak looked towards the top of the mountain, then looked back at Grinfell Manor down the hillside a few hundred meters away, and saw a large number of knights entering one after another from the outside. Manor, they knew that the large forces had arrived with timely reinforcements, and both Carl and Captain Sauron should be safe at this moment. There were also several magicians riding magic harpoons, flying toward Shandong in this direction. Several magicians passed over Serdak's head. The way they flew freely in the air made Serdak very envious. Grenfell Manor is now completely occupied by the Hellanza Guard Camp and the Magic Guild Law Enforcement Group. If you return the same way at this time, it probably won't be of much help, Serdak thought in his heart, since he has chased him so far. Then he continued to chase them. So he followed the direction of the three magicians in the sky and chased them with the knight's sword. A wooden house was built on the top of this dense red pine forest. This wooden house was connected to the mountain behind. When Soldak arrived, the wooden house had been blown apart by a large fireball, revealing the entrance of the cave behind the wooden house. The H, L dog fell at the entrance of the cave. Next to the H, L dog, there was a magician who had a section of his thigh bitten off. He was lying next to a huge rock. The wound on the broken leg had been bandaged. The magician was slightly closing his eyes, endured the intense pain, and leaned there without saying a word. His face turned blue in the cold wind. He felt someone coming over, and the magician opened his eyes. And when he saw it was a guard from the camp, the knight just nodded politely. The magician thought that Serdak would follow closely behind him and chase him into the cave. Unexpectedly, Serdak squatted down directly in front of him, picked up his broken leg from the fallen vicious dog, and carefully picked up his broken leg. Putting it next to the magician, he asked in a concerned tone, How do you feel? Do you need help? The magician shook his head speechlessly and replied calmly, I probably won't die. When he spoke, he must have endured great pain. Under the gaze of the magician, Soldek stretched out his hand, just above the magician's broken leg, and revealed a faint power of holy light. The magician's broken leg heals faster. Is this the holy light? The magician was so surprised that his jaw almost dropped. He looked at Soldak and asked seriously. Serdak nodded and said to him, The rescuers will catch up soon. I will go to support the people in front first. You can rest here first and be careful of the H, L dogs nearby. The magician nodded, pointed to the entrance of the cave and said, Margaret escaped into the cave. She is a very dangerous and cunning person. There is a wanted warrant for her in Helensis City. We after searching for so long, I have never been able to find her hiding place. She is one of the leaders of the Black Magic Hermitage in Bina Province. We must not let her escape this time. Serdak waved his hand to him and chased inside the cave. Unexpectedly, the wooden house outside was just to hide from others. This cave was a huge magic experimental base. There was a magic wall lamp every ten meters on the cave wall. Soldak chased him into the cave and found that the young magician Lance was there. Three magicians fought against the siege of a group of H, L dogs. The four magicians were surrounded by the H. L dogs on the mountain wall. The four took turns to use magic to resist these H, L dogs. But they were still harassed by these seven or eight H, L dogs. Very embarrassed. Soldak held up his shield and joined the battle without saying a word. He used the dwarf chain shield to knock away a charging H, L dog. And he also took several steps back. Be careful. Don't get bitten by them. Lance's voice came from behind Soldak. A H, L dog took the opportunity to rush over and bite Serdak on the shoulder. Serdak waved his sword to block. But the H, L dog bit the knight's sword in its mouth. Serdak was unable to withdraw the knight. With a long sword, H, L hounds on both sides surrounded him. Serdak was about to abandon the sword and retreat, only to hear someone from behind shouting, Lower your head! Serdak lowered his head subconsciously, and a wind blade flew from behind, hitting the H, 
L dog in front of him between the eyebrows. Chapter 352 Shadow Terror The knight's long sword was drawn out from the mouth of the H, L dog. Serdak threw out the dwarf chain shield and focused on the H, L dog surrounding him on the left. The knight's sword in his left hand took advantage of the situation and rushed towards the face of the H, L dog on the right. A wound of more than a foot length was cut on it. Three wind blades flew out from the gap between Serdak's body one after another, hitting the H, L dogs around Serdak one after another. Then a fireball exploded from the group of H, L dogs. And several H, L dogs were hit by the fireball. The explosion was bloody and bloody. And the wind blades were also extremely sharp. Almost every wind blade scratched the H, L hound body, almost reaching the bone. This was the first time that Serdak felt that magicians were so powerful. He stood in front of these H, L dogs. The four magicians behind him actually killed these H, L dogs one by one. They cooperated very well. Serdak gave the young magicians full trust. So Serdak almost fought between magic skills, with wind blades and fireballs flying by from time to time. After these H, L dogs were injured by the fireball. Almost all of them were cut black and blue by the wind blades. When he got to the back, Serdak only had to rush in front, apply finishing blows to the injured H, Lounds, and chop off their heads. In addition to these calf-like H, L dogs in the cave. Several stone chambers full of fishy smell were also found along the way. There were some bones piled in almost every stone chamber. It seemed that they should be those of Baron Grinfell. Realizing that the matter had been exposed, he turned all the more than a hundred bandits into dog food one after another, and found several empty stone rooms one after another. The magician Lance and his companions continued to search inside. In addition to raising a group of H, L dogs in this cave, there is also a purple leaf plant planted in the cave. This plant looks like a pineapple. But there is a huge mouth in the middle, which looks like a, a huge Venus flytrap. Whenever someone approaches, these magic plants will open their mouths wide, waiting for the prey to come close and swallow it in one bite. However, these plants are not very aggressive and will only attack people when they get close. Attack. Soldak had never seen this kind of plant before. And if Lance hadn't reminded him, he might have been bitten on the calf by a night charm. There were some spider webs in front near the cave wall. But no demon spiders were seen. Serdak walked in front holding a shield. Followed by four magicians. The young magician Lance followed Serdak. Looked at Serdak curiously. And said to him. Hey. Why haven't I seen you in the support squadron before? Are you new here? Serdak nodded and replied. Well. I only officially joined the guard camp after Carl's recommendation last week. Lance showed surprise. Turned his head. And stretched out his hand to him and said, No wonder I felt a little strange when I saw you. You did a great job. I owe you once. I believe Carl will know who I am. If you need anything, please feel free to do so. You can come to me at the Magic Guild Law Enforcement Team. Serdak stared at Lance with a look of horror in his eyes. Lance also realized that something was wrong. At this time, Serdak kicked him over and directly kicked the magician Lance to the ground. At the same time, a sharp edge just protruded from the stone wall grazing Lance's arm and piercing the air. Serdak took a big step forward, waved the knight's sword in his hand, and cut off the needle that came from the rock wall. Serdak stretched out his hand to pull up Lance, who was sitting on the ground. Seeing his pale face and frightened expression, he smiled and said, Okay, be careful of the crypt spider. Lance warned several companions. Walking into the cave, there were sounds of chanting magic spells again from several empty caves. Everyone chased into a spacious cave and saw several magic experimental tables placed in the spacious cave. However, at this moment, these magic the experimental bench was empty. There were some display racks behind the experimental bench with various weird magic materials on them. Some magic crucibles used for experiments were still left on the experimental bench. There is an open space in the middle of the six huge test benches. On the open space is a huge magic circle. Mrs. Grinfell is sitting in the center of the magic circle wearing a set of black magic robes with gold edges. In front of her is the captain of the guard, with a charred corpse. She sat in the center of the magic circle and chanted magic spells. Several H, L dogs guarded the periphery of the magic circle. As Mrs. Grenfell's singing ended, the magic circle continued to light up with magic threads, and the magic power was continuously transmitted into the magic circle from the six test benches. When everyone reached the edge of the magic circle, they saw a huge transparent barrier covering Mrs. Greenfield. Lance tried to explode the barrier with a fireball.
but the fireball was silently swallowed by the transparent barrier. At this time, Mrs. Grinfell suddenly raised her head and stared at Lance and Soldak with her cold eyes. A decisive and sad sneer appeared on her face. She looked at everyone with a look that said no. It looked strange. The lines on the magic circle were full of magic power. And in the center of the magic circle, countless black tadpole runes appeared on Mrs. Grenfell's face and body. And countless black magic threads crawled all over Grenfell. Mrs. Eyre's body. A black flame rose from her feet. The flame ignited the precious magic robe on her body and quickly spread throughout her body. She was burned in the blazing flames until her face was distorted, and her body was reduced to ashes little by little. Then she fell on the burned bodyguard captain lying on the ground. The two corpses overlapped. The steaming flame showed a faint blue color, and the H, L dogs around the magic circle were also sucked dry of their flesh and blood. Serdak could clearly see from the outside of the magic circle that in order to activate the magic circle, Grinfell actually sacrificed his life. Lance looked at the black flames in the magic circle through the magic barrier, and a dark intertwined door emerged. His face became extremely solemn, and he said, This seems to be some kind of powerful summoning ritual. I heard that Margaret Tay has been researching some kind of powerful dark summons in the past few years. The fellow magician next to him asked, Should we destroy this magic barrier to prevent her from summoning? It's too late. Lance said in a hoarse voice, as he looked at the door of flesh and blood in the center of the magic circle. Several wind blades hit the magic barrier, like stones thrown into the sea, unable to stir up any waves. The fellow magician next to him asked in shock, What is that? The magician Lance replied, Maybe it's some kind of summoning door. Then he shouted to his companions, Hurry up and find teacher Gerald. We can't deal with this thing at all. We have to get out of here quickly. When Lance said these words, the intertwined door was suddenly pushed open by a shadow hand. Chapter 353 Shadow Terror 2 through the magic light shield. Soldak could clearly see a big purple hand stretching out from the door. And I grew out of the palm of that big hand. The huge eye stared at the cave and looked around before he opened it with force. A three meter long arm was forced out of the black door, which was covered with thorns and bone spurs. A heart rending roar came from behind the black door. And a layer of black fire ignited on the huge arm stretched out. This layer of black fire quickly spread to the surroundings. And even Mrs. Grinfell's body erupted the black flames. The hot black fire almost carbonized Lady Grinfell instantly, and some embers rushed to the top of the cave. She and her bodyguard were not even ashes left in the flames. A black door covered with bone spurs appeared in the center of the magic circle. The entire door was burning, and the black fire crackled the door. In the midst of such fierce black fire, a shadow terror with extremely twisted limbs crawled out from the door full of teeth, and the terrifying aura emanating from it filled the entire cave. From a distance, it looked like a tree stump hidden in the shadows. Six arms with eyes growing out of their palms climbed on the black door, pulling a huge body out of the door. Dozens of tentacles penetrated into the magic circle. The stone slabs are like the roots of a big tree taking root on the ground. And its trunk-like body is covered with more than a dozen large mouths full of sharp teeth. Those mouths are constantly opening and closing. And the eyes on its arms are constantly opening and closing. He glanced around. This is a shadow terror. Everyone. Get away quickly, and don't stare into its eyes. The magician Lance shouted hysterically. And then he pulled his companions around him, and ran towards the cave exit. The horror got out of the portal. And its body quickly ignited with black flames. Just like the evil ghosts on the Warsaw Plain who crawled out of the evil ghost gate, and were stripped of their skin by the world's laws. The power of the world's laws in Roland Continent, will make them a layer of black fire ignited on the horror. The powerful black fire burned Mrs. Grenfell in just an instant leaving not even a trace of bones and dregs left. However, this horror was burned by the black fire, tenaciously climbed out of the door. Countless black flames emerged from its body, and countless dark auras also condensed towards its body. Its body was like a huge vortex, greedily absorbing the dark aura here, fighting against the black fire on its body. As if its body, the magic circle below is the foundation for its power. The magic circle is constantly running and continuously providing energy for its existence. In the black door covered with thorns, there are still countless hands struggling to crawl out. However, when those purple skeletal hands reach out, they will quickly ignite a black fire and turn into ashes in an instant. Countless miserable wailing sounds came from inside the door, and other terrifying creatures that wanted to crawl over from another world were quickly reduced to ashes under the burning power of the world's laws. 
Lance, and the other four magicians turned around and ran out of the cave. As they ran, they did not forget to give Suldak a danger here gesture, asking him to leave with everyone. Surdak saw the magicians from the Magic Guild Law Enforcement Group running outside in a panic. They didn't know that there were monsters that they couldn't deal with running out of the summoning magic circle. He was carrying a dwarf chain shield. And of course, he didn't care. He ran outside the cave hesitantly. But before everyone could run out of the cave, the shadow terror in the center of the magic circle screamed. It was a kind of sharp whistling sound that clearly couldn't be heard. But it made people tremble from the inside of their souls. Serdak only felt that his body was instantly surrounded by a strange force. As if he had fallen into a glacial lake. But the surface of this glacial lake was covered with a thick layer of ice. He didn't know where he fell in. In the cold lake water, the tendons all over his body were twisted together. His hands and legs were in a kind of cramping pain. And they slowly sank to the bottom of the dark lake. Infinite coldness surrounded Serdak. In the suffocating lake water, Serdak only felt that the cold lake water kept pouring into his mouth and a string of bubbles floated to the surface of the lake. Under the glacial lake, Serdak held his breath for a moment and twisted his body forcefully with his own willpower. Although he could not move his hands and feet, he still floated to the surface of the icy lake little by little. It was only when he got close to the lake that he realized that he was under the ice. Against the biting ice, Serdak could even see the blue sky on the other side of the ice. At this moment, his body burst out with strong willpower. One hand was freed from the cramp and he pulled out the craftsman's sword from his waist, piercing the ice more than a foot thick. The world in front of him was shattered like glass, and a suffocating darkness poured out from all around. He opened his eyes from the darkness, and found himself lying on a desk. He was surprised to see a line of clear small words carved with a pencil sharpener on the desk. Although he could no longer remember the appearance of the quiet girl clearly, but the small line of writing is still fresh in my memory. He is wearing a familiar navy blue sportswear on his skinny body. A two-foot-high stack of textbooks and review papers are piled on both sides of the desk. The desk mate next to him is studying hard at his desk. Listening to him it means that if you can't finish writing these exercises, you have to stay until you finish them all before you can go home from school. He picked up a black pen and looked at the math problems on the paper in front of him. He couldn't write down a single line. Even if he were asked to copy these exercises, he wouldn't know where to find the answers. He simply put down the pen in his hand and looked at the young faces around him with curiosity. He hadn't seen them for so many years, but their smiles were still so bright. The mountain of homework did not make him feel scared. He looked at the vague classroom with some nostalgia. Those classmates who were more impressive were sitting next to him, and those who could not remember clearly were sitting further away. For a moment, he no longer had the fear of not being able to finish his homework, and was only left with nostalgia for it all. The blurry classroom in front of him was once again shattered and the photo-like memories fell from his eyes, like falling leaves, piling up at his feet. An urban beauty wearing a beige windbreaker stood under a sycamore tree, stuffing the gifts in the paper bag into the nearby trash can, bending down and getting into a black luxury car, and merged into the bustling urban night scene. He stood at the water stall across the street, holding two cups of milk tea in his hand, and staring blankly at the woman who left in the car without even saying age, lo. He didn't even have a word of complaint in his heart. Isn't this how the world is supposed to be? A young woman was lying on the bed, holding her child with a loving smile. He was standing at the door holding the paternity test certificate. His whole body was shaking, and tears were pouring down his face. A twilight old man was lying on the hospital bed. He discovered that the old man lying on the hospital bed was himself. His body was so exhausted that he could only use a ventilator to maintain breathing. Nutrients were being transfused on the shelf, but his eyes were still slowly falling into darkness the aura of death filled his body. The next moment, a golden door in the cloud suddenly lit up in front of him, and he strode into the door that exuded warm light. Then he woke up from the nightmare that followed, between reality and illusion, more like supplementing the incomplete life of his previous life. Serdak recalled the images that rarely appeared in his dreams. My eyes became clear. Serdak stood in the cold cave, looking at the magic circle in front of him that was constantly absorbing the dark atmosphere. The eyeballs in the giant hands of the shadow terror in the center of the circle were watching several magicians. One of the eyeballs looked at Serdak with horror. Only then did Serdak realize that he actually fell into a nightmare created by the shadow terror. He glanced at the shadow terror's eyeball again with some curiosity. If it hadn't been for the dreams created by this eyeball, I'm afraid these dreams buried deep in his heart would have been completely forgotten by him. Lost, 
Sirdak subconsciously threw the knight's sword in his hand. And the sword rolled and flew towards the big purple hand facing him, stabbing the eyeball in his hand. The shadow terror was shaken all over. And the arm with a broken eyeball quickly grabbed at Sirdak, wrapping around Sirdak like a thorny vine. Sirdak nimbly dodged the giant hand. Catch! He happened to bump into the young magician Lance. At this time, Lance was looking at the other eyeball. His eyes were blank, and he was knocked to the ground by Soldak. The huge tentacle rolled over from the opposite side. Soldak grabbed Lance and pulled him to the wall. He managed to avoid the attack of the giant hand. This giant hand stretched out from the shadow terror. After a few dozen meters, the tentacles on the giant hand were like sharp spears. After breaking away from the glare of the shadow terror, Lance suddenly woke up quickly. When he saw Soldak opposite him, he immediately realized the dangerous situation. He waved the wand in his hand and released a fireball. The fireball exploded in the air, but did not repel the giant hand that rushed towards him. Lance seemed to have expected this scene to happen. He quickly unfolded a magic scroll and a wall of fire. Appearing in front of the two people, he blocked the giant hand. Before Lance had time to speak, he saw that his companion was falling into the nightmare of the terror. He immediately flew out a few sparks and exploded in front of his companion, knocking him away. Nightmare awakening. At this time, the two giant hands bypassed the wall of fire and rushed towards Serdak and Lance. Serdak held up the dwarf chain shield to block an arm swung by the horror, and his whole body was also knocked away. He fell heavily on the stone wall of the cave. The other giant hand was knocked back by Lance's fireball again. Lance also wanted to rescue two other companions, but found that the two companions had been rolled up by two huge arms. At the same time, they opened their purple eyes and the wands in their hands frequently drew magic patterns. Wind blades and fireballs flew over one after another, causing Lance to flee. They seemed to have lost their minds, and could only obey the orders of the Shadow Terror. The Shadow Terror was not yet familiar with these two new magic puppets. So only Lance could pull his companions and escape from the flying wind blades. In just such a short time, these two magicians had become the magic puppets of the Shadow Terror. We can't deal with him! Let's go quickly! Lance shouted to another magician and Serdak, who had just woken up. Serdak got up from the ground in embarrassment, jumped out, and once again avoided the attack of the giant hand. A tentacle as sharp as a spear on a giant hand pierced Lance's shoulder, and Lance let out a miserable cry. The wand inlaid with a ruby in his hand lit up with a brilliant magical glow, and all the runes on the wand lit up one after another. Lance shouted, Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. The wand flew out of Lance's hand and hit one of the horror's giant hands. The wand exploded with a bang. The giant hand hidden in the shadow was blown to pieces. Lance and his fellow magicians also fell in the explosion. After getting out, Serdak stood far away and was not affected by the wave of explosions. At this time, he quickly threw out the dwarf chain shield in his hand and tightly entangled Lance and the fellow magician who fell on the ground, dragging two people towards the cave entrance. The two magician puppets at the back had now completely merged with the shadow terror. The purple shadows wrapped around their bodies jumped out from the palms of the giant hands and chased towards Serdak. A fireball appeared in Sue's direction. There was an explosion under Erdak's feet. And Serdak felt a sharp pain in his right leg. And his body flew out. Serdak hit the stone wall again. He was wearing a full set of armor. So he was not seriously injured. He wanted to get up from the ground. But found two wind blades flying one after another. And he quickly rolled on the ground. After a circle... Kankin avoided the wind blade. At this time, Lance's magician companion got up from the ground, wrapped the unconscious Lance with the chains of the dwarf chain shield, and shouted at Suldek, Go! After saying that, he tore open a magic scroll, and a translucent magic light shield appeared on his body. He blocked the back and fired three fireballs in succession. The three fireballs exploded between the puppets and giant hands of the two magicians. At the same time, the magic light shield on the magic student was also hit by two wind blades and became almost completely transparent. Serdak took the opportunity to drag Lance towards the cave entrance. He had no feeling in his right leg and became limping while running. The magician followed closely behind Serdak. The shadow terror. Catching up from behind, several giant hands grabbed them at the same time. And the two magician puppets frequently release fireballs and wind blades. A giant hand caught up from behind. The sharp tentacles pierced the magic light shield of the magician, pierced into the magician's back, and came out from the chest. The magician coughed blood and his body was hung. On the giant hand, other giant hands surrounded Serdek. At this moment, 
a bolt of lightning rushed in from the entrance of the cave, and the arc made a crackling sound. When the lightning passed by Serdek, the roots of the hair on Serdek's body the roots stand up. The arc of electricity fell on the giant hand, and a large part of the shadow terror's giant hand melted away in an instant. Another giant hand continued to stab Soldek. A construct knight rushed in from the hole with a double-edged sword and cut off the giant hand in an instant. Captain Sauron appeared in front of Serdek. And at the same time, an old-looking magician walked quickly from the entrance of the cave, followed by a group of magicians from the law enforcement group. Chapter 354 The Power of Magic Cannon The giant hand of the shadow terror stretched out from the cave was cut off by Captain Sauron's sword. The broken arm that was burning with black fire quickly retracted into the cave. A black light shot out from the cave, and Sauron quickly stepped back. After a few steps, he avoided the shadow arrow shot and felt the powerful power of the shadow terror in the cave. Sauron did not take the initiative to pursue him. Gerald was asking about the situation inside the Lance Magician. Captain Sauron did not rush into the depths of the cave. He walked to Serdak to check his injuries. Serdak leaned against the rock wall and saw a layer of gleaming runes emerging from the magic pattern structure on Sauron's body. The cyclone was constantly rotating under his feet, making his steps light when he walked. There was no doubt that this body the magic pattern structure enhances agility and balance, and is suitable for use by great swordsmen. I heard that having a set of magic pattern structure can give warriors a qualitative leap in power. Serdak looked envious. Look at Captain Sauron. It was a little cold inside the cave, and a light layer of white frost had condensed on the cave walls. Captain Sauron stretched out his hand to pull Serdak up from the ground, looked at the burned leg armor of Serdak's right leg, and asked, How is it? Is your leg okay? Serdak shook his head, indicating that he was fine, and glanced at the dark cave again, worried that the huge creature would suddenly rush out of it. The shadow terror had one of its arms cut off by Sauron. At this moment, it actually became so honest that it hid inside and did not dare to come out. Serdak said, Two magicians died inside. I was lucky. Only my right leg was burned by the fireball. As he spoke, Soldak moved his burned leg, and he couldn't help but grin as he felt intense stinging pains. Serdak felt that with the help of his sacred aura, he should be able to heal his leg injury quickly. After all, it was just the black fire that was burned. So he said, there should be no problem. Captain Sauron took a look at Serdak's leg injury. The injured leg was wrapped in his trousers. The specific injury could not be seen. So he stopped asking about the matter. Captain Sauron asked Serdak, What exactly is inside? Serdak was guiding the power of holy light in the node to flow through his body, which could speed up the healing of the burns on his body. He said, It is a monster summoned by Mrs. Grenfell using a magic circle. It is covered with tentacles and eyeballs. I haven't seen it before. Before Serdak could finish speaking, Magician Gerald interrupted Serdak and said to Captain Sauron, That is a shadow terror. It has powerful charm and fear capabilities. It has a huge body, but it is currently suppressed by the power of the world's laws and does not show much ability. We must fight it as soon as possible before it becomes familiar with the laws of this world. We must deal with him. Otherwise, once the power of the world cannot suppress it, it will continue to become extremely terrifying. It is said that an adult shadow terror can pull the entire city into a nightmare. It's the trouble caused by those guys from the Black Magic Monastery again. Captain Sauron felt that things were a bit tricky and couldn't help complaining. He liked to hold a double-edged sword when he spoke, as if this would make him more powerful. A sense of security. Captain Sauron turned his head slightly and turned his ears toward the cave to listen carefully. After a few seconds, Serdak heard slight footsteps coming from the cave. Captain Sauron frowned and asked inside the cave, Who? Two magician puppets quietly emerged from the depths of the cave. They looked like they were hiding in the shadows, with a purple mist surrounding their bodies. Captain Sauron didn't wait for their answer. Three wind blades and a fireball shot out from the cave. Captain Sauron tensed up and clenched his double-edged sword to split the three incoming wind blades. He dodged the other fireball, which exploded on the stone wall behind Captain Sauron. Before Captain Sauron could stand up straight, three more wind blades came flying towards him. This was a desperate posture. No magician dared to cast spells quickly without any interruption, regardless of the magic pool drying up. Captain Sauron the captain only defended passively and did not take action. At this time, Magician Gerald used his wand to prop up a semicircular magic light shield in front of everyone, which could barely block the following magical wind blades. Then the wand in his hand lit up again. A row of magic runes appeared on the wand. 
and a silver hexagram array emerged from under his feet. Magician Gerald recited a magic spell quickly and brilliantly, and the wand the runes on it suddenly lit up and went out, and a bolt of lightning suddenly struck down from the heads of the two magicians in the shadows. The electric arc hit their bodies, and immediately split the purple mist around them. Two zombie-like magician puppets with pale faces and blood-red eyes emerged from the purple air mass. Their faces still maintained their appearance in life, but their eyes had turned black and purple, and they were exuding black devilish energy. Seeing the two young magicians in this state, Magician Gerald whispered the names of the two magicians, Hubert and Alan, and closed his eyes in pain. Then he waved his hand to the magicians behind him, and more than a dozen fireballs exploded on the two magicians one after another. The black flames instantly burned the two magicians to ashes. The magician at the entrance of the cave easily blew the two magic stone puppets into pieces, making the shadow terror in the cave feel a huge threat. The shadow terror once again let out a piercing scream, but everyone hid in the magic shield of the magician Gerald. Everyone just felt a tremor all over their bodies. They did not fall into a terrifying nightmare, but the sharp scream that shocked the soul. The roar still made all the magicians subconsciously cover their ears. Some young magicians with weak willpower even had a trace of blood coming out of the corners of their eyes, nostrils and mouths. A purple tentacle stretched out from the cave quietly, and the dark purple eyeball in the hand kept looking at the cave entrance. Captain Sauron held a double-edged sword and rushed in front of the eyeball like a gust of wind. The pupil in the eyeball suddenly opened wide, like a bottomless abyss, and halos with different colors kept rotating. Captain Lewin's footsteps became heavier and heavier. When he reached the opposite side of the eyeball, he stopped and looked straight at the eyeball. The double-edged sword in his hand fell to his feet with a clang sound. A crisp sound. The other magicians in the magic light, shield were also fascinated by the central eyeball of the purple tentacle hanging from the top of the cave wall. At this moment, only Gerald and Serdak were still awake, and several tentacles emerged from the cave wall. It stretched out and shot at the two of them like a spear. Gerald Magician was caught off guard and had no time to release the spell to protect himself. Those tentacles easily pierced the magic light shield and shot towards Gerald Magician's body. Wrap around. Serdak quickly rushed in front of the Magician Gerald and blocked the tentacles with a dwarf chain shield. At this time, Magician Gerald had time to quickly take out a scroll from his magic pocket, unfolded directly, and with a brief spell in his mouth. The magic scroll instantly turned into a piece of lightning and formed a thunder net and the surrounding people, the tentacles growing out of the stone wall quickly dispersed in the thunder net. The magician shrouded in thunder nets also quickly woke up from their nightmares. Captain Sauron was the first to wake up, before the tentacle in front of him could not evacuate in time. Captain Sauron slashed an eyeball with his sword again. The moment the eyeball shattered, it formed a ball of black fire, and was instantly reduced to ashes. At this time, a large number of knights from the guard camp gathered outside the cave, but they did not enter the cave rashly. Attention all members of the law enforcement team. Prepare to cast the continuous fireball spell. We will send the shadow terror back to H. L. Magician Gerald raised his wand high and issued an order to the magician behind him. A group of magicians waved their wands at the same time. And a dark red six-pointed star array appeared under the feet of almost all the magicians. Hot fire elements filled the cave. And rolling fireballs appeared out of thin air. These fireballs were not only slowly rotating, but also burning on them with blazing flames. As a magician's spell ended, three fireballs flew into the cave, followed by dozens of similar fireballs flying into the cave. These fireballs exploded in the cave one after another. The successive explosions caused the cave to shake continuously, and the shadow terror's more violent screams came from inside. Magician Gerald once again propped up a magic shield to resist the soul scream that made people lose their mind. At this time, he glanced at Captain Sauron, who was standing at the front. The hot breath came out and walked towards the cave. Suldak and a group of magicians followed closely behind. At this time, some knights from the guard camp outside the cave also bravely walked in. At the front were the squadron captains of the guard camp, and Carl was among them. When everyone walked into the cave hall, they saw that the shadow terror was burning with black fire. After being baptized by a series of fireballs, the shadow terror's body was only half its original size and the tentacles that stretched out were all it had been blown to pieces and turned into a pile of ashes when it fell to the ground. The six test benches in the cave hall have basically collapsed. Only the magic circle in the center is still in operation. It continuously absorbs the shadow breath from the surroundings and replenishes it into the body of the shadow terror, allowing him to compete with the power of the world's laws. The black fire burned, 
and the Shadow Terror's body had several large mouths, which were constantly opening and closing at this time. The big handful of bone spurs and the black door in the center of the circle were pulling the Shadow Terror's mouth, body, trying to drag it back to H, L. This is the gate of hell. These black magicians have been hiding here to study the magic circle connecting the H, L world. And they actually succeeded in their research. Magician Gerald said in shock. Our spells can't destroy it. Teacher, can you take that thing out? The young magician on the side reminded. Relying too much on magic devices will not be of much help to your cultivation. Gerald reached out from his magic pocket and took out a silver cylinder covered with inscriptions. I saw that there were actually seven gemstone bases installed on this cylinder. And the bases were not inlaid with magic crystal fragments. But complete magic crystal stones. Magician Gerald did not issue any instructions. The young magicians behind stepped forward and set up the cylinder with their shoulders. Magician Gerald inserted a golden key into the keyhole behind the cylinder and pressed one hand on the wall of the cylinder. Suddenly the runes on the entire cylinder lit up. A kind of destruction. The breath emanated from the cylinder, frightening the shadow terror to keep retreating. It didn't care about the bone spurs protruding from the door of H, L. Its body was completely pressed against the door of H, L. And it even wanted to crawl back. But how could Magician Gerald give it this chance? As the magic patterns on the cylinder lit up, a light bullet slowly appeared in the cylinder, and a magic crystal on the wall of the cylinder slowly appeared. It shattered into powder with a pop sound, and a massive amount of magic power gathered inside the cylinder. Boom! A strong beam of light ejected from the cylinder and instantly hit the body of the Shadow Terror a hundred meters away. A light ball appeared inside the Shadow Terror's body, and the strong light from the light ball penetrated the body of the Shadow Terror was destroyed. And then the Shadow Terror's body was completely torn apart by the light group. Even the gate of hell that was connected to the Terror was completely destroyed by the energy erupted from the light group. The remaining dark purple flesh and blood had no energy source, and was quickly burned to ashes by the black fire formed by the power of the world's laws. Serdek opened his mouth and looked at the scene in front of him in surprise. After the light bomb shot out of the cylinder exploded silently. It was more like a flash bomb without forming any shock wave. And the terror was right under the light bomb. Falling apart, Captain Sauron stood next to Serdek, patted his shoulder with a pleased expression, and asked in a slightly hoarse voice, Have you never seen a magic cannon? Serdek nodded repeatedly and looked at Captain Sauron with curiosity. Captain Sauron knew what he wanted to hear and said, This magic cannon is an ancient magic device passed down from the Hex era. It is one of the few magic devices of the Helanza Magic Union. Sauron, this is top secret information in the Helanza Magic Guild. You'd better not talk about these taboo topics in front of the members of the law enforcement team. We don't want our trump card to be known to everyone. Gerald the Magician coughed slightly beside him and reminded Captain Sauron calmly. Okay, I know the rules of your law enforcement team. At this time, are you letting people come in to clean the battlefield? Captain Sauron changed the subject and said, as he spoke, Magician Gerald frowned, looked at the six collapsed test benches in the stone chamber, and said in a deep voice, It seems that this is the Black Magic Hermitage Magic Laboratory we have been looking for. There are a total of there are six test beds, indicating that there are at least six black magicians leading this magic circle research project. Now it seems that there is only one black magician left here. Your security battalion must cooperate with us this time to find out as soon as possible. The true identities and whereabouts of those black magicians remain. The guard battalion has a duty to do this, Captain Sauron said with his chest raised. At this time, Soldak felt someone greeting him from behind. When he turned around, he realized that it was Carl waving to him from behind, with a look of concern on his face. Chapter 355 The Source of Fear in My Heart After the Grenfell Manor incident, the nobles in the city of Helensa began to perform around the purges of the Black Magic Monastery. Nobles with eye tattoos on certain parts of their bodies will be subject to very strict scrutiny. Many noble families' young members were involved, which made the daily work of the guard battalion very busy. At the same time, I don't know how many young nobles were confined at home, or simply left Alensa City to study outside. However, the truth is unknown whether those young nobles left their hometowns to pursue their dreams, or to avoid the huge wave that was set off in the aristocratic circle of Alensa City. In this incident, the Magic Guild Law Enforcement Group lost two magicians, and two magicians were injured, which can be regarded as paying a heavy price. Of course, no one will die in vain. These two magicians died in the line of duty, and gave the Magic Guild in Hylon what Seiching brought was a greater voice. 
the influence of traditional aristocratic forces was further reduced in this incident. Most people who knew about it believed that it was the stubbornness, arrogance, and conservatism of these traditional aristocratic families that became the source of black magic, a benign soil for the spread and survival of the priory. For a while, the civilians in Alenza City also complained against the nobles, those with black eyes, whether they were peripheral members of the Black Magic Monastery or not, would not have a good time during this period. The House of Representatives requested a guard camp, restore good law and order in Helenza City as soon as possible. This group of knights from the guard camp are like mad dogs biting people everywhere in the city. They ride black horses and wear full black armor. So they are nicknamed Black Dogs by the city residents. Obviously this was not a nickname. But soon the whole city accepted this nickname for the guard camp knight. As a result, the Helensa Opera House was closed for a month for large-scale rectification. Some of the Opera House dancers, who had some friendship with Samoa were investigated by the Magic Guild Law Enforcement Team, or could simply be said to be under surveillance. Although this group of people was not put him in prison, but he has to go to the guard camp every week and report his week's itinerary, including where he went every day, who he met, and what he did. If he doesn't want to arouse the suspicion of the knights in the guard camp, it's best to just confine yourself at home. During this period, a heavy snowfall fell in the city of Holanza, completely turning the city into silver. Soldek's life was back on track. He still had to go to class every day with his cultural books. Assistant Professor Pablo changed some courses for him, so that he could finally participate in some physical training classes. However, in the Knight Academy, those training knights who didn't know Sirdek secretly still called him the Clerk Knight thinking that he was the knight with the least fighting ability among the many commissioned knights. I don't know how many people here say, The grapes are sour. In short, Soldak did not escape his indecent nickname because of the Grenfell Park incident. Many people in the Knight Academy believe that Serdak returned safely because the black magician kidnapped instructor Darcy Christie. After all, she was the daughter of Consul Christie of Alinsa City. After the winter comes in Alanza City, people put on thick winter clothes. People walking on the street no longer walk lazily. They step on the crunchy snow. Everyone is cautious. For fear of slipping. Unfortunately, I broke my limbs in this cold and freezing season. I have to wait until next spring to get out of bed. Although the city has more abundant supplies than the countryside, it is only for civilians with jobs and assets. For the nobles, every cold winter is not so friendly to the vagrants. Poor people and down-and-out nobles in the city. The cold wind blew on his face. Serdak wiped the frost and snow from his mouth. He regretted running out to blow the cold wind in this weather. If he had known it was so cold outside, he should have lied on the bed in the dormitory and watched those interesting grim empires. History books. He is currently reading Secret History of the Royal Court of Angel Boulder. The aesthetic and emotional entanglements of the royal members in it have opened his eyes. It turns out that the queens of the Green Empire are not only human beings, but also include the silver moon on the World Tree City. The elves, Janna in the Endless Sea, and even earlier, the winged princess in the Sky City and the female dragon in the Kingdom of Dragons. Of course, college life is quite interesting. The two neighbors in the dormitory next door, Lena and Nedra, started their second year experience trip the day before yesterday. They were said to be going to the Red Pine Forest in the east of Helensa City to clean up the forest there. Grey Wolf. In recent years, the Red Pine Forest has become a potential safety hazard with wolves attacking villages every year. Serdak didn't know if they could successfully peel off the gray wolf skins, but it didn't matter whether they could peel them off or not. Those wolf skins weren't very valuable anyway. What was slightly more valuable were the wolf teeth and wolf ears. Go back to the logistics and military supplies office of Holanza City to exchange for some modest rewards. As for those wolf fangs, they can only be purchased from shops that sell hunting bows. Merchants use them to make some wolf fong bone arrows which are better than the standard fine steel in the army. Arrows. The hunters in the city of Holanza are more recognized by the wolf fong arrows. These days, Serdak hangs out in the classroom of the Knight Academy every day, seeing the trainee knights who are 10 years younger than him sitting around him. Serdak can't help but hold his forehead with his hands in pain. Although he is already a member of the Holanza City Guard Battalion in name, he still needs to attend classes at the Knight Academy honestly. Otherwise he will not get the graduation certificate. This knight certificate is the key to whether he can become an official knight. Serdak sat on the railing by the roadside at the gate of the Knight Academy. He was flipping through the magic pocket on his body. He had found a magic pocket from the black magician. There were many valuable things in it. 
including 10 three magic crystals and five gold coins, a magic robe, an antique black magic book, and a thick magic notebook. In addition, there are some strange magic materials and some magic herbs that are in high demand on the market. More than a dozen magic scrolls of different types and magic potions with no apparent purpose. Before Serdak figured out the specific use and value of these things, he had no intention of taking them to a magic shop and selling them. And he was not short of money now. Recently, Soldak has gained two new friends, Darcy Christie and Lance. He was sitting on the railing at the gate of the college, where he had made an appointment with Lance to meet. Although Darcy Christie did not admit the friendship between the two, the two had interacted since the last time they were kidnapped by the Black Magician. Soldak would occasionally go to the Sword Hall and meet Professor Let's Compete with Darcy Christie in swordsmanship. However, Darcy Christie's swordsmanship is the same as Hathaway's. Most of them are fancy routines. They may look dazzling, but they are not practical swordsmanship honed on the battlefield. This kind of sword skills can only win applause in the arena. Nothing more. Of course, Darcy Christie strongly disagrees with this. She feels that her weak physical fitness, lack of strength and speed have led to many flaws in her sword skills. As long as she has a set of primary magic pattern structure, it will be enough to make up for these flaws. When the time comes, she will you can become a real intermediate swordsman and kill everyone on the battlefield. Soldak was not prepared to tell her the truth. He felt that there was nothing wrong with a person having some dreams and pursuits. Darcy Christie was destined not to go to the battlefield anyway. And there was no need to look directly at the cruelty there. Sometimes, the two of them would have lunched together in the college cafeteria. The students in the Knight Academy were naturally envious of Soldak being able to get close to instructor Darcy Christie. Some even prayed that a certain black magician would come next time. When the teacher comes to the Knight Academy and kidnaps instructor Darcy Christie, it would be best to kidnap him as well. As for the young magician Lance, the members of the Magic Guild Law Enforcement Team are currently taking a break and have not taken any outside missions. Lance has been conducting some simple magic experiments in the Magic Guild's laboratory these days and occasionally sneaks out, chat with Serdak or something. The Magic Guild is not far from the Knight Academy and Lance feels that Serdak deserves to be developed into a peripheral member of the Magic Guild. Every magician noble needs a Knight Retinue so that they can protect them at close range during battle. Magicians master some powerful magic skills and can attack opponents from a distance. But their bodies are weaker than ordinary people. Once you are approached by the enemy on the battlefield, you will face great danger. So many magician nobles will have their own knights. In the Grinfell Manor incident, the Magic Guild's law enforcement team also joined forces with the knights of the Helensa Guard Battalion to act together. I just didn't expect that the opponent's magician would actually sacrifice his life in the end forcefully open the door to H, L, and summon a shadow terror. Although this shadow terror was suppressed by the power of the laws of the Roland continent, it's still showing great strength. According to the subsequent analysis by Magician Gerald of the Magic Guild Law Enforcement Group, it was pure luck that two of the four magicians in the cave survived. The magician Lance was wearing a black and white striped devotional robe. He jumped out of a magic caravan. His feet slipped, and he almost fell into the snow wall on the roadside. He was wearing a pair of exaggerated pointed leather shoes and holding a hand. He was holding a magic book and wearing a gray wool scarf. And his whole body looked very bloated. He stepped on the snow. And two streaks of white steam came out of his nose. He walked carefully to Soldak. Stopped. Showed his white teeth towards Soldak. And said, It's such a cold day. Do you want to go drink? Have a drink? The impression that the people of Holanza gave to Soldak. Whether they were knights or magicians. Young or old, their favorite thing to say when meeting was do you want to have a drink together? This made Serdak a little speechless. Serdak didn't plan to get drunk in the morning. When the magician Lance saw that Serdak didn't respond, he rubbed his still frozen hands vigorously and said, Okay, didn't you say that there are some things that I need to identify? Otherwise you can go to my laboratory. Sitting on the side? You may not know that some appraisals require some special magic crystals. Seeing that Soldak did not respond positively, the magician Lance smiled. Of course, I asked you out this time because the Magic Guild received authoritative information from Benna City. The Shadow Terror is not only it can emit soul screams to make people fall into nightmares and be unable to extricate themselves. It can also control nightmares to make people feel fear and despair. Finally, taking advantage of the collapse of the spiritual world, it breaks through the spiritual defense line in nightmares thereby controlling and occupying people's bodies and transforming them into human beings. Become his puppet. Of course, 
it can also make people fall into nightmares. And then use some means to kill them silently. The magician land said while making gestures. The former can enhance one's own strength. And the latter is simpler and more effective. He pulled Serdak onto his magic caravan. The carriage was very warm. He leaned on the brown soft leather sofa and gave Serdak a glass of light green transparent liquid. He also poured himself a glass. And then enjoyed himself. He took a sip. Lance said to Soldak. Do you know what kind of despair I faced at that time? A red dragon crouched in front of me. If you hadn't woken me up, it is possible that the giant dragon in the nightmare would have been there. It would swallow me up in one bite. If that were the case, I might have become the magic puppet of this shadow terror. In fact, it was not a real dragon at all. Just a fear that I absolutely did not dare to face. But I was really about to collapse. Then Lance added, My friend Merlin even dreamed that he was being entangled by Medusa. Just as those beautiful eyes were about to look at him. I pushed him awake. Lance asked curiously. I'm a little curious. What kind of fear did you experience and actually woke up from the nightmare? Lance asked such a question. And Serdak immediately understood that this should be a routine investigation by the Magic Union Law Enforcement Team. Otherwise Lance would never ask such a question rashly. Which is probably what Lance said. Magic the top leaders of the Union Law Enforcement Team couldn't understand why they could wake up from the nightmare. So they asked Lance to come forward to do some investigations. Soldak held the cup of green snot-like liquid under his nose and smelled it. There was a faint apple set in the cup. Although he knew that it would definitely not taste too bad. Soldak still didn't have the courage to take a sip. He put the glass on the table, rubbed his forehead with his fingers, and pondered for a moment before saying, How should I put it? There is a big lake in front of my house. In winter, the lake will be covered with a thick layer of ice. In the coldest winter, sometimes, if you cut a hole in the lake ice, you will catch the fish in the lake. When I was a child, I was afraid of falling into this kind of ice hole. Once I fell into the cold lake water, not only would my whole body be frozen, but also after sinking, it is very likely that I will not be able to find the exit of the ice cave. And even if I can swim, I will only be able to stick to the ice. This is the fear in my heart. Lance didn't expect that the fear in Soldak's heart was actually this. What's so scary about this? Serdak smiled shyly and said, I remember using the craftsman's sword to cut through the ice. Even if I overcame this fear. Lance suddenly had a strange thought in his mind. It seems that being ignorant as a child is not without its benefits. Of course, Soldak would not say that he dreamed about his homework in middle school. He just said vaguely, As for some nightmares later, some of them cannot be regarded as fears hidden in my heart at all. Some of them may be some of my memories. In fact, he was not married in his previous life. And he didn't even have a girlfriend. He just talked about life with his friends while drinking. It is not terrible to be a successor. I am afraid that even if the son he raises is not his. How terrifying that would be. How hopeless it would feel. So for these illusory things, even in a dream, Soldak could clearly tell that they were not real. He smiled and said to Lance, Of course, I have also experienced some illusory things. But it is not the dragon or the ancient giants and so on. Maybe that shadow terror doesn't understand the so-called fear hidden in its heart. And it may not be considered fear at all in front of Adyosi. As for death after old age, isn't he reborn? What's so scary about that? Soldak confessed to Lance. In the end, when I faced life and death, I didn't care about that form of death at all. Lance was a little speechless when he heard what Cernak said. He said as he could understand. Yes, you can sense the sacred attribute elements and have the power of holy light. Even if you die in the future, you will naturally enter the kingdom of God. So Lance discovered that Cernak had such potential and tried to persuade him. By the way, would you like to reconsider my previous proposal? Becoming a peripheral member of the Magic Guild Law Enforcement Group. You will enjoy many benefits. Serdak rubbed his forehead helplessly and said, Please, I just joined the guard camp last month. I know. I just hope you can think about it again. After all, our law enforcement regiment has a much better reputation than the guard camp. Lance. Chapter 356 Leg Injury The carriage became quiet again. Unable to convince Soldak. Lance had to change the subject and said, Baron Grenfell will be put on trial next Monday and may be sent to the guillotine or the stake. The nobles hope to send him to the guillotine and let him a more dignified death. But the Magic Guild advocates sending him to the stakes to completely remove the mark of the devil from his body. Soldak thought of his cronies, the Dark Red Knight, and if he were there, Baron Grenfell might be rescued by him. 
One third of the red pine forest outside the city of Halinsa belongs to the territory of Baron Grinfell. These territories are destined to be confiscated. The forest farm has been targeted by many nobles in the city of Halinsa. And how to divide it up the conclusion has long been made. And Carl was still lamenting that he could not get a share of the forest farm. Wizard Lance continued, None of Baron Grinfell's eleven children were born to Margaret, Mrs. Grinfell. It is said that they were tortured by Margaret at home. Now, their fate will not change. The younger ones are okay and will be sent to the War College of Benna City to study. The older ones may face being sent to the Plain Battlefield to participate in cruel Plain Wars. Maybe will be incorporated into the Infantry Regiment and become Cannon Fodder. Now that he was talking about Cannon Fodder, Soldak thought of the 57th Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment who died in Moyenling and felt like a stone was stuck in his chest. By the way, how are your legs? Lance looked at Soldak's right leg and asked him. After Soldak's right leg was injured by a fireball in the cave, it did not heal as quickly as other wounds. Instead, there were signs of ulceration on the edge. In the past few days, Serdak used the power of the holy light every morning and night. The leg injury was treated, but the wound has not improved so far. It hurts occasionally, and it feels like a tendon injury. It's usually fine and doesn't affect walking. Serdak showed an indifferent expression on his face, and even patted the bandage wrapped around his leg with his hand. Lance pondered for a moment and said to Soldak, I know a magic scholar who is proficient in magical biology and human anatomy. He occasionally treats some weird patients. If I have time, I can take you there. Visit him. Soldak had his own plan. He hesitated and then said to Lance, Just wait and see. I think it can recover slowly on its own. If the injury continues to worsen, then go visit the magician. It's not too late. Okay. If you need to see that magic scholar, just come to me. Magician Lance nodded. At this time, the carriage drove to the long street near the magic guild. Magic shops could be seen everywhere on the street. Serdak planned to sell all the magic materials, magic scrolls, and potions obtained from the black magicians, and keep them with him anyway. It's of no use either. The two had a barbecue at a restaurant opposite the magic guild, and then parted ways in front of the restaurant. This made Serdak even more certain that Lance came to chat with him. In fact, the main reason was to understand how he overcame the source of fear in his heart. Even magicians with strong mental power like them can't escape from the control of the Shadow Terror. However, a knight like himself who has just joined the guard camp can get rid of his inner fear. This is probably the case for those senior magicians in the Magic Union. There is nothing to figure out either. Serdak glanced at the dazzling sun in the sky and planned to walk back to the Knight Academy, which was not too far away from the Knight Academy. The moment he walked into the dormitory building, passed through the dimly lit corridor, and climbed the stairs, he felt a sharp pain in his right leg again. Serdak staggered and almost fell. The wound on the leg would cause unbearable severe pain from time to time. The pain seemed to be burning his soul. Serdak stood at the top of the stairs and took a breath before stumbling up. Climbing up the wooden stairs, a group of 13 or 14-year-old apprentice knights ran down. They were enthusiastically discussing the competition on the night training ground. These energetic young people, after learning equestrian skills, would go to night training when they had the opportunity. Practice equestrian skills. They happened to be face to face with Serdak. The training knight who was walking at the front saw that Serdak was struggling to walk. So he asked enthusiastically, Soldak, do you need help? Serdak waved his hand and said to the training knight, No, I'm fine. There was still some fine sweat on his forehead. And he didn't look like he was okay. Seeing that Serdak rejected everyone, the group of young training knights waved to Serdak and walked out of the dormitory together. The clerk knight seems to have an old injury, and it looks like a recurrence of the old injury. No wonder he never participates in physical training classes. He returned to Alinsa from the plain battlefield, probably because he has some old wounds that cannot be healed. I see that he has some difficulty with his legs and feet. He may have suffered a leg injury. A group of young training knights thought they had found the real answer to why Serdak did not participate in physical training classes, and they walked further, and further away from each other while discussing. Soldak climbed up to the third floor. The pain in his leg had disappeared without a trace. He pushed open the door of the dormitory, walked to his wooden bed and sat down. He took off his linen pants and wrapped his right leg around the outside of the tibia. A thick layer of gauze was covered with it. At this time, the gauze was obviously stained with blood seeping out from inside. He carefully untied the gauze layer by layer, 
revealing a wound the size of a gold coin on the outside of the tibia. At this time, the wound had festered into a bloody hole. Serdak gritted his teeth and used a dagger to scrape off the erosion near the wound. The wound was not only there was no sign of healing, but it seemed to be a little bigger than before. He sat quietly on the bed and meditated quietly for a while with his eyes closed. His whole body glowed with a layer of pale golden light. The sacred aura in the nodes continued to flow with his body, and an even richer sacred aura gathered in his hands. He pressed his hand on the wound on his right leg, and saw that the flesh and blood near the wound was full of vitality. Countless flesh and blood wanted to gather together, but there was a strange smell left in the wound, which prevented the leg wound from healing. There was a layer of fine sweat on Serdak's forehead. After he wiped it with his hand, he decided to try the last method. He hesitated for a moment before locking the bedroom door from the inside and closing the curtains. Then he took out four pottery bowls from the magic pocket and ignited the blue flames. He recited the incantation in the temporary altar and opened the door. The sacrificial ceremony. The two-faced, four-armed demon statue emerged. This time he walked up to the god's face and took out a sand wolf head and placed it at his feet. Then three symbols representing the blessed body, blessed shield and eye of truth appeared in front of Serdak. Serdak skillfully chose the blessed body and touched it habitually. Looking at the blessing shield magic symbol, his hand stopped in midair. He thought that in the night academy, even if he chose the blessing shield layer of buffs, he would actually not use it at all. This sand wolf head can give him two effects. Serdak hesitated for a moment and touched the third symbol representing the eye of truth. Two beams of light filled with sacred aura descended from the sky and landed on Serdak's body. The increase in strength and strong recovery brought by the divine blessing body allowed the wound on his right leg to begin to heal. At the same time, with the help of the ability brought by the Eye of Truth, Serdak's injury suddenly had a strange gray aura that constantly rejected the restorative power brought by the blessed body. The two forces were in a stalemate at the wound on his leg. It was obvious that the restorative power of the blessed body combined with the power of holy light in the body had the upper hand. Constantly suppressing the gray aura, and his leg wound began to slowly heal little by little. Serdak finally breathed a sigh of relief, and rewrapped the wound with a hemostatic bandage. He was thinking that the effect of the blessed body would last for at least two days, during which time the leg injury would heal anyway. During this short period of time, Serdak also possessed the ability of the Eye of Reality. His understanding of the ability of the Eye of Reality was limited to the fact that he could peer into the inner layer of the fur when peeling it. Allowing himself to peeling off the leather perfectly would also allow him to peek into the hidden magic patterns of life hidden on the body of Warcraft. Unfortunately, there was no Warcraft leather on hand to peel off. So he could only use the Eye of True State to look around the room. Scan it once. He put away the items for the sacrificial ceremony. And with a flash of inspiration in his mind, he took out a magic scroll from his magic belt bag. The magic scroll in his hand was rolled into a tube. At this moment, Serdak's eyes showed a completely different picture than usual. Layers of magic symbols gathered together to form a mysterious magic pattern array. The magic power of the scroll continued to flow. The traces flowed slowly, and he held the scroll in his hand. It felt like he was holding a beam of light blue mana light that was more than a foot long. Unfortunately, he didn't know anything about magic, so he couldn't see the use of this scroll. When he took out the second magic scroll, he finally discovered that there were some essential differences between the two scrolls. That is, the mana properties contained in these scrolls were somewhat different. These differences showed different colors in his eyes. Like it is the first magic scroll with a light blue halo. Serdak can feel the faint water element breath. While the second scroll is obviously an orange red mana light beam, which is clearly a warm and restless fire element breath. And the magic power contained in the scroll is also obviously much stronger than the first one. Unexpectedly, the Eye of Truth actually gave him this ability, which surprised Serdak in his heart. He obtained a total of 13 magic scrolls from the Black Magician's magic pocket. At this time, he took them all out of the magic pocket and placed them neatly on his bed. Then 13 short magic light pillars clearly appeared in front of his eyes. And these magic light pillars were divided into three colors. There were four scrolls containing the light blue water element aura. And there were six other scrolls full of shadows. Breath. The magical power contained in this scroll is several times stronger than those of water element scrolls. Only three scrolls have fire element breath. While the effect of the Eye of Truth had not disappeared, Serdak quickly made marks on these magic scrolls that only he could understand. He used charcoal to write water, darkness and fire on the edges of the scrolls. In fact, 
He just didn't see the magic symbols printed on the outside of these scrolls. Serdak took out the bottles of magic potions in his magic pocket again. Serdak had seen life healing potions and detoxification potions. But the magic potions in the black magician's pocket were dark green and light blue. Color. There are only two bottles of each potion. Now take them out and place them on the bed. Under the eye of truth, the light blue magic potion in the test tube shaped glass bottle presented brighter blue magic spots. Which made Serdak feel like sunlight shining into the blue sea. And the two bottles of dark green magic potion were not antidote. At this moment, Serdak looked through the glass bottle at the green liquid inside. And could see the thick green aura inside constantly rolling in the bottle. And sometimes skulls appeared. The phantoms appeared. And those skulls were like bubbles in bottles. Constantly forming and disappearing. Serdak felt that these two bottles were more like some kind of poison. Unexpectedly, with the help of the Eye of Truth, he could actually distinguish the general attributes of these magic scrolls and magic potions. At least, he could distinguish between good and bad. This made Serdak feel very energetic. He took out the magic book from the magic pocket, which was covered with a layer of simple carved copper. The complicated patterns on the copper surface of the magic book now turned into something tangled in Serdak's eyes. With the magic symbols together, he casually opened the hidden button on the magic book and opened the magic book, which was so heavy that it could almost kill someone. Unexpectedly, the pages in the magic book were all bound with magic parchment. These the magic sheepskin is soft and thick, and an 8 centimeter thick magic book only has less than 20 pages. Opening the first page of the magic book, a dark magic circle emerged from the parchment, floating on the magic book and slowly rotating. Dozens of magic runes were clearly visible in Serdak's eyes. It turned out to be a picture. On the structural drawings of the magic pattern array, Serdak just looked at a few magic runes and felt dizzy in the sea of spirit. Obviously, these profound magic runes were not within his grasp. So this was the reason why he felt dizzy. This force of repulsion. Serdak quickly closed the page and closed his eyes. After relaxing for a few minutes, the dizziness in his mind slowly disappeared. Serdak didn't let that stop him. He took out the black magic robe from the magic waste bag and placed it on the bed. Originally, there was nothing strange about the black cloth of the magic robe. But at this moment, Serdak looked like there was actually something on this magic robe. Hidden is a large magic pattern array. This magic pattern array is still flowing with the flow of mana. Those magic pattern lines almost run through the entire robe. The magic pattern array on this magic robe doesn't seem to be mysterious. At least Serdak doesn't feel dizzy when he sees the magic patterns on it. Chapter 357 Encounter on the Street Serdak put these magic items back into his magic waste bag, then stood up and opened the curtains, letting the dazzling sunlight shine into the faded brown oak floor. He opened the window, and a sparrow fluttered from the eaves. After flying away, the cold air outside hit my face. All the leaves in the small garden below the dormitory had fallen. The low shrub walls and a few sycamore trees looked bare. The lawn was covered with a layer of snow, and there were some messy things on it. Footprint in the open space in the center of the small garden. There are several trainee knights who are practicing swinging their swords. Their movements are a little out of shape, and their lunges are not solid at all. But they are very serious. They also choose practice wooden swords that are slightly heavier than knights' long swords. It snowed twice since the beginning of winter, although the afternoon sun was exceptionally bright. The cold wind still felt like a knife blowing on my face. Serdak glanced at the thick craftsman's sword at his waist. This craftsman's sword was re-received from the guard camp. The previous one had been damaged in Grenfell Manor. And Serdak burned it until it was completely destroyed. After the dark craftsman's sword was brought to the logistics department of the guard camp, Gwendolyn directly approved the scrapping order and gave him a brand new one. He didn't plan to wear the standard full-cover black iron armor all day long. Not to mention it was bulky. The main reason was that when he walked in the academy, others would point at him from behind and call him, I Lance a black dog. In contrast, the title clerical knight is milder. Many knights like to wear leather armor with light texture. Serdak said of Warcraft leather armor was damaged in the battle with a dark red knight. Now if he wants to buy a suit that fits better, he has to go to the leather shop to have it custom made. And Serdak Dark's magic waste bag also contains some high-grade salamander leather, which is suitable for making leather armor. Through Carl's introduction, Soldak found a leather shop that could cut and make high-grade leather and made an appointment there in the afternoon to customize a set of more personal fitting salamander leather armor. Number 59 Killin Loka Street is located on the easternmost side of the small townhouse facing the street. This leather shop does not have a conspicuous plaque. 
It only has a leather curtain around the rainproof eaves at the door. The attic glass windows are wiped very clean. Through the glass window, you can see many exquisite leather goods on the shelves inside. A shop assistant wearing a white shirt and leather vest is holding a brush and applying grease to maintain the leather goods on the shelves. Serdak stepped off the magic caravan, paid the driver a silver coin, turned around and walked into the leather shop in front of him. When I opened the door, I touched a string of wind chimes hanging on the rainproof eaves leather curtain. And then I remembered a series of sweet wind chimes. The shop clerk was a handsome blonde young man. He put down the leather protective gear in his hand, walked toward Seldak, and asked with a smile, Mr. Knight, this is the Abe Leather Shop. What do you need? The room was filled with wooden shelves, on which were placed various styles of leather items, leather armors, leather bags, and exquisite saddles. Serdak walked next to a wooden man, which was covered with a suit of leather. A. The exquisite tailoring skills allowed Serdak to find no seams in the leather armor, and the texture of this beige leather armor was very soft, and it felt like a girl's skin. Serdak stopped and said to the shop assistant, Master Abe and I have made an appointment to meet in the afternoon. Are you the knight of Serdak? The store clerk asked tentatively. Seeing Serdak nodded slightly, he quickly led him into the rest area inside, poured him a cup of warm milk tea, and said, You please sit here first. I will go and notify Teacher Abe right away. There are many pieces of leather hanging on the white walls around the rest area. There are handwritten notes underneath these palm-sized pieces of leather. They include Geomancer, Swamp Giant Crocodile, Two-Headed Basilisk, spiny tail Crystal Lion, Salamander, Basilisk, White there are all kinds of skin samples of rhinoceros and other second-level monsters. And they are all explained in detail. Serdak stood nearby and watched with interest. Several pieces of cyan armor the size of a palm were placed on a specially customized shelf. The scales actually had a series of dark lines. Soldak wanted to get closer and take a closer look. A middle-aged man walked in from the door. And the young shop assistant followed him obediently. Serdak guessed that he should be the private leather-making master. When Carl introduced him to the Abe leather-making master, he told him that the protective gear made by this master was very popular in the city of Alinsa. Leatherworker Abe looks to be in his 40s or 50s, with a neatly trimmed beard. He wears a white shirt and leather vest similar to those of a store clerk. He looks smart and capable. He has a measuring tape on his shoulders and looks from the inside. Walk out. When he came to Serdak, he looked at Serdak carefully from bottom to top, and then said straight to the point, I am Abe a leather craftsman in the city of Valenza. I heard Carl say that your skills there is some salamander leather in there. Are you planning to make a set of leather armor? Soldek nodded quickly and said, I am officially here for this matter. Abe leaned on the sofa, gathered up his scattered curly hair, and asked, Are you going to make ordinary high-grade leather armor? Or the base material for the magic pattern structure? Master Ibe, is there any difference between the two? Sardak asked with some confusion. Of course. Leatherwork Master Abe said. He took out two drawings from under the square table and explained to Soldak with reference to the drawings. Making an ordinary high-grade leather armor does not count for the integrity of Warcraft leather. Hi. As long as there is enough leather, it can be made. As for the base material of the magic pattern structure, the texture of the high-grade leather used must be very particular. In addition, if there are too many hidden wounds on the leather, it is not suitable for making magic patterns the base material for the magic pattern structure. Those inscription masters have almost strict requirements for the base material for the magic pattern structure. Then I think. Serdak hesitated. He had never thought about making a magic pattern base material before. However, Serdak has learned more about magic pattern constructs recently, especially since the Dark Red Knight and Captain Sauron both wore magic pattern constructs, showing extremely powerful combat power. Serdak Dak had some spare money on hand so he would naturally have some ideas, seeing that Serdak was hesitant. Master Abe smiled slightly and said, Knight Serdak, you don't have to decide right away. I want to take a look at the high-grade leather you prepared first. I once met a customer who prepared 10 high-grade white rock rhinoceros leathers in one go in order to make a magic pattern construction base material. However, these leathers were covered with hidden wounds. In the end, I can't even put together a piece of magic pattern construction base material. I can only make some high-grade leather armor. Since you brought your own leather, I think it is necessary to do some appraisal first. Serdak took out three folded salamander skins from his magic pocket and piled them on the square table. It looked like a big pile, he said directly. Then let Master Abe take a look. 
Master Abe did not expect that Sardak would take out so many salamander skins at once. He carefully distinguished them and said, These are three very good salamander skins. The peeling method of this one is a bit too amateurish. In this case, it is not advisable to separate the leather at different places. When I take the materials in the future, I need to extend the leather from the waist and abdomen to the inside of the hind legs. If the leather in these places can be connected together, it can be made into a seamless front half of the breastplate in order to reserve a large area in the magic pattern structure for the inscription master to engrave the magic pattern array. Naturally, the fewer seams in the leather armor parts, the better, Serdak said with some surprise. It turns out there is so much talk about skinning. Master Abe laughed dryly. Of course, but although the division of these three salamander skins is not ideal, the texture of the leather is pretty good, and the lizard tail and belly skin are well preserved and fine. If you click on the cutting, you can piece together two sets of base materials for the magic pattern structure. And you can also use the leftover scraps to make five sets of ordinary high-grade leather armor without any problem. Actually, I only need one set. Sardak frowned slightly. He was not prepared to make so many sets of leather armor at once. Could he make them all for himself? Master Abe looked at Sardak with some astonishment and came to him to make high-grade leather armor. Isn't it to piece together a few more sets of magic pattern base materials? Then he said, it is a pity that this kind of high-grade leather cannot be used as the base material for magic pattern construction. You can think about it carefully before making a decision. Walking out of Abe's private leather shop, Soldak took a deep breath. He turned back and waved to Master Abe who was standing at the door to see him off. He turned and walked to the street. As he walked, he thought, the cost of custom-made leather armor is really expensive. Even ordinary high-end leather armor is more expensive than outside. The leatherworking shop is quite a bit taller. As for the base material for the magic pattern structure, the production cost of a set is five times that of ordinary Warcraft leather armor. Each set of magic pattern construction base materials actually requires 10 gold coins to be produced, which is really horrifyingly expensive. In the end, Serdek decided to follow Master Abe's advice and make full use of these leathers to make a set of ordinary high-grade leather armor and three sets of magic pattern structure base materials. After all, to make the magic pattern structure base materials, you still need to hire a leatherworking master. It is safer to do it, and the success rate of making magic pattern structures in the future will be higher. He took out 32 gold coins at once, which made Soldak feel a heartache in his heart. Fortunately, he obtained 13 magic crystals from the black magician. Of course, this was also the reason why Serdak had the confidence to make four sets of high-grade leather armors in one go. In addition, there will be a lot of salamander leather leftovers. Although it cannot be used as the base material for magic pattern construction, there is still no problem in making ordinary Warcraft leather armor. However, of course, these leftovers do not need to be all made into leather armor. It's certainly best to keep the leather in hand, as you'll have more options in the future. According to Master Abe, that set of ordinary leather armor can be used for daily wear, and the three sets of magic pattern construction base materials can be saved first. If you can get five sets, you can find an inscription master and try to make it for yourself. To make a set of magic pattern structure, ordinary inscription masters draw the magic pattern structure, although there is a high probability of failure. If you want to use five sets of leather armor base materials to build a set of magic pattern structure, the chance is still very high. Of course, the cost of asking an inscriptionist to make a magic pattern structure is even more outrageous. Many small nobles will regard the magic pattern structure as a small fortune which can be inherited to future generations almost like the territory. From this alone, it is not ugly. I wonder how expensive it is to draw a set of magic patterns. Soldak was walking on the street. Suddenly a magic caravan stopped on the street. Darcy Christie opened the carriage door and leaned out her upper body. She was wearing an exquisite long skirt. Even in the severe winter, she had to lift her shoulders. When she was exposed, she was hit by the cold wind, which made her shiver a little. She casually took a fur shawl from the maid behind her, jumped off the magic caravan, stood on the street and asked Serdak, Soldak, why are you here? She is tall and tall. She is half a head taller than Soldak when she wears dancing glass slippers. No matter which man she stands in front of, she will always face some height pressure. Soldak pointed to the row of townhouses on the street behind him, and then said, Oh, H. Lo, Darcy, I'm here to visit Master Abe, and ask him to make a set of leather armor for me. Darcy Christie nodded repeatedly. It seemed that she also knew the leatherworker Abe. 
she said to Soldak. The leather armor made by Master Abe is barely passable. The main reason is that there is no better leatherworking master in Halanza City. I just want to make a set of light armor. But I don't have any suitable leather on hand at the moment. I'm going to try my luck at the auction house tomorrow to see if I can buy a spiny tail crystal lion skin. Oops. I was here to chat. And I almost forgot to introduce you to you. Darcy Christie's expression was a little exaggerated. It could be seen that she had definitely not forgotten to introduce herself to her friends because of chatting. But was planning to chat with Suldek first. She was an arrogant, willful, and somewhat selfish noble lady with a certain. He has some unknowing bad temper. A young aristocratic lady emerged from the carriage. She was dressed almost the same as Darcy Christie. But she was much shorter than Darcy Christie. Her appearance was not as beautiful. But her quiet face was to Soldek. Said, but it is a bit familiar. A young nobleman jumped out of the carriage first. And then he reached out to help Miss Hoyle jump out of the carriage. The young man looked eager. And anyone could see that he and Miss Hoyle had an unusual relationship. Intimate. Since there was no news of Miss Hoyle's marriage, Soldak guessed that the two were probably a couple. Darcy Christie did not think that Soldak would know Miss Hoyle. So she directly introduced her. This is Miss Hoyle, the hostess of Hoyle Manor, who will be awarded the title of First Class Viscount. This is Miss Hoyle. It's Knight Ivan Baruch of the Baruch family in Helensa City. They are all my friends. This is Knight Serdak, my colleague at the Knight Academy. Hello, Knight Serdak. I have been hearing your name from Darcy recently. Miss Hoyle looked at Soldak deeply. She would never forget the tall man in front of her riding on the mountain road. With a majestic look on the horse, he killed the robbers and helped her when he was in the most embarrassing situation and needed help. Then, regardless of reward or mercy, he put her on the horse and let the old horse carry her back to Helanza City. She could have been more dignified and didn't have to act so embarrassed. At least, she would have changed out of the dress that was torn to pieces by the bandits. Thinking of this, she felt grateful and resentful in her heart. Intertwined. Good afternoon. Miss Hoyle. Knight Baruch. Cernak did not expect that he would meet Miss Hoyle one day, and secretly smiled bitterly in his heart. This city of Valenza is really a bit small. But the young nobleman put on a false smile and said kindly to Soldak, Please call me Ivan. It's rare to meet me here. I suggest we find a place to sit down and have a drink. Again, is drinking alcohol the way people in Alanza communicate? Soldak wanted to slap his forehead hard. Turn around and leave. Chapter 358 Black Curse Without accepting Ivan Baruch's invitation to have a drink, Soldak and Miss Darcy Christie stood on the street chatting for a while. The weather was relatively cold and a young lady wearing a noble court-style dress would soon be shivering from the cold, even if she was wearing a winter dress standing on the winter street. Darcy Christie casually chatted with Soldak and reminded him not to forgetting the afternoon training in the Swords Hall the day after tomorrow. She would reserve a practice room in advance, and then invite Miss Hoyle and Knight Ivan Baruch to board the carriage. Darcy Christie ordered the coachman to continue his previous journey. The coachman, huddled in his fur coat, quickly drove the carriage forward slowly. Serdak waved to the three young people, said, I won't forget, and watched them leave in the carriage. Two days later, in the morning, Serdak woke up from his dream when he felt a sharp pain in his right calf while lying in bed, climbing out of the bed and cutting off the hemostatic bandage covering the wound. Serdak suddenly discovered that the wound that seemed to be about to heal had actually returned to its original appearance. Surrounded by slowly festering blood holes, it was unexpected that even the power of the holy light could not heal the wound. The blessed body could only temporarily suppress the wound from deteriorating. Once the blessing effect disappeared, the wound deteriorated rapidly. Sir Duck finally realized there was some trouble. Although there are eleven sacrifices such as sand wolf heads and the magic waste bag, one cannot expect that these sacrifices will heal the leg injury. He bandaged the wound again, washed his face casually in the dormitory, asked for leave from assistant professor Pablo, and limped out of the college. The fallen leaves on the street were swept very clean. As I walked along the long street towards the Magic Guild, empty carriages would come by from time to time. I asked Serdak if he wanted to rent a Magic Caravan, but he was politely rejected. The distance between the Night Academy and the Magic Guild is not far. Although walking is a little inconvenient, it is definitely not impossible to walk. Entering the lobby on the first floor of the Magic Tower, with the help of the waitress at the front desk, Lance hurried out of the research room wearing a magic robe and asked Serdak with a face of surprise. Soldak Koo, have you changed your mind? Soldak was sitting in the waiting area of the lobby on the first floor, seeing Lance with an excited face. He waved his hand awkwardly and explained, 
Oh, no. I need your help this time. Didn't you say you knew someone last time? A magic scholar who is proficient in human anatomy can help me look at my leg injury. I want to see him. The power of the holy light seems useless. Oh my god. It's been almost two weeks. How did you delay it until now? Lance looked at Soldak speechlessly and said, I'm going to see Scholar Ferdinand right away. Come with me. Lance made a prompt decision and pulled Soldak along the spiral staircase to the second floor of the Magic Guild. Soldak said with some scruples, Lance, isn't this a little too abrupt? Lance waved his hand and comforted Soldak. It's okay. Scholar Ferdinand is very easygoing. As he was walking along the spiral staircase, a magician walked towards him in the corridor. Soldak stopped quickly and took the initiative to say H, Lo. Hello, Mr. Francis Magician. Magician Francis also looked surprised. He did not expect to see Serdak and asked quickly. Night, Serdak. Long time no see. Have you obtained fresh salamander meat again? Soldak stood in the corridor and said to Magician Francis, holding a tray of magic potion. That's not the case. My friend and I are here to visit a magic scholar. Francis glanced at the tray in his hand, signaled to Soldak that he was leaving immediately, and said very politely, that I still have things to do. If you need help, you can come to me at any time. Soldak quickly straightened his posture, saluted Francis Magician with a night salute, and said, Thank you, Mr. Francis Magician. When Magician Francis quickly walked into a laboratory with a tray, Lance said curiously next to Soldak, It turns out you have acquaintances in the Magic Guild. To be precise, Magician Francis is my client, Soldak explained. The two walked side by side in the corridor and there were always some magic apprentices rushing over. They looked very busy, and the entire magic union was filled with a tense atmosphere. Customer? Lance couldn't understand the word, so he repeated it. Serdak smiled and said, Sometimes I hunt salamanders in the mountains, and I take the salamander meat to Holanza city to sell it, and sometimes I send some to the magician. Salamander, are you still a demon hunter? Lance asked with an incredulous expression. If Serdak is a demon hunter, then Lance will need some troublesome procedures if he wants to cooperate with Serdak. The main reason is that the Magic Union does not trust those demon hunters who have no position and only have magic crystals in their eyes. Although the Demon Hunters Guild is a relatively loose organization, it undertakes various tasks like the Mercenary Guild, mainly focusing on hunting. Serdak knew about witchers, but he was currently only a reserve knight. So he said, I am not a witcher. I just happened to encounter salamanders twice in the Padlos Mountains. I have to say you are very lucky, Lance said with some envy. As a magician in the Magic Guild Law Enforcement Group, he doesn't think a salamander is difficult to deal with. He simply thinks that Serdak is very lucky. And not just anyone who enters Padlos Mountain will be able to deal with it. Those who encounter those elusive salamanders. This kind of fire-attributed monster is very popular among magicians. Regardless of the leather on its body, or the fresh flesh of the monster. The two walked to the door of a research room on the second floor of the spiral staircase. Lance stopped, straightened his collar outside the door, stood up straight, took a deep breath, knocked on the door, and faced inside, asked, Is Scholar Ferdinand here? The door was pushed open by a magician's assistant. He looked out from inside and said with a straight face, The scholar is doing experiments. If you have anything, you'd better come back tomorrow. Lance and Soldak looked at each other, not expecting to be rejected so happily. Just as they were about to turn around and leave, they heard someone in the room say, It's okay. Maggie, let them in. The magician's assistant looked at Soldak and Lance warily, pushed the door open, and stepped aside to let the two of them enter the research room. The research room is filled with various large and small glass jars. These glass jars are as big as a person and as small as a fist. They contain liquids of various colors and the liquids are soaked with the organs of certain creatures. The whole room is full of such glass jars. Preliminary estimates are that there are at least several hundred jars. A naked magician is sitting next to the test table, taking off a piece of lizard skin from his shoulder. Looking at him, he didn't feel any pain at all, and his flesh and blood were all bloody. Lance quickly stepped forward and handed over a piece of hemostatic gauze. The magic assistant also ran over and unfolded a magic scroll of hydrotherapy. A flash of white light flashed, and the wound on the magician's shoulder healed at a speed visible to the naked eye. At the same time, the pain caused the magician to grin and his face was almost distorted. After taking care of the wound on his shoulder, the magician put on his magic robe again. He had large tattoos on his chest and abdomen. 
Serdak knew that those magic patterns were a kind of magic pattern structure that could be drawn on the body. Originally, Swordsman Baikal said that his body is covered with burned scars. In the future, he may not be able to inscribe this kind of magic pattern structure on his body, which will greatly reduce the power he possesses. Unexpectedly, this Ferdinand scholar was actually doing some kind of experiment on his own body. Looking at the bloody scene, Soldak had to admire the courage of this Ferdinand scholar. This magic scholar was very approachable. He invited Lance and Soldak to sit in the sitting area next to him, and asked very enthusiastically, Oh, Lance, your vacation is not over yet? Lance said, My assignment is to leave the day after tomorrow. Scholar Ferdinand nodded, and then asked, So, what do you want from me? Lance pointed to Serdak beside him, and said to Scholar Ferdinand, This is my friend Knight Serdak. In fact, he encountered a little trouble and wanted to seek your help. Scholar Ferdinand was very considerate of Lance, pointed at him, and said helplessly, You are really good at causing trouble. Then he asked Serdak seriously, Knight Serdak, what can I do for you? Serdak quickly rolled up his loose trousers, revealing the bandaged leg inside, and said to Scholar Ferdinand, This leg was slightly injured, but it has never healed. Scholar Ferdinand was not polite, and immediately approached Soldak, squatted beside his legs, and said seriously, Let me take a look. Serdak untied the wrapped bandage, and the blood hole inside expanded again, almost as big as an egg, and the surrounding wounds began to fester again. Scholar Ferdinand stretched out his hand to the magician assistant beside him. The assistant handed over a piece of magic crystal on the test table without any prompting. Scholar Ferdinand took the transparent three-sided crystal and scanned it carefully next to Serdak's legs. He frowned slightly and carefully scraped off a trace of festering flesh and blood from the edge of the wound, placed it next to a magic crystal ball on the test bench, and then recited a spell, and the flesh and blood the size of a fingernail turned into a wisp of black in a moment. The flames disappeared completely. Scholar Ferdinand's face became more serious. He raised his head and asked Soldek, How long have you had this wound? Almost two weeks, Serdak replied. Scholar Ferdinand continued to ask, Where was this injury caused? Seeing that Scholar Ferdinand had a serious expression on his face, Lance quickly explained to Soldek, He is a knight in the guard camp, and he was injured when he and I went on a mission to Grenfell Manor last time. With Lance's endorsement, Scholar Ferdinand nodded and suddenly said, It turns out to be the black magic of the black magic hermitage. This explains it clearly. However, he asked Serdak curiously, What did you do to prevent it from getting worse? It is said that it is a miracle that your leg did not completely rot after delaying treatment for so long. Serdak was stunned on the spot. He didn't expect that his injury would be so serious. He thought it was just an unhealed burn. But now it seems that it is not that simple. No. Is it so serious? Lance also opened his mouth, showing a surprised expression. Scholar Ferdinand nodded seriously and said, This is not an ordinary wound. He is cursed by black magic. If it were in the past, this kind of black magic curse would be easy to deal with. Just go to the god in the city of Alinsa. Temple, you can find the priest to help you purify the curse. But now the temple in Alinsa city has been completely closed, and the priest disappeared two years ago. If you want to lift the curse, you have to. It's a big problem. Then Scholar Ferdinand said, However, I hope you can answer. How do you delay the black magic curse from eroding your body? Serdak quickly released a trace of sacred aura, causing a faint golden light to appear in his palm. He explained this from a magical perspective. This should be regarded as a magical element with sacred attributes. They say I have a little bit of an element of sacred magic. Soldak said. Scholar Ferdinand looked at Serdak again, nodded to him and said, Oh, no wonder it is like this. He is actually another warrior who has awakened his magic perception. And he has also awakened a very rare sacred attribute. I don't even know how long it's been since the Green Empire saw a paladin. Lance interjected and asked, Scholar Ferdinand, can you lift this black magic curse? Scholar Ferdinand pondered for a moment before saying, I don't know this without testing it. My magic research does not involve black magic curses. But you can perceive the magic elements of sacred attributes. The power of the holy light is just right restrain black magic. And perhaps the answer to breaking the curse of black magic lies within yourself. You cannot completely eliminate it now because you are not strong enough. What should I do? Scholar Ferdinand. Serdak humbly asked for advice. Scholar Ferdinand looked at Serdak and hesitated before saying, My method is to saw off your leg and let the black magic curse be thrown into the furnace together with your half leg. Burn them together. 
and I am sure to replace you with a new leg that is better to use. Of course, you can also choose some parts of Warcraft other than humans, such as the tentacles of an emperor squid or the hind legs of a magic antelope. That will let you run faster and jump higher. Soldak felt that Scholar Ferdinand was not joking. He wanted to smile. But his face became a little stiff, and he couldn't smile. Is there no other way? I can help you prepare some magic potions to help you suppress the deterioration of the injury. But the effect should be very limited. The only way at the moment is to continue to drag out the leg injury. And wait until you become stronger. So powerful that the divine power can completely suppress it. It. Or just melt it away. Scholar Ferdinand said to Soldek. Or you can find a priest in the temple to help you purify the curse. Chapter 359 Magic Pattern Clothing A potion that can suppress the curse of dark magic? Serdak looked at Scholar Ferdinand with a blank expression. That's right, Scholar Ferdinand said. Looking for a priest is basically impossible in the city of Halanza at this stage. The only way to dispel the curse is to use this dispelling potion. He took a blank piece of parchment from the experimental table and quickly wrote a series of words with a quill. They were all names of magic grass that Serdak had never heard of. Such as three emperor blood grasses. Just hearing the name of this magic grass makes me think it is very rare. Scholar Ferdinand raised his head and took a serious look at Serdak and said, I can prepare the magic potion for you for free, but you need to find some magic herbs in it that you need to collect on your own. The magic market in Halensa magical herbs are very scarce. Many common magic herbs are now difficult to buy. Many magic herbal shops in the magic guild have closed down in recent months. The rare magic herbs on the list may have to be auctioned. Let's try our luck. I will pay more attention. Scholar Ferdinand. Serdak took the parchment, looked at the names of the herbs in the herbal list, and secretly complained. It is no secret that magic herbs are scarce in the market of the Green Empire. In the past few years, wars have broken out frequently in the Green Empire, until the priests and priests in the Freedom Temple refused to give any form of help to the Green Empire army. The war casualties doubled overnight. The price of magic herbs on the magic market was rapidly rising, as several planes rich in magical herbs were captured by the forces of the Abyss. Magic herbs were out of stock in many areas of the Green Empire. Serdak very carefully put this list of herbal medicines into his pocket, thinking about how to get so many kinds of rare magic herbs. If the production cost of these magic herbs was higher than those of sand wolf head sacrifices, it would be better. Simply use the blessed body to suppress the black curse in your body. According to Scholar Ferdinand, the power of holy light in his body happens to be the nemesis of the black curse. But its power cannot completely remove the black curse. If he continues to light up those nodes in his body, maybe it won't take long to break the dark curse. Scholar Ferdinand also saw Serdak's problem. He may have felt that Serdak could not suppress the black curse on his body. So he whispered to him, If it is really impossible to suppress the black curse, when the injury spreads and the injury worsens to the point where you have to give up the leg, you can come to me at any time. I didn't joke with you before. I can help you change a leg, as long as it is not a human leg. Among these instruments, the animal leg is up to you. And most importantly, you will gain some new abilities because of this beast leg. After saying this, he stood up and walked to a group of glass containers next to the rest area. He knocked on the nearly one meter high glass container with his hand and motioned for the two of them to come closer and appreciate his collection of years of collection. Serdak and Lance approached and found that the container was filled with light green liquid and there was an animal leg soaked in it. The hairy animal leg looked very strong and there were faint black magic patterns on the gray fur. The gray hair of the toes showed through. And there were only two thick toes at the end, which looked like two sweet potatoes squeezed together. Scholar Ferdinand told Soldak, This is a hind leg cut off from an adult male jerboa. If you choose the hind legs of this jerboa, you may be able to jump out in one step. Excellent jumping ability of 7 to 8 meters. If you choose the front legs of this devil antelope, Scholar Ferdinand pointed to a glass jar next to him and he enthusiastically introduced the collection in the laboratory to Soldak. Lance followed, winking at Soldak frequently. Soldak understood the intention of Lance's eyes, probably explaining that Scholar Ferdinand had such a personality and liked to show off his weird collections to others. He nodded calmly to Lance to show that he understood. After Scholar Ferdinand introduced five or six kinds of monster legs in one breath, he glanced at the surrounding glass jars with unsatisfied interest. If it weren't for the magic seal on them, Scholar Ferdinand might want to open the jars, take out the animal legs inside, and show them to Serdak. Are these Warcraft specimens? Serdak looked at the glass jars, some of which contained Warcraft heads, and thought to himself, 
if the heads can still survive. Can they still be considered human beings? Scholar Ferdinand said to Soldak solemnly. They are not specimens. These are the magic materials I have accumulated over the years, even though they have been dismembered. I can guarantee that they are still alive. As he spoke, he tapped the side wall of another glass bottle with his magic wand. He saw that there was a sheep's head in the glass bottle. When he knocked on the side of the glass, it made a pleasant jingle, and there was a sheep's head inside. When I really opened my eyes, there was something indescribably weird. Scholar Ferdinand said earnestly, In the past few years, I have been following my teacher, Professor Sinji University, in the research of magical biology. The topic that my teacher is currently researching is magic pattern transfer. We have tried to combine the bodies of some powerful monsters with those of other magical beasts. The heads of primary intelligent creatures are connected together to give them new abilities. This experimental research has begun to bear fruit. I am confident that through the magic circle and magic contract, these animal legs can be perfectly integrated with your body. Serdak kept smiling politely and shook his head resolutely, thinking that he could not reattach an animal leg no matter what. Scholar Ferdinand sighed, but still refused to give up and said, If you want to try, you can come to me at any time. People can never give up worldly prejudices. Of course, he muttered the last part under his breath. Scholar Ferdinand, I have no intention of giving up this right leg for the time being. Soldek said to Scholar Ferdinand, Of course, no one will ask you to make a choice immediately. Scholar Ferdinand replied, Seeing that Scholar Ferdinand was still a very knowledgeable scholar, Soldek asked curiously, Can some part of the body of these monsters really colonize our bodies? Of course. It seems that you still don't understand this magic subject. Scholar Ferdinand saw that Serdak did not reject this, and he immediately became energetic again. He continued to preach. Speaking of this, I'm afraid there are some many magicians can't understand it, and some even think that magic pattern transfer belongs to the category of black magic. In fact, this is advanced magical biology, and I am a very successful example. As he spoke, he lifted up his magic robe, let Serdak look at one of his legs with brown scales, and said to Serdak, This is a jungle iguana caught from a wild swamp. What I got on my body was when I followed Mr. Henji on an adventure in the wild swamp, and the petrifying ray from the eye of a basilisk hit my legs. At that time, my legs turned into two hard stone pillars. I didn't hesitate at that time. He chose to transplant the healthy legs of a jungle iguana and participated in the entire magical transplantation ceremony. This is also the transplantation magic ritual that I am most certain to successfully perform. Scholar Ferdinand vowed. Isn't it very convincing? Look, it is actually very convenient to use. Isn't it? He took two more steps back and forth in front of Serdak. Serdak forced a smile and nodded to Scholar Ferdinand. Soldak remembered the colonization equipment that the great wizard in Oyatila once said. The magic patterns on the monsters can be transplanted to the human body. If there is enough carrying capacity, the magic patterns on the clothing can be obtained. Strength. After the great wizard in Oyatila transplanted the magic patterns on the monsters to the indigenous people, the indigenous people gained great power in a short period of time and died soon after. Therefore, although Zerdak learned some knowledge about magic pattern breeding from the great wizard in Oyatila, he never wanted to study it. Now it seems that what the great wizard in Oyatila said is actually it is so similar to the topic studied by Ferdinand scholars. Soldak then said, I once encountered an indigenous tribe in the mountains of Handanar County on the plain of Warsaw. There was a powerful indigenous warrior among the group of indigenous people. Those warriors were usually just a group of ordinary tribesmen. Aboriginals. Before every war, the great witches in the tribe will stick the leather of the hunted monsters on their bodies. They will temporarily have strong power. But this power usually does not last long. When their power disappears, their lives will it has also come to an end. Due to the continuous wars in recent years, almost all the men in that tribe have died. The infantry team I was in was chasing a green-faced evil ghost deep into the area. Serdak simply described the native tribe. Scholar Ferdinand listened very carefully, and he even asked the great wizard of Inoyatila in detail how to completely peel off the hide of the monster and how to transfer the power. Of course, Serdak couldn't speak out about the sacrifice ceremony, so he just vaguely said that he didn't understand it well either. Scholar Ferdinand felt a little regretful and wished he could go to the Warsaw Plain immediately. He rubbed his hands vigorously and said to Soldak, The kind you are talking about is also a kind of magic pattern transfer. They just implant animal skins or bones with magic patterns on their bodies. This is called magic pattern implantation in the magic field. 
This is different from the magic pattern structure is more powerful. But the prerequisite is to explore the mystery of the life magic pattern. That is, you must first be proficient in the life magic pattern. And you must also find a suitable carrier. Once the carrier cannot be affected by the power of the life magic pattern, it will endanger your life. Lance rarely heard about this kind of knowledge. When he heard Scholar Ferdinand talking about the magic pattern clothing, he pretended to be listening. Scholar Ferdinand kept asking Serdak for details. Serdak will completely tell the story of the battle that opened the gate of evil in the valley where the indigenous tribes are located. Scholar Ferdinand even asked the three indigenous warriors whether they needed to do such trivial matters as eating, sleeping and going to the toilet after gaining strength. When Serdak said that they all died one after another within a week after the victory in the battle, he couldn't help but sigh. I am very interested in these interesting things. I hope you can talk to me more about these things and tell me everything you know. If conditions permit in the future, I would like to organize an expedition to the Warsaw Plain. But for now, no. I heard that Duke Ryan Busman caused big trouble in the Imperial Capital. Not only did he completely anger the Magician's Guild, but he also offended the Prince of Wales and Prince James. He left the Imperial Capital in disgrace. When we arrive at the Warsaw Plain, a large number of magicians are currently evacuating from the Warsaw Plain. It would not be a wise move for us to go to the Warsaw Plain at this time. What about Duke Newman? Will he lead the Bena army to evacuate the Warsaw Plain? This was the first time Lance heard the news. And he hurriedly asked Scholar Ferdinand. That's not necessarily true. The Bena Legion is currently located in Handenar County on the Warsaw Plain. If they want to withdraw from the entire territory, even the transfer of territory will not be completed in less than half a year. Ferdinand the scholar said. What's more? There are so many business groups and huge logistic supply lines supporting the Bena army. How can it be so easy to withdraw? I hope the Bena Legion will not be involved. Lance muttered. Soldak and Lance chatted for a long time at Scholar Ferdinand. Finally, Scholar Ferdinand's magic assistant urged the meeting at the Magic Guild to start. Scholar Ferdinand reluctantly got up to attend the meeting. Before leaving, he told Soldak that he would come to the Magic Guild when he had time. Turn around. In addition to those rare magic herbs, there are ordinary magic herbs on the magic potion list. Scholar Ferdinand can help collect them. When Lance and Serdak left the second floor of the magic tower and the two walked out of the door of the magic guild, Lance took a long breath, patted his chest and said to Serdak, I was really afraid that you would be raped by Ferdy. The southern German scholar was convinced and agreed to his magic experiment. Lance carefully reminded Soldak. In fact, the potion he prepared is more reliable. You must not give up your right leg in a hurry. Serdak smiled and nodded, indicating that he would not. Although he had never thought about changing his legs, he was very interested in the magic pattern breeding clothing described by Scholar Ferdinand. Are you going to go to the magic herbal shop? Lance said enthusiastically, I know the owner of a magic herbal shop very well. I think he might be able to help you. Okay. Soldak agreed. The two of them strolled around the magic herbal shops around the magic guild. Only then did Soldak have a clear understanding of magic herbal medicines. There were almost no valuable magic herbs on the shelves of these magic herbal medicine shops. Grasses. Only some of the most common hemostatic grasses. Most of the bosses in the herbal medicine stores have gloomy faces. There is no need for them to complain. It can be seen at a glance how depressed the magic herb industry is. The two of them wandered around until dark, but couldn't find any of the magic herbs on the list. Lance said with some frustration. It seems that the only way to try your luck is to go to the auction house. Nowadays, most magic herbs are sold in the auction house. Soldak nodded. He knew that there was a tavern in the city of Valencia that was an auction house. He thought that he could find time to go there for a stroll. Thinking of this, he touched his magic pocket and found the items in the auction house. Not too cheap. Lance said to Soldak again. I will also help you keep an eye on the news about the priests in the Temple of Freedom. Serdak expressed his gratitude to Lance for his enthusiastic help. The two of them originally wanted to have a drink. On the way, Lance saw the lighthouse on the top of the magic tower lighting up with red light. His face changed slightly, and he faced Serdak. Said, It seems that I can't drink anymore. The law enforcement team has summoned all members of the city. And I have to rush there. As he said that, he pulled out a magic harpoon from his magic waste bag. Nimbly rode on the magic harpoon and flew towards the magic tower at dusk with a whoosh sound. Serdak had no choice but to drag his injured leg back to the Night Academy dormitory. When he returned to the dormitory, he found that the blood hole on his right leg had remained the size of an egg. The bleeding blood stained the hemostatic bandage. 
Sernak saw himself in the mirror. His face was a little pale. He sat on the bed and thought about it seriously. He started the sacrificial ceremony in the room. A beam of light shrouded his body. The warm power spread all over his body. Sernak immediately felt the wound on his leg. It is shrinking rapidly. Although it has not completely healed, it is only the size of an arrow hole. More importantly, the bleeding has stopped. Sardak thought to himself, If that doesn't work, he can go to Paglo's Mountain to hunt some sand wolves and save more sacrifices. Chapter 360 Roaring Miss Darcy Walking into the Sword Hall I happened to see Darcy Christie walking out of the practice room wearing tight-fitting light leather armor. There was a thin sword hanging on her waist. Her legs looked particularly slender due to her tall figure. But her the shoulders are slightly broad, giving people a very strong feeling. Soldak has often gone to the Academy's sword hall to practice swordsmanship recently. And most of the time, he was invited by Darcy Christie. Soldak benefited a lot from this kind of swordsmanship competition in the sword hall every time. The fancy swordsmanship described in many books cannot be understood by just turning two pages of the book. In this regard, graduation Darcy Christie from the Hubina Advanced Swordsman Academy has very strong strength. Serdak has a very solid grasp of basic swordsmanship, but he does not understand some exquisite sword moves. Many techniques and tactics are learned from the battlefield. Those are fighting skills on the battlefield. In the sword hall and with during Darcy Christie's competition, Soldak could not use those fighting skills on the battlefield. So Darcy Christie was always suppressing him in the sword skill competition. But every time Darcy Christie wants to win against Soldak, she has to do her best. Seeing Soldak appear at the door of the sword hall is promised. Miss Darcy had a proud smile on her face and raised her chin slightly, which seemed to better show off her slender neck and delicate collarbones. Serdak said, Soldak, you are late today. Sorry. The story told by Teacher Colin in the last history class was a bit long. Even if the bell rang, he refused to announce the end of school. We had to wait for him to finish the story before leaving the classroom. But the story he told was still not bad. This time it tells about the war with the orcs on the Pipe Plateau 80 years ago. Serdak walked to the wooden frame, picked a heavy wooden sword and carried it in his hand, and then followed Darcy. Christy walked into the practice room. In that war, the Green Empire's constructed knights fought against the Orc tribe's wolf cavalry, but they probably didn't gain any advantage. Later, the Green Empire imposed an economic blockade on the Pi Plateau Orc tribe for decades. However, in recent years, in the year, the trade between the Empire and the Orc seems to have resumed and countless caravans have flocked to the Pipe Plateau to pick up gold. Darcy Christie walked in front, and said to Soldak as she walked, walking to the front of a practice room. Darcy Christie opened the door, and the sound of fighting could be heard from inside. Serdak didn't expect that there was anyone else in the practice room. Then he discovered that there was Miss Hoyle in the practice room, wearing a set of exquisite leather armor. Standing opposite her was the knight Ivan Baruch. I saw him teaching Miss Hoyle sword skills in a persuasive manner. After the door was opened by Darcy, the two people in the practice room looked toward the door. When Ivan Baruch saw Soldak standing at the door, he immediately stopped what he was doing and greeted Sue with enthusiasm. Erdak said, I heard from Miss Hoyle that Knight Serdak and Miss Darcy are going to compete in swordsmanship here in the afternoon. I have always wanted to learn Knight Serdak's sword skills. So I took the liberty to come here this time. Darcy put on an air of Hoyle insists on bringing him over to Soldak. During the recent period of contact with Darcy, Soldak gradually discovered that Darcy Christie is an aristocratic lady with a distinctive personality. She is assertive and competitive, and at the same time a little selfish. In order to make herself the interests of others are guaranteed, and they believe that even if they harm the interests of others a little, it is a matter of course. She is also the binder of aristocratic etiquette. She knows that kindness, gentleness, and virtuousness are the words of praise for ladies. As long as her interests are not harmed, these virtues can be seen in her body, and she will very decently done. She will act like a well-educated aristocratic lady, at least in the Knight Academy. She is the kind of woman who is admired. At the same time, she is a somewhat cold and arrogant female swordsmanship instructor. She is also the subject of discussion among many trainee knights in the Academy. She is somewhat famous in the Academy, and is popular among a group of trainee knights. Serdak spread his hands and said to Ivan Baruch, I came to the Knight Academy to take classes to make up for my shortcomings in sword skills. I am a shield warrior of the Heavy Armored Infantry Regiment and have never been exposed to advanced sword skills. Dot. When Ivan Baruch heard what Serdak said, he immediately became interested. He said to Serdak very enthusiastically, I am very proficient in swordsmanship. 
I can give you some advice. Our Baruch family once there was an earl who was the commander of a heavy cavalry regiment under the command of Archduke Newman of the previous generation. I have always wanted to join the Bena Legion. But my family felt that I was too young and had never had the opportunity to go to the battlefield to gain merit. Otherwise, I would never he is still just a knight. Miss Hoyle's eyes have been falling on Ivan Baruch. And hearing what he said, her big eyes look even more watery. Miss Hoyle, who had fallen in love, had completely lost her basic judgment and looked at Ivan Baruch with admiration. Serdak glanced at Darcy Christie and saw that she just smiled and said nothing. He said to Ivan Baruch with a headache, I'm just a beginner. Since Knight Ivan is proficient in advanced swordsmanship, I think forget it. Darcy Christie heard what Soldak said and knew that he was unwilling to compete with Ivan Baruch. So she said, Boyle, are you going to attend the auction this afternoon? There is still time. This delay? Yes. If you didn't tell me, I almost forgot. This time, there is a work by Master Moltz. I have always wanted to buy a hat cut by Master Moltz himself. I don't want to miss it this time. Miss Hoyle said. With that said, he wanted to take Ivan Baruch away. Knight Ivan Baruch was a little reluctant to part with him. It seemed that he didn't want to participate in the auction. But he didn't want to show it. In the end, he was pulled away by Miss Hoyle. Through the glass window of the practice room, the two of them could just see Miss Hoyle holding Ivan Baruch's arm and walking out of the Knight Academy affectionately. When Darcy Christie looked at Ivan Baruch with a mocking expression on her face, she said to Soldak, You see? This is what you see. Everyone thinks that Ivan Baruch is unreliable. Only Hoyle is caught in it and cannot see Ivan Baruch's many shortcomings. She has been blinded. He couldn't listen to anything our friends advised her. And now all the choices she makes are blind. Soldak looked at Darcy Christie without saying a word. Darcy Christie's expression gradually became unnatural as Soldak stared at her. She relaxed her shoulders and said indifferently, Earl Hoyle and my father are close friends. Hoyle and I grew up together my friends, and I don't know how to persuade her. She won't listen to anything we say. And we can't offend Ivan Baruch too much. His grandfather is a member of the House of Representatives of Valenza. So you dragged him to the sword hall and plan to use my hand to teach him a lesson? Then have you ever thought about whether his family would cause trouble for me if I left Ivan Baruch? Soldak's face darkened. And he wanted to fall out with the woman in front of him on the spot. Darcy Christie forced a smile and said to Soldak, I know it was my fault. Then she tried to explain. I just feel that you are a little different in Hoyle's eyes. She always looks evasive when she sees you. She is an aristocratic lady who owns a complete viscounty. If you marry her, you can join the aristocracy. Isn't it nice to have a circle and inherit a large territory? The implication is that she planned a sword competition as an opportunity to let Serdak beat up the knight Ivan Baruch. Another blow to win love. Soldak felt that he and Darcy Christie had nothing to talk about. So he simply turned around and left. Darcy Christie quickly stepped forward to stop Soldak and said to him, Hey, wait a minute. I know it's a bit rude for not telling you in advance. But haven't I already apologized? If I can marry someone what's wrong with a famous concubine getting a large territory? Darcy Christie roared loudly at Soldak's back. But Soldak walked out of the sword hall without even looking back. 